This is Audible. The Spread. The Complete Infection. Books 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Written by Ian Rob Wright. Narrated by Aubrey Parsons. The Spread. Book 1. The Hill. Written by Ian Rob Wright. Narrated by Aubrey Parsons. Chapter 1 Here they come! Here they come! Lightning surged through Ryan Cartwright's veins as a car appeared in the distance, bouncing up the hillside. The lads were over three hours late, but that didn't matter. They were here now. This is going to be legendary. No women, no work, no worries. Disappointingly, Ryan's younger brother, Aaron, didn't even feign excitement. It had taken weeks of hard persuasion to get him to leave his video games behind for a couple of days. But he was making no effort to disguise the fact that he didn't want to be there. Pasty-skinned and greasy-haired, Aaron looked very little like Ryan, and the differences continued beyond appearances. While Ryan was confident and athletic, Aaron was a loner who would benefit from a little more sun. Besides having the same chestnut brown hair and matching green eyes, they looked completely unrelated. All the same, Ryan was glad his little brother had come along on the weekend. It meant a lot. So he put his arm around him and gave him a reassuring squeeze. It'll be a laugh, I promise, Aaron nodded. Yeah? The approaching car was a sleek 4x4, four four, and in the weak autumnal sunshine, its opulent red paint shone like a thousand rubies. It crunched to a halt on the weedy gravel in front of the cottage, completely out of place against the ancient landscape. The engine grumbled and the vehicle went to sleep. All four of its doors opened. Ryan met Tom at the driver's side. His friend's neat blonde hair had grown long, and a fuzzy goatee elongated his slender face. Nice motor, mate, what is it? Tom, grinning proudly, running a hand over the sleek red bonnet. Alfa Romeo Stelvio. Drove it away from the dealership last week as a treat for having such a great financial year. Handsome, isn't she? I'm actually considering breaking things off with Amanda, just so I can spend more time behind the wheel. Would that be incredibly materialistic of me? Ryan chuckled. I reckon so, yeah, mate. How are things going with Amanda anyway? It's been six months and you haven't even introduced us yet. I'm cautiously optimistic that she may be the one. We'll have to grab dinner together soon. I'd like that. Luby rounded the Stelvio's bonnet, his belly jiggling beneath a stripy jumper. A grin took up most of his face. She didn't run a mile when she saw Tom's shiny knob, so that's a good sign. Tom rolled his eyes, but took the joke as intended. I wanted to call her, actually, to let her know we'd arrived safely, but I haven't had a signal since we left the village. Is there a landline here? Ryan gave an apologetic frown. Sorry, mate, we're completely cut off here. No signal, no landline, no Wi-Fi. We can head into the village tomorrow morning, though, to make a call, if that's cool. Tom seemed to mull it over, both hands in his chino pockets. He was the only one of them not wearing jeans. Hmm, I suppose that'll have to be okay. Hopefully she won't worry too much. Treat her mean, keep them keen, said Luby. It'll make her want you more. Ryan gave his best friend a hug. How are you doing, Luby? I ain't seen you, man. Where have you been hiding? I've been proper busy, mate. Old man got a job tarmacking for the council and it's been a right madden. Well, at least you got plenty of work. You look like you've lost weight. Luby put his hands on his hips and gyrated. Ain't morbidly obese no more, me. Just regular obese. Lasses can't get enough. Ryan chuckled. I'll bet. Luby definitely looked better for the weight loss, but something about him didn't seem quite right. It was as if his bones were too big for his body. He'd shaved his head as well, which made his face appear pudgy and round. Might have to break it to you later, our kid. It's not a good look. 
Sean and Brett moved from the side of the Stelvio and joined everyone at the front. Sean was twitching like a maniac as per usual, the human incarceration of Mad Ferret. His green eyes shifted left and right as he hopped on the toes of his blood-red trainers. This place is proper mint. You could chop some poor bastard up here and no one would ever find the pieces. Next to him, Brett rolled his eyes behind his sensible black glasses. He was always the most serious of the group, but it only took a few drinks to loosen him up. After that, he was as up for a laugh as anybody was. It's the Scottish Highlands, Sean, he muttered, not the Nevada desert. There's gangsters everywhere, pal, you should know that. Because I'm black? Nah, because you're a shady bastard. I'm a fully qualified veterinarian. Exactly. What kind of geezer studies eight years to stick his finger up a dog's ass? Shady is what that is. Idiot. Ryan chuckled. He was already having the best time he'd had in ages. Just being with the lads made him happy. When was the last time they'd all been together like this? Too long. I've been spending too much time with Sophie. Luby went to Aaron who was still standing on the uneven slabs that made up the cottage's front step. How's it going, our kid? Oh, good. Are you going to have a lark with us? Yeah. Luby didn't push it. He knew Aaron well enough to recognise his shyness, so he tussled the lad's greasy brown hair and turned back to the others. Sean's right, this place is mint. We're going to have a right laugh. Yeah, we are, said Ryan looking around and enjoying the scenery with his mates. Living in Manchester, he'd hopped the border into Scotland once or twice, but he'd never gone further than Glasgow. The seven-hour drive it had taken to reach the cottage had been miserable. And at 4am this morning, when he and Aaron had set off, it seemed like the biggest mistake ever. That changed as soon as the landlord ferried them up from the village and handed over the keys. Ryan had never seen the sky so wide or the land so vibrantly hued. He had expected mountainous grey rock and featureless glens, but the highlands were nothing like that. The land was full of life, coloured in a hundred different shades. A multitude of birds filled the sky. Every bush rustled when you passed it, unseen critters hiding within. The drive had been worth it. This entire weekend will be worth it. Where's your car? asked Tom, peering around, hands still in his chinos. Ryan blushed. I parked up in the village to grab the keys and the landlord pissed himself laughing. Cheeky sod said I wouldn't make it halfway here before I ended up in a ditch. I had to leave me car behind while he drove us up here in his Land Rover. McGregor his name was. Could barely understand a word he said. Sean threw his head back and laughed. I told you not to buy that poxy Audi, you daft bastard. You're a right poser, you are, our kid. Hey, don't insult the TT, she's my girl. Brett folded his arm and raised an eyebrow, his classic pose born from an innate disapproval of most things. I thought Sophie was your girl, isn't that why we're here, to celebrate your love and impending nuptials? Do one, said Sean. We're here to get hanging, starting now. Luby pulled a face. Can't we have a mooch first? Let's enjoy some of this clean air. There ain't a kebab shop in sight. Sean recoiled, orange freckles bunching on his cheeks. You what? We ain't here to go sightseeing, you bellend. I just want to settle in first before the madness starts. It was a long drive and I'm knackered. Tom seemed to agree because he was nodding. The drive was an endurance test, to say the least. It didn't help that Luby and Sean were competing in the Fart Olympics most of the way here. Brett grimaced, his glasses riding on the ridge of his scrunched-up nose. Yeah, that was rough. Luby looked away sheepishly. I couldn't help it. Me guts were acting up. Heaven knows why, said Tom. You didn't need a thing the entire way here. You must be starving. I'll eat later. Ryan was confused. You could usually depend on Luby to have a good time, but he seemed on a downer. His reluctance to party was disheartening, but Ryan didn't want to be a dick about it. So he looked at Sean and shrugged. We're here all weekend, mate. No need to rush. Sod that! 
Sean reached into his jean pocket and produced a baggie filled with a white powder. He dipped a finger in and rubbed the contents on his gums. Ah, oh, that's banging! Anyone want a taste? Everyone declined. While none of them were saints, this was a weekend on the lash, not the reenactment of train spotting. Ryan had never been one for drugs. Alcohol gave him enough of a buzz. Sean could keep his gear. They still had jobs to go to on Monday. Don't think about work. That's the last thing I want in my head. I'm here to have a laugh and nothing else. This might be my last chance. OK, said Ryan, clapping his hands together. Let me give you the grand tour. He strolled towards the side of the cottage, beckoning everyone to follow. Over here, we have a large, mysterious shed, which the landlord informs me is to remain locked at all times. I'm getting in there, said Sean. I swear down. Try to behave, said Tom, smoothing back his blonde hair as it flapped in the wind. I know it'll be difficult. Sod off, Ryan glared at Sean playfully. I had to pay a deposit on this place, mate, so nothing gets broken, OK? It's not meant for parties, usually, but I found it cheap online and convinced the landlord we'd behave. Sean pulled a face. What do you mean it's not meant for parties? It's a spiritual retreat or something. That would explain the spooky-looking cross over there, said Luby, pointing to a circle of white stones, within which stood a large wooden cross. The only thing lacking was a sacrificial altar. Another thing we're not supposed to mess with, said Ryan. It's like hundred years old. The landlord said it would be a crime to damage it. I'm climbing it, said Sean, pupils already like dinner plates. Ryan groaned. Sean, don't make me regret inviting you, OK? I came here to party. This is a stag do, ain't it? Ryan rolled his eyes but ended up laughing. Sean was a live wire, sure, but he'd never been any different. A party with him was a party you remembered, and Ryan wanted this one to be a weekend none of them ever forgot. OK, behind the cottage is a big hill, as you can see. I suggest we don't try to climb it, because the nearest hospital is 30 miles away. Back the way we came, down by the road, is a little stream. Me and Aaron have been down there already, it's nice. The water's crystal clear, said Aaron meekly. There are fish in it. Skinny dipping, said Sean, rubbing his hands together. Nice! Brett pulled a face. Really, Sean, just us guys? Ryan's got strippers, ain't he? Ryan was forced to disappoint them. Do you really think a stripper would come out here? Two miles from the nearest village? To entertain a bunch of drunken idiots? No way, mate. Would have been a non-starter. Tom chuckled and gave Sean a playful shove. His expensive watch glittered in the sunlight. Yes, that would be a rather unwise career move for a young lady. We're not rapists, said Luby, wounded. Jesus, you make it sound like we're dangerous. They all looked at Sean. One of us has already talked about chopping up bodies, said Brett. Sean tutted. I ain't gonna kill nobody, am I? I'm just excited. Good to know, said Ryan. OK, let's go inside. About time. Luby clutched himself and shivered. I'm freezing me nuts off here. You could have booked us a weekend in Ibiza, Ryan. Sean pinched his belly fat. Freezing? With all that insulation? Well, piss off. I'm a bit chilly too, said Aaron, wearing only a light grey jacket. He didn't own anything thicker because he hardly ever left the house. Ryan nodded to the front door, a solid slab of wood with a cute diamond-shaped window at the top. Let's get in and build a fire. Everyone, grab your gear. They grabbed their bags from the car and headed inside. While the exterior was traditional, whitewashed stone and a thatched roof, the interior was modern. Manufactured oak planks covered the floor and the bulk of the living space was open plan. A compact kitchen diner adjoined a large lounge area with a fireplace and television. A stack of shiny blue solar panels behind the cottage provided electricity, along with a diesel generator beside the shed. Even inside, with the door closed, you could hear the motor thrumming away. Ryan led everyone to the kitchen counter, which he'd stacked full of beers, vodka and bottled water. 
There was shopping bags full of snacks on the floor and pizzas in the fridge. Eat regularly and stay hydrated, he told them, or you'll be out of the game. I'll stick to vodka, me, said Sean, grabbing a bottle and unscrewing the cap. Before he swigged, he looked at everyone and shrugged. What? It's what we're here for, ain't it? Ryan grabbed a beer. Let's get this party started. Because Tom is coming out, said Sean, elbowing Tom in the ribs. Tom rolled his eyes. Moron. Next, Ryan showed everyone to their bedrooms. The master was on the ground floor at the rear of the cottage, through a door beside the stairs. Ryan and Aaron would share its double bed. The staircase was opposite the kitchen, and on the upper floor were three cramped bedrooms. Sean and Luby agreed to share the room with twin beds, while Brett and Tom had a double each. Sean pulled a face when they re-emerged onto the landing. There's only one bathroom. I ain't going in after Luby's taking a dump. Everyone chuckled. We're in the wilderness, said Aaron. He clutched himself as he spoke, as if he was worried someone might prod him in the chest. Everywhere's a toilet, if you want it to be. Sean nodded. Good point, our kid. Luby, you'll have to drop your kecks outside. Luby shoved Sean against the pastel blue wall. It wasn't a fair fight when it came to weight divisions, but Sean rubbed his elbow and grinned like a Cheshire cat. Get off, you fat bastard! Everyone laughed. The noise echoed off the old-fashioned white tiles that made up the bathroom's floor. The toilet and bath were lime green, the colour of kiwis, the sink too. Ryan felt a little queasy just looking at it. Time for an update. Sean was still beaming. I've missed you, Pillocks. We should do this more often. Ryan nodded enthusiastically. I know, right? What happened to us? We, we used to go uptown every weekend. Now we're all too busy. We grew up, said Tom. We're not teenagers anymore, Ryan. You're about to get married. I'm settled down with Amanda and Luby has a daughter. Brett sticks his fingers up dog's bum holes, Sean added. Brett rolled his eyes. You really are on form today, aren't you? Are you going to be like this all weekend? There's a strong possibility. Ryan sighed, frustrated without really knowing why. Growing up doesn't mean our lives have to be over, though, does it? We can still have a laugh. Of course we can, said Luby. We're here now, ain't we? Ryan patted him on the back. I'm just missing the old days, I guess. Sean pointed a finger at Ryan and cackled. He's getting cold feet, lads. Is that why you dragged us out here in the middle of nowhere, our kid? You're running out on the missus. Ryan felt himself blush. Give over. I'm just glad we're all together like old times. It means a lot that you all came. Of course we came, said Tom. We wouldn't have missed it for the world. Absolutely, said Luby, cracking his first actual smile since he'd arrived. You're my best mates and always will be. Sean reached out and grabbed Luby's cock, making him shy away. The hell you doing, Sean? Ah, uh, sorry, our kid. I thought we were going to start nobbing. Uh, can we go downstairs now and start drinking, you bunch of jesses? A smile crept onto Ryan's face. This was going to be a weekend to remember. OK, lads, let's go make some memories. Everyone agreed. Chapter 2 Ryan got a buzz as he started his third beer, and he was pleased to see Aaron moving on to his second. Maybe his younger brother would actually loosen up and have a good time this weekend. This might make it worth the ear-bashing Ryan's mam had given him about taking a 15-year-old on a stag do. Best make sure he doesn't overdo it. A couple of hangovers won't kill him, though. I just need to keep him away from Sean. Yeah, definitely keep him away from Sean. A blue three-seater sofa took up the largest part of the lounge, placed opposite the stone fireplace. A beige two-seater sat perpendicular to it, with a black leather armchair completing the U-shaped seating arrangement and a low glass coffee table making up the centre. A modest television was perched on a table in the corner, while a narrow console table took up the space beside the front door. A lamp 
and a guest book sat on top of it. Brett was sitting on the larger sofa beside Ryan, sipping from a highball glass full of vodka and coke. As well as being the most serious, he was also the most intelligent, a full-blown vet as of a few months ago when he'd finally qualified. It made Ryan anxious just thinking about the amount of studying and training it must have taken Brett to get where he was. He would have had to have quit after the first year. In fact, that's what Ryan had done. A year of technical college, but no more, thank you very much. Goodbye, forever classrooms. Stick it up your ass, teachers. Brett was a different animal, though. Driven, determined, and desperate to show that a black kid from Manchester's mean streets could achieve anything an entitled white kid from Hampshire could. To his credit, he'd done just that. Ryan nodded at Brett's drink. You're off to a good start. Tough week? Brett tilted his glass and stared through his glasses into the fizzy brown mixture. Not particularly. Had to euthanise a four-year-old cocker spaniel, which wasn't fun. But other than that, it's been a pretty routine few days. I don't think I could do your job, mate. After eight years of studying, I would hope not. Nah, I mean, I couldn't put an animal down. Brett tutted. I'm not a monster. The cocker spaniel ingested rat poison from a neighbour's garden. His kidneys were failing. It's not my favourite part of the job, admittedly, but I remind myself that the animals are going to suffer with or without me. My job is to help those I can. Ryan raised his pint glass. Proper respect, mate. I'm proud of you. Brett clinked his glass against Ryan's. I'm proud of you too. Give over. I'm 25 and dig flower beds for a living. Yeah, sure, now and then my boss might let me help lay a deck, but other than that, I'm a dog's body. Right, success story, me. I'm proud that you're getting married. To be honest, I thought you'd stay a bachelor forever. Instead, you're one of the first of us to take the plunge. Ryan's throat was dry, so he swigged his lager before talking again. I ain't married yet. This weekend, I'm still a free man. I'll toast to that. To freedom, said Ryan, loudly enough that everybody heard him. They all raised their drinks. To freedom and drugs, said Sean. In the last two or three hours, he'd taken another two hits from his baggie of cocaine, and he was now talking a mile a minute. Luby had adopted a blank expression, no longer even attempting to keep up. In fact, he seemed liberated by the brief interruption. Anyone fancy a cuppa, he said. Might take the chill off it. Ryan frowned. I'm not cold, mate. We've got a good fire going. Thanks to Tom, who'd stacked the wood like an expert, due to having grown up in a big old house that seemed to have an open fireplace in every single room. Get a drink down ya, said Sean. I can't believe you ain't had one yet. What's wrong with you? Luby shrugged. I'm just feeling a bit iffy. Think it's travel sickness from the never-ending dive here. Excuse me, said Tom pissily. You were brought here in absolute luxury. Your car might be luxurious, said Sean, but you drive like a joyriding wino. And if you don't ride an Alfa Romeo fast, you don't deserve to be behind the wheel. Sean looked at the others while nodding at Tom. Ark at him, Jeremy Sodding Clark's in here. Tom chuckled. Yes, okay, Bez. Everyone hooted with laughter. Sean straightened up in his armchair. Folks, that's supposed to mean nothing, it's a joke. I don't get it. The joke, said Tom, is that we're all from Manchester, but none of us are anywhere near as mank as you. Everyone laughed, except for Sean, who leaned forward with a scowl on his face. His eyes were like deep pools of ink. I'm proud of me roots, me. Why don't you piss off back to private school if you don't like it, Tom? Whoa, 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 said Luby. Chill out, our kid. Don't bring the mood down. Sean's freckled cheeks flushed, matching the colour of his short, coppery hair. Posh twat and his goddamn Alfa Romeo thinks his shit don't stink. Tom rolled his eyes. We've been mates for over a decade, Sean. When have I ever acted like the snob? You always thought you were better than us. Ryan didn't like where this was going. If problems occurred this weekend, 
it would most definitely be because of Sean. They all knew it. Whenever they had used to go out on the lash, Sean would always be the one to start a fight or disappear in a taxi with some dodgy bird. But out here in the middle of nowhere, there were no strangers for Sean to go off with. There was only the six of them. Get real, Sean! Ryan tried to convey the ridiculousness of the situation by chuckling as he spoke. Tom isn't being a snob, he's just proud of his new car, wouldn't you be? If I worked for it, yeah, not if me old man bought it. Tom growled, are you kidding me? I paid for it myself. In fact, no I didn't, it's a goddamn lease, okay? Sean leapt out of the armchair and started pacing back and forth on the other side of the coffee table like a caged lion. A lease, paid for by a fat solicitor's salary from daddy's firm. Tom stood up too. I've had enough of this. More fool me for offering to drive everybody up here. I shouldn't have bothered. Sean stopped pacing and glared. You want to make a move, our kid? No, I don't. I'm going outside to get some air. Please move out of the way. And what if I don't? Aaron put his hands on his head. Please stop fighting. Ryan leapt up between the two of them. Sean's eyes were all over the place, rolling around like marbles. Maybe you ought to lay off the powder, Sean. You're being a right dickhead. Sean rarely got nasty with Ryan, and thankfully this was one of those times. Instead of being outraged, he dropped back down in the armchair and shrugged. Just having a laugh, ain't I? Calm the fuck down. We are calm, said Brett. It's you that's... Ryan waved an arm to shut him up. It's sorted. Okay, let's just have a good time. He pulled a sulky face and stomped his foot. This is my party and you're ruining it. You're ruining it. Everyone howled with laughter, even Tom, who'd sat back down instead of going outside for air. He reached out to reclaim his beer from the coffee table, but it tilted and fell over as the coffee table's glass insert hopped in its metal frame. What the? A sudden thumping sound like a condemned Manchester tower block coming down, made everybody flinch. A picture frame featuring a hairy cow fell off the wall and smashed against the floorboards. In the kitchenette, the oven door swung open. Ryan, still standing, stumbled towards the fireplace, only just managing to grab the stone surround to keep himself from falling into the recently lit fire. What the hell's happening? The entire cottage shook, white painted walls creaking, flecks of ancient paint fell from the uneven ceiling. It's a sodden earthquake, said Sean, a mad grin on his face. Buzzing! Brett braced himself against the arm of the sofa. I've never felt anything like this. Aaron called out anxiously. Ryan! Ryan stumbled his way towards his brother, trying to keep his balance as the floor rocked beneath his feet. He was utterly confused and growing more and more terrified as the quaking continued. Then, the quaking stopped. Everyone looked at one another. The only sound was Tom's beard dripping over the edge of the coffee table. After a moment, Tom stood up. That was rather unexpected. Sean hopped up, knees like springs. That was amazing! What a way to remember your stag to Ryan a proper earthquake! Luby glanced at Brett. Was it an earthquake? Brett shrugged. I suppose it must have been. That was horrible, said Aaron, leaning over his knees and taking deep breaths. I thought we were going to die. Sean patted him on the back and handed him a fresh beer. Don't let it bother you, little man. It's over now and we can laugh about it. Aaron took the beer and managed to smile. Yeah, I suppose it was pretty cool. It didn't feel like an earthquake to me, said Tom. It felt more like an impact or something. Brett folded his arms and frowned. Like a plane crash. We would have heard an explosion, said Ryan, but otherwise I agree. It felt like something thumping into the ground outside. Maybe it was a boulder falling, said Luby. We're surrounded by mountains, right? Everyone looked at Brett, causing him to grow irritated. Why does everyone keep looking at me? Because you're the smart one, said Luby. You always have the answers. Well, not this time, I'm afraid. Let's have a mooch outside, said Sean. Whatever it was, I want to see the damage. 
Uh, that sounds like a bad idea, said Luby. It's getting late. You're scared of the dark, our kid. Don't worry, I'll hold your hand. I'm not afraid, said Aaron, chest puffed out. And it would be better to know, right? Absolutely, said Tom. What if it was a boulder and another one falls during the night and crushes us in our sleep? Ryan groaned. I think we might be getting a little carried away here, lads. I agree, said Brett. He took his glasses off to rub at his eyes. Why don't we just go and take a look, said Aaron. What harm will it do? Brett put his glasses back on and shrugged. I suppose it is feeling a little claustrophobic in here. Some fresh air might be nice. You lot crack me up, said Sean. Come on, get your coats. We're making this party al fresco. I'm freezing, said Luby, clutching himself inside his grey woolen overcoat. Ryan frowned. Really? You look a bit sweaty. Luby wiped at his clammy forehead and seemed embarrassed. You try being fat. Temperature control ain't one of my strong points. Ryan wore a scarf inside his super-dry jacket. He took it off and handed it to Luby. Truthfully, he wasn't finding it that cold. He'd expected the weather in the Highlands to be biting, but it was only chilly. Having said that, it was September. He could only imagine what December would be like. Would the solar panels around the back even get any sun? Maybe it came from up there, said Sean, pointing to the top of the steep hill that rose behind the cottage. Ryan huffed. You just want an excuse to climb it. It'll give us a cracking view, won't it? If something's crashed into the earth nearby, we'll definitely see it from up there. He has a point, said Tom. No, he doesn't, said Brett. It's pitch black. How much of a view do you expect to find? Oh, yeah. We'd have more of a view than we have down here, said Sean. I'm going up. Luby groaned. Seriously? I don't fancy climbing. Stop blarting, it'll be a piece of piss. Aaron pointed. There are plenty of places to get a foothold. It shouldn't be that hard. Ryan couldn't deny how good it felt to see his brother taking part. But letting him climb up a hill felt like a bad idea. The nearby cross made him even more anxious. The white painted stones reflecting the moonlight and illuminating the ancient wood like a beacon of bad spirits. There seemed... Nothing holy about it. What if Aaron falls and breaks his neck? Christ, how would I ever live with myself? See you pullocks at the top, said Sean, bolting towards the hill. Wait for me, said Aaron, taking after him. Ryan called out, wait, you'll slip and fall and mam will kill me. I won't fall, Ryan. It's a fucking hill, not Mount Everest. Sean howled with laughter. You tell him, our kid, stick with me and we'll be up there in no time. Brett exchanged a glance with Ryan. You'd best go with him. I wouldn't leave him alone with... Yeah, no need to finish the sentence. I'm going. Fuck me, said Luby. Are we really doing this? Ryan turned to him. You can stay down here, mate. Don't worry about it. What? And face Sean taking the piss out of me for the rest of the weekend? No thanks. Shite. Here I go. Luby hurried towards the hill, cursing the entire way. You'll be the bloody death of me one day, Sean. Tom looked up between Brett and Ryan. He's not wrong. A cracked skull is better than Sean heckling us relentlessly. Brett looked towards the top of the hill and shrugged. How hard can it be? Ryan sighed. Come on, then. Let's go kill ourselves. They all headed for the hill, a loose pack. Aaron and Sean were already ten feet up, racing each other and giggling. Ryan's stomach sloshed with undigested beer as his mind conjured images of his little brother slipping and cartwheeling down the jagged rocks. The bottom of the slope wasn't so bad, and they were more or less able to walk it, only leaning forward occasionally to keep their balance. But a few feet higher, and they would have to crawl. Ryan tried to close the distance on Aaron, wanting to be close by if he slipped. Please don't slip. Please don't slip. Hey, Sean shouted down at them. After this, we should go looking for magic mushrooms. I bet they grow all over this place. Brett peered across at Ryan and groaned. He's a nightmare. You should never have invited him. I concur, said Tom. Ryan put a finger against his lips. 
telling his friend to keep his voice down. Shh, he'll kick off if he hears you. Brett stopped climbing so he could whisper. So, we have to spend the entire weekend on edge worrying about his temper. He's only just got started. He's got enough smack in that baggie to take on a lion. Sean would take on a lion sober, said Tom. He's our mate. That's no excuse, Ryan. Look, I'll handle him, okay? Let's just get up this hill. Maybe the exercise will wear him out. Like a misbehaving dog, Brett shook his head and resumed climbing. They reached the middle of the hill and started using their hands, clambering up like monkeys. Even though it was steep, it was still fairly easy going, the footholds continuing all the way up. Aaron and Sean were near the top, still racing each other. Aaron was winning, which caused Ryan to smile oddly proud. He's actually having fun. In fact, so am I. I can't wait to see what's up there. Probably just nothing, but still there might be. Ryan made the mistake of looking down, causing moths to take flight in his guts. The solar panels behind the cottage seemed small. They glinted in the moonlight like the surface of a lake, in stark contrast to the cottage's dull thatched roof and white painted stone. The shed, however, blended into the landscape, a dark shadow against the rocky ground. Dust blasted Ryan's face, bits scattering in his eyes. He shielded himself with one hand and almost fell. Above him, someone cursed. Uh, my ankle! It's... I've twisted it! Brett grunted in a mixture of anger and agony. Ryan rose up on the rocks, trying to see above and to his right. In the dark, he could see the shape of his hunched-over friend. Hold on, mate, I'm coming. What are you daft bastards doing down there? Sean shouted from above. Stop prying about. Just shut up a second, Nuba yelled back. I think someone's hurt. Aaron yelled. Ryan, are you all right? I'm fine, it's Brett. Ryan clambered up the rocks and found Brett clutching his ankle. Underneath the moonlight, it was possible to see blood staining his white sports socks. It appeared as a silvery black stain. I got it caught between a pair of rocks, said Brett, hissing in pain. I don't think it's broken. I got you, mate. Ryan put Brett's arm around his neck. Let's get you down. Come on, you lot, Sean shouted. Little man is about to reach the top. He's mad for it, this one. Ryan growled. Hold on, for God's sake, will you? I'm trying to help Brett. I'm coming down to help, shouted Luby. Me too, said Tom. This was a poor idea from the start. Sean started to complain. You lot are a bunch of... Ryan! Oh my God! It was Aaron. Ryan! You need to get up here and see this! Ryan hissed. Is anybody listening to me? Brett, sir, and I'm going to... Sean shouted and interrupted him, having apparently reached the top with Aaron. Ryan! You need to listen to your little brother. You need to see this. Brett glanced at Ryan, his pain seemingly forgotten for a moment. They had both sensed the strangeness in Sean's tone. It sounded serious, which was extremely unlike him. Brett waved a hand. Just help me up. I can keep going. Ryan peered up the hill, trying to see Aaron and Sean, but all he could see was Luby's arse coming towards him. Luby, man, go back up. See what that idiot is shouting about. Are you sure? What about Brett? I'm okay, said Brett. Just get me up and I'll be right behind you. Don't leave Aaron up there alone with Sean. Yeah, okay, mate. Luby reversed his descent. Try not to break an ankle, said Tom sarcastically, which meant he was stressed. He was only ever bitchy when he was under pressure. Brett rolled his eyes. Ryan... Go kick his posh ass for me. Will do. Ryan helped Brett get back upright, making sure he was steady on the rocks. Then he resumed his climb, feeling bad about leaving his injured friend slightly behind, but more worried that his younger brother was on top of the hill with only Sean as company. What on earth had they found up there? Tom was the next to make it to the top, but he didn't add his voice to Sean's or Aaron, which was worrying. Was he shocked into silence by what he saw? In contrast, Luby made it up a few minutes later and immediately started shouting, Holy shit! Ryan climbed faster. 
His guts churned and he couldn't work out whether it was from excitement or fear. Something was clearly on top of the hill, but he had no idea what. The only way to know was to climb, so that's what he did. He made it to the top in less than two minutes, hands chafed and scratched from the jagged rocks. His left knee was throbbing. Despite his wounds, he straightened up and quickly found his mates in a huddle facing away from him. Ryan limped forward, glad when Aaron turned around and saw him. Ryan, you need to see this. What is it? He joined the others and got a look at the thing that had captured all of their attention. Again, he asked, What is it? We have no idea, said Aaron, but it's cool. Do you think it was this that caused the earthquake? asked Luby, staring down at the strange black object. It was shaped like a spiral, a giant corkscrew. Its black surface appeared metallic and wet, but there had been no rain. Deeply lodged into the ground, it rose six feet into the air before them, widening at the top. It must have fallen from a plane, said Tom, perhaps from the plane itself or some kind of special cargo it was carrying. It looks like farming equipment to me, said Luby. He pulled a bottle of water from the deep pocket of his coat and took a swig. Or an oil drill or something. I bet it weighs a ton. Try ten, said Brett. It's huge. He had reached the top of the hill and was now limping to join them. Tom looked around like he expected to see something coming their way, but there was nothing but stars and half a moon. Perhaps an oil rig exploded? They have a great many of them off the Scottish coast, I understand. Yeah, said Sean, the jocks are always banging on about their oil. Should have let them leave the union if you ask me. Ryan frowned at Sean. Seriously? Politics? Now? I reckon it's a secret weapon, said Aaron, his eyes wide and beaming in the moonlight. Maybe the military launched it as a test. Tom frowned. Not much of a weapon. It only managed to knock a picture off the wall. Aaron shrugged. Who knows what it does? Could be a radar or something. Maybe it digs into the ground and explodes later. Everyone exchanged nervous glances. Whatever it is, said Tom, I think we're best leaving it alone. Do we report it? asked Luby. Should we call the police? We'd have to go into the village, said Ryan. He looked at his watch. It's nearly eleven. No one is calling the old bill, said Sean. It's just a chunk of metal in the ground, look. Everyone gasped at what Sean did next. He grabbed a section of the black corkscrew and shoved, locking his jaws tightly as he fought to move it, but it didn't give an inch. Tom shook his head. Sean, for heaven's sake, get down. Oh, shut your gob. Everyone gasped again as Sean leapt up onto the corkscrew, clambering almost to its top. From four feet up, he threw his arms out wide like some coked-up Christ. See? Now to worry about. Ryan had visions of Sean falling and cracking his skull. That would put an end to the weekend before it even began. Get down, you idiot. Sean stopped his frolicking and seemed hurt. He hopped down from the massive corkscrew and tutted. Why am I the only one trying to have a laugh? Ryan sighed. I just don't want you to get hurt, okay? It's the middle of the night and it's dangerous up here. We don't know what this thing is, so we're best just leaving it alone. I'll tell the landlord about it when we leave here on Sunday. Sean eyed him suspiciously. You leave it till then? No grass until the weekend's over? Ryan promised. Like you said, it's just a chunk of metal. It's probably been here for years. We don't even know for sure it's what caused the ground to shake. Well, if it isn't, said Aaron, zipping up his light jacket and giving a shudder, something else caused it. I don't even care anymore, said Luby. He was sweating and panting. I just want to get back indoors in front of that nice warm fire. Don't be nesh, said Sean. It ain't even that cold. He reached out to shove Luby, but Luby leapt back and gasped. Oh. What the hell is that on your hands, man? Sean stopped and raised his palms. They were stained dark by something, but appeared silvery when they caught the moonlight. He turned around to face the corkscrew and sneered. 
sod in things, covered in something, me hands are well rank. You can clean off at the cottage, said Ryan. Come on, let's get back inside before anyone else gets hurt. Sean swiped at Luby again, trying to smear him with the substance on his hands. But Luby dodged away again, this time only narrowly avoiding the attack. His bottle of water fell on the ground and emptied at his feet, soaking the stony grass. Get away from me, man. I don't want that shit on me, OK? It's just oil or something. Don't get your knickers in a twist. He shook his head and tutted. It's just a bit of oil. Brett's ankle had got worse, leaving him unable to get down the hill unaided. So Ryan and Tom had to carry him. They only narrowly avoided tripping over themselves in several places and were relieved when they finally made it to the bottom safely. Once back inside the cottage, they placed Brett in the armchair and raised his foot up on a stack of beer crates. When Ryan pulled off his friend's trainer, he found an ankle puffed up and swollen. Jeez, it's twice the size, mate. It's fine, said Brett. It's bleeding. You must have sliced it on the rocks. I'm certain it's just a sprain. Do we have any ice for it? Sorry, mate. There's only a tiny freezer and I filled it with pizzas. It's fine. Just get me a drink and make it strong. Coming right up. Sean was already in the kitchenette, ranting and raving by the sink. Luby was scrubbing at his hands with a dish scrubber on the end of a stick. Just try and get this shite off me, Lubes. I'm trying. It's not coming off. Get it off. Calm down. Ryan hurried into the kitchen. What's going on? Sean held his hands up to show what was up. His palms were stained dark green with flecks of yellow. Offhand, Ryan couldn't come up with any idea of what such a substance could be. Instinctively, he took a step back to keep Sean from touching him. It's not coming off at all. Luby showed Ryan the disc scrubber. Its coarse surface was in tattered. I got some of it off. Sean rubbed his hands on this white Armani T-shirt. It was sacrilege, but thankfully the green stains failed to transfer from his hands onto the cotton. It looks like I've been wanking off the Hulk. Ryan tried to reassure him. I don't think there's anything strong enough to permanently stay in your skin. Try to chill out. Sean eyeballed him suspiciously. What about tattoos and that? They're staying forever. Luby shook his head. He was leaning over the counter slightly out of breath and still wearing his coat. The ink goes underneath the skin, on, like, the deeper layers or something. He's right, Brett shouted from the lounge. The outer layer of your skin sheds constantly, so nothing can stain it permanently. Not unless it has some kind of dangerous chemical that alters your DNA. Can I have that drink now, please? Sean's eyes widened. Alters my DNA? I'm messing with you, said Brett. Drink? Sean shook his head. You daft bastard, Brett. I'll get your bloody drink. What are you having? Vodka, neat. Think I'll join you? Sean fixed a pair of drinks and left Luby and Ryan alone in the kitchenette. Ryan popped the tab on a fresh beer and offered it to Luby. No thanks, mate. Reckon I'll get me head down in a minute. Climbing that hill really finished me off. Seriously, Luby, what's wrong with you? This is my stag do and you haven't had one drink. I'm starting to take it personally. Well, don't, because it ain't. Then what is it? Why aren't you having a laugh with the rest of us? Luby glanced towards the lounge, then back at Ryan. He leaned forward, conspiratorially. Because I've been having chemo, all right, just keep it to yourself. If Sean finds out... Ryan rocked back against the counter, rattling a drawer full of cutlery. The others in the lounge glanced over, but only briefly. They hadn't heard Luby's confession. Ryan kept his voice low. What do you mean? You were having chemo. Exactly what I said. He ran a hand over his clammy forehead and sighed wearily. About six months ago, I started getting really tired and weak, you know. Remember I missed that Man United match with the flu? Next thing I know, I've lost a stone in weight. Then I noticed these lumps in my neck. The doctor took some blood tests and samples from the lumps and the results came back wrong. Two weeks later, they tell me I have this thing called Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's rare, but they can treat it. They can? 
So you'll be okay? You're not going to, you know? Luby shrugged almost like it didn't matter. What? Am I going to die? I don't know, mate. They caught it late, which is bad. Normal survival rate is like 85%, but I have worse odds than that because I ignored the symptoms for a while. Tell you the truth, I've been feeling exhausted for over a year. I should have got it checked out sooner. Anyway, the chemo's been rough, but the doctors think it's working. It's fine. It's my problem, not yours. Ryan felt sick to his stomach. I don't get it, Luby. How can you have cancer? You're 25. I turned 26 last month, mate. But it don't matter anyway. Someone has to be the unlucky statistic, don't they? It's fine, I'm dealing with it. Don't tell anyone, OK? I wonder why you're not drinking. Is it the chemo? Luby nodded. Alcohol makes me puke. Most things do, to be honest. I have some pills to help me with the sickness, but I feel rough all the time, mate. Like I said, don't take it personally. Jesus, Luby, I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do? I just want to take my mind off it for a couple of days. Let's talk about something else, OK? You nervous about the wedding? Uh, you could say that. I don't know how I feel about it, really. Uh, I know I should be excited. Sophie's amazing and that, but... I made over heels for her, but... But what? What's the problem? Ryan blurted out. I don't think I want to get married. He placed his fingers against his temples and massaged a circle, closing his eyes. My head's a mess, mate. I just feel like I'm making this big mistake and that my life will be over. I mean, once I'm married, that's it, right? Next comes kids, a mortgage, working my fingers to the bone. Luby struggled for words. Well, you know, I... Shit, man, that's heavy. I mean, sure, marriage will change things, of course it will, but in a good way, right? There's nothing wrong with settling down and having kids. Believe me, I wouldn't change a thing if it meant not having my Lucy. Her mum's a complete nutter and scares me to death, but I look forward to every moment I get to spend with our daughter. It changes you in a good way. Does Lucy know you're ill? She's three years old, man. Does Sophie know you're getting cold feet? Of course not. Why the hell would I tell her that? Seems like she's the person you should tell the most. You don't have to get married, but I do think you have to be honest with Sophie. It would break your heart. So of marrying someone who doesn't want to get married. Talk to her. Maybe she'll understand. Ow, when I don't even understand myself. Luby reached out and patted Ryan on the shoulder. You think too much, mate. It's always been your problem. Have you considered that what you're feeling is normal? Marriage is a big commitment. It's supposed to be scary. Life is hard and it never stops moving forward. But you have no choice but to roll with it. Don't you think I wish I could press pause on my cancer for a while so I can catch my breath? Of course I do. But shit ain't like that. I can only try to embrace each day and not try to puke. He grabbed a bottle of water from the counter and let out a lengthy sigh. Seriously, everything will be okay. But I'm struggling to stand up right now. I need to go to bed. Of course, go. I'll tell everyone to keep it down. Joe, it's your stag too, man. I'm just sorry that I... Ryan hugged his friend. Don't you dare apologise. You're my best mate. Luby, I wish you'd told me sooner. Me too. I'll see you in the morning. Yeah. Good night, Lubes. Luby went to bed, leaving Ryan alone in the kitchenette. He looked over at his other friends, all drinking and laughing in the lounge, and didn't know whether to join them. Suddenly, he didn't feel very much like partying. Chapter 3 You all right, Ryan? Brett took his glasses off for a second and rubbed his eyes. Then he said, You're a little quiet. This is your stag do, remember? Ryan blinked, exiting his thoughts. Huh? Oh, yeah, I'm fine, mate. Just relaxed. Must be the fire. Brett turned to observe the crackling logs on the metal grate inside the stone fireplace. It's nice, isn't it? I love a place like this, some quiet cottage removed from all the hustle and bustle where the nearest bus stop is a few miles away. You mean the exact opposite of Manchester? 
Yeah, I suppose I do. If I never see another red or blue football shirt again, it'll be too soon. Are you joking? I don't think I could ever leave town. It's so full of life, the people, the businesses, whatever you want, whenever you want it. Out here it's lovely and that, but I'd go out of my mind after a while. I'd have to go into a village every time I wanted to download porn. Brett chuckled. You have soapy? Oh, yeah, well, I hope you get a place like this one day, mate. You've worked for it. Sean leapt up on the other side of the room, a fag in his gob and a bottle of vodka in his right hand. Since Luby had gone to bed an hour ago, Sean had snorted two lines of coke and drank half the bottle he was holding. He was getting progressively louder and Ryan wanted to tell him to be quiet, but it would inevitably lead to grief for Luby. Sean had already kicked off about him going to bed early. Speaking of Sean, he was currently standing on the small sofa and butchering this charming man by the smiths. Brett pulled a face at Ryan and exhaled. Here we go again. At least this singing is taking away the pain from my ankle. I heard that, you cheeky bastard. Let's hear you sing. Brett shook his head, but Sean kept needling him until he relented and sang a couple of verses with him. By the end, Brett was grinning and drinking more readily. His ankles seemed to bother him less and less. I hate this song, said Aaron, gulping from his latest beer. He'd been joining in more and more as the alcohol sank in, his inhibitions melting away. Sing something else, Sean. Sean blasted a finger at him. All right, our kid, this one's for you. He started singing Oasis, and everyone was powerful not to join in, making it all the way to the first chorus of Wonderwall before they collapsed in raucous laughter. Ryan felt bad about Luby, but this could be the last time he got to be with all his mates like this. No way would he waste it. He'll understand, someday soon. Him and me will laugh about this. We'll celebrate the end of his cancer. Oh, I've got one, said Tom, standing up and placing a hand across his diaphragm. He began singing the Verve's Lucky Man, even doing an impression of Richard Ashcroft's sullen voice. Na, 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 said Sean. I ain't that sodding Verve. Makes me want to slip me wrists. Give over, said Brett, laughing. They don't sound any different to Oasis. Sean thrust his hand out with the vodka bottle, sloshing the liquid inside. Oi, don't you piss on Manchester's greatest sons. Debatable, said Tom. What about the buzzcocks? Never mind the sodding buzzcocks. No band ever come close to Oasis. The Gallagher brothers are gods. Only the Happy Mondays come anywhere close. There's a surprise, said Tom, swigging his beer and chuckling. Sean glared, a subtle yet detectable darkening of his features. You and me are gonna fall out, our kid. Over music? Yeah, over music. Tom sighed, fine. Let's just agree to disagree. Right. Tom sat back on the sofa and crossed his legs in that feminine way they all teased him about. Perhaps he did it to annoy Sean, but under his breath he started singing. Slowly the volume of his voice increased until he was singing the main chorus of Bittersweet Symphony at the top of his lungs. Motherfucker! Sean lunged across the room, vodka bottle raised above his head. Shit! Ryan leapt off the sofa and tackled Sean before he managed to brain their friend. Aaron leapt aside as the half-full bottle bounced off the two-seater sofa and tumbled to the floor, where it quickly vomited its contents. What the hell are you doing, Sean? He's a sodden nutcase, Brett was furious, only his swollen ankle keeping him seated. He leaned forward, a furious scowl on his face. Does he have to ruin everything? Sean battled with Ryan on the floor, hurling curse words one after the other. Ryan didn't want to hurt him, but Sean's wiry frame made it hard to keep him under control. He kept placing his palms against the floorboards and trying to push himself up but Ryan did everything he could to keep him pinned. Calm the fuck down, Sean. He's taking the piss. I'm going to do him, post swat. Ryan grunted, struggling to keep Sean's arms pinned at his sides. What are you talking about? It's just banter. Yeah, Brett shouted. What the hell's wrong with you? You take the piss more than anyone. Get the hell off me, Ryan. 
Calm down and I will. Sean struggled a little more, then finally went still. All right, all right, I'm calm. Just get the hell off me before I proper lose it. Ryan eased up slowly, pausing several times to make sure Sean wasn't faking compliance. Thankfully, he remained calm and didn't fight. Once Ryan was standing, Sean turned onto his side and got up slowly. He was laughing. It isn't funny, said Brett. It's ridiculous, you're a goddamn cokehead. It's a sodding stag do. I came to have fun. What is it with you lot? Brett lifted himself out of the armchair, doing his best to keep the weight off his sprained ankle. Gingerly, he took a step towards Sean, pointing a finger right in his face. Nobody is doing drugs except for you. The rest of us want to have a good time without acting like maniacs, but instead we're all having to tiptoe around in case you kick off. May I also add, said Tom, that this is the second time you've tried to attack me, Sean. It's getting rather tiresome. Sean glared at Tom but refrained from doing anything else. He turned to Ryan like a naughty child begging for forgiveness. I'm sorry, our kid. You know me, I'm just having a laugh, ain't I? Ryan wanted to let it go. He wanted to go back to drinking and singing and having a good time. But he saw the looks on his friends' faces every time Sean got Larry. No one could relax. No one could have a good time. And no way could this go on all weekend. We've had enough, Sean. No more coke, OK? You're crazy enough without it. But it's a level of crazy we can cope with. No more coke. Sean put his hands up, his palm still stained a dark green. OK, OK, no more powder, I swear. Apologise to Tom. What? Apologise to Tom. He was trying to wind me up. He should apologise to me. Tom tutted. You'd sooner see hell freeze over. You see, he's got it in for me, the posh swat. I never liked him, him and that poncy private school. How did he ever end up with us? Ryan shook his head, truly disappointed. The five of them had been friends since secondary school. Sure, Tom had gone to a different school than the rest of them, but they had become friends anyway. It helped that Tom's uncle had run a chain of pubs, which meant Tom could get them beer at 16, so long as they drank it in the function room out of sight. Tom's uncle made no secret of his dislike for Ryan and the others, but he seemed to realise he was buying friends for his awkward and shy nephew. Truth was, with his posh accent and middle-class manners, none of them would have given Tom a chance otherwise. But he is one of us, always has been. What the hell is Sean's problem? Ryan realised he was grinding his teeth, so he spoke to release the pressure. I can't believe what I'm hearing, Sean. Tom's a good bloke. You're the one who's out of order. Sitting on the sofa, Tom had tears in his eyes and was shaking his head in disbelief. You used to say at my house, you prick. How many times have you and I gone out drinking together? Now you're saying you never even like me? Sean continued grinning. His pupils were rolling all over the place. Ryan felt like slapping him unconscious. Why was he doing this? Why was he wrecking everything? His eyes are sodding kite. Even for him, this is extreme. Ryan studied his friend, taking in the dry skin around his nose and the dark bags beneath his eyes. Sean, do you have a problem? Do you need help? Give over, I'm fine. It's you lot what has the problem. Ryan sighed. Sean, I think... I think maybe we should give you a ride to the village tomorrow so you can catch the train home. We can talk when I get back. Sean flinched. Don't be like that, man. I'll stop all the blow, all right? Tom, I'm sorry, mate. Of course I like you. We've been mates for donkeys, ain't we? I'm just... He shook his head and seemed utterly lost for a moment. Yeah, maybe I'm a bit of a mess right now. OK, Sean, I'm glad you can admit that you... I used a different dealer. Reckon he sold me crap. I won't touch any more, right? Ryan sighed. He thought Sean had been admitting he had a problem. But it was all down to a bad batch of blow, apparently. Sean, I don't know. It's fine, said Tom. This is your stag do, Ryan. 
If Sean stops the blow and acts like a normal person for the rest of the weekend, we can all go back to being mates. No one has to leave. Sean turned to Tom, surprised. Thanks, mate. No hard feelings, yeah? I was just talking bollocks. Off me head, ain't I? Let's just put it behind us. Tom stood up and went over to Sean, embracing him. Immediately, Ryan felt better. Maybe the weekend could be salvaged. Still embracing Sean, Tom let out a chuckle. You're a certifiable nutcase, Sean, but you're our nutcase. You fucking what? Sean reared back, surprising Tom with a sudden aggression so much that he did nothing as Sean lunged back and clamped his jaws around his ear. Tom squealed in pain. Ryan grabbed Sean and pulled him away, but he kept his jaws clamped, pulling Tom along with them until something tore loose. Ryan was aware of blood in the air, and it added to his growing panic, panic that quickly turned into a fight instinct. He shoved Sean against the wall in rage. His friend's skull clonked against the stone and he slumped to the ground. Immediately, and without any remorse for Sean, Ryan turned to Tom, who was moaning in agony and clutching his ear. Blood ran down his hand and forearm. Let me see, Tom. Move your hand away. Tom's hand was shaking as he removed it from his ear. And what Ryan saw was revolting. Sean had torn away the entire lobe leaving behind a ragged, bloody edge like an uncooked steak. Ryan took a step back and felt something beneath his trainer. When he lifted his foot, he saw a morsel of pink flesh crushed against the floorboards. This is a nightmare, and I'm going to wake up. Suddenly everyone was shouting and swearing. The smell of blood permeated the air, mixing with the smoky odour of the open fire. Ryan bent over, and puked six pints of beer onto the bloody floorboards. It was a good thing Sean was slumped on the ground, because if he'd been standing, everyone would have given him a good hiding. Ryan couldn't believe what his friend had done. Brett was right. Sean is an animal. Ryan had puked up everything in his stomach, which had the benefit of sobering him up. He sipped from a bottle of water now, staring into space and trying to soothe his scorched throat. Brett was in the kitchenette, cleansing Tom's torn ear over the sink. He'd found a first aid kit in the cupboard and was putting his veterinary skills to use the best he could. Aaron was sitting next to Luby on the beige two-seater, telling him about everything that had happened while he'd been asleep. The furor had obviously woken Luby, but the brief rest seemed to have done him some good at least. He didn't seem so weary. Ryan heard Sean sobbing in the corner but felt numb as he approached him. Sean, man, you really messed up. I know, me head. I don't know what's happened. We'll never forgive you for this. Sean flinched as if the statement physically hurt him. When he looked up at Ryan, there were tears in his bloodshot eyes. His green-stained hands trembled on his knees. Ryan... I swear to you, I never hurt any of you. I would never. But you have hurt one of us. You've hurt Tom really bad. We should call the police on him, Brett shouted from the kitchenette. He needs locking up. Sean nodded. He's right, man. Call the police. I deserve it. We don't have any signal and it's the middle of the night. We'll have to sort this out in the morning. Party's over. I hear you. I'll go straight to bed. Can you help me, though? I don't feel right. Sure. Ryan offered a hand to Sean and pulled him to his feet. But his friend was groggy and toppled back against the wall. It was then that Ryan noticed the splotch of blood on the stone wall where Sean's head had struck. Shit. I think I cut your head open when I pushed you. Turn around and let me have a look. Sean kept a hand on the wall for balance and turned his back on Ryan. The lump was clearly visible through his short hair, which was bloody in places. Is it bad? You've got a lump and a cut. I'm really sorry, man. Don't be. I had it coming. Too right you did, said Brett. He limped angrily into the middle of the lounge. You're a maniac. Whenever you get involved in anything, it turns to madness. When are you going to get your shit together? 
Sean put a hand up like he feared Brett might attack him, but Brett had never hit anyone in his life. Tell me what I can do and I'll do it. What'll make this better? Just tell me, man. Nothing will make this any better. The damage is done. Sean looked towards the kitchenette, where Tom was leaning over the counter with his ear bandaged up. The way he was taking deep breaths meant he was either in a lot of pain or feeling sick, probably both. Sean swallowed, a desperate look on his face. I really fucked up, didn't I? Brett turned away in disgust, so Sean looked back at Ryan. Mate, I'm sorry. I just... I just... He went to take a step forward, but his left leg buckled and he fell. Ryan grabbed him just in time to direct his fall. Brett heard the commotion and turned back around. What's he playing at now? He's hurt, said Ryan, easing Sean onto his side. He hit his head pretty hard when I shoved him. Brett's anger evaporated. He knelt beside Sean and started parting the hair at the back of his head so he could inspect the lump. The sight of it made him wince. He could have a concussion. I didn't see the impact. How hard did he hit the wall? Harder than I meant for him to. I was angry. We all were. Brett pulled up Sean's eyelids. He was conscious but lying still and moaning. We have to get him to hospital. With all the drugs and alcohol he's taken, a concussion is the last thing he needs. Ryan cursed beneath his breath. I can't believe this. Was it always like this? Yes. Why do you think we've been drifting apart, Ryan? This stuff starts getting pretty pathetic at our age. Our crazy days should be behind us. Go tell Tom to get the car started. Ryan got to his feet, chastised. He went to Tom, who was still leaning over the counter. Mate, are you okay? Tom looked up at him, face pale, lips curled into a snarl in response to his obvious pain. Oh, I'm wonderful, thank you. Ryan considered trying to get Tom and Sean to make up, but it would be a selfish act. Tom had the right to never see Sean again if that's what he wanted. I can't believe that he's done this, Tom. And I know it's crazy to even be saying this to you right now, but Sean needs our help. We have to get him to a doctor. Tom straightened up. His scowl became a frown. What are you talking about? What's wrong with him? Ryan moved aside so that Tom could see into the lounge. He had a funny turn. Brett's worried he might have a concussion from when I slammed him against the wall. Good. Come on, man. You're better than that. With all the blows Sean took, you could end up in real trouble. Do you want it on your conscience if something happens? Seriously, Ryan, whatever happens to Sean is Sean's fault. Don't place it on me. You're right, but that doesn't change the fact that we need to get him to a hospital. You could use one yourself. Maybe they could fix your ear. Perhaps, if you hadn't stepped on it like a clumsy oaf, Brett said, there's no way to salvage it. Shit, it was an accident. Ah, Tom waved his hand dismissively. You're not to blame for this. I brought you here. You asked me here. I was happy to come. There's only one person at fault, and we both know who it is. As if hearing the accusation, Sean groaned on the lounge floor. Brett looked towards the kitchenette. We need to get going, guys. Tom hissed and shoved himself away from the counter. Fine, but I'm not stopping at the hospital. I'm going to drive back onto Manchester with anyone who wants to join me. You've been drinking, Ryan pointed out. Less than the rest of you, and Luby hasn't had anything, so if he wants to come, he can drive. I'm sorry, Ryan, but I'm going home. All Ryan had wanted was one last weekend before coming a fully-fledged adult. He had wanted to laugh and joke one last time without a ring on his finger. Sophie was his future, but he wanted to give a proper goodbye to his past. Now it seemed like the past had ended without him realising it. He was trying to recreate something that was already dead and buried. I understand. I just hope you can forgive me. There's nothing to forgive. I'll go start the car. Ryan stayed by the counter, suddenly exhausted. He checked his watch and realised it was nearly two o'clock in the morning. By the time they were done at the hospital, he would be a zombie. The last thing he expected to think about this weekend was Sophie, but right now he wanted to lie in her lap 
while she stroked his hair. The way they did when they watched the match of the day rerun on a Sunday. Brett called for Luby to help get Sean to his feet. When they struggled, Aaron joined them until they eventually succeeded. Sean was wobbly and unable to focus. He kept trying to talk, but only frothy saliva filled his mouth. Ryan grabbed a bottle of water and brought it over. He poured it into Sean's mouth carefully, relieved when he drank some. You're going to be okay, Sean. We're taking you to a hospital. Let's get him outside, said Brett. The fresh air might wake him up. Ryan nodded. Aaron, can you pour some water on the fire? Last thing we need is to come back and find the place in flames. Aaron rushed off to fill a glass at the sink. Luby was panting, so Ryan moved him aside and took Sean's weight with Brett. Luby got to the door. Outside, their footsteps crunched on the gravel. The silhouette of Tom's car stood before them, its light switched off. Why hadn't Tom started it yet? Tom emerged from the side of the car, dimly illuminated by the light coming from inside the cottage. He jangled his car keys at them angrily. Who messed with it? What? Someone messed about with my car. It won't start. Ryan reached out to console him, but Tom thrust a finger in his face. This has gone so far past the line, Ryan. Who the hell messed with my car? I demand to know right now. No one? Nobody messed with your car? Tom glared at Sean, slumped groggily between them. It was him. Chill, Sean muttered. It was surprising he could even still follow what was being said. Swear down. I don't believe you, said Tom. What the hell did you do, Sean? Sean's chin was pressed against his chest, but he lifted his head slightly to look at Tom. Didn't? We've all been together, said Brett. Sean hasn't been out of our sight. No one messed with your car, Tom. What's wrong with it anyway? It's dead. I can't even switch on the dashboard. Let me take a look, said Luby. Can you lift the bonnet? Tom stepped aside grumpily. Be my guest. Brett and Ryan stood with Sean while Tom popped the bonnet. Luby lifted it and propped it up. Then he gave an appreciative whistle. This is a thing of beauty. Yes, I know. Can you see what's wrong with it, please? Hang on. I can't see anything offhand. The battery's connected. Nothing seems unplugged. I'm no expert, but it all looks fine. You have an alarm, right? It wouldn't have gone off if anyone tried to mess with your engine. Yeah, look. The alarm is wired right here. Huh? What? asked Tom. What is it? Some alarms are connected right to the car battery, which means if it goes flat, the alarm won't go off. This one seems to be wired to a backup, though, which means it will definitely go off if someone tries to mess with your engine. There must be some kind of fault. Sorry, mate. Impossible. It's less than a month old. You'd be surprised. With all the computers on board, brand new models are just as likely to fail as something older. Since when are you a mechanic, Luby? I've been reading a lot of Top Gear magazine lately. Wow, then you deserve a diploma. Ryan pictured Luby sitting in the hospital all alone, with nothing to do while he waited for his cancer treatment except read magazines from the newsagent. Why hadn't his friend told him about his illness? I could have been there for him. Hell, I would have happily quit my job to attend all of the hospital visits. Ryan had been planning on leaving his job for a while. Digging gardens and laying flagstones stopped being fun pretty quickly. And the thought of getting married had caused him to look at his life through a wider lens. There had to be more to life than poor pay and long hours. Luby slipped in behind the Stelvio's steering wheel, the car's suspension rocking gently. It was impossible to see what he was doing in the dark, but he soon returned to join the rest of them. I can't figure it out. Things as flat as a pancake. This is outrageous, said Tom, storming back inside the cottage. Where are you going? asked Ryan. To get my phone. There's no signal. Then I'll walk until I get one. Brett seemed to agree with the idea because he shrugged. Emergency calls can go on any network. He might catch a signal if he's lucky. So we're calling an ambulance now? Luby ran a hand over his patchy skull. This is going to end up on the local news. Manx go crazy in the Scottish islands. 
Brett groaned. Christ, I hope you're wrong. The door clattered against the wall as Tom came storming back onto the driveway. I will seriously strangle someone in a minute. What is it now? Brett demanded. My phone's dead too. What's going on here? Brett adjusted Sean's weight across his shoulders. Hold on. I think I have my phone on me. He shuffled a hand into the pocket of his jeans and pulled out a large black phone. He raised it in front of him and thumbed the home button. Mine's flat too, but it's hardly surprising. It's the middle of the night. Mine's plugged into the bedroom, said Luby. You want me to go grab it, Tom? Tom stormed back into the house while the others waited in tense silence for his return. Out of all of them, Tom was usually the one with the least of a temper. Tonight, it seemed like he might actually strangle someone. Note to self, don't get between a posh boy and his toys. A minute later, Tom returned, still fuming, but now appearing slightly anxious. He held a phone up that must have been Luby's and shook his head. It's dead. It was on charge, but it's dead. The generator's still running, said Ryan. I can hear it. The lights are on inside. Maybe a fuse went, said Luby. The sockets might be on a separate circuit to the lights. Ryan didn't know much about electrics, but he knew how to flip a fuse. He eyed the generator beside the shed. It was rattling away without an issue. That must be it. I'll try and find the fuse box. Tom folded his arms. So where does that leave us? We have no phones and no transport. We're two miles from anywhere and it's the middle of the night. Do I go and get help? I don't think anyone should walk off in the dark, said Brett. I was lucky only to sprain my ankle. It's treacherous on these hills. He's right, said Ryan. You walk about in this dark and you'll break a leg. Oh, what a sleep, said Sean. Brett let out a lengthy breath. It's not a good idea to let you sleep, Sean. You might have a concussion. Or the idiot's OD'd, said Tom. This is all his fault. Luby was shivering, despite being the only one who was wearing a coat. Does anyone mind if I go back inside? No, said Ryan. I think that's what we should all do while we think about this. He looked at Brett to see if he agreed. Brett gave Luby a strange look, like he was trying to work something out. But then he returned to Ryan and nodded. We're going to have to wait this out. We can check the car out properly in the morning and send someone on foot if it still won't start. Tom fingered his bandaged ear and sighed. What about Sean? We'll have to watch him, said Brett. Any luck and he'll improve. And if he doesn't, then we'll have a lot of explaining to do. Chapter 4 Luby had expected to struggle this weekend, under no illusion that he would feel rotten the entire time. Unable to get hammered with the lads, or even enjoy himself that much, it had been an impossible situation from the get-go, but no way had he been willing to miss Ryan Stagdo. Ryan was his best friend and always had been. If not for him, Luby would have remained the quiet fat kid at school. Large Lewis, the punchline to every joke. Ryan was one of the few who never joined in the insults or said anything mean. In fact, Ryan had eventually taken pity on Luby during his twelfth birthday, intervening when the thugs at their school had been giving him the birthday bumps. But Luby didn't even know how the bullies had found out, because he hadn't told anybody. But Ryan had broken up the ruckus and walked Luby home. It was the first time he'd felt safe in years. After that, Ryan had introduced Luby to Sean, who was two years above them at school. Even then, Sean was crazy, but having him as a friend meant that no one in the entire school dared mess with Luby ever again. With a little bit of breathing room, he was able to build his confidence and find his feet. Eventually, school hadn't been so bad. You could say it was Sean who had helped Luby to come out of his shell. But it had all started with Ryan's kindness. No wonder he was the first of them to get married. People had always loved Ryan, and Sophie most of all. She was a sweet girl from a nice family who never seemed to complain or lose her temper. 
On the dozen or so occasions Luby had met Sophie, he'd liked her a lot. But Ryan isn't sure he wants to marry her. Man, that guy doesn't know how lucky he is. You sure you're okay to watch him? Brett asked Luby, as everyone stood inside the cramped bedroom. Sean was lying on one of the twin singles already asleep. They had agreed to let him nap for an hour at a time before somebody woke him and checked on him. Luby offered to keep watch until morning. I'm fine, mate. I got a nap in earlier, didn't I? I tell you the truth, I ain't been sleeping much through the night lately. Brett chewed the inside of his cheek, eventually nodding. All right. If anything happens, you come and get me right away, okay? Keep an eye on his breathing. Luby waved a hand. It'll be fine. Get some sleep, you lot. I'll see you in a few hours. Tom left the room without argument. From the evening he'd had, he probably just wanted to get his head down and be done with things. Brett exited next, leaving behind Ryan and Aaron. Ryan turned to his younger brother. Hey, can you leave us alone for a minute, bro? Sure, I'll see you in bed. I'll be right along. Once they were alone, Ryan turned to Luby. Luby knew what he would say, so he raised a hand and spoke first. I'm fine, mate, seriously. I'm going to feel like shit with or without sleep, so it might as well be me who stays awake. You need your strength. We don't want to make you, you know. You can say the word cancer, it won't upset me. Look, I'll sleep in the morning when you lot sort this mess out. I'm just glad I missed the worst of it. Ryan nodded, his face a mess of confusion and hurt. It was clear to Luby how much this weekend had meant to him. It was rough, Lubes. I still can't believe what happened. Sean needs proper help. He's always been an addict, said Luby, looking down at their sleeping friend. With his eyes closed and still, he was harmless, innocent. We can act like it's all his fault, but when did any of us try to help him? We've always laughed at his mad antics and invited him along to every booze up, but we never once told him to take it easy. I know everyone hates him right now, but I just feel sad, you know. Ryan exhaled and seemed to deflate. My head's a complete mess, Luby, and I think it's because I feel exactly the same way. Despite what Sean did tonight, he's still our mate. In his right mind, he would never want to hurt any of us. Problem is, he's rarely in his right mind lately, which is why he needs our help. I suppose we'll talk about it tomorrow. You sure you don't mind the rest of us getting our heads down? Nah, man, it's sound. Ryan gave Luby a hug, then left. Luby collapsed on his bed, gasping for breath. The excitement of the last hour had knocked him for six, but he knew he would be okay in a few minutes. This happened all the time. He just needed to lie still. Lie still until my body forgets it's dying. At first, Luby learning he had cancer had been the scariest thing ever. Nothing was scarier than dying, right? But then he learned that being alive with cancer was even worse. Despite the doctors telling him that his odds of surviving were constantly improving, he'd grown weaker and weaker until he barely felt like himself anymore. He was closer to death than ever, even as he fought to live. But it was what lay ahead that worried him most. Health was no longer a straight line, it was a roller coaster, and he never knew when the next stop was coming. His biggest fear that he would eventually start fearing life more than death. If that happened, it would all be over. The only light in his life was Lucy, and the thought of leaving her behind caused him even more pain than the cancer. Three years old. Is that all I get? I wanted to see her grow old. Fuck, I want to grow old. It isn't fair. Sean muttered in his sleep tormented by a nightmare or perhaps remembering his actions from tonight. No matter what happened, Luby wouldn't turn back on his friend, and he didn't think Ryan would either. In a way, the three of them were the true heart of the group. As teenagers, their loyalty had always been to each other, but Brett and Tom had held other priorities. Brett had always kept one eye on the future, 
studying his ass off so he might one day escape. He had always pictured something better, something that most likely didn't involve the rest of them. Tom, on the other hand, had been born with something better. As a kid, he would often disappear on month-long summer holidays with his family, or weekends down to the races. He had a full life and his friends were only a small part of it. Luby, Ryan and Sean, however, had grown up with little else besides each other. Their bond had been stronger than anything else in their lives, until the last couple of years. Luby had met Tracy and welcomed Lucy into the world before realising what a psycho her man was. Ryan had met Sophie and was about to get married. Brett was a vet working 60 hours a week. Tom was seeing a lot of Amanda and driving fancy cars, but Sean... He's been left behind. Sean was two years older than the rest of them, but was the furthest behind in almost every conceivable way. He'd never been in a long-term relationship, had scarce family, and as for a career, he did the odd shift as a doorman for a couple of Manchester's seedier clubs, but had never possessed anything resembling a steady job. Nothing about his life today was any different today than it had been five years ago, or even ten years ago. The only thing Sean had was his friends, and today he pushed them away. Luby's heart ached for Sean, because he was going to wake up with the worst hangover ever. And he's already had his share of skull-splitting hangovers. Tonight might have been rough, but tomorrow is going to be so much worse. Luby turned onto his side to watch his sleeping friend. You mad bastard! What are we going to do with you? Sean mumbled and coughed. It was a wet sound, and if it continued, Luby would have to go and get Brett. Fortunately, Sean returned to silence. His breathing seemed okay. Luby began to cry. Luby didn't know if he'd fallen asleep, but he had dwelled beneath its edges for a while, his dreams entangling with reality. He pictured his cancer growing worse, coughing and coughing and coughing over and over again. But it wasn't him coughing. Luby's eyes snapped open and he bolted upright on the bed, still fully clothed in everything bar his coat. He threw his legs over the side of the mattress and saw Sean choking on the other bed. His chest was heaving in and out and his arms and legs were flapping. Fuck, Sean! Sean, wake up! He grabbed hold of his friend's shoulder and tried to stop him convulsing. Shit or oh, shit or oh, shit! Brett! Brett, I need you here, man! Brett! Thirty seconds later, Brett crashed through the door. Move aside! Luby stumbled away, falling onto his bed. His vision tilted as waves crashed against his stomach lining. He couldn't stop himself from vomiting over the side of the mattress onto the floor. Brett didn't seem to notice. One by one, the others filed into the room. Ryan saw Luby lying on his side and probably smelled his vomit. He came rushing over. Shit, Luby, are you? I'm fine. Sean sure needs help. Get me some water, Brett yelled. And towels, he's burning up. I'll go get them, said Tom, rushing away. He might have held a grudge, but it was clearly forgotten for the time being. Aaron stood in the doorway, clutching himself and staring. Luby put a hand on Ryan's thigh and pushed him weakly away. Get your little brother out of here, man. He shouldn't see this. Ryan turned and noticed his brother. Cursing beneath his breath, he quickly ushered Aaron out of the room just as Tom hurried back inside with bottled water and towels. Brett told him to soak the towels, which he did before handing them over. Brett cooled Sean's forehead. Sean, Sean, stay with me. Try to breathe for me. Sean thrashed on the bed jaws locked together. It was unclear if he could even hear anything being said. What can I do? asked Tom, white as a sheet. Help me get his claws off. Luby wanted to help too, but if he moved he would be sick again. There was nothing he could do except watch in horror as one of his oldest friends fought for his life. He understood the battle more than anyone else in the room. You gotta pull through, Sean. There's no giving up. You have to fight. Sean frothed at the mouth, eyes rolling back in his head. 
The smell of piss filled the room, mingling with the stench of Luby's vomit. Brett shook him repeatedly. Sean! Sean, look at me! Sean stopped seizing and went still. Sean! Can you hear me? Sean! Damn it, Sean! Brett started pouring over his body, checking for a pulse, for breathing, for any signs of life. Luby wanted to look away, but he couldn't. I can't do anything to help him. Brett and Tom ripped off Sean's shirt. Then Brett performed chest compressions, followed by mouth to mouth. The sound of his palms pumping against Sean's brittle chest was sickening, and Luby had to take deep breaths not to throw up again. He'd spent much of the last few months in hospital witnessing the fragility of the human body, and he wasn't sure how much more of it he could take. I came here to escape death just for one weekend without black clouds hanging over me. Tom was shaking his head in despair. Sean, you fool, what have you done? Brett switched back and forth between chest compressions and mouth to mouth. Ryan stood in the doorway looking like a ghost, pale skin and mouth hanging wide open. They'd failed, Sean. They'd all stood by and let it happen. Because we're blokes. And blokes don't nag each other. Blokes don't tell each other when they have drug problems or relationship issues. They don't tell each other they have cancer. We stick it out on our own, alone and terrified. The room fell silent. The only sound that of Brett's palms pumping against Sean's chest. It went on for a full minute, the air turning more and more foul with the stench of piss and sweat. Everyone looked at each other, fear in their eyes. The worst was happening right in front of them. Then everyone jolted as a giant gasp broke the silence. Tom tumbled off the bed and thudded against the floor as Sean folded in two, chest and knees coming together like two sides of an accordion. He looked around the room, clearly not understanding what was going on. Leaping off the bed, he shoved Brett aside and turned a frantic circle in the middle of the room. What? What's happening? What's going on? Ryan stepped back into the room, speaking calmly, despite the fact his nerves were clearly shot to pieces. Sean, it's okay. You old D, but we got your back. Brett got your back. Sean's hands trembled at his sides. Slowly he turned to face Brett, fat tears brimming in his eyes. Am I okay? Am I okay, Brett? Brett nodded. Yeah, you're going to be just... F his words trailed off. At first, Luby didn't know what was wrong. But then he saw Sean's naked torso and gasped. What? What the hell is that? Tom was still on the floor, but he scuttled backwards on his hands and feet, clearly horrified. Brett raised a hand and placed it before him like he was trying to keep a dog from biting. Sean, just sit down on the bed for me, OK? Take some deep breaths while I check you over. Tears ran down Sean's cheeks. What is it? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Brett swallowed and adjusted his glasses with a shaking fingertip. There's just something on you. Sean looked at himself, taking a moment before he spotted the strange growths all over his stomach. Patches of green fuzz had sprouted just above his belly button, forming a patchy line that disappeared beneath the waistband of his boxer shorts. A clump of it also covered the back of his right arm and both hands. Luby shifted himself backwards on his bed, pulling his legs up. Oh, what the hell is that stuff? Brett shook his head. I have no idea. Luby kept his legs tucked up on the bed, wondering if he was delirious from all the chemo. This couldn't be happening, could it? What the hell is this? Sean was pouring at himself frantically and tugging at the tufts of green fuzz covering his body. It looks like some kind of fungus, said Brett. Did you have it before? Before when? Before you got here. I've never seen it before, man. Just get it off me. Brett leaned forward and examined the tuft on Sean's arm. Just hold still, OK? Let me take a look. Sean tried to keep still, but he was trembling. Sweat soaked his face. Luby felt sweat trickling down his back but he knew it wasn't an accurate gauge of temperature. It could be freezing in the room for all he could tell. It seems to have fused with your skin, said Brett. I can try to peel it off your arm, but... Do it! Sean nodded. Get it off! It's the oil, said Aaron, 
stepping back into the room. Ryan went to remove him, but he dodged and went over to Sean. Look at the colour. Dark green, just like the oil. Aaron was right. The green stains were all over Sean's hands and sprouting green fuzz. When he moved them next to his stomach, the colour matched exactly. It was all connected. What is this stuff? Sean demanded, starting to panic. It's a weapon like Aaron said, isn't it? I'm going to die. Stay calm, said Brett. I still think it's some kind of fungus. There are all kinds of vegetation out here, and we're just a bunch of city boys out of our element. I want to see a doctor. Take me to see a doctor, Brett. We can't, said Ryan. Tom's car won't start, and it's too late to walk. Sean grabbed his face and rocked back and forth with his elbows on his knees. Luby pushed himself up off his bed, trying to hide how much of an effort it was. He moved over to Sean and put his arms around him, being careful not to let his bare hands touch Sean's sweaty skin. He'll be okay, mate, he said. First thing in the morning, we'll get you to a doctor. In the meantime, we're all here for you, okay? Don't be scared. Sean wrapped his arms around Luby, and Luby tried not to flinch. Fungus was infectious, right? At least Sean's hands were only making contact with his T-shirt. He swallowed and glanced at Brett. What do we do now? Is this green stuff dangerous? We have no reason to assume it is, said Brett. Sean, do you still want me to remove it? Yeah, get it off me. Okay, I'm going to try and pull this patch away from your arm. It'll show us if there's any damage to the underlying tissue. Luby held Sean tighter, still keeping his hands raised away from his skin. He turned his head so he could watch Brett work. Brett asked for the first aid kit and waited while Tom fetched it. Then he put on a pair of latex gloves and produced a tiny pair of steel scissors. Finally, he got started, snipping at the strange green fuzz and plucking at it progressively harder until the skin on the back of Sean's arm was stretching out like a fleshy tent. It's not coming off. What does that mean, man? Sean's voice was a quiver. Luby gave him a reassuring squeeze. I'm not sure. Whatever it is must produce some kind of bioadhesive. Without the correct solvent, we'd be doing more harm than good by trying to remove it. Sean pushed Luby gently away, then stood up and took a deep breath. I'm going out my head here, lads. What the hell is this stuff? You have no idea, do you, Brett? Brett remained sitting on the bed. No, but that's because I'm a vet and not a doctor. The worst thing we can do right now is panic. Panic helps nothing. First thing in the morning, we're going to get out of here, Sean, OK? Until then, we just need to get some rest. You're dehydrated and physically drained, and you've already had one dice with death, so just lie down and try and get some sleep. Try to sleep? Are you serious? I'll head out on my own if I have to. Ryan stepped up to him and got his attention. Hey, hey, Sean. Let us make the decisions right now, OK? You're not in the best frame of mind. Yeah, but Ryan... Look, you know we all care about you, so stop worrying and lie down. We won't let anything bad happen to you. You swear? I promise. You're my family, Sean, no matter what. I'll be right here with you too, said Luby. I'll keep an eye on you. Sean finally seemed to relax. OK, OK. I'll try to rest. I just need some water. There was a fresh bottle on the bedside cabinet, so Luby handed it over. Try to drink it all. Sean swigged the entire thing down in two gulps. He was out of breath afterwards as he lay down on the bed and stared up at the ceiling. Brett leaned over, examining him one last time. We'll get this all sorted out, Sean. OK, just relax. Sean reached out and grabbed Brett's wrist. Thanks, mate. Brett pulled his arm away. No problem. Then he quickly exited the room. Turn off the light, said Luby to those still remaining, and let us get some rest. Ryan hit the light switch and closed the bedroom door. But before he did, he looked at Luby, concern written all over his face. Luby waved a hand to shoo him away and was relieved when total darkness finally descended upon the room. 
He collapsed back on his bed, sick to his stomach and not knowing how he would get through another day without sleep. Constantly tired but unable to rest. In the dark, Sean spoke. Lobe? Yeah, I'm scared. Before he'd been diagnosed with cancer, Luby had hardly ever cried. Now he did so all the time. Tears slid down the sides of his face now as he stared into the darkness. Everything will be fine, Sean, don't worry. I love you, Luby. I love you too. Get some sleep. Chapter 5 Ryan hadn't slept a wink. He lay in bed staring at the ancient timber running across the centre of the bedroom ceiling until dawn arrived with a chorus of hundreds of birds. Beside him, Aaron had fared better, passing out the moment his head had hit the pillow. He hadn't drunk much, only two or three beers, but for Aaron, it had been a lot. Mum will kill me if she ever finds out about this. She's never been a fan of Sean as it is. Ryan's mother had briefly gone out with Sean's dad years ago, a while after she'd left Ryan's father. Sean had been like an older brother back then, babysitting Ryan and teaching him how to play football. When their parents had eventually split, Sean's dad had gone to prison on a GBH charge. Ryan's mother had met Aaron's dad and they drifted apart. A few years later, Ryan started secondary school and discovered that Sean was in a form group two years above. They'd quickly rekindled their friendship, Sean once again becoming like a big brother. He never stopped looking out for me as a kid. He kept Luby safe too. Whatever happens, I'll get him the help he needs. He's as much as my brother as Aaron. It wasn't even 6am yet, so Ryan had expected to be the first one up. But when he entered the lounge, he found both Tom and Brett already there. Brett checking on Tom's ear, his bandaged ankle up on the coffee table. Morning, said Ryan. His anxious tummy gurgled as he opened his mouth. Everything okay? Just eager to be away, said Tom. Brett rubbed at his hands with alcohol wipes. His glasses were on the coffee table, making his eyes seem oddly small. I checked on Sean. He's resting, but that green fuzz hasn't gone away. I'm not sure if we tried to bring Alp here or tried to take him in the car. If it starts, said Tom, I'll give Alpha a piece of my mind if it doesn't. Ryan raised an eyebrow. You don't think one of us messed with it any more? No, I've calmed down and thought about it. Sean lacks a brain, which is why he acts like a Neanderthal. It's not his style to be devious. Ryan agreed. But just because he hadn't messed with Tom's car didn't mean Sean was off the hook, not even close. What he did to you, Tom, he wasn't in his right mind. Tom ran a hand through his blonde hair, which was bloodstained near his bandaged ear. I know that, but it changes nothing. He's too unpredictable, and I don't need that kind of stress in my life. Brett and I both agree, Sean is persona non grata. Let's assume I know what that means, said Ryan. It sounds like you're writing Sean off just when he needs us the most. He's clearly an addict. Clearly, said Tom disdainfully. He's always been a one-man disaster. But it's up to him now how he lives his life. I've never forced him to take drugs or drink himself into a stupor. None of us have. We could have done something at any time in the last ten years. We could have said something to him. Instead, we just laughed along and let him entertain us. It wasn't always this bad. It was a gradual slide that we'd stood by and watched. Brett sighed. Let's just wait for the dust to settle, shall we? If this is Sean's rock bottom and he actually tries to clean himself up, maybe we'll be there to help him pick up the pieces. Tom rolled his eyes. Speak for yourself. Ryan went into the kitchenette and grabbed a bottle of water. His throat was like sandpaper. He finished the entire thing in one gulp, letting out a monumental burp afterwards. Pardon me? Lovely, said Tom. Human nature, said Brett. Better out than in. Ryan had a rummage. Hey, there's cereal under the counter if anybody wants some. We already grabbed something to eat, said Brett. He motioned to a collection of crisp packets on the table. We've been up for a while. 
Ryan grabbed himself a bowl of cornflakes, his hands trembling slightly, and poured on some milk. Then he grabbed a spoon. With his mouth half full, he asked a question. Brett, have you had any thoughts about what the weird fuzzies all over Sean could be? It's weird, right? Tom tutted. Knowing Sean, he probably stuck his genitals in something he shouldn't have. Come on, man, give the guy a break. Honestly, said Brett, I still assume it's some kind of fungus or maybe some kind of bacterial growth. It's not really my area of expertise, none of this is. I know, said Ryan. We're lucky you're here, though. Extremely fortunate, said Tom, touching his bandaged ear with his index finger. If I would have gone to pieces without you calming me down and taking charge. I'm not good around blood, especially when it's my own. Remember that time when we were playing football and I cut my knee open on that broken bottle? Ryan chuckled, although the situation had actually been quite gruesome. You went white as a sheet. We had to call your dad to come and get you because you lay on the floor like a plank and refused to get up. Even when he arrived, we had to carry you to the car. Exactly. And if it weren't for Brett's composure last night, I fear you'd have seen a repeat of it. Brett shrugged. Dogs, people, it's all the same. Keep them calm and they won't bite you. Wonderful, you're comparing me to a dog. You're right, I apologise. You're far too prissy to be a dog, you're more of a cat. Persian long hair, perhaps? Tom cackled, dimples piercing his cheeks. Tom and Brett had always had a smooth relationship both even-headed and sensible. In a way, their friendship with Ryan, Sean and Luby was an odd fit. If the group ever split, you could be sure that Tom and Brett would end up on the same side. Something was bothering Ryan, the main cause of his insomnia. Do you think the fungus came from that metal corkscrew we found on the hill? The oil Sean got his hands was the same colour as the fuzz on his stomach. Seems like the obvious conclusion to make, said Brett. Metal isn't an ideal breeding ground for fungus, but if it's porous enough, it could allow for growth. Tom nodded. My parents had mould on the pipes a few years ago. They had to get half the system replaced. Ryan gulped down another spoonful of cereal, milk running down his chin. It was probably antique knowing your parents' house. That place is always falling down. That's what you get with Georgian houses, unfortunately. It's on its third roof, and the roots from the poplar trees are starting to unearth the foundations beneath the conservatory. My father has had quite the ordeal. Oh, I can only imagine the hardship, said Ryan, a forced smile on his face. Tom had grown up very differently to the rest of them, but there was nothing he could do about it. So he had always chosen to own it. Eventually, his poshness had become endearing. To everyone except Sean, apparently. How long has he been holding a grudge? Or was it just the drugs talking? When do you want to leave? Tom glanced at his expensive watch. I feel stranded this far from home, and I just want to get back to Amanda. We can crack open a nice bottle of wine while I regale her with courageous tales of how I lost my ear. I'm thinking bear attack? I know they don't exist in Scotland, but fortunately she's not that bright, bless her. I want to let Aaron sleep a bit first, said Ryan, but we'll get going as soon as we can. You're sure I can't convince you both to stay even if Sean gets on a train? I think this weekend is beyond saving, said Tom apologetically. We'll have to arrange a night out in town, a quiet night with a few beers, perhaps a meal. I'm sorry, Ryan. I know this weekend meant a lot to you. It did. It meant so much to me, and now it's ruined. Shit happens, I guess. Ryan forced a smile. It's sound. Don't worry about it. We'll catch up before the wedding. You're both still going to be there, right? Of course, said Brett. But I'd think twice about inviting Sean. He's my best man. I've known him longer than anyone since I was a kid. I can't believe you never asked Luby. I spoke to him about it, but we both decided it would mean a lot to Sean. He's always looked out for me, Luby too. I owe it to him. Brett sighed. Why don't we just try the car and think about getting out of here? Tom nodded. I'm eager to learn whether the wretched thing will start. Come on. Ryan went to the door. They'd left it unlocked during the night, 
but it didn't exactly matter out here in the middle of nowhere. All the same, he grabbed the set of keys from where he'd left them upon arrival, on the console, beside the door. He didn't want to forget to lock up when they left. The air that rushed into the cottage when he opened the door was mild, almost humid, and yet the sun outside was barely in the sky. The gravel on the driveway glistened like dewy grass, yet the surrounding grass itself seemed dry. Tom's car was beautiful in the half-light of a morning, yet to decide what kind of day it would be. Once again, the Stelvio sparkled like a ruby. Ryan could only imagine driving such a thing, and it made him realise that having four jobs in two years didn't breed success. I need to find something and stick with it. The problem is, I have no idea what I want to do with me life, and it feels like time is running out. Brett was standing on one leg, struggling to keep his balance, so Ryan reached out and steadied him. How's the ankle? Stiff and painful. I didn't sleep a wink. Me neither. Tom raised his key fob and pressed the button. Nothing happened, and he grimaced. That's not a good sign. Next, he opened the driver's door, which he had to do manually with a pop-out key. A few moments was all it took for him to reach a verdict. He climbed back out of the car and kicked its tyre. I can't bloody believe it, Brett huffed. It's to be expected. Cars rarely fix themselves miraculously overnight. Okay, it looks like someone needs to walk to the village. I would offer to go myself, but, um... He waggled his swollen ankle. I'll go, said Ryan. This is my mess to sort out. You should stay with Aaron, said Tom. I'll go. If I don't call Amanda soon, she'll find another man. Sophie will be worrying too, said Ryan. I'll call her for you when I get to the village. I I can't be here when Sean wakes up, okay? I want to be the one to go for a walk. I need to clear my head. Ryan sighed. Okay, but please think about forgiving Sean. He didn't mean what he did. He's devastated. I just need some time to think. I understand. I'm just... Really sorry that... Just let him think, Brett snapped. You can't fix everything all the time, Ryan. You act like it's your job to keep everyone together. But sometimes you just have to let people make their own decisions. Ryan flinched. But it didn't take him long to nod his understanding. You're right. Tom sighed. I'm going to get going. There was a shout from inside the cottage coming from upstairs. It was Luby. Brett pinched the bridge of his nose and groaned. Looks like Sean's awake. Ryan sighed. Hold off on that walk, Tom. We might need your help. Tom groaned. What is it now? What do you think? said Brett. Trouble? The three of them hurried back inside. Ryan knew the situation was bad even before he reached the stairs. A crash sounded upstairs, followed by the sound of Luby crying out in pain. It could only be Sean. What the hell was he doing? Aaron was already on the landing when Ryan made it up there, standing unsteadily like a drunken student on Princess Street. When he saw Ryan, he was visibly relieved. Something's happening? It's all right, Aaron. Just stand back, OK? Ryan moved up to the bedroom door and glanced back to see Brett and Tom standing behind him. Brett had his arm around Tom's neck to keep the weight off his bad leg. His glasses were crooked, but he didn't adjust them. Both of them nodded to Ryan, informing him that they had his back. Ryan shoved the door. What he saw inside the bedroom was hard to describe. First there was Luby, fully clothed and sprawled backwards against the bedside cabinet. Then there was Sean, or a distorted version of him, half naked and wrestling with Luby. His face was a picture of pure rage, cheeks the colour of sour milk, teeth bared. Ryan threw himself at Sean, not punching or kicking, but using his entire body to remove him. With hands no longer grabbing at his chest, Luby fell to the floor, gasping. Brett and Tom immediately dragged him out of the room. Sean had toppled onto his bed, which had become like a pit. The fitted sheet was yellow, dark brown in places, and soaked with piss and sweat. The stench in the room was foul, 
like the stairwell to a block of flats in a bad part of town. Sean! What the hell, man? I don't understand what's happening. Sean rose to his feet, keeping his back to Ryan. The dawn sunlight came through the window and illuminated him, made his pale flesh seem to glow at the edges. Slowly he turned around, revealing that his short ginger hair now had patches of dark green in it. The strange fuzz had spread, now covering all of his stomach and parts of his chest. Ryan gasped. A florette of green fuzz had replaced Sean's left eye. His other eye seemed confused, half closed with the upper lid flickering. Ryan? Ryan, I feel well rough. How much gear did I do last night? Sean, just, just sit down on the bed, all right? Sean did as he was told, and he did so calmly. The rage that had taken over when he'd been attacking Luby had completely gone. He spotted a bottle of water lying on the ground and picked it up, drinking from it so ordinarily that it was clear he thought everything was okay. Had he forgotten about having just attacked Luby? Sean put the lid back on the bottle of water and dropped it at his feet. It cleared his throat and rubbed at his fuzzy green eye. For a second it seemed to dawn on him that something wasn't right, but he didn't voice it. Sean, you're not well. Why were you trying to hurt Luby? Sean frowned at the question, apparently confusing him. Huh? I was just screwing around, weren't I? I'd never hurt Luby. Shit, I've looked after that kid his entire life. Ryan nodded. And you've looked after me too. That's why we're going to get you the help you need, Sean. Someone will walk to the village to get help, okay? In the meantime, you need to stay calm and rest. In the doorway, Brett and Tom were aghast. No doubt they couldn't believe what they were seeing either. If Sean had contracted some kind of fungus, it was one hell of a specimen. Brett seemed in no rush to study it. Ryan caught Brett's attention. Do you know of anything like this? Come fungus, do this. Brett's mouth remained wide open. All he could do was shake his head. Ryan stood up. I'm heading back to the village. Luby appeared in the doorway from the landing, covered in sweat and visibly shaken. No, you need to stay here, Ryan. You're the only one who can handle Sean. He stays calm around you. The fear in Luby's eyes gave way to the fact that he wanted Ryan to stay for his own benefit too. He was the only one who knew about his cancer. The only one who could cover for him if he got tired or ill. He's right, Ryan. Tom adjusted the waistband on his chinos. Sean sees you as his brother, always has. Without you, he might go nuts and we won't be able to calm him down like you can. Ryan turned to Sean. Despite the fact they were talking about him, he showed no recognition of their conversation. He was plucking at a patch of green fuzz on his bony elbow. It was slightly darker than the rest and crusty. Ryan gave Tom the nod. Okay, go. I'll be as quick as I can. Tom turned once more, asking Luby to step aside. Then he disappeared onto the landing. Follow the stream, Ryan yelled after him. You'll find the road a couple of hundred metres down from it. Got it. Tom's footsteps clonked on the stairs. Brett hobbled into the room with Aaron following. Luby remained in the doorway slumped against the frame. Everyone kept their distance from Sean. Sean smiled, a twinkle in his one eye. The gang's all here, we gonna party or what? Brett folded his arms and tentatively placed some weight on his swollen ankle. Sean, do you understand what's happening? You've contracted some kind of fungal infection. You need medical attention. You're not in your right mind. I'm fine, mate, heir of the dog and all that. I'll be up for it again in a bit, right as rain. We came here to party, right? Ryan shook his head, growing more and more worried by the second. Had the fungus crept into Sean's brain? Why wasn't he panicking about what was happening to him? Why didn't he recognise the dour expressions on the faces of his friends? He looked like something out of a horror movie. Aaron moved up beside Ryan and whispered, Is he going to be okay?
That stuff is all over him and he's turning dark in places. Sean overheard, but he didn't seem concerned. Stop worrying so much, our kid, look! Ryan jolted backwards as Sean rose from the bed and reached down near the waistband of his boxer shorts. With no reticence, he plucked at a darkening crust around his belly button. It came away easily, making a faint, cracking sound as it removed itself. It revealed a patch of clean flesh underneath, but it wasn't healthy human skin. It was milky and smooth, more like bone than meat. Sean pulled away another chunk of the blackened fuzz and revealed another patch of shiny bone. Brett hobbled forward, but he didn't dare to grab him. Sean, stop! You're doing yourself damage! When he failed to listen, Brett snatched at Sean's wrist, even though he clearly didn't want to touch him. Sean glanced at Brett's hand on his wrist and grunted. For a moment he seemed like he might get angry, but instead he pulled Brett into a hug. I love you, man. Stop worrying, okay? I just wanted to have a good time. Brett struggled. Let go of me, Sean. Sean did not let go. He wrapped his arms around Brett even tighter. Brett struggled and shoved him away forcefully enough that Sean stumbled backwards onto the bed. He was laughing. Shite! That hurt like an up, man. Sean, you need to get some rest. I'll come back to check on you in a bit. We'll bring you something to eat. Sean went to argue, but Ryan cut in before he could. We won't be long, Sean. OK, just chill for a minute. With a sigh, Sean lay back on his soiled bed, folding his hands over his green stomach. Make sure you bring us a couple of beers, mate. No problem. Ryan turned and ushered everyone out into the landing. They closed the bedroom door and Brett headed towards the stairs hopping frantically on his good leg. Brett, what's wrong? His hands were all over me, Ryan. Fuck! Ryan hurried to catch up with him on the stairs. You think it's contagious? Yes, it's a fungus. I need to clean myself. Ah, God damn it! He winced in pain as he landed heavily on the lower step, jarring his swollen ankle. He almost fell, but Ryan grabbed the back of his shirt and steadied him. Slow down! Brett turned aggressively and broke contact. Don't touch me, you idiot. In fact, nobody touch anybody. Fungus can feed on dead skin cells, which means every goddamn surface in this place could be contaminated. Ryan's legs felt hollow as he staggered into the lounge and dumped himself on the arm of the main sofa. Aaron came to join him, but chose to sit on the armchair. Luby sat on the bottom step, Brett, however, went hurtling into the kitchen, almost forgetting his injured ankle. He ripped open the cupboards and tore through them. When he found a bottle of bleach, he poured the chemical onto his skin, neat, and started rubbing it all over his hands and forearms. Then he stripped off and rubbed it on his chest and stomach. Aaron had fear in his eyes, his knees bobbing up and down as he sat and watched Brett. Won't that burn? I'll take mild chemical burns over a virulent fungus, said Brett, continuing to soak himself with the bleach. You should all be doing the same. After a moment's thought, they did just that. There was only a single litre of bleach, so they were forced to dilute it, but Brett told them it was better than nothing. They grabbed a mop bucket they found in the cupboard and filled it with bleach and water, before taking off their clothes and scrubbing themselves raw. Aaron ran his wet hands through his messy brown hair and all over his body until he was shivering with cold. They would need to start a fire to warm themselves up. Is there a cure? he asked, his voice fraught with nerves. For fungus? There are antifungal treatments, said Brett. Most are effective, but I don't know. Whatever Sean has, it's something I've never heard about. If we breathe it in, it could take root in our lungs, it could infect our brains. Aaron wobbled. Ryan grabbed him and made him look at him. It's okay, little brother. Tom is already on his way to get out, just stay with me, okay? Aaron took a series of shallow breaths, but eventually he gave a nod. I'm good. Ryan took a deep breath, 
trying to keep his heart from beating out of his chest. He turned to Brett. Sean's confused, like he doesn't even know what's happening. You think the fungus reached his brain? It would explain why he lashed out at Luby, and why he became so calm afterwards. What do you mean? In nature. Parasites, fungi, bacteria and even viruses act to ensure both their survival and their reproduction. If the fungus has got into Sean's brain, it might have caused an initial mood swing or panic that made him attack. But then it rewired his thought process to keep him calm. If a person doesn't panic, they're less likely to seek help. The longer it takes a patient to see a doctor, the more time the fungus has to take hold. The thing that scares me most is just how quickly this thing spreads. The amount of energy an organism would need to grow like that. The fungus must be feeding directly off Sean's fat cells. The chemical reaction is so fierce that the green fuzz darkens and decays in a matter of hours. We all saw it. Ryan put a hand over his eyes and shook his head. This is bad. Aaron kept the conversation going. When Sean pulled that patch of dead fuzz away, there was something underneath, as if his skin had turned into some kind of shell. I saw it too, said Brett. Like the surface of an egg. Don't ask me to explain because I can't. We all need to get a change of clothes and go outside. It's less likely we'll breathe in fungal spores if we get out. What about Sean? asked Luby. He was still sitting on the bottom step and had been listening to them in silence until now. He's still our mate, and he's sick. Brett grabbed a tea towel and started drying himself off. He ignored the question, although he clearly heard it. He either didn't have an answer or didn't care to give one. OK, that should be enough. Everyone, get dry and get dressed. It's all up to Tom now. Chapter 6 Ryan sat on the bank of the stream watching the crystal water flow from left to right. Now and then a tiny fish would wriggle by, and the carefree movement made the current situation even more surreal. I'm trapped in a nightmare where all of me friends turn on each other and a fungus is eating Sean. Aaron sat beside Ryan, poking a bendy stick into the water. He looked nothing like a 15-year-old lad from a rough housing estate in Manchester. He was a lost child, which made Ryan feel even more like his father instead of his brother. That's not my job. It was never supposed to be my job. Aaron's father had stuck around for the first couple of years after he was born, but eventually the piece of shit had grown tired of being a parent and disappeared to Spain with a friend who had a bar. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, he'd called it. But it was really just a way to run out on his responsibilities. He might have loved Aaron, but he had no affection for Ryan or his mother. The promises of annual visits had dried up by the time Aaron was six, his father quickly becoming a memory. Ryan had been 16 and suddenly found himself becoming Aaron's male role model. At the request of their mother, he had tried to include his younger brother in as many things as possible, allowing him to tag along to the few gatherings that didn't involve alcohol or frisky girls. Pretty soon, Sean and Luby had taken Aaron under their wings too, but it was hard for a bunch of teenagers to look after a six-year-old responsibly. Aaron was exposed to too much at too young an age and it scared him. The last straw had been when Aaron witnessed Ryan getting beat up after a fun time egging houses. The egg-based terrorism had been indiscriminate, which somehow made it feel safer. Sean and Luby were all smiles as they spat at car bonnets and second-floor windows. Inside their fit and healthy bodies, they felt invincible. Nothing could catch them. They were teenagers having fun but the last house they egged belonged to an ex-paratrooper without a sense of humour. The furious veteran bolted out of his house like a retired thoroughbred. While Sean and Luby, Aaron and Ryan had made a run for it, it soon became clear that Aaron with his small legs and Luby with his large belly weren't going to make it. 
Ryan stopped dead in the middle of the road, a strap of terror tightening around his chest. His knees trembled, but he stood his ground while his friends and brother got away. The paratrooper didn't slow down. He sprinted right through Ryan, knocking him to the ground so fiercely that he wondered if he'd been hit by a man or a bus. He slid across the uneven tarmac, arms and lower back shredding to pieces. The pain was immense, but the shock of being hit so suddenly and so hard was even worse. Ryan remembered trying to get up, but the ex-paratrooper had kicked him in the head. Then at some point while he was unconscious, Ryan's arm had been bent backwards and snapped at the elbow. It took six months to fully heal. Ryan's mum had been furious, distraught, and had wasted no time in calling the police. The man who had attacked her boy was Neil Mitchell, and he'd received 18 months in HMP Wakefield, and a nasty newspaper article written about him in the Manchester Evening News. Aaron had gone to his bedroom and had stayed there for the next nine years, surviving on pot noodles and video games. Ryan's stupid antics had traumatised his younger brother, who was already reeling from the loss of an uninterested father. I'll never forgive myself for what he saw that day. I just want him to grow up and be happy. That's the only way I know the damage I caused is healed. You okay, little brother? Aaron pulled his stick out of the stream and looked at Ryan. I'm just worried about Sean. I know he's caused a lot of trouble, but I want him to be okay. Me too. I don't think he meant to hurt Tom. Me neither. No, Ryan. I mean, he wasn't in control. When he bit Tom, it was after he'd gotten the green stuff all over his hands. What if it was already messing with his brain? Ryan considered it. It was a comforting thought that Sean might not be to blame for his actions, but it felt like wishful thinking. He shook his head. I don't think there was enough time between. He only had the oil on his hands for a couple of hours at most, and he first had a pop at Tom before we even went outside. But if he breathed it in or something, we don't know, do we? None of us has any clue what that stuff is up there. He turned and pointed to the hill rising behind the cottage. We'll know soon enough. It won't be much longer before Tom comes back with help. Then Sean will get whatever help he needs and our life will go back to normal. Until you get married. Ryan shifted slightly on the bank so that he was facing his brother. What do you mean? Aaron shrugged and went back to poking the water with his stick. You're already hardly ever at home as it is. Once you're married, you'll be at Sophie's all the time. Well, yeah, that's what being married is. That's cool though, right? You're growing up, Aaron. You should get a girl of your own. Aaron didn't seem to be listening. It's always been you and me, Ryan. Now it'll just be me and Mam. It's going to suck. Ryan sighed. This was a conversation long on the cards. Aaron, you're 15. You should have friends of your own and a couple of shags under your belt. It's not healthy wanting to spend all your time with me or alone in your room. We're brothers. We stick together. Always. But that don't mean we can't have separate lives. When I'm gone, you need to step up and be a man. No more sitting around playing video games and wanking, okay? Toughen up, or this world will eat you alive, our kid. Aaron tossed his stick into the stream and got up. He walked away without a word, so Ryan called out to him. And when he didn't respond, he got up and went after him. Aaron, stop, talk to me. Where are you going? I'm climbing the hill to take another look at the corkscrew. You wanted to be a man, right? That don't mean being stupid. You ain't going anywhere near that thing. It's dangerous. We were near it last night and it were fine. Sean's the only one with a fungus on him because he's the only one who touched it. I want to look at it in the light. Why? How will that help anything? Maybe it won't. But either way, I'm going to climb the hill and take another look. If I don't, I'll just keep worrying about it. Ryan cursed beneath his breath. What was this? A dick measuring contest? Aaron wanted to prove how fucking brave and stupid he was? 
Yeah, that's exactly what this is. He's scared. And he's trying not to be. He's showing me he's stronger than I give him credit for. OK, Aaron, if you're going back up that hill, then so am I. I can do it on my own. I don't need your help. I didn't say that you did, but you ain't going up there without me. Aaron rolled his eyes. Fine. Just don't expect me to wait. Climbing the hill was easier than it had been in the dark, and it took all of three minutes to go from the bottom to the top. In the muted morning sunlight, the summit seemed higher than it had beneath last night's moon, and the corkscrew seemed much larger. A part of Ryan had expected the strange artefact to be gone, so when he set his eyes on it, it took a moment for it to feel real. It was such an odd thing to be sitting on top of a grassy hill in the middle of nowhere. In the sunlight, the metallic surface was dark green, and the yellowish spots were amber. What none of them had noticed last night, however, was that the ground around the corkscrew was the same dark colour as the oil on Sean's hands. While it could almost be mistaken for grass, it was too dark, and several rocky patches were also green where they should have been grey. The strange oil had soaked the ground. It must be some kind of chemical, said Aaron, stepping back so that his trainers were nowhere near the tainted soil. It's leaking out of the corkscrew, look! Green oil oozed from a series of holes at the bottom of the corkscrew. It sent a shiver down Ryan's spine as he zipped up his jacket and wrapped his arms around himself. In matters such as these, matters of the strange, Aaron was more of an expert than Ryan. His video games and Netflix education was infinitely superior. So Ryan deferred to his younger brother. What could it be? Do you think it fell off a plane like Tom said? Aaron shrugged. I think it's supposed to be buried in the ground like this. That's what a corkscrew does, right? It embeds itself. From the size of this section above ground, I reckon it must go down really deep. Ten feet, maybe more. What will be the point, though? Why bury a corkscrew in the ground filled with some strange chemical? Aaron furrowed his brow and thought. The shy, socially stunted teenager gave way to an excited, confident young man. The mystery clearly something he enjoyed. It could be a terraformer, was his first suggestion. Maybe the government is working on a chemical to make unstable land better for farming. The green fuzz all over Sean, maybe it's like some kind of nutrient meant to enrich the soil. He looked down at their feet at the spoiled grass and rocks. It's spreading through the ground. Maybe it'll make all this rocky ground farmable. Ryan chewed his top lip while he thought about that. If what Aaron said was true, it made a lot of sense. A third of the world was starving, hadn't he read that somewhere? If there was a chemical to make mountains and deserts farmable, it would be a massive triumph for mankind. I want to believe you, little brother, but it all seems a little too easy to explain. Whatever this oil is, it's clearly dangerous. Just look at Sean. The government wouldn't release something that wasn't safe, would they? Aaron shook his head, incredulously. Do you know anything about the government? They're not the villains from the movies, Aaron. The worst thing about the government is that they're incompetent and greedy. Aaron smirked, clearly ready to continue the argument. But before he opened his mouth, he flinched and hopped back. Whoa, what the hell? Ryan hopped away too. Insects covered a patch of the earth near where Aaron had been standing. They were thick and slimy like slugs, except they had legs. Ryan shuddered. Are they some kind of beetle? No, Aaron spoke confidently as he leaned over to examine the lumpy creatures about the size of an unshelled peanut. They only have four legs. That doesn't make sense at all. Insects have six legs, arachnids have eight. Only mammals have four, but no mammal is this small. You're positive about that? Aaron shrugged. I guess not. Ryan watched 
as the tiny lumbering creatures stomped about on their four thick legs, and he could find no memory of ever seeing anything resembling them before. Not at the zoo, not in an Attenborough special. What are you saying? That we need to capture one of them to show to Brett? Maybe it's a new species? No way, we're not touching those things. Aaron wasn't listening. He was clearly fascinated. They look like slugs, but they have thick little legs. Hey, we need to get down off this hill, okay? If it is something new, then we need to send a bunch of scientists up here to run tests and that. I'm sure we'll get the credit for finding it. We can name them Aaron Bugs, as in Aaron Bugs me, because he won't listen to me. Aaron started looking around, searching. Hey, there's a water bottle over there. Ryan nodded. Luby dropped it last night when Sean tried to grab him, so what? Aaron picked up the bottle and crouched beside the critters. They're slow. I can catch one. Ryan's skin was crawling by now, and the longer they stood there, the more insects, or, or not insects, emerged from the earth. They seemed to be coming out of the ground around the base of the corkscrew. Had the massive chunk of metal unearthed some colony of undiscovered wildlife deep underground? Or had they come out of the corkscrew itself? Just hurry up and do what you need to. Okay, I'm freaking out here. Aaron reached out towards one of the tiny bugs without hesitation, scooping the neck of the plastic water bottle into the green-tinged dirt and easily capturing the creature. It tumbled into the bottom of the container and immediately tried climbing up the sides. Whatever it was, it was cumbersome, and its attempts to escape proved futile. Aaron held the bottle up to Ryan, beaming proudly. See? Piece of piss? All right, smart ass. Can we go back down now? You want me to hold your purse? Ryan rolled his eyes. I'll be fine. Aaron flinched. Whoa! Ryan jolted. Jeez, will you stop doing that? The insect just squirted something. Aaron held up the bottle. Inside, the frantic creature had elongated. Less a fat slug now, and more of a slender beetle. Behind it, a green smear covered the plastic. That's the oil, said Ryan, stepping away. Aaron, put it down. It's okay, it can't get out. Let's just get it to Brett. I don't like this. Hey, you said to be a man. Maybe you should take your own advice. Panicking won't help anything, right? Let's just do this. Ryan grunted. Fine, but it's on your head if that thing escapes. It's just an insect, Ryan. No, little brother. You said yourself it's something else. Brett and Luby were looking under the Stelvio's hood when Ryan and Aaron returned. Brett was still clearly unnerved by the situation. But Luby seemed focused on what he was doing. His forehead was sweaty and his expression grim as he prodded at the lifeless engine. See anything? asked Brett, holding his glasses and chewing on one of the arms. No, it's the same as last night, mate. I hoped I'd see something in the daylight, but it looks fine. Not that I really know. Still dead? asked Ryan. The answer, obvious. Luby dropped down the bonnet and wiped his hands on his tracksuit bottoms. Dead as a donkey, to be honest. I only had a mooch because I were bored. Brett surprised Ryan by grabbing an open beer from the roof of the car. He took a swig and glared. Don't judge me. I'm on the edge. Where the hell is Tom? It's been almost two hours. I'm sure he'll be along soon, Ryan said. Anyway, we have some of you to look at. Show him, Aaron. Aaron approached Brett cautiously, the plastic bottle held up before him like some kind of offering. Check this out. Brett squinted and leaned forward. What is that? We were hoping you could tell us, said Ryan. We found it up on the hill coming out of the ground next to the corkscrew. It only has four legs, said Aaron, clearly savouring the reveal. Impossible. All insects have six legs. You must have lost a couple when you picked it up. Aaron shook his head. There were a ton of them up there, and they all have four legs. They look just like this one. He's telling the truth, said Ryan. Four legs, every one. Brett moved his face right up to the bottle, but he didn't reach out to take it. 
I've never seen anything like it. Some kind of slug, maybe, but with appendages. How did the green oil get inside the bottle? The insect squirted it, said Aaron. It's the same stuff Sean has got on his hands, right? I couldn't say, possibly. We should kill it, said Luby. What if it's dangerous? Brett shrugged. It may well be. Having a live specimen will help Sean if it ends up being related to the substance all over him. If it's some kind of toxin, this creature might help us provide an antidote. Good job, Aaron. Aaron beamed, but Ryan saw nothing to be happy about. Brett was a vet, but he had no clue about what was inside the bottle. How could that be anything but bad? Suddenly, the thought of discovering a new species was unappealing. He imagined the first person to discover a lion hadn't walked away to talk about it. There was a noise from the cottage and everyone turned around. The front door had opened and Sean appeared on the front step. Lads, what's everyone doing out here? Brett moved away, holding his beer like he might use it as a weapon. Luby moved away too, but Ryan was rooted to the spot. The sight of his friend was heartbreaking. More of the strange green fuzz had turned black and crusty, and Sean's entire stomach now looked like it had been singed by flame, except for the bony protuberance he had uncovered earlier on his stomach. His left eye was completely ravaged, the fuzz now creeping down towards the edges of his mouth. His ribs showed through his flesh. Had Sean been so skinny when he'd arrived at the cottage? Was the fungus eating him alive, using him as fuel? Killing him? Suddenly, Ryan realised there was a strong chance that Sean was going to die. Whatever was happening to him was clearly catastrophic. You should go back inside, Sean. You need a rest. Sean's lower lip quivered. Please, Ryan, don't make me stay inside when you're all out here. I'm so hot. I feel like I'm on fire. Please, can I just stay out here with you? I don't want to be on my own. Ryan glanced at Luby and Brett. Brett was shaking his head. Luby had tears in his eyes. Sean looked so afraid, so weak and alone. Ah! I'm going down to the stream, said Aaron, forcing a smile to his face to remove the revulsion. Uh, do you want to come with me, Sean? Ryan looked at his younger brother. Aaron, what are you doing? He's our friend. If you all want to keep your distance, fine, but I'm going to look after him. Sean was smiling, a massive relief clearly washing over him. He was so frail, like a little old man being asked to go out for a walk. Yeah? I want to see the stream, want to see the water. Come on then, it's just down here. Keep back a little though, okay, you're not very well and I don't want to catch it. Sean nodded even more enthusiastically. No problem, our kid. I'll keep my hands to myself, I swear down. Sean hobbled towards Aaron, not noticing that Brett and Luby were cowering away from him. Aaron smiled warmly and told him that everything would be okay. Ryan felt a pain in his chest and a stinging in his eyes. These could be Sean's final moments, and his friends were abandoning him. Wait, I'll join you. Aaron shrugged like it was no big deal. You want to uh, grab a few beers then? I think Sean could use one. Sean started laughing. A weak and brittle sound. I don't laugh. Ryan went inside the cottage to fetch some beers. His hands were shaking as he opened the fridge and the hairs on the back of his neck stood up as he felt a presence behind him. He straightened up to see Brett and Luby standing behind him in the kitchenette. You need to keep Aaron away from him, said Brett. His infection is worse than it was a couple of hours ago. It's spreading fast. It's all over him. You don't think I know that? I'll make sure Aaron is safe. That's why I'm going. None of us are safe with Sean running around. He's a goddamn biological hazard. Luby winced. He's just ill. It's not his fault. So what? It's not worth risking our lives for, is it? He's contagious and we need to stay away. He's not like he has cancer. Ryan couldn't help it. His eyes went to Luby. His friend gave him a pleading expression. Don't do it, was the message. 
Brett caught the silent exchange and grew suspicious. What? What is it? Luby shook his head at Ryan. But Ryan couldn't keep a secret. It had hurt finding out that Luby had kept the cancer secret from him, and he couldn't do the same thing to Brett. Luby has cancer, Luby groaned. Fuck, man, you promised. We're your mates, Luby. We can help you. Are you an oncologist, Ryan? Because if you're not, then you can't help me at all. You know what I mean. No, I don't. Wait, said Brett. Luby, you have cancer. What's the prognosis? Luby sighed and leaned against the counter. The sweat on his forehead came in beads. It's no panic, but I'm dealing with it. It is what it is. I'm sorry, said Brett. My nan had breast cancer in her fifties. She survived, but I know she went through hell. What kind do you have? Hodgkinson's lymphoma. It's a cancer of the lymphatic system. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I kind of block my ears when the doctors get too technical. But it's treatable and I'm being treated. End of. Brett took in a deep breath and steadied himself. OK, we, we don't have to talk about it, Lubes. If you do need anything, I'm here. Thanks. I just want to get on with things. Of course you do. But if you have cancer, then it's even more important that you stay away from Sean. With all your compromised immune system, you're in greater danger than any of us. Luby grabbed a beer from the fridge and took a swig. She's probably going to make me puke, but I need it. Brett put a hand on the counter and shoved aside some of the snacks until he found something he seemed to be searching for. It was a packet of salted peanuts. Here, eat these while you drink. I read once that it can help with nausea. Really? It's probably an old wives' tale, but you never know. Eat a couple after every sip, see how you go. Luby took a swig of beer and gasped with pleasure, then munched on a handful of peanuts. He seemed to loosen up. Oh, sweet intoxicating poison, just what the doctor ordered. Brett turned to Ryan. You need to keep Sean away from the cottage until Tom gets back. If you and Aaron want to risk your health, that's your choice, but keep him away from Luby and me. Fine, let's just hope no one else gets infected if this is the way we behave. I'm just being practical, Ryan. Keep yourself and Aaron as far away from Sean as possible, OK, and at all costs. Do not let him touch you. I get it, but I can't abandon him. You saw how pathetic he was, how afraid he was. He's dying, said Luby. When they looked at him, he sighed and went on. I've spent enough time around cancer wards to know the luck. If Tom doesn't get back soon, Sean ain't gonna make it. Brett cleared his throat and ran a hand across his forehead. I don't know what we're dealing with. But based on his rapidly increasing emaciation, I would have to agree. The fungus is draining his reserves. Get him to eat something, Ryan, if you can. Ryan grabbed a packet of crisps to accompany the beers. I'll do my best. What were you two going to do while I'm back at the stream? Wait for Tom, said Brett. What else is there to do? Drink, said Luby, holding up his beer. To our health... Chapter 7 Ryan joined Aaron and Sean by the stream. There was a good three metres between the two of them, and Sean appeared calm, with his bare feet in the water. The fact that he was naked, bar a pair of boxer shorts, didn't seem to concern him. Ryan was wearing his jacket and still felt a crisp chill. You OK, Sean? asked Ryan. Sean twisted around, a weak smile on his green and pale face. Just enjoying the scenery, mate. Not every day you get to enjoy fresh air like this. It can add years to your life. Ryan plonked himself down on Sean's left, Aaron already sitting on his right. He stared down the hillside as his lungs took in the clean air, absorbing the grey-green-orange landscape that seemed to stretch on forever. This is why I picked the place. I wanted to make some memories. Job done. Aaron muttered. Once again, he was poking at the water with a stick. None of us is ever going to forget this. Ryan had to concede his brother's point, although he could have done without the tone. 
Things didn't exactly go the way I expected, but we're going to get through this. How are you feeling, Sean? Sean shrugged, as if to suggest he was fine, but a small amount of that calm gave way to panic. The sudden, pleading look in his one good eye made it seem like he was a prisoner trapped inside his own body. When he spoke, it seemed to take great effort. Oh, what's happening to me, Ryan? You're going to be just fine, Sean. I don't believe you. I can see it in your face, man. This ain't going to get better, is it? Brett said it's just a fungus. Medicine will treat it. As soon as Tom gets back with help, we'll get you seen to right as rain you'll be. It's too late, Ryan. There's all these noises inside my head. It's like screaming, hundreds of people screaming at me. Ah, I'm scared. I'm really scared. Ryan wanted to reach out and hold his friend, but the green fuzz was all over his body, right up to his throat. It was like sitting next to a monster. Something human in shape only. Ryan did the only thing he could think of. He rolled a beer across the bank and tossed the packet of crisps. Here, try to eat something, okay? Sean reached out to take the beer, but changed his mind and put his hand in his lap. His fuzzy fingers rested against the strange, bone-like protrusion on his stomach. The desperate, frightened look in his eyes had gone. I'm not thirsty. Ah. Okay. Do you mind if I drink? I know it's early, but my nerves are fried. Fine. That's all Sean said. He sat completely still, staring into the water. Ryan tossed Aaron a beer behind Sean's back and opened one for himself. They both took a swig and exchanged nervous glances with one another. For a second, Sean had been himself, afraid and confused but himself. Now he was a zombie staring at nothing. Aaron rattled something on the ground in front of him. It was the plastic bottle with the critter inside. Ryan groaned. Are you still carrying that thing around? Brett thinks we need to keep it for the antidote or whatever. Sean isn't poisoned. Brett has no idea what he's talking about. Aaron rattled the bottle, knocking the critter about inside. There was now green oil all over the bottom section. Brett said I was right to capture it, so I'm holding on to it. Look, there's more of the green oil on the plastic and... What? The fungus. It's growing along the bottom, see? Ryan had to get up and go around Sean to take a closer look. At first he saw nothing. Then he noticed the narrow seam of fuzz growing along the bottom edge of the bottle. It's the same as... He glanced at Sean. It's the same... Sean flinched, making them both jump. What you got there? What you got? Um, Aaron raised the plastic bottle and rattled it. Just something we found on top of the hill. Sean suddenly growled, his fuzz-encrusted left eye twitching. Let it go! Ryan frowned. What are you talking about, Sean? It's a bug we found. Sean leapt up, landing on his feet like a cat. He bared his teeth, several of them covered by a slimy green mould. A stale odour escaped his mouth. Ryan panicked, wondering if the stench meant he was breathing something in. He took a step back, moving Aaron behind him. Sean crouched like he was preparing to pounce. Let it go! No, said Aaron. This can help the doctors figure out what's wrong with you. We need to keep... Sean snatched at him. Ryan pushed Aaron out of the way and then threw himself to the floor to avoid Sean's attack. He quickly rolled along the rocky embankment until he was back up on his feet. Sean followed him, preparing to leap again. He bent at the knees, scowling at Ryan like he wished him dead. The fuzz in his eye began to quiver, something festering within. Bugs, said Aaron. There's bugs coming out of his eye. Ryan covered his mouth with a hand as Sean's left eye ruptured and a disgusting mess of foul brown liquid spilled down his cheek. The liquid was filled with tiny slug-like creatures, matching those they'd found on the hill. Ryan dodged backwards, horrified by what he saw. Sean, stay the hell back! Sean was beyond words. He lunged at Ryan again. Ryan kicked out and planted a foot in his stomach, sending him backwards. 
The bony patch beneath Sean's belly button broke open and more brown slime oozed from his body. More four-legged slugs erupted from his flesh, raining down onto the grass with a pitter-patter. Sean attacked again, a large flap of his stomach now hanging open and revealing his decaying insides. This time he didn't lunge. He came forward with his arms outstretched, hissing and snarling like a ghoul. Sean, stay back! What the hell is wrong with you? It's in his brain, said Aaron. He isn't in control of himself. Ryan backed away, hands out, pleading, begging. Sean, don't! Our kid, said Sean, before lunging at Ryan's throat. There was nothing in Ryan's hands except an open can of beer. Instinctively, he chucked the contents in Sean's face, blinding his one functioning eye and disorientating him long enough to get out of the way. Aaron grabbed Ryan's arm and pulled him backwards. We need to leg it! No shit! Come on! Sean tried to block their retreat, but Aaron tossed the plastic bottle with a bug inside. It sailed past Sean and landed in the stream, causing him to turn around to retrieve it. Was he concerned about the bug's welfare? Ryan and Sean raced up the hill. The cottage wasn't far, but Ryan wished he had wings so he could fly there. His hopes for Sean disintegrated as he became certain that his oldest friend was done for. Surely there was no cure for whatever was happening to him. There would be no treatment that would lead to them all laughing about this in a month from now. There was no happy ending to whatever this was. Brett and Luby were on the driveway. Luby was sitting on the front step. Brett was perched on the bonnet of Tom's car. They were drinking beer and chatting, and when they saw Ryan and Aaron sprinting for their lives, they seemed confused. What else could they be? How could they know that Sean was leaking bugs and trying to kill them? Get inside, yelled Ryan. Get inside the cottage. Brett shook his head and mouthed something. Clearly he didn't understand. Sean has lost it. Get inside the house. Brett still didn't seem to get it, but Luby stood up from the step. It wasn't enough of a reaction, and Ryan was frustrated when he finally reached the driveway. He clutched his side, struggling with a stitch, but he bellowed at his friends full force, We need to go inside right now! Sean's out of his mind! Luby shoved the door open. All right, man, I'm going! Aaron and Luby hurried inside, but Brett remained standing near the car, looking towards the stream. I don't see Sean coming. What happened? I'll explain inside. Please, just trust me. The shit has hit the fan. Unbelievably, Brett still didn't make a move towards the cottage. He continued looking around, searching for Sean. Ryan grabbed him. I know you're the smart one, Brett, but right now you need to accept what I'm telling you and get inside the cottage right fucking now. Okay, okay, calm down. I'll calm down inside. They both turned towards the front door just in time to see something bolt inside before them. When they heard Luby cry out, they panicked and got going. Brett entered the lounge first and immediately skidded to a halt. Ryan did the exact same thing a second later. What the hell is happening? This can't be real. Aaron was kicking wildly and trying to defend himself. Luby grabbed a can of beer from the counter and tossed it across the room. It struck a large rabbit on the flanks and caused it to spin around in the centre of the lounge. Its dark eyes were crusted around the edges. Its light brown coat was stained green in places. Bugs festered in its fur in a sea of movement. The rabbit leapt at Luby, but Luby hopped up on the counter and yanked his legs out of the way. Aaron took a run up and booted the rabbit in the undercarriage, sending it airborne. The sound of the animal's ribs breaking echoed off the low ceiling as it bounced off the arm of the sofa and landed on its back. It immediately corrected itself, resuming its attack. Its long incisors were mottled, white and green, and a patch of dark fuzz was peeling away from its hind leg. Beneath was the same bony material that covered Sean's stomach. Ryan willed his legs to move, mortally afraid for himself, his brother, and his friends. He made it halfway across the lounge before he caught the rabbit's attention, but the sight of it racing towards him rooted him to the spot. This small animal should have been no threat, 
but instead it was a thrashing ball of teeth and claws. Ryan turned himself, intending to launch the hardest kick he could muster. If he was lucky, he would crush the rabbit's skull and kill it. If he was unlucky... The rabbit leapt into the air with a furious squeal, powerful hind legs propelling it right at Ryan's throat. Any chance of kicking it went right out of the window, as he could do nothing but shield himself now. I'm gonna die on me stag do, gored to death by sodding Peter Rabbit. Brett shoved Ryan aside and caught the airborne rabbit in his jacket. He quickly dumped it on the floor before pinning it against the floorboards. Underneath the jacket, the crazed rabbit thrashed and squealed. Help me, said Brett, not fearfully but testily. Hurry up! Aaron and Ryan looked at each other, neither knowing what to do. Luby hopped down off the counter and lifted up a full box of beer. He clutched it against his waist and toddled over to the rabbit trapped beneath the jacket. Calm down and have a drink, he said, and then dropped the box of beer on top of the coat. The rabbit was clearly stunned, its movements no longer frantic, but jerky and slow. Luby bent down, picked the beer back up, and threw it down a second time with added force. The rabbit went still. Luby collapsed on the sofa, panting, while everyone else stared at the misshapen lump beneath Brett's jacket. Suddenly, Aaron shouted, Ryan, the door! Ryan turned, expecting to see Sean. Instead, he saw a fox its red and white fur spoiled by the green oil. It stared at them hungrily. Ryan wasted no time. He raced across the lounge and slammed the door closed just as the fox made a move to enter the cottage. It scratched against the wood, letting out a strange mewing sound. Ryan dropped the latch and leaned against the door, taking deep breaths and trying not to faint. He felt sick, dizzy, exhausted, terrified. Aaron yelled again, Shit! Bugs! Not knowing how much more he could take, Ryan looked over to see his brother stamping on the floorboards. From beneath Brett's jacket, an army of the slug-like creatures had emerged. Brett raced to help, jumping up and down on the bugs like an excited toddler. Despite their thick legs, the creatures were slow moving, and within a minute, a squashed mess stained the floorboards. Ryan turned to face the front door, sweat soaking his hair. He peered out of the small, diamond-shaped window and thought about only one thing. Where's Sean? This is insane, said Brett. His philosophy of not touching had gone out of the window as he attempted to make Lou be comfortable on the couch. Picking up and slamming the box of beer had clearly taken it out of Luby, as he was now as pale as a freshly laundered bedsheet. With Brett's swollen ankle, and Tom's severed ear, only Ryan and Aaron remained in full health. This is insane, Brett said again. Ryan gripped the kitchen counter, still dizzy from the battle with the rabbit. As long as we stay inside, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. After closing the front door, Aaron and Ryan had pushed the armchair up against it. Then they had drawn the curtains over the windows, turned off the lights, and kept their voices down. The fox outside had seemingly gone away. Nothing was trying to get inside. It felt safe, but Ryan knew it was an illusion. We're not safe in here. We're trapped in here. Aaron was sitting on the smaller of the two sofas, staring at the lumpy mound beneath Brett's jacket. The animals are infected with the same thing Sean has. He was seemingly talking to himself. It's the bugs. The bugs were all over the rabbit. The bugs produce the oil and it turns into the fungus. That doesn't make sense, said Brett. Creatures can produce venom or toxins, but they can't produce life forms separate from themselves. The only thing I can assume is that the insects are themselves infected with some kind of organism that takes control of them and uses them as a means to spread. It's not unheard of in nature. It's taking control of Sean too, said Aaron. He's violent and confused. Wasn't he always? You know what I mean. Brett folded his arms and leaned back against the kitchen counter beside Ryan. Increased violence has been shown in sufferers of the rabies virus, so I suppose it's possible that Sean's behaviour could be as a result of infection. Of course, this isn't rabies we're talking about, not by a long shot. 
This is like nothing I've ever read about or studied or even heard of. It's like something from a horror film. Yeah, Attack of the Fussy Green Zombies, said Luby, lying on his back and taking deep breaths. Sean's not a zombie, said Aaron. It was more like he was angry and confused. Brett went into the lounge and handed Luby a bottle of water, then placed his hand against his sweaty forehead. You're burning up, Lubes. He looked at his watch. Where the hell is Tom? You should have come back by now. What is it to the village? Two miles? Ryan shrugged. More or less. The road isn't easy, though. He's, he's probably had to take it slow. Brett nodded, but didn't seem to believe it. Out of all of them, he was the most on edge. Just looking at him made Ryan feel guilty for putting him in this situation. Aaron slid off the sofa and knelt beside Brett's jacket. Everyone tensed, Ryan most of all. Aaron, what are you doing? I want to look at the rabbit. Maybe we can learn something. What the hell are we going to learn by looking at a dead rabbit? Brett should take a look, he's a vet. Brett grimaced, but slowly his expression changed. I'm not an expert in contagious organisms, but I suppose it might help if we can find out how the infection progresses. How it progresses? Ryan was unsettled by the word. Don't you want to know which organs it affects? How it spreads? No, not really. I do, said Aaron. I want to know what we're up against. Without asking for permission, he whipped away Brett's jacket, revealing a pile of rotting brown flesh and clumps of green fuzz. The rabbit's glassy eyes stared at the front door, as if it might try to get up and escape. Ryan covered his nose with his forearm. It fucking reeks! Aaron moved away in revulsion too. Brett, however, probably used to blood and guts, leaned right over the corpse. It's completely desiccated. There was wonderment in his voice. The fungus fed on the rabbit's organs, probably using it as fuel to spread outside the body. There's more of that bony stuff, said Aaron pointing at the rabbit's guts whilst pulling the neck of his T-shirt up over his mouth and nose. Ryan grimaced, not understanding how his brother could be so curious about something so gross. All the same, he wanted to add to the conversation. With Sean, the bone cracked open and the bug spilled out. Give me a pen, said Brett. The small console table next to the front door had a guest's comments book. On top of the book was a red biro. Ryan grabbed it and handed it to Brett, being sure to keep his distance from the squashed rabbit. Brett used the biro to poke at the corpse, specifically at the bony protuberance. It's not bone, he said. It's fibrous, more like chitin. What the hell is chitin? Luby had rolled onto his side and was watching them intently. It's the substance you usually find in insects and sea creatures. Insects have their skeletons on the outside, right? Think of a scorpion or a beetle. They don't have skeletons like us, they have shells. Chitin is the stuff those shells are typically made of. It can be very thick, like with a crab, but also thin enough to form the wings of a dragonfly. It's one of the most common biological components on Earth. In this case, it seems to have formed some kind of protective sac. For the insects, said Aaron. Brett adjusted his glasses, took a moment, then sighed. It seems like the insects are the vectors for the fungus. They're born inside an infected creature. Once they're mature enough, they escape their protective sac and start spreading the green oil. The green oil leads to more fungus. That, in turn, leads to more infected animals, which leads to more insects. It's a complete life cycle. The only problem is that this organism is entirely unknown to science. How can you be sure? asked Ryan, holding his nose to combat the smell. Made him sound bunged up like he had a cold. You don't know every species of animal. Brett gave a slightly defensive smile. Of course I don't. The vets don't study 30,000 separate species of spider to know about spiders. They study a few of the most common species along with a small collection of outliers. By doing this, they can make an educated guess about all of the species in between. Same goes for all other animal species. Learn the biology of a Havana rabbit 
and you can be pretty confident about the biology of a Florida white. What's your point? His point, said Aaron, is that he might not know every fungus or insect, but he knows enough to realise when something isn't right. Brett nodded. Exactly. I understood enough to be sure that what we're dealing with isn't in any textbook. The bugs and the fungus both. For some reason, Ryan was irritated. He wanted answers, but all he was getting were reasons to be afraid. So, what are you saying? Did some new species emerge from the earth right next to this cottage in the middle of nowhere, distributed by that chunk of metal falling from the sky because a plane forgot to lock its cargo hatch? The hills and mountains are ancient, and mostly untouched. For all we know, this organism could be prehistoric, lying inert beneath the soil for thousands of years until a big chunk of porous metal came and provided a route to the surface. What if the metal didn't come from a plane, said Aaron? What if it came from higher up? Like, from aliens? Everyone tutted. Aaron blushed, but he was defiant. You don't know. What if the corkscrew was launched from space by an alien civilization? Ryan rolled his eyes. To do what? To take over. What if the bugs are alien life forms and the fungus is a way of infecting Earth or altering it? Maybe it's an alien plot to make the planet suitable for them to come here and take it for themselves. I don't like how convincing he's making this sound, said Luby. He's talking bollocks, right, Brett? Once again, said Brett, visibly annoyed. I'm just a vet. You're asking me whether or not we're being invaded by aliens, seriously? Is it possible? asked Ryan, ignoring his protests. Brett sighed. Isn't anything possible? It's far more likely that something was in stasis beneath the soil. But yeah, sure, why not? Let's assume it's aliens. They have to exist somewhere, right? Maybe Aaron's right, and this is a biological attack in order to terraform the planet. He had sounded serious for a moment, but slowly the sarcasm crept into his voice. Two weeks from now, our planet will be covered in a green fungus, and Oscar the Grouch will become our new overlord. Look, guys, whatever this is, it's 100% terrestrial. The fungus is thriving in our atmosphere, which means it must have come from here. An alien life form would likely to need a set of conditions so completely different from ours that it would be incomprehensible. Organisms grow and adapt to suit their environment, not the other way around. They evolve in sync with the unique biomes they're born into. The chances of our Earth being in any way compatible for an alien life form is extremely unlikely. He sighed and rubbed at his temples. Christ, you got me talking about aliens like it's a real possibility. This is not... Aliens. It's dangerous as hell, but we're going to sit tight and wait for help, okay? Once it arrives, someone else can figure it all out. What I can tell you is that if we catch it, we're screwed. This rabbit has no insides. For all intents and purposes, it was dead when it attacked us. The fungus has ravaged its central nervous system and reduced its biological imperatives to just one thing. Attack. Aaron licked his lips finally showing fear instead of awe. Because attacking means spreading the fungus, right? Brett exhaled. Sean wasn't trying to hurt you. He was trying to infect you. We need to make sure nothing else gets in here. No more rabbits, no foxes, and most definitely no Sean. Ryan looked over at the windows, realising that curtains weren't going to be enough. Help me get this up against the window. Ryan grunted and fought with the fridge, which he dragged out of the kitchenette. He could wave goodbye to his deposit after the mess he'd made of the floorboards. Twin gouges ran all the way across the lounge like a set of railroad tracks. The fridge was currently snagged on a wire leading to the lamp on the console table. Aaron moved the lamp and its wire out of the way, then helped his brother slide the fridge up against one of the two windows in the lounge. Fortunately, the cottage wasn't large, which meant there was a decent chance of barricading themselves inside with the meagre resources they had. The master bedroom's window was now blocked by a heavy oak wardrobe, and the small window in the kitchen was locked tight and secured. Upstairs was less of a concern, but they had double-checked all of the windows anyway. Morning had passed and it was now afternoon, 
Bright sunshine crept in through the slender gaps between the curtains and through the window diamond set into the top of the front door. The diamond was their portal to the outside, and Ryan stared out of it regularly. Nothing seemed to be on the driveway, but somehow that made things worse. Where the hell was Sean? What was he doing? Tom should definitely be back by now, said Brett, lining up kitchen knives on the counter. Only a couple of them were long enough to do any real damage. Something happened to him, said Aaron, sitting on the big blue sofa. What other explanation is there? Luby was on the smaller beige sofa, sipping from a bottle of water. He'd managed to catch his breath and a smidge of colour had returned to his cheeks. There isn't any other explanation, he said. Who knows how many infected animals are out there? It could have been attacked by anything. Aaron turned away from the fridge, now in place by the window. Like what? Brett left his knives and folded his arms. Stags can be territorial. Island cows can trample you to death if you rub one up the wrong way. Even a fox can give you a nasty bite, especially if their inhibitions are impeded by a rapidly growing fungus. Hell, a rat can kill a human being if it's determined enough. Graveyards are full of dead idiots who thought it was a good idea to pet something fluffy. We're in the wilderness. It belongs to the animals, not us. Aaron's head dropped. What if Tom's just hurt? He could be out there somewhere, praying for help. Nobody argued. Nobody spoke. The cottage was barricaded as well as it could be, which left them with nothing to do but sit and wait for something to happen. With any luck, that something would be help arriving. Tom was a grown man. They had to trust that he could reach the village one way or another. Brett took a seat on the large sofa and began tapping at his phone. I still don't understand what's happened to this thing, he said. I've had it on charge for the last 30 minutes and it's still not switching on. Hold on a sec, said Aaron. And he disappeared into the back bedroom. He reappeared a moment later holding an iPad. I charged this before Ryan and I set off. He held the power button on the top and waited. And waited. After another moment, he tutted and placed the tablet down on the kitchen counter. It won't switch on either. Luby, try the TV. Luby leaned forward and grabbed the remote, which had miraculously stayed on the coffee table since their arrival. He pointed it at the small flat screen in the corner and pressed a button. A nearly undetectable flash of light, but then nothing. Luby grunted. No, it's happening. Ryan frowned. Outside, the generator continued to hum. He looked over at the lamp on the console table. It was switched on and glowing brightly. He went into the kitchen to try the appliances. The microwave was dead, but the hob burners came on when he pressed the electric ignition button. The kettle boiled without issue. I don't get it. Some things turn on and others don't. EMP, said Aaron. He almost shouted it and his face lit up like he had the answer to everything. The lights and the kettle switch on because they don't have computers in them. A light is just a simple circuit. So is the element in a kettle, I suppose. He tapped a finger against his chin, clearly trying to figure things out. Our phones and tablets have computers. The TV looks modern, so it's probably a smart TV. Tom's car is smart too, said Luby. It's filled with gadgets and screens. Almost drove itself here. The sat-nav, the keyless ignition, it's all computers, man. I read something about new cars having more lines of code in them than the computers NASA used to put people on the moon. Ryan looked at his brother. So what are you saying? EMP is like a shockwave, right? A blast that knocks out all the electronics. Aaron grew animated, excited once more as things re-entered his geeky wheelhouse of internet conspiracy theories and cheesy special effects laden movies. The military are working on all kinds of EMP devices to knock out enemy infrastructure. When that corkscrew landed on the hill, it must have sent out a massive pulse. The earthquake, said Luby. We all felt it. Hold on, said Brett. First you're telling us that the corkscrew is some kind of alien canister meant to transform Earth. Now you're saying it's a military EMP device. EMP can be caused by many things, even lightning. 
but modern computers and equipment are shielded from the effects. Aaron narrowed his eyes. How do you even know about EMP? You're a vet. I'm a vet that likes to read science fiction in his spare time. There are dozens of books about EMP scenarios, which is why I know it would take something monumental to take out our phones. A nuclear blast or an unprecedented solar storm, that kind of thing. Aaron's eyes went wide. How about an alien artefact crashing through our atmosphere? Would that do it? It's that thing on the hill, I'm telling you. It could all be part of what I said earlier about aliens readying the planet for invasion. Knocking out communication sounds like a good way to help an infection spread, don't you think? We can't call for help. We can't warn anyone. Brett tossed his useless phone down on the counter, rattling the knives he'd placed there. We're not being invaded by aliens. I'm more inclined to believe your imbecilic theories about military weapons. Grow the hell up, Aaron. Aaron flinched. Sorry, I was just... Just keep your stupid fantasies to yourself, OK? It's worrying everyone. Ryan glared at Brett across the counter. He's just a kid, man, and he's as freaked out as the rest of us. Exactly, said Brett. He's just a kid. What the hell were you thinking, bringing him along on a stag do? I assumed I could trust me mates to show him a good time and keep him safe. Brett huffed and folded his arms. And how's that going? Back off, Brett. Having a pop isn't going to help us. We came here because we're mates. Are we? I mean, really, are we mates? I haven't seen you in six months. I haven't seen Sean in even longer. I'm assuming you haven't seen much of Tom either. We moved on with our lives, Ryan. We have careers and other interests. I don't understand your fixation on trying to keep us all together. What was so great about the old days that you missed them so much? Was it drinking ourselves stupid every night of the week? Or was it never having any money? Is your life really so awful that you want to stay stuck in the past? News flash, Ryan, but the past was awful. Ryan reeled, taking Brett's words like a blast to the face. What are you talking about? We were inseparable, the laughs we used to have. The laughs might have seemed worth it at the time. But I'm embarrassed about the things we used to get up to. It's a miracle none of us ended up in prison or a coffin. We were idiots and I don't miss it at all. I finally have my life exactly how I want it. And unfortunately, that doesn't include the likes of Sean or... Brett shook his head and turned away. Or you. That's what he was about to say. Ryan's body betrayed him and a tear spilt down his cheek. He quickly wiped it away, trying to hold on to the anger instead of letting it give way to sadness. With all that was happening, it was getting harder and harder to keep himself together. I always knew you would end up doing something great with your life, Brett. You were always so smart, so dedicated. There was no question that you would succeed. I just didn't realise the kind of person you'd turn into. Brett kept his back turned. I'm not going to feel guilty for growing up. If you had any, I was just disposable to you, huh? Ryan shook his head, more disappointed than angry. Just a mate? To fill the time while you were working towards something better, yeah? Well, thanks for using me for the last ten years, mate. Feels great. Brett turned around. He pulled off his glasses and glared. I didn't use you. We grew apart like most people do when they become adults and other things become priorities. You should be planning a future with Sophie. Not looking back at the past and wishing you were still living it. You don't even want to get married, do you? Ryan glanced at Luby, wondering if he'd shared last night's conversation as revenge for Ryan spilling the beans about his cancer. But nothing about Luby's expression suggested he'd said anything to Brett. When Ryan failed to answer, Brett gave a smug grin. You see? You're terrified to grow up. But it's your issue, not mine. Stop blaming everybody else and accept the truth that you're just drifting through life without a purpose. How many jobs have you had since leaving school? A dozen? Luby grimaced on the sofa. Come on, Brett, that's enough. Ryan felt his fists clench, his upper lip curled into a snarl. Do you agree with him, Luby? You've been ill for months and you never fucking told me. 
Am I deluding myself and thinking we're all mates? Am I an idiot? Of course not. I love you, man, and I always will. But part of what Brett says is right. Eventually, the fun ends, you know. Adult responsibilities come along and suddenly there's less time to hang out. It's happened to all of us, and so slowly we didn't even notice. I used to spend the weekends on the lash, but now I spend them with my daughter. Brett and Tom have demanding jobs. We don't have the free time we used to. It sucks, but it's life. As for why I didn't tell you about my cancer, well, I just didn't want you to have to drop everything to be there for me. I knew that if I told you, you'd put your own life on hold, and that wouldn't be fair. Ryan turned and headed for the door. Where are you going? Aaron asked, following after him. I'm walking to the village. I can't stay here. Then I'm coming with you. Ryan wanted to hug him, but he wouldn't do it in front of the others. Instead, he smiled at his brother and gave a nod. Thanks. Luby got up off the sofa. Ryan, just sit down, OK? It's not safe to go outside. Fuck you, Luby. Seriously, you're going to be like that? You see, said Brett, that is what I'm talking about. You're storming off like a child instead of facing the truth. It's pathetic and it's going to get you killed. Ryan spun around and pointed a finger at Brett. It took a moment to get his words out because his jaw was locked so tightly in anger. You listen to me. If you... There was a banging at the door. The wood rattled in its frame. Everyone froze except for Ryan, who turned around slowly. Um, hello? Ryan, it's me, Sean. You need to let me in. You need to let me in right now. Chapter 8 Ryan slid the armchair aside slightly and tried to see Sean through the window diamond in the door. The only thing he could see, however, was his friend's shadow on the driveway. Do not let him in here, said Brett, and he grabbed the biggest knife from the collection on the counter. I swear to God, do not open that door, Ryan. Ryan put a finger against his lips to quieten Brett, then returned his focus to the door. Sean, can you move where I can see you? Why? Because I need to know if you're okay. You're ill, Sean. You tried to attack Alan and me by the stream. Silence, and then, Sorry about that, our kid. I didn't want to tell you, but I did some more blow this morning, sent me a bit doolally and that. I'm fine now, though, I swear down. Let me in, Ryan, it's freezing out here, and I'm dying of thirst. I can't do that. You could be infectious. There's no wrong with me. Whatever was on me has dried up and fell off and right as rain, me. Brett glanced at the others in the room. They seemed as doubtful as Ryan was. Then step in front of the door so that I can see you. Give over, mate. Me tits are turning blue out here. Luby sat forward on the sofa, his palms against his cheeks. He's lying. Ryan nodded. Of course, Sean was lying. You're not coming in here, mate. I'm sorry. What about some water then? Just open up the door and hand me a bottle. I can't do that. Silence for a moment. And then Sean's footsteps retreated on the gravel. Ryan breathed a sigh of relief. He's going. He sounded normal, said Aaron, like himself. Impossible, said Brett. There's no way he's okay. We all saw him this morning. He was close to death. Ryan peered through the window diamond, trying to see Sean on the driveway. He caught a slight movement to the right, assuming it was Sean walking away. But he wasn't walking away. Shit! Ryan leapt back as Sean sprinted at the door and threw himself against the wood. The entire frame shook and the window diamond shattered as a twisted arm punched through it. Sean's hand was skeletal, coated in a syrupy brown substance that was infested with insects. The tiny four-legged bugs dropped onto the floorboards and began to scuttle. Ryan yelled in terror and began stomping on them. Aaron and the others came to help. Let me in, Sean! Sean snarled from behind the door. Or I'll fucking kill you! Go away! Aaron shouted. Go away, Sean! Let me in, little man! 
Ryan stomped on the last few bugs. But Sean's foul arm still reached through the small window, trying to snatch at them with fingertips of sharpened bone. Brett hurried forward and buried a knife in Sean's forearm. His foul flesh parted like butter, and the blade sliced right down and through the knuckles of Sean's index and middle fingers. His hand and arm split open in a V-shape, while more bug-infested slurry spilled down on the floor as Sean roared in agony. A monstrous sound that shouldn't have been possible from human vocal cords. You daft bastards! What you do that for? Ryan stomped, more bugs, panting as he replied, Sean, you need to get out of here. If you try to come inside, we're going to hurt you. Do you understand? There was silence again for a moment before Sean spoke. I protected you your entire life, and now you're turning your back on me. You're a Judas, Ryan. Just go away, Sean, please. I ain't going anywhere, our kid. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you all. Ryan screamed as Sean's face appeared in the broken window diamond. His face dripped away from his skull, a green and brown slop. Both of his eyes were gone replaced by writhing insects, his nose a pair of sunken pit holes. Sean was gone. A monster had taken his place. Sean backed away from the front door, a twisted grin on his unrecognisable face. He spread his arms out to the side as he retreated, almost like the whole thing had been a joke and no harm was intended. Inside the cottage, no one was laughing. Brett started handing out knives, limping back and forth between them. He tries to get in here, stab him. That's not our mate out there. Sean's like the rabbit, already dead. We need to make sure the same thing doesn't happen to us. He isn't dead, said Aaron. He was talking to us, it was him. Ryan nodded. He was in there. It was him. Brett picked up a pair of knives from the counter for himself, the two biggest. He's no different to that cat lying on the road, purring, not realises its lower half's been crushed flat by the tyres of a lorry. It might still be alive, but it's temporary. Sean is beyond saving. We all saw it. Luby was twirling a wooden-handled steak knife in his hand, like he was trying to get used to its weight. Sean's gone, he said, tears in his eyes. I'd do anything for it not to be true, but it is. Sean's dead whether he knows it or not and I didn't suffer months of torment to try and beat cancer only for a fucking fungus to do me. If Sean comes back, I'm planting this in his brain. I'll be doing him a favour. Ryan collapsed onto the armchair, which was still pushed up against the door. I can't believe this. We're talking about Sean, he's our mate, and he's out there. Even if there's a 1% chance that he can survive this thing, then there's no way I'm going to stab him. Can't we just take a minute to think about what we're saying? What if one of us gets infected, said Aaron? Are we saying that we're all prepared to kill each other? Come on. I'm not saying that, said Luby, but I'll defend myself if I have to. If you have to, said Ryan, seizing on the word. So let's try and avoid that, yeah? Sean is still outside and we're still in here. There's no need to get stab happy. If we have to go outside, we can probably outrun Sean in the state he's in. So let's focus on that. Killing him doesn't help anything. And what if we find out afterwards that he could have been cured all along? Can we live with that? Brett grunted. OK. I'm fine, I get your point. He placed the knives back down on the counter and leaned over it, scratching the back of his head. A sigh escaped him and he turned back around. Look, Ryan. What I said earlier. Ryan waved a hand and dismissed what his friend was about to say. It don't matter. There are more important things to worry about right now. No, really. I'm sorry, Ryan. The truth is that our friendship meant the world to me. I didn't use you, and I never expected to grow apart. He chuckled. Back in the day, I thought we'd be together forever, having barbecues in the garden with our kids and wives. Life seemed easier when we were young, but it's not like that at all. It's tiring and stressful, and it leaves no time for fun. I'd love to hang out with the lads every weekend, of course I would, but... But what? 
but I want a career and a family and a big house in the countryside. I want some land to raise chickens and goats and maybe even learn how to ride a horse. Might sound silly, but I don't want to feel guilty about wanting those things. I don't want to feel guilty for working hard. Ryan held up a hand to stop him. I get it. I don't have the right to tell you what your priorities should be. You can live your life however you want to. I just want you to find your own happiness, Ryan. I want you to have the same sense of achievement that I do. I want peace and happiness for you. Yeah, I want that too. Luby cleared his throat. What's the deal with Sophie? Ryan glanced towards the front door. The daylight seemed to be dimming already. He checked his watch and saw that it was now past four. How much longer before night fell? And once again, where the hell was Tom? Are you okay, mate? Are you dead? Ryan shivered. He left his friend's question hanging in the air, and Luby was still waiting for an answer. With a sigh, he tried to avoid giving one. You really think this is the time to discuss my engagement? Luby shrugged. It's your stag do. If you don't discuss it now, when will you? Brett folded his arms and raised an eyebrow. Ryan, do you want to get married? Yes or no, I'm not sure. Sophie's amazing and I love her. In fact, I can't even imagine being with anybody else, but did I ever tell you about how we met? Luby chuckled. A goose, right? Ryan nodded. Yeah, it started with a goose, that sodding goose. Brett chuckled. A goose? I haven't heard this story. I was jogging around the lake by the industrial estate, Ryan began. You know the one. Well, I must have jogged it a hundred times without a problem, but this one day it was really hot and I took a break to catch my breath. Next thing I know, this Canada goose comes storming up the embankment like a samurai and attacks me. It's biting me ankles, flapping its wings. Seriously, I thought I was going to die. Brett erupted into laughter. Luby was smiling too and he clapped his hands in joy. I love it. Gets me every time. Yeah, well, anyway, Ryan felt his cheeks growing red. There I am, in a ball on the ground, screaming for dear life, when I hear someone hissing. The goose is honking like a maniac, but slowly it starts to back off. Finally, I dare to look up and there's this gorgeous brunette staring down at me. She has a rolled up magazine in her right hand that she used to bat the goose around the head to save me. It was the most embarrassing moment of my life. But she never made me feel silly about it for a moment. I remember her shouting at the goose to fuck off. It was like a goddamn mugger after me wallet. He shook his head with a smile, remembering it like it was yesterday. She helped me over to a bench and rubbed me back until I'd stopped hyperventilating. And then she took me to have a cup of tea for me nerves over at the burger van by the factories. I never went to that sodding lake again, but the rest is history. Sophie literally saved me life that day. I doubt the goose would have killed you, said Brett, tears in his eyes from laughing. It was probably defending its young. They're highly territorial. When you stopped to catch your breath, you must have felt threatened. Trust you to take the goose's side, said Ryan. Anyway, my point is that I loved Sophie ever since the moment she fought a goose for me. Brett's laughter disappeared and he appeared confounded. Then why? The front door rattled and Sean peered in at them through the broken window. His eyes were gone, but somehow he seemed to see them anyway. The grin on his face was obscene and without a word he reached in through the broken window and let go of something. A bird took flight, swooping towards Luby on the sofa. He managed to grab a cushion and shield himself just in time. The bird was tiny but clearly infected by the fungus. A ball of dark green fuzz swooping through the air. A flash of blue might have been the bird's original colouring, but it was no more than a patch. The bird swooped again, this time aiming for Aaron. Instinctively, Ryan leapt across the room and slapped at it. He missed, but it caused the bird to redirect its flight and miss Aaron. The whole while, Sean cackled with laughter at the broken window. Green fuzz had replaced his eyes, but he knew the peril he'd caused them. Brett slashed at the air with a knife, but the bird was too small and too fast. Several times it almost collided with his face. 
Luby batted the bird away with the cushions, screaming like a little girl. It flew silently, making no sound or showing any signs of anger or fear. Yet it was relentless in its aggression, continuously swooping around the room and trying to collide with their terrified faces. The bird dove at Ryan. Ryan ducked. Ever since the goose attack, he hated birds. But never had he been afraid of one so small. Would one peck be enough to infect him? One scratch? Nearby, Aaron scrambled between the sofas and threw himself over to the console table where he grabbed the lamp. The plug pulled away from the socket as he yanked it by the wire and the glowing bulb turned dim. Brett shouted a warning as the bird swooped over and dove at Ryan a second time. This time, Ryan was already crouched, which left him unable to go lower or move aside. There was no way he could avoid the bird. Aaron swung the lamp by its cord. Through miraculous luck or uncanny accuracy, the bulbous lamp base struck the bird in midair and knocked it to the ground where it thudded against the floorboards and started twitching. Immediately, Ryan straightened up and stamped on it, adding its guts to the sloppy mess already coating his trainers. Pass that on to the goose, you son of a bitch! Brett hobbled towards the front door with his knife. Despite their earlier conversation, Ryan couldn't bring himself to object. Sean, if you can hear me, if there's any part of you left, just leave us alone. We won't let you infect us, do you hear me? I'll kill you if I have to. Still peering in through the broken window diamond, Sean's face distorted, his grin stretching right across his ruined face. Rancid flesh and brown liquid oozed down his cheeks. One of his ears had slid right down onto his collarbone. It's too late, Brett. It's too late for you. Brett lunged with the knife, stabbing it through the broken window and trying to sink it into Sean's face. Sean stepped backwards casually and walked away, leaving behind his words. It's too late for you. What the hell did that mean? said Luby. He began patting himself down, pulling up his sleeves and examining himself. Are we infected? He's just messing with us, said Brett. Stay calm. But Luby didn't stay calm. You're already saying we can breathe it in. What if it's inside me? He leaned forward on his knees and started taking deep breaths. I can feel it. It's in me lungs. I can't breathe. Ryan hurried over and started rubbing his friend's back. It's all right, Lubes. In and out, slowly, okay. Everything's fine. You're fine. Luby sucked in the air through his nose and let it out through his mouth. This is so messed up, seriously. How is this happening? How? Like you said, someone has to be the shite statistic. We're the one in a billion unlucky losers who happen to find a deadly fungus in the middle of nowhere. We're definitely going to end up in the newspapers. Let's just hope it's not on the obituaries. Brett stood by the front door, peering out of the broken window. After a few moments, he turned around. Sean's headed off towards the stream. We have to come up with a plan before he comes back. We should just make a run for it, said Aaron. He won't catch us. Brett held up his swollen ankle. Speak for yourself, Aaron groaned. Oh, yeah. Ryan glanced at his watch. It's going to start getting dark in an hour or two. If we're going to make a run for it, it would have to be soon. Maybe one of us can go. Tom already tried that, said Brett. He's dead, said Aaron. We all know it. The wildlife is infected. So are we, muttered Luby. We don't know that, said Brett. He pointed a finger to enforce his point. Don't make assumptions. Luby's eyes went wide and for a moment it seemed like an overreaction. Then he leaned back against the sofa, as if trying to put more space between him and Brett. Your arm, man. Your arm is green. Brett was still pointing his finger in the air but slowly he lowered his eyes to his wrist. Ryan was too far away to see, so he took a step closer. Sure enough, the bottom of Brett's arm had a green circle around it. Several of his fingers were stained as well. Luby buried his face in his hands. Sean was right. It's too late. We're infected. Aaron lifted his shirt and started checking himself frantically. I don't see anything on me. Ryan, check my back. Ryan examined his brother. You're fine. 
There's nothing on you. What about me? Aaron checked him. I think you're all right. I don't see anything. Brett's finger was still piercing the air, but his hand had started to shake. It's just me, he said, his voice flat and emotionless. Last night, Sean grabbed my wrist. He grabbed it and held it. I've been infected this entire time. Slowly he lifted his shirt. Everyone gasped. Green fuzz had grown in half a dozen places. He prodded it with his fingers. My skin is numb. That's why I never felt it growing. Luby swallowed, the sound loud enough that they all glanced his way. He grabbed me, too, when he attacked me in the bedroom. You were fully clothed, said Ryan. Did he touch your bare skin anywhere? Ah, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Luby rubbed himself over, prodded at himself, lifted his shirt. I don't see anything on me. I don't see anything. Then you might be okay, said Ryan. Brett sat down on the small sofa. He did so mechanically, like he was ordering his limbs to move rather than feeling them. Then he changed his mind. He leapt back up and raced over to the kitchenette sink, turning on both taps. The bleach was all gone, so he searched for something else, eventually grabbing a fresh bottle of vodka. He poured it into a plastic mixing bowl and submerged his entire hand. Aaron hurried over to him, but kept his distance. Will alcohol help? Brett closed his eyes, his face a picture of pure misery. He ignored the question posed to him. Didn't even seem to hear it. We need to get out of here. I'm not ending up like Sean, I won't. Ryan came closer and examined Brett's wrist from a few feet away. A fuzzy green handprint encircled his flesh. An echo of Sean's touch. It confirmed that the infection was spread via contact. Is there anything I can do? Short of chopping off my hand, no. Ryan looked at the knives on the counter. None of them looked capable of taking off a hand, but if there was no other choice... Brett's expression turned sour. I was joking. No one is cutting off my hand. I just need to get to hospital. That's what you can do for me. Get me in front of a doctor who understands this because I sure as hell don't. No problem, said Ryan, not knowing what else to say. I'll get you to a doctor, I promise. Give over. Brett always worked hard to keep his speech polite and educated, but more and more the Manchester boy was escaping. It ain't like we can catch a bus. I can't even get anywhere on this sodding ankle. I can't make it into the village either, said Luby. I'll be out of breath before I make it halfway. Less if Sean legs it after us. Either we all go or none of us do, said Ryan. So where does that leave us? What if we try rolling Tim's car, Aaron suggested. We're uphill, right? Maybe if we can get the car to the road, we can roll it all the way into the village. Brett seemed to mull it over, then shrugged. Even if it gets us halfway, it would help. We'd still have to make it inside the car, said Luby. Sean's still out there along with God knows how many infected animals. You're right, said Brett. But what's the alternative? Ryan, when does the landlord expect you back with the keys? He said he would come by Sunday around noon. Brett grimaced, glancing back at Luby. You see, we can't wait until tomorrow. God knows what Sean will dump through the window next. Not to mention, he held up his wrist. Tiny green hairs had begun to sprout from the oily stain. Time is literally ticking for me, Luby. I don't have the option of staying put. Luby nodded unhappily. Then, I guess we're making a run for the car. Brett grabbed the knife from the counter. I'm already infected, so I'll lead the way. Ryan disagreed. You might be infected, but that doesn't mean you can't get hurt. We stick together the old way, mates, right? Brett nodded. Yeah, mates. I'd shake your hand, but... Yeah, stay the fuck away from me. Ryan smiled to show he was joking. Sean might be beyond help, but he was going to do whatever he could do to help Brett. There had to be a way out of this. It couldn't be as bad as it seemed. This has to all make sense somehow. It's 2020, not the dark ages. Doctors can treat everything. Aaron looked towards the door. Should we make a plan first? It's... Gonna get dark, said Ryan. 
There's no way we'll be able to find our way back to the village in the dark. Even in the car, we lose the road and end up in a ditch. The odds are the same whatever time we leave, so we might as well get it over with. The plan is to run for the car and get in as quickly as we can. Wait, said Brett. Do we even have car keys? Ryan patted his pockets, even though he knew he didn't have them. The only keys in his pocket were those the landlord had given him, a small bundle on a Scottish flag keyring, along with his own personal car keys. Tom must have them, damn it! It's unlocked, said Luby. Brett and I were checking the engine earlier, remember? The driver's door is still unlocked from when Tom opened it last night manually with the key. The auto locking is as dead as the engine. What about the other doors? asked Ryan. Luby shrugged. Never checked them. Hopefully they will be. Ryan moved over to the front door and peered out of the broken window. I don't see Sean. No animals either. Are we ready to do this? No, said Luby. And that ain't going to change. He pulled himself up on the sofa, stretched and flexed. But what choices do we have? Ryan sighed. None. Then let's go. Ryan placed his hand on the door handle. Chapter 9 Everyone put on their coats and gathered at the door, none of them happy. Ryan checked his watch. The sun was going to start setting soon. They had to do this now or they'd be trapped inside the cottage until morning. As he clutched the door handle, Ryan wondered if he was making contact with the fungus. Brett had said it could live on almost any surface. Had Brett touched the door handle? Had Sean? Sean let himself out this morning. His arm must have touched the handle. Aaron looked at him. You are right, Ryan? Uh, yeah, I'm just taking a minute. Everybody ready? They all nodded. Let's begin. Ryan opened the front door and hurried out into the gravel driveway. There he stood, searching left and right. No sign of Sean or the animals. Tom's car was still parked nearby. The coast was clear. Ryan turned back and grabbed Brett, despite his protests, and helped him to walk. He winced with every step, but they had no choice but to move quickly. Each second was a hypodermic needle injecting more and more anxiety into Ryan's veins. Sean must be out there somewhere watching them, stalking them. He wouldn't have just walked away. His promise to kill them had seemed too genuine. In a group, they hurried towards the car, their footsteps unavoidably crunching on the gravel. The Stelvio's sleek bonnet was still propped up, so Ryan told Luby to drop it. He did as he was asked, knocking away the prop and letting the lid drop down with a loud clonk. Everyone winced. You idiot, Ryan said through gritted teeth. Luby blushed. Sorry, our kid. Shaking his head, Ryan grabbed the driver's door handle. Mercifully, the door opened without argument. He quickly bundled Brett inside, glad to be free from the burden of his weight. Aaron dodged by him and tried the rear passenger door. The handle sprung out, but the door stayed shut. It's locked. Damn it! Luby moved over to the other side of the car and tried the front passenger door. Same here. Vet, lean over and pull the... Ryan registered movement from an unexpected place. He looked upward, expecting to see a bird, but instead he saw Sean crouched on the high-pitched roof that sheltered the front door. His legs straddled the peak on either side. His face had now fallen away completely, leaving behind a bare brown stained skull. Both his eyes were balls of green fuzz. His mouth was an empty maw, barely any teeth remaining. Ryan tried to grab Luby, but the bonnet was between them. Luby, move! Luby clearly had no idea why Ryan was shouting, but the urgency was enough to communicate danger. He leapt back from the car, knowing only that he needed to be somewhere else. It was enough to move him out of harm's way. Sean came crashing down against the side of the car's bonnet, fists thumping into the painted steel and making two deep dents. When Luby realised his near miss, he staggered back on his heels, moving away from Sean as fast as he could. Then he tripped and fell. Sean turned and opened his skeletal jaws, releasing a cascade of soaking wet bugs. 
not thinking, Ryan leapt onto the bonnet and used the added height to kick Sean's lump and skull like a soccer ball. He might have been a monster, but the ferocious impact was enough to send him sprawling onto the gravel driveway. Wasting no time, Ryan raced to the other side of the car and gathered Luby to his feet. Come on, mate, get in the car! Brett was already reaching over to unlock the passenger door, and when Ryan yanked on the handle it opened. He got Luby inside and slammed the door before searching for his brother. Aaron was yanking at the rear handle, yelling at Brett to let him in. Sean leapt back on his feet, somehow his arms had elongated, and now ended with single sharp talons. There was no time to wait for Luby or Brett to clamber over the seats and unlock the rear doors. Sean would be on them in seconds. Ryan took a step in the direction of the cottage's front door, but Sean dashed in front of him, seeing him through the fuzzy masses filling his eye sockets. Ryan took another step, and once again Sean matched it. He turned to his brother. Aaron, get the hell out of here! I'll keep him busy! No way! I'm not going without you! Ryan grunted and looked desperately around. He took in the ominous cross and the white stones. Next, he took in the juddering generator peeking out from behind the shed. Then he took in the shed itself. He felt the weight of the landlord's keys in his pocket. He fished them out and tossed them to Aaron. The shed! Get inside the shed! Aaron took off just as Sean attacked. He leapt at Ryan, slicing at his face with one of those sharp talons. His arms were more like lengths of spongy elastic now, rather than anything with bone and muscle. The talon whipped through the air like a striking cobra. Ryan ducked, the talon disturbing the air a few centimetres from his head. From down low, he scooped up a handful of gravel, groaning when he saw it filled with writhing bugs, and tossed it in Sean's face. The bugs went airborne, scattering all over the driveway. Instead of attacking again, Sean turned and watched the critters fall. Ryan bolted for the shed, praying that the bundle of keys the landlord had given him contained one for the shed, and that Aaron could find it and get inside in time to keep them from being infected. Mam is definitely going to kill me. Aaron was at the shed's door, struggling with a large brass padlock. Ryan reached his side, gasping for air. Do you have the right key, do you? He glanced back at Sean who had finished checking on the welfare of the bugs and was once again focused on attacking them. Aaron! Hold on, I'm trying! Aaron had about six keys to deal with. He was trying them one after another. But each failed attempt led to a wasted second of jangling the key and trying to get it unstuck from the lock. He was taking too long. Sean began to stagger along the driveway, picking up speed. Bugs spilled from his open mouth. His talons whipped the air like monstrous tentacles. He was completely silent as he approached. Ryan grabbed his brother's arm. Come on, we need to get out of here. One second, there's only one more key. There's no time, come on. Sean leaned forward and sprinted towards the shed. Even if Aaron found the right key, there was no time to unlock the door and get inside. Ryan raised his fists, knowing that a bare-handed fight would definitely infect him, but seeing no other way to protect his brother. I've got it, said Aaron, but it was too late. Way too late. Sean raised a talon, preparing to strike. Hey, Sean, watch this. Luby had got back out of the car. He started tap dancing on the gravel. A picture of ridiculousness. He was squashing the bugs that had fallen around the car. Sean skidded to a halt, gravel spraying up in the air. He let out an ear-piercing scream and turned around, then ran back towards the car, towards Luby. What the hell are you doing, our kid? Luby continued tap dancing for another second, then stopped. He glared at Sean as angry as Ryan had ever seen him. I'm sorry, Sean, but I don't think we can be Bessies anymore. Sean leapt at Luby but Luby very quickly slid back inside the car and slammed the door. Clearly enraged, Sean whipped his talons at the window over and over again, but the glass didn't break. Ryan, come on! Aaron grabbed his brother from behind and yanked him backwards into the darkness. The shed was dark, but not pitch black due to a small amount of light spilling in through a plastic window at the rear. Ryan searched for a light switch, but couldn't find one. 
Then Aaron yanked on the pull cord, and a naked bulb came to life above their heads, hanging from a cobweb-covered wire. Ryan needed to know that Luby was okay, but there was no way to see what was happening outside. There were no windows or openings facing the driveway. He'd seen Luby make it back inside the car, but was that enough to keep him safe from Sean? How long before Sean managed to break the window with those talons of his? Talons? He turned into a monster? This isn't just a fungus. Ryan checked his hands and wrists underneath the light bulb, expecting to see the green stains. So far he could find nothing. How long would it take for the infection to show? How long did Brett have? They're trapped in the car, said Ryan, and we're trapped in here. Things are even worse than before. Maybe not, said Aaron. Take a look around you. Ryan realised he was panting, so he concentrated on calming his breathing. Once his lungs were under control, he did as his brother asked and looked around. The shed was crammed full of tools, equipment and random junk. A petrol mower and a chainsaw were secured by a rope to the wall opposite the window, and beneath the window was a workbench stocked with all manner of tools. In addition, there was a rusty old barbecue and a pair of mountain bikes. This could be our way out of here, said Aaron, clutching the handlebars of one of the bicycles and lifting it upright. Both of them seemed in good shape, a little faded and old-fashioned, but no rust and all four tyres were inflated. What? You want to go cycling through the highlands? Aaron huffed. Yes, we can race to the edge of the hill and then coast all the way down. There's no way Sean will be able to catch us. Did you see, Sean? How that thing ain't even him anymore. He's a monster, and it left off that roof like a goddamn gorilla. If we try and make a run for it, it'll be on top of us before we make it past the driveway. I don't fancy trying our luck. It's an alien, said Aaron. Oh, come on, I'm telling you, it's an alien. How can you even deny it? There's nothing natural that can change a person like that. The corkscrew came from space. Ryan wanted to argue. If he'd had an alternative theory, he would have put it forward. But the truth was that he had no idea what was happening, aside from the fact that it was horrifying and unbelievable. Sean had gone from man to monster in a single weekend. It didn't take a doctor to see how wrong that was. I don't know what this is, Aaron, but man made me promise to keep you safe, so somehow I need to get us out of here. I don't think a pair of old mountain bikes is going to cut it. What about this then? Aaron nodded at the chainsaw. Ryan had never used a chainsaw before, but he suddenly pictured himself revving the thing up and slicing Sean to pieces. It was an unpleasant image, yet strangely empowering. He lifted the tool from behind the rope, holding it in place. I just pulled this cord, right? Don't ask me. Ryan huffed. Okay, well, here goes. He yanked at a small plastic loop attached to a nylon cord, turning his head away and wincing. Nothing happened. He yanked the cord again, several times. But all he managed to produce was a weak, throaty sound from the tool's inner workings. Defeated, he hoisted the chainsaw and rattled it beside his head. I think it's out of petrol. Is there any in here? They must keep some for the generator. Both brothers searched, but it didn't take them long to discover that there wasn't any petrol lying around inside the shed. Ryan swore in disappointment. We could siphon it from Tom's car, Aaron suggested. If we could safely go outside and siphon petrol, we wouldn't need the sodding chainsaw, would we? Aaron tutted and turned away, rooting through the various junk in search of a solution. Ryan sighed. I'm sorry. I'm just on edge, obviously. I keep expecting to wake up from this nightmare, but it keeps going on. Did I take some of Sean's gear last night? No, but it probably would have been better if you had. This whole thing's like a drug trip. Uh, not that I'd know. He shared a laugh with himself, then muttered, I should have stayed at home. Ryan was hurt for a second, but then he leaned back against the wooden slats making up the walls and let out a long sigh. Ah, I shouldn't have dragged you up here. Why did you? Why did you even want me here, Ryan? Are you having a laugh? You're my little bro, of course. I wanted you here. Cartwright Brothers United, yeah? United? 
until one of them goes and gets married. Ryan groaned. You really want me to stay at home forever? Yes. Petulance was a natural defence for a fifteen-year-old, but it still managed to aggravate, and Ryan groaned at the display of selfishness. Aaron seemed to realise he was being unfair because he quickly apologised. Of course I don't expect you to stay at home just for me, but I thought that you'd take a little more time before you upped and left. Why can't you wait a little longer before you marry Sophie? Because I love her! Ryan almost shouted it, a sudden need to defend his choices taking over him. He had asked Sophie to marry him because he loved her. That much he knew. His reluctance had only arrived afterwards, as the wedding drew nearer. But on the night he had popped the question, there had been no doubt in his mind. He had wanted to marry Sophie. I wanted it more than anything else in the world. It had happened at Alton Towers. They were riding oblivion suspended in mid-air and waiting to plummet into the smoky depths below. Ryan had been terrified, sure he was going to die so he reached out and grabbed Sophie's hand. They fell, and he screamed, but he never let go of her hand. A moment later, they emerged from a dark tunnel and whipped back into the light, safe and alive and deliriously happy. Right then was the moment Ryan had known with his entire being that the woman laughing beside him was the most important thing in his life and that he wanted to spend decades sharing moments like this with her. Scary moments. Funny moments sad moments. He didn't want any of it if it wasn't with her. Ryan had asked Sophie to marry him the moment they stepped off the ride. It wasn't romantic or thoughtful, but it was real. Sophie must have felt the authenticity of his proposal because she'd said yes. She had said yes, and a week later they were picking out rings. Then the fear had set in. I know you love her, said Aaron, but it just seems like you're rushing things. Ryan stepped in front of his brother and placed a hand on his shoulder. I've been with Sophie for 18 months. But you're right, it's not that long. The thing is, though, when you fall in love, it only takes a second. And if it takes any longer than that, then you're not doing it right. Aaron tried to turn away, but Ryan wouldn't let him. I love Sophie, and I'm going to marry her as soon as I get the hell away from this cottage. But you know what, little brother? Nothing will ever replace my love for you. Till the day I die, I'll always be your big brother. And I'll always have your back. But I need you to have my back too. I need you to be a man and be happy for me. Be happy for me because I'm finally moving forward with me life. Aaron seemed angry for a moment, but slowly he softened. Tears formed in his eyes, but he hid them by pulling Ryan into a hug. I am happy for you. I'm just sad for me. That's okay, though, because you're right. It's time for me to grow up. It's time for me to get out from under your shadow and see what life's all about. Ryan eased out of the hug, a smile on his face. We're gonna get out of here, Aaron. We're gonna get out of here and take life by the balls, yeah? Aaron wiped a tear from his face and smiled. Yeah, but no matter what, we don't tell Mam about any of this. Too bloody right. The shaft of light coming in through the plastic window diluted more and more. The sun was deserting them and it would soon be dark outside. Ryan found himself standing directly beneath the dangling light bulb in the centre of the shed, as if its glow might keep him safe. Aaron was standing near the back, readying the two bicycles that he still insisted were their best way out of the situation. He was probably right. It would sure be running. Ryan looked towards the shed door, wishing he could see through it. How long had they been hiding in there now? An hour? Two? Do you think Brett and Luby are okay? I don't know. Aaron's glum tone suggested that he thought not. Sean was still out there somewhere. They'd armed themselves the best they could after having searched the shed's inventory, and Ryan now held a 16-ounce hammer. Its wooden handle was old and splintered, but the tool was solid overall. It would break bone. Aaron held a pitchfork with only three tines. The left middle one snapped away. It would have to do. This one has a light, said Aaron, switching on a small torch mounted to the handlebars of one of the bikes. The frame was yellow while the other bike was red. 
We're going to have to make a break for it eventually. Ryan didn't want to think about it. Out there in the night-covered hills, the ground would be merciless. Arriving by daylight in a four-by-four had been hazardous enough. Mr. McGregor knew the roads, but had still taken every corner cautiously while bringing them up here. The light bulb overhead flickered, causing both brothers to glance at each other. Aaron pulled a face. How long do you think the generator will last? McGregor said it would last all weekend. He said the solar panels supplied most of the power and the generator was just a backup. Aaron's eyes widened. The solar panels? Shit. They were probably fried by the EMP if they were... Ryan groaned. And the generator will be working overtime and we might not have long left. The light bulb flickered again. Ryan grabbed his hair with both hands. I can't stay here in the dark, man. I'll go to pieces. Aaron shushed him. It'll be all right. Don't panic. I feel trapped. It's almost worse than being outside with Sean. It's not, and you know it. We're safe in here. Keep your head and we'll figure a way out of this. Ryan nodded. He wasn't usually claustrophobic, but these were extreme circumstances. Being trapped inside an old spider-infested shed miles from anywhere and with a monster stalking them was enough to make anyone panic. In fact, he was surprised by how calm Aaron was being. He's been calm all along. I don't give the kid enough credit. The light in the room shifted as something moved past the plastic window and cast a weak shadow. A subtle sound, like crumbling paper, caught their attention. Aaron took a step to see what was happening. His expression left no doubt that it was bad. Bugs! They're coming in through the window! Ryan didn't dare move closer, but he spotted a tiny gap between the plastic window and the wood. Bugs were scuttling through one by one like fat-legged slugs. Ryan looked at the hammer in his hand, reassured by the weight. I think we should make a break for it. If we have any chance, we need to go while there's a tiny bit of sunlight left and I'd rather face Sean than stay in here with all these bugs. Aaron seemed pained, but he nodded. I don't think we have a choice. Once the light goes out, we'll have no way of seeing where the bugs are. We'll get infected. I swear if we make it back to the village, I'm coming right back with a flamethrower. I wouldn't argue with that, but listen to me, Aaron, okay? If Sean is out there, leave him to me. I'm your big brother, which means I'm the one who takes the risks. Aaron rolled his eyes. I ain't kidding. Once we get outside, you get on a bike and you pedal like crazy. Anything else you leave to me. I need you to promise me. Promise me. Aaron shrugged. Whatever, I promise. Can we just get out of here before we're covered in bugs? All right. By now, the bugs had started to drop to the floor beneath the window. Aaron stamped on a few, but they kept on coming. It was now or never. Ryan stepped out of the bulb's weak halo and went to the shed's door. It was on a latch but not locked, which filled Ryan with horror that he hadn't done anything to secure it. In his panic, he hadn't even thought about it. As it turned out, the monster outside had made no attempt to get in. Was it unable to physically, or hadn't it even occurred to it to try and open the door? Sean would have known how to get inside. He would have grabbed the handle. Does that mean he's truly gone? Yeah, he's been gone a while. He's gone. Ryan felt a hitch in his throat and had to push aside his feelings before he broke down. He placed his left hand on the shed's handle and held the hammer in his right hand. His thumb moved to the latch release. His heart pounded in his chest. Wait, said Aaron. Then he wheeled both bicycles to the front of the shed. He propped one against the wall, but the other, the yellow one with the light, he straddled ready to take off. You're going to get on the other bike? Soon as I open the door. After three, okay. One, two, three. Ryan pressed the latch release and pushed the door outwards and stepped out onto the driveway. Where's Sean? Ryan searched left and right and caught movement over by the car. It wasn't what he expected, though. And instead of seeing Sean, he saw Luby throwing himself onto the driveway. He hit the gravel and immediately started scrambling, fear igniting a fire behind him. Ryan called out, Luby! Luby looked up and saw Ryan, and then it caused him to change direction. He straightened up and sprinted towards the shed. Run! he shouted. It's Brett! What do you mean? Aaron shook his head in confusion. 
Instead of taking off on his bike, he chose to stand idly by. When Luby reached the brothers, Aaron had asked the question again. What do you mean about Brett? Luby grabbed Aaron and shook him. Get the hell out of here! Ryan grabbed the other bicycle from inside the shed and rolled it towards Luby. Take it! Get Aaron to the village! Luby took the handlebars, thought about it, then rolled the bike back. No, man. Brothers should stick together. You're with Aaron. I'll never make it. I'm too weak. There was a loud crack from the car. Everyone turned around. A bony arm broke through the driver's side window, brown flesh melting away and dripping onto the driveway. Bugs erupted from a bony protrusion on the back of a rotting hand. Luby put a palm over his mouth and wobbled. That's what I meant about Brett. He's changed. Like Sean, only worse. Ryan swallowed a hot coal in his throat. How could he be worse? Luby shoved the bicycle at Ryan. You don't want to stick around to find out. Chapter 10 Aaron was on the yellow bike ready to ride away. The problem was, who took the red bike? No way would Ryan take off and leave Luby behind, but it seemed like Luby was in the same frame of mind. He waved a hand at Ryan. Go, Ryan, now! I'm not leaving you. Me neither, said Aaron. Take my bike, I'll run. This isn't a video game. You'll be out of breath before you make it a hundred metres. He's right, said Ryan. I've seen you on sports day. Brett was still inside the car, his bony arm hanging out of the broken window. He was shouting at them, but that raspy voice was alien. It didn't sound like Brett at all. A little help. A little help here, please. Hey, Ryan, be a mate and help me. Be a mate and help me. Ryan took two steps towards the car, but Luby put his hand on his chest. That ain't him in there, man. Trust me. As if to prove a point, Brett shoved his head and shoulder through the car window. He was facing away, but the back of his head was elongated and misshapen, more like a hairy peanut shell than a human skull. Slowly, like a slimy octopus, he pushed more and more of himself through the small gap until eventually his entire body flopped onto the driveway like a stillborn fetus. Ryan felt woozy, his legs starting to go weak beneath him. Brett! Get on the goddamn bikes! Luby shouted. Fear made Ryan selfish, and he finally jumped onto the red bike saddle. Rather than complain, Luby put a hand on each of their backs and shoved. I'll hide in the shed, he said. Bring help! Ryan didn't have a chance to reply. Movement to his right caught all of their attention. It came from the cross beside the cottage. Perched on the cross beam and lit by the last gasps of sunset, Sean glared at them like a twisted bird of prey. The white stones in the ground below him were stained green. Sean raced towards them, taking them by surprise. The resulting collision knocked Ryan clean off his bike and onto his back. Sean whipped one of his talons like a cowboy's whip. Ryan threw an arm out and wailed as a white-hot flash of agony bit into his elbow. He rolled aside, desperate to get out of danger, and grabbed at his aching elbow. In his horror, he expected to see blood, but he was monumentally relieved when he saw his coat still intact. The talon had struck him hard, but it hadn't made it through to his skin. More a vicious punch than a slice. Sean whipped his talon again, but missed. Ryan cried out for help, almost calling for his mam. It took him back to when the ex-paratrooper had knocked him unconscious and broken his arm. And just like that, Aaron was once again a fearful spectator. The fun had turned deadly once more. Forgive me, brother. Luby tackled Sean to the ground. In his current emaciated form, Sean was only one third of Luby's size and he was unable to get out from under him once he was pinned to the ground. He whipped his talons and thrashed, but couldn't get free. Luby sprawled himself out, making himself even heavier. At the same time, Brett stood on the driveway. He was at least two feet taller than before, but inhumanely thin, as if a cruel god had clutched him by the head and feet before stretching him out. His fuzzy green eyes were uneven, the left at least an inch lower than the right. 
In the centre of his face, only part of his nose remained. In a matter of hours, Brett had transformed. He tottered towards them now, like some kind of humanoid plant. His arms waved wildly like a plant stem, like the bones inside had turned to liquid. He hadn't yet formed the talons that had replaced Sean's arms, but several of his fingers had fallen away to make way for the emerging bone. Not bone. Chitting. It really is aliens. Sean and Brett have been taken over by aliens. Aaron stood next to Ryan, brandishing his pitchfork. We have to do this, right? That isn't Brett anymore. Or Sean. I really wish you would get on that bike and leave, little brother. You think I want to survive if it means leaving you here to die? You think I could ever forgive myself for that? No way. We'll get out of this together or not at all. Ryan glanced at Aaron and saw a stranger. He saw a man. Looks like you're all grown up. I'm proud. I had a great big brother as a role model. Brett came for them, swiping his arms but unable to use them fully yet, the last remnants of bone making them too rigid to whip. There was an inhuman quality to his gaze as he glared at Ryan, even as he spoke. Your life is beyond you, Ryan. All that's left is the drudgery of growing old. Ryan swallowed, dreading that the words were coming from Brett. Were these his genuine beliefs, or was the fungus messing with his brain? The answer quickly became apparent. That's not Brett talking. Brett spent his whole childhood looking ahead. He couldn't wait to grow up. Life was finally exactly how he wanted it, and you took it away from him. Brett, if you're still in there, you were always the best of us. And I love you, man. Ryan and Aaron faced forward at the same time. Ryan swung his hammer at Brett's misshapen skull, catching him in the temple, while Aaron buried his three-tined pitchfork underneath his twisted ribcage. Flesh parted like butter, bone shattered like eggshell. Brett screeched, a torrent of blood and brown fluid erupting from his foul jaws. Bugs slopped onto the ground, alongside liquidized viscera. Aaron twisted the pitchfork and opened up a deep hole in Brett's stomach. More bugs emerged from the gaping wound, falling onto the driveway. Immediately a dark green stain started spreading throughout the gravel. They were ejecting the infectious oil. Ryan pried his hammer out of the sticky brown hole he'd left in his friend's skull and swung it again. This time he planted the hammer right in the middle of Brett's forehead. His skull parted, opening up to reveal chunks of decaying brain matter. The brown ooze spilled between the cracked bones and dripped down Brett's ruined face. His body collapsed onto the driveway, Aaron's pitchfork still buried in his guts. Aaron yanked it free and planted it in the mush that was the remains of Brett's head. The last of it came apart. Ryan bent over and vomited. Still battling with Sean on the ground, Luby cried out for help. Luby was losing his grip, and it was clear why. Sweat came from his every pore, the exertion far too much for his diminished reserves. Sean already had half his body free, lashing out with one of his tendrils and whipping it back and forth in the air. Luby did his best to avoid the talon on the end. Aaron retrieved his pitchfork from Brett's skull and quickly came to Luby's aid. He planted the tines in the gravel, pinning Sean's tendril underneath. It was just in time, too, because Luby finally gave in, rolling aside and gasping for breath. Sean was finally free of Luby's weight. Ryan lunged with his hammer, attempting to plant it in the middle of Sean's forehead, erasing whatever was left of his friend. But he was caught by surprise as an unpinned tendril whipped at the hammer and knocked it from his grasp. Instinctively, Aaron pulled his pitchfork free from the ground, causing him to unwittingly free Sean's other tendril. Now unrestrained, Sean leapt to his feet. His skeletal face had cracked apart on one side, bugs scuttling out of the bony chasm. Ryan turned and dragged Luby to his feet. Look, we need to go. Can't. Aaron thrust at Sean with the pitchfork, but Sean's tendril lashed out and whipped around the metal shaft. 
Aaron fought to hold on to it, but the pitchfork was quickly torn from his grasp. Shit! We need to make a run for it! Ryan attempted to grab one of the bicycles lying on the ground, but Sean leapt in the way. He whipped both tendrils at the same time, trying to scissor Ryan in half, but he was able to lunge out of the way just in time. He spotted his hammer lying on the driveway and tried to make a grab for it. But once again, Sean moved in the way. The monster was too fast, its whip-like appendages slicing through the air. Luby appeared and grabbed Ryan, but his grasp was weak, almost childlike. Go, Ryan, please. You have to get help. Ryan went to argue, but Luby shoved him. It's too late for me. Aaron tried to get around behind Sean, edging slowly towards his fallen pitchfork. Sean saw the movement and lashed out at him, almost slicing his throat. The near miss filled Ryan with dread. He had to get his little brother out of there. Ryan looked at Luby. We can't leave you. I can't leave you to die. I'm already dead. Luby held up his arm. The back of his hand was sliced right open, blood flowing down the woolen sleeve of his coat. Mixed with the blood were tiny splotches of green. Sean caught me. Oh, I said he'd be the death of me. You're not dying. Yeah, mate, I am. I was dying before this weekend even got started. Ryan understood immediately. He'd known Luby too long not to sense the tone in his voice. Your cancer is worse than you let on, Luby nodded. Nearby, Sean continued hunting Aaron. Ryan was desperate to go and save him, but... Luby, he's my best friend. I'm sorry I lied to you, Ryan. I didn't want to ruin your stag do, but there was no way I could miss it either. Just get out of here, okay? Get help. It's your only option. Ryan turned and grabbed the pair of bicycles, propping them upright. He turned to Luby and smiled, doing everything he could to keep his tears at bay. Don't worry about it, our kid. We all knew that Sean would be the one to blame if this weekend turned bad. Yeah, he really fucked things up this time, huh? Aaron wheeled his way back around towards Ryan, ducking and dodging with surprising dexterity. I guess those video games finally paid off, little brother. Crash Bandicoot will be proud. Aaron frowned. Who? Never mind. We're getting out of here. What about Luby? Luby started backing up towards the shed. Don't worry about me. I'm going to stick around a bit and clean up. Aaron frowned. But before he could say anything, Luby started shouting at Sean, waving his arms around like a madman. Hey, Sean, come and give your old mate a hug. That's it, come on. Sean's green fuzzed eyes fixated on Luby, as if attracted by the movement. Or was it the noise getting his attention? Either way, Ryan and Aaron stood completely still while Luby danced and shouted. Eventually, he got all of Sean's attention. We always said you'd catch something one of these days, you mad bastard. We just assumed it would be the clap. Come on, you mank twat. Let's see how hard you are. Sean made no sound as he rushed furiously at Luby. Luby retreated backwards, heading towards the open door of the shed. Ryan wanted to do something to try and grab the hammer in time to save his friend, but it was too late. Luby took a few more steps and then Sean leapt at him, tendrils whipping in the air. Luby threw out his arms and wrapped them around Sean's emaciated waist, pulled him into a tight embrace. They tumbled together towards the shed. Luby turned, forcing Sean through the open doorway as they fell. Before he disappeared, he managed to reach out and pull on the door handle. The door slammed shut. Silence. Behind the shed... The generator conked out with an asthmatic grunt. The last of the sun disappeared. Inside the shed, Luby was alone with Sean in the dark. His grunts of exertion turned into agonised screams. Aaron stepped towards the shed, but Ryan grabbed the back of his jacket. Luby's gone. You might not understand it, but he's gone. We need to get out of here. But... Ryan picked up a bike and thrust it towards Aaron. You said it yourself. Someone needs to come here with a flamethrower. A single tear spilled down Aaron's cheek, but he nodded. The brothers Cartwright mounted their bikes and pedalled away. 
the stag do was over. Aaron rode the yellow bike and led the way with his light. As soon as they made it down to the stream, they saw how bad things were. A fox glared at them, but only one of its eyes shone beneath the newborn moon. The other was a shadowy fuzz. Several times rabbits bolted towards them, but their coordination was poisoned by the fungus, and Ryan and Aaron were able to skirt by them. It felt like the infection was all around them, growing out of the very earth. How quickly did the green oil spread? Had all the wildlife caught it from the corkscrew on the hill? What the hell is that thing? Where did it come from? Ryan had to keep telling himself to slow down. He wanted nothing more than to feel the wind in his hair as he put more and more distance between him and the cottage. But the night had gone from grey to black, and every curve in the road hit a pothole, rock or precipice. One wrong turn and he could be lying out in the open with a broken leg. Aaron too was pushing his luck, and several times his front wheel had hit an obstacle and caused him to wobble frantically until he regained his balance. After a while, it felt safe enough to slow down, so Ryan called ahead to get Aaron to pump the pedals a little less hard. They settled into a new rhythm, side by side, but neither of them spoke for a long while. Eventually, Aaron broke the silence. We shouldn't have left Luby behind. He wouldn't have done that to us. He was infected, said Ryan, between gasps. Not only that, but he was dying from cancer. Aaron turned sideways. What? He was dying of cancer. None of us knew. But this weekend was his goodbye. I don't think he had long. The silence resumed for a few minutes more until Aaron spoke again. Luby was really dying. I swear down. He was infected too. Back at the cottage, he showed me his arm. Sean had got him. One slice of those talons and it's game over. I think it's a miracle we got out of there alive. Brett. Brett wasn't so lucky. He changed so fast. He'd been infected for a while. I just think it was happening on the inside. We never noticed until it was too late. They sped around a bend in the narrow road and then descended a dip. Ryan's tummy fluttered and he found it comforting. A normal bodily function that told him he was alive. Or were his insides teeming with fungus? Brett had no idea. He hadn't known he was changing. As if thinking the same thing, Aaron said, Brett changed much quicker than Sean did. You're right. Maybe it was all the drugs he took. The fungus might not like to get high. Ryan was too numb to laugh immediately, but after a second a cackle erupted from his lips. Even a deadly fungus couldn't keep up with Sean, God bless him. No way is he getting an invite to heaven. Ryan's cackle became a chuckle. Yeah, you'll probably have more fun in hell anyway. I'm going to miss him. Me too. They rode on for another half a mile, but this time they didn't do so in silence. They chatted and chuckled, glad to be free of the terror. A numbness had set in, pressing pause on the horror they'd witnessed, and it allowed them to think about something else. For now, they had a task, and that task was riding to the village to get help. The mental breakdowns could come later. The morning and therapy could wait. At least I still have my brother. I need to speak to Sophie, said Ryan, realising how glad he was that he'd see her again. She's going to be going out of her mind with worry. She's probably been thinking strippers, though, not green fungus monsters. Aaron chuckled, but it was a tense sound. No one is going to believe us when we tell them what happened. They're going to lock us up in a loony bin. You're probably right, but when we tell them our friends are dead up at the cottage, they'll have no choice but to investigate. They'll see what happened. Then it's their problem. They're all dead, said Aaron, disbelief in his voice. They're all really gone, aren't they? Ryan didn't give an answer. It was too painful to say out loud. Another minute's ride took them to the bottom of a hill. The village wasn't far away now. In fact, they passed by a gutted, weed-covered outbuilding that Ryan remembered passing on the ride up to the cottage. That ride felt like a lifetime ago. There's something in the road, said Aaron. I think it's a car. Ryan squinted to see in the dark. The light on Aaron's bike was weak, 
but there was most certainly a car up ahead, a Land Rover or other large vehicle. It was parked off to the side of the road. Its lights and engines were switched off. Ryan took a hand off the handlebars and checked his watch. It was just past eight. An odd time to be parked in the middle of nowhere. Slow down, Aaron. Aaron did as he was told, coasting without pedalling. After a dozen or so metres, they both stopped and got off their bikes, choosing to walk beside them. Ryan risked a glance back behind them, wondering how close the nearest infected animal was. How many birds had taken flight with the fungus coating their wings? Whatever it is, we'll find a way to cure it, or kill it, or burn it. It's just a fungus. A fungus from outer space. The car's driver side door was hanging open. Once Ryan got closer, he saw it was an old Land Rover, one he recognised. Mr McGregor? Mr Cartwright. Ryan and Aaron jolted, instinctively pressing against one another. The voice had come from the rear of the Land Rover, and as they looked, a shadowy figure stepped out into the dim light cast by the yellow bicycle's lamp. Old Mr. McGregor wore a flat cap and wax jacket. Mr. McGregor, what are you doing out here? How was your stay at the wee old place? I hope you've kept her as you left it. He took another step into the light. The expression on his face was odd, somewhere between a grimace and a smile. One of his eyes was closed. No, not closed. Green fuzz covered half of Mr. McGregor's face. Some of his teeth were missing. His right hand dangled beside his knee, far too low. His fingers were splayed to make way for a bony talon. Ryan threw out an arm. Aaron, get back! He's infected. How? He must have been coming to check on us. Mr. McGregor shambled towards them, arms out like he wanted a hug. Ryan shouted at him to stay back, but the old man didn't listen. He kept on coming towards them, determined to make contact. He's trying to infect us. Ryan moved left, while Aaron moved right. With his attention divided, McGregor looked back and forth between the two brothers. I hope there is no mess, he said. I hope your bonny lads behaved yourself. The party got a little crazy, said Ryan. Perhaps you should head up there and check the old place out. I littered for that, lad. First, I just want to shake your hand. Ryan backed away, nearing the opposite edge of the road. From the look of the old landlord, the infection had only just begun to change him. How long had it taken with Brett? Sean had infected him many hours before he'd started showing symptoms. Almost a full day. Had Mr McGregor been out here all weekend? Had his car died on the road like Tom's? Come here, lad. Mr. McGregor lunged, swiping his sinewy, too long arm at Ryan's face. Ryan dodged backwards and his ankle buckled, his left foot coming down on uneven ground. He cried out in shock and pain, and then before he knew it, he was falling backwards into the weeds. The back of his skull struck a patch of rocks and his vision filled with twinkling lights that he first thought were stars in the sky. Shit! Ryan! Aaron needs to get out of here. He needs to run, but he won't. Aaron, help me! Mr. McGregor bore down on Ryan, but Aaron was quick to deliver a firm kick to the side of his thigh. It sent the old man staggering sideways and allowed enough time for Ryan to clamber to his feet. He was dizzy and the back of his head felt wet. A wave of nausea took hold of him. He wanted to defend his little brother, but he couldn't. Every time he tried to take a step forward, he went sideways. Every time he tried to reach out, his arms disobeyed him. McGregor regained his balance and chased after Aaron, both arms swiping at the air. Somewhere nearby, an owl hooted. Aaron hopped back and forth, avoiding his attacker with ease. Every now and then, he would throw a kick and strike a kneecap or a thigh. Before long, McGregor was limping and stumbling around like the injured old man he was. Bizarrely, though, he didn't grow angry or annoyed. He just kept trying to grab Aaron, methodically and undeterred, single-minded. Ryan tried to get a grip of himself. If his brother tripped or made a mistake, 
if McGregor got his fungus-covered hands on him. Aaron backed up towards the Land Rover, and when he bumped against it, it startled him and caused him to half turn around. That was all McGregor needed. He leapt at Aaron. Aaron dodged and rolled along the side of the vehicle, just managing to get out of harm's way. Ryan hurried forward unsteadily and managed to shove the old man in the back. The driver's door was still open and McGregor went sprawling across the seat. There was a loud clunk and the Land Rover lurched backwards, its parking brake coming loose. The wheels rolled half a metre, stopping at the edge of a steep ditch bordering the road. McGregor clambered back out of the Land Rover and tried to grab Ryan again. Ryan tried to escape, but the old man's hand caught his jacket and held on with surprising strength. At the same time, his other hand rose in the air, a talon bursting through sinewy flesh. Any second and it would whip away Ryan's flesh, infecting him. Ryan screamed in terror and threw himself at McGregor, desperate to do anything that would stop him from whipping that deadly talon. They stumbled on the uneven ground, colliding with the back of the Land Rover, and then went pirouetting into the ditch. Ryan slipped, his knee hitting against a rock. It filled him with pain he could barely believe. They tumbled into the ditch, landing awkwardly at the bottom. McGregor's neck twisted beneath him, making a noise like snapping twigs. Ryan thought the old man was dead, but then he began to shuffle around in the weeds, searching. When his fuzzy green eye found Ryan, he crawled towards him, his head hanging at a horrifying angle. Ryan's leg trembled uncontrollably, the blow to his knee sending his nerve endings into a frenzy. He wanted to stand up and run, but it was impossible. He could only drag himself along the ditch in the same way the old man was doing. From the road, Aaron called out, Ryan, Ryan, are you okay? I can't see you down there. You need to get out of here. No, wait, the car. Push the car into the ditch. What? Push the car backwards. Do it now, Aaron. He heard no reply from his little brother, so all Ryan could do was keep crawling away as quickly as he could. McGregor was slower than him, his broken neck causing his gaze to float all over the place and mess up his direction. But Ryan was hurt, and every second it got harder and harder to move. He could feel his knee swelling up. There was the sound of crunching gravel above. Ryan looked up and saw the rear of the Land Rover moving more and more into view. It was a heavy vehicle, but Aaron was managing to roll it towards the ditch. Because he knows my life is at stake. He's got my back. I need to get the L out of the way. The Land Rover's rear wheels passed over the edge of the embankment and gravity took over. The boxy vehicle seemed to hang in the air for a split second, like the oblivion rive that had prompted his proposal to Sophie. But then it picked up speed. Ryan scrambled along the ditch, knowing he had a single second before he was crushed to death. His fingers grabbed hold of clumps of grass and weeds as he frantically summoned everything he had left and pulled himself along. McGregor was right behind him, reaching out with his elongated arm, trying to slice Ryan's legs with his talon. I'm sorry, old man. The Land Rover crashed into the ditch like a charging rhino, the rear bumper striking the earth and causing the whole vehicle to leap up on its axles. The driver door slammed shut, and the car bodywork crumpled a little. But the Land Rover was a tank. It came to a stop, barely in any worse shape than it had been in before. McGregor snatched at Ryan's ankle, that deadly talon only inches away from Ryan's flesh, but his arm landed harmlessly in the mud. His head rose up on a broken neck, and he seemed to stare pitifully for a moment. Then his fuzzy green eye erupted into a brown mess. His remaining human eye had bulged to the point where it was almost hanging out. Red and green blood spilled from his open mouth. Ryan shuffled backwards and waited for McGregor to die. It only took a few seconds. Then he reached into his pocket and tossed the old man the keys to the cottage. I'm checking out and you can keep my security deposit. Ryan, Ryan, are you all right? Ryan glanced up the embankment and saw the spectre of his brother standing on the road. The sight of him was a cause to smile. Yeah, little brother, 
I'm alive. Help me out of this ditch. Chapter 11 The journey back to the village was taking longer than expected, mainly because the narrow country road didn't follow a straight line. Instead, it cut back and forth through the rock and hillsides, and while the village might have been two miles away on a Google map, the road could easily have been twice as long. They covered some of the distance by bicycle, but after a while they had decided it would be safer to walk. Ryan's right knee was stiff and he could no longer bend it. It caused him to waddle along like a peg-legged pirate. Despite that, he enjoyed the walk. The fresh air was rejuvenating and the view was comforting. There was nothing and no one around. The infection had ended with poor Mr. McGregor. Ryan hadn't known the old man, and yet he felt saddened by his death. Like Brett, Sean and Luby, he hadn't deserved to die. If I hadn't have been so desperate to relive the glory days, they might still be alive. I dragged everyone out here, hundreds of miles from their lives because I was scared to marry Sophie. Now there's nothing else I'd rather do than hold her in my arms and never let go. She's the best thing that ever happened to me, and I've been too fucking immature to see it. I thought marriage was the end of my life, but it's not. It's the beginning. I've made a mess of everything. Aaron? Yeah? I'm sorry if you felt I was running out on you. The truth is that you're the most important thing in the world to me and I shouldn't have given you a shit about growing up. We're different, and that's okay. I'd rather you keep being you than anything like me. You're a good man, a good one. Aaron looked away and cleared his throat, then said, You and Sophie are going to have a great life. I'm sorry I've been so stroppy about it all. Forgive and forget, man. By the time this shit is over, I imagine we'll be sick to death of each other. I have a feeling it's going to be a while before we get back to our normal lives. Maybe that's not such a bad thing. I need to get out more. If this weekend has taught me anything, it's that life's too short to slob around indoors all the time. Ryan smiled. There's a bright future ahead of you, little brother. I'm glad you finally see that. I just wish the past weren't so dark. Yeah. They walked in silence for another 30 minutes, and when Ryan next checked his watch, it was almost 10, which was good and bad. Good because they wouldn't have to reveal their far-fetched nightmare to a bunch of incredulous spectators, but bad because it meant that people would no doubt be dragged from their beds to come and take statements long into the night. Ryan was exhausted, but it would be a while before he saw a bed. I think that's the village up ahead, said Aaron, pointing, and when they spotted a welcome sign, it became certain. Ryan sighed a breath of relief. Thank God, any more walking and my legs are going to fall off. The first building they encountered was a bowls club. It had a white painted wood cutting of a man rolling a ball affixed to grey stone walls. There was a small glass-sided tea room adjoining the main building but the entire place was dark and uninhabited. Where do we go? asked Aaron. I doubt there's a police station here. We'll try the pub in the middle of the village where we parked up. Last orders wouldn't have been called very long ago. Any luck and there'll be someone about. We'll head there and call the police. Do you think we'll get into trouble for what happened? We should never have messed with that weird corkscrew. We were stupid. Ryan huffed. That's an understatement. Well, it wasn't a crime. How could we have known any of what happened? I suppose you're right. We're never going to get over this, are we? It's not like we'll ever be able to forget or laugh about it. Ryan stopped walking and stood with his bicycle. He looked at his brother. Hey, listen to me, OK? Whatever comes next isn't going to be nice or easy. But no matter what, we'll have each other. You and me are alive and that's all that matters. We're not going to waste a single day looking back and getting afraid. I got you, little brother. Everything will sort itself out, OK? OK. They left the bowls club behind them and headed for the next set of buildings. A church sat on a low rise to the right, surrounded by a stone wall, and rows upon rows of gravestones. 
If memory served Ryan correctly, there should be a post office and a row of cottages just beyond. The pub itself was still a ways off, but no more than a few hundred metres. The silent walk reminded Ryan of his nights on the town with the lads. Too broke to hire a taxi, they would walk home drunkenly, two or three miles at a time. They would laugh and holler while the rest of the world slept and the highways lay empty. It would have been a happy memory, but things were different now. After the events of the last two days, Ryan looked back now and saw only emptiness and loneliness. The past was gone, curled inwards like paper over a flame. The only way to keep from being consumed by the past was to run towards the future, arms wide open. I'm ready to run. I'm ready to leave the past behind. It's dark, said Aaron, looking around as they walked slowly down the centre of the road. Quiet. It's the middle of the night. Aaron shook his head. No. I mean, all of the lampposts are switched off. None of the houses have their lights on. You'd think at least one would have left on a landing light or a bathroom. There's no lights anywhere. Look around. Ryan squinted, staring down the cobbled road towards the village's various buildings. Rows of cottages lined both sides of the road, featureless grey shapes in the moonlight. There was something else, too. Something... Something's wrong. Aaron nodded. I know. What is it? I don't know. The shadows moved. Aaron edged closer to Ryan, and Ryan instinctively put an arm around his younger brother. Don't move. Stay here, right next to me. Aaron let out a weary sigh, like a part of his soul was leaking out. I'm so tired, Ryan. I just want to go home. Me too. Ryan glanced around, alert, worried, afraid. Stomach acids rose into his throat. His guts were already trying to tell him something. They were trying to tell him that the weekend wasn't over and that home was still far away. Ryan! Someone shouted. Not Aaron. My word! I can't believe it! Ryan looked up towards the church on the right-hand side of the road and spotted a group of people standing inside a porch with glowing candles in their hands. While it was too dark to make out their faces, the person who had shouted was unmistakably familiar, the posh accent especially so. Tom? Is... is that you? Yes! Now get inside quickly, and for heaven's sake, hurry! Aaron tugged at Ryan's arm and pointed to the side of the road. Look! At first it was unclear what Aaron was indicating, but then Ryan's eyes adjusted enough to discern a dim silhouette of a corkscrew. No. His eyes flicked to the right, and he spotted a second corkscrew, further away, but easier to see due to the way its metallic surface caught and reflected the moonlight. No! A wheelie bin toppled over nearby. A creature emerged, formerly human, now waving a pair of talon-tipped tendrils instead of arms. Get inside, Tom cried out. Three more infected people emerged from the shadowy side streets. What's going on? Aaron cried, holding his head like he had flies buzzing inside his skull. This can't be happening. I don't understand. People are sick, shouted Tom stepping out of the church's porch. They're all sick! Ryan couldn't move. His mind was cartwheeling down a steep hill, thoughts flying out in all directions as he tried to make sense of what was happening. The, the corkscrews! They've landed everywhere! It wasn't just the one we found! Aaron was muttering to himself, still clutching his head, and now pulling at his hair. All of his resolve had melted away in an instant. He was a helpless kid again. The infected people stumbled closer. Ryan managed to shake himself free of his stupor and grabbed his brother. Aaron, snap out of it. We have to move. Aaron blinked twice. He let go of his hair and nodded. Yeah, okay. The Cartwright brothers raced towards the church. The whole time, Ryan couldn't help screaming madly inside his own head. 
The corkscrews landed everywhere. Everywhere! Chapter 12 There had been only darkness, but then came the light. Dim at first, but slowly spreading wide and bright like the petals of a tulip. It cut through the shadows and illuminated metal edges and splintered wood. For a moment, Luby didn't know where he was. Then he thought that maybe he was in a prison cell, staring up at a ceiling that was far too low. If not for all the wood, he might have continued down that line of thought. But then, he realised, he was lying on his back inside a shed. His mind took him no further than for a moment. But then he remembered it all. Ryan Stagdu, the cottage, the fungus. Shit. Luby bolted upright, hitting his shoulder on the underside of an old workbench. He was surrounded by tools and junk. Beside the workbench, a petrol mower hung from a hook. Dust swirled in the shafts of light, spilling in through the shed's single window. Hundreds of tiny bugs skittered along the floorboards. Luby yelped and dragged himself back along the floor. His hand hit something warm and wet, and when he turned, he saw Sean, or what was left of him. The twisted creature held only scraps of Luby's former friend. Pieces of skin here, a patch of ginger hair there. Mostly it was a mass of brown fluids and green fungus, along with the bony carapaces that seemed to grow at random. A pair of metal shears stuck out of Sean's skull, lodged inside his left eye socket. The memory of having put them there flashed through Luby's weary mind. I killed Sean. No, the fungus killed Sean. I just dealt with what was left. Luby remembered being in the dark with a silent monster whipping at him with two vicious talons. He looked down at his arms now and saw the deep lacerations he'd sustained. Dry blood ran from his hands to his elbows. When he had pulled Sean into the shed with him, it had been an attempt at euthanasia. His death had been certain, but at least he would give Ryan and Aaron a chance to get away, instead of slowly dying in a bed on a cancer ward months from now. He got the chance to die for a reason. But I ain't dead. Why ain't I dead? Luby reached out and kicked at Sean's corpse, wanting to make sure it wasn't going to suddenly leap up. The fungus had turned Sean into a monster. Who was to say the monster couldn't come back from the dead? The corpse moved and Luby yelped, but the monster was most definitely dead. The movement came from something else. Bugs. Sean's remains were infested with four-legged bugs, the same ones that covered the shed floor in their hundreds. Luby made up his mind to get moving, so he leapt to his feet, surprised at his own agility. For months, he'd felt weak and heavy. Now he felt rested, almost excited. Adrenaline coursed through his veins and made him feel connected to every part of his body. My body! It's still my body! Luby looked down at the gash on the back of his right hand. He'd got it outside when he'd been wrestling with Sean. A talon had bit into his flesh and infected him. The wound had been laced with green oil and subtle strands of green fuzz. And as he looked at it now, he still saw the fungus, but it had blackened. The fungus had spread no further than his hand. How long had the infection taken with Brett and Sean? Sean was covered in the stuff after a few hours. Brett changed in less than a day. How long have I been lying here? Luby stared out of the window. It was made from a sheet of murky plastic, so the only thing he could see was that it was daylight. When Ryan and Aaron had escaped on their bikes, it had been evening, not even midnight. I've been lying here for hours. After I planted the shears in Sean's skull, I, I, I lost my breath and passed out. I was exhausted. It was too much. But now I feel... OK. I feel better than I have done in months. 
Luby felt like he was trapped inside a dream, confused by the strange logic of an imagined world. As much as he felt in touch with his own body, he felt completely adrift from reality. Sean was a rotten mess on the floor, alien bugs swarmed at his feet. But I feel healthy. Luby took a shaky step towards the shed door. It wasn't weakness that caused him to shake, it was energy. He was a bag of nervous electricity, a firework ready to explode. He shoved open the shed door and leapt into the weak sunshine. The day was cold, but he barely felt it. The blood in his veins ran hot. The colours of the world almost overwhelmed him. The greens, the oranges, the greys, they seemed to shimmer and vibrate, begging for his attention. Only when he focused did the colours remain still. The air was like crisp ice chips in his lungs. It was only when his gaze fell upon Brett's body, twisted and distorted the same as Sean's, that the euphoria began to fade away. His friends were dead. Brett, Sean, most likely Tom too. My friends are all dead. No, Ryan and Aaron got away. They're alive. I need to find them. Luby turned a circle for a moment, finding it hard to put his thoughts in order. He needed to get to the village, but which way was it? The road. Just follow the road. The road leads to the village. And people. Yeah, people. Luby took the first step, and then he was moving, almost at a jog. His lungs and heart pumped happily, full of vigour, full of life. He would make it to his destination in no time. But halfway down the hill towards the stream, Luby slowed down. A fox stood staring at him, half its face covered by green fuzz. Beside the fox stood a massive brown hare, also partially covered in fuzz. In the distance, an owl hooted, strange for that time of day. The fox and the hare continued eyeing Luby up for a few seconds. Then they turned away, uninterested. Luby let out a sigh of relief and picked up speed again. He didn't know why the animals didn't attack, like those inside the cottage. But he wasn't going to complain. Maybe the fungus affected individual animals in different ways. Lion and Aaron will get help. We'll figure this all out. Someone will know what's going on. Someone will make this all better. Luby started running. He needed to get to the village. He needed to find his friends. He needed to find people. The End This has been The Spread, Book One, The Hill. Written by Ian Rob Wright. Narrated by Aubrey Parsons. Copyright 2020 by Ian Rob Wright. Production copyright by Ian Rob Wright. The Spread, Book Two, The Village. Written by Ian Rob Wright. Narrated by Aubrey Parsons. Chapter One, 18 Hours Ago. Steel splinters. That's what it felt like. Steel splinters grinding into his shins. Tom thought he'd been walking for hours, but when he glanced at his Omega Seamaster, only 90 blasted minutes had passed. At 25 years old, he was in no way unfit, but traipsing through the Scottish Highlands to fetch help for the drug-addled thug who had recently bitten off his ear, was a test of endurance that no number of hours on the squash courts could have prepared him for. The dust and grime in his uncombed blonde hair was enough to send him insane. The village can't be much further. Thirty minutes at most, surely. Thirty minutes before I start trying to convince people there's a biological hazard loose in the highlands, or possibly a military weapon, or an alien substance. Maybe we're all trapped in hell. Be serious, Tom. He still couldn't make sense of the mess that he'd left behind. Sean had clearly been exposed to something dangerous, but how dangerous remained unclear. Tom gained comfort by reminding himself he wasn't a doctor and that things might not be as bad as they'd seemed. Regardless, his part in things was over. The horror lay behind him, not ahead. 
the sun was shining. The exertion of the hike caused him to sweat. Beads of it trickled down his back, gathering beneath the waistband of his chinos. He unzipped the front of his blue Henry Lloyd jacket to let in the crisp air, but it wasn't enough. Eventually, he would have to take a break from hiking and give his legs a rest. Instead of keeping to the meandering road, Tom had decided to walk a straight line over the rocky outcroppings and sloping meadows. His shins regretted that decision now, so when the road arced back around in front of him, he was relieved. Stepping back onto the hard, flat surface eased the ache in his legs and made him feel a little less lost. Stranded. I feel stranded. After he finally reached the village and found help for Ryan and the others, there would still be the issue of his car. A seven-hour drive away from home, and his brand-new Stelvio was a lifeless hunk of ruby-red metal. Never had he felt so cut off from the world and all of its safeties, and it exposed how vulnerable he was when removed from his comfortable surroundings. His job at his father's firm, his relationship with Amanda. Oh dear loyal, uncomplicated Amanda. And his never-missed Sunday dinners at home. Those things were soft blankets around his shoulders. He was naked without them, and the wind was biting. I really should have made an excuse not to come on this weekend. I knew it would end up being a nightmare. Stag do's, what a ridiculous concept. I didn't expect the things to turn out this badly, though. A small outbuilding appeared ahead little more than a pile of old stone, roughly shaped into walls. Ragged holes existed where the windows once would have been, and weeds sprouted two feet high, both within and without the structure. As Tom approached it, something bolted out of the shadows and his heart leapt in his chest. He calmed down when he saw it was just a rat, a dirty, fat little beastie, but nothing to worry about after what he'd just been through. The wary rodent scarpered across the road and bolted into the ditch, leaving Tom to wonder just how many creatures existed all around him, sleeping inside burrows or hiding away in deep thickets. The notion made him feel oddly at ease. In Manchester, it was people who were everywhere, not animals. It was surprising to find their absence so comforting. Maybe I'm not the people person I thought. Tom relished his surroundings more and more as he put distance between himself and the madness back at the cottage. Out here, beneath the endless ombre sky, there were no worries of divorce cases piling up on his desk, or his father breathing down his neck about billable hours. No stress of expensive Arndale shopping trips because Amanda needed a new Radley handbag every five minutes. Out here, the conditions were harsh but simple. It almost made the splinters in his shins bearable. Almost. He hiked another twenty minutes until his seamaster showed 9.45. He was about to take a rest at the side of the road when the village finally came into view. Hallelujah! For the last two hours, Tom had been dozing inside his own head, almost zen-like, in order to deal with the boredom and discomfort of the hike. Now it was coming to an end, he needed to wake up and ready himself to deal with strangers. Strangers who would no doubt treat him with ridicule and suspicion when he told them what had happened. Perhaps he could just flash his missing earlobe to help convince them that the deranged yarn he was spinning them was true. He gave his iPhone another glance, checking for the umpteenth time whether or not it would switch on, but of course it didn't. The 800-pound lump of plastic and glass remained completely dead, just like his car. That's another thing that makes no sense. Why did all of the electrics fail? They didn't. The lights stayed on back at the cottage. It was only my car and the phones. I can't even begin to think about it. Let's just focus on one thing at a time. Tom's weary legs took him to the edge of the village, the rocky landscape rising behind him and revealing just how far he'd hiked. The first building he encountered was a bowls club, erected on top of a small hill. A chain-link fence ringed its well-mowed lawns, and a single-story building lay at the back, with a large plate-glass window overlooking the playing area. A quaint tea-room lay inside. 
Tom could see the chairs and tables. Lower down the hill was a tiny church with stone walls painted white in contrast to the village's predominantly grey palette. The building was modest and uncomplicated. Ryan said he'd parked his Audi at the village pub, so that was where Tom intended to go. A pub was a good place to find people at all hours of the day, and someone would surely step forward to help a stranger in need. There might even be coffee involved. Oh, please let there be coffee. I could murder an espresso compana. Then again, this doesn't seem like the kind of place to have a Starbucks, although I would settle for a Costa at this point. Tom had just made it past the bowls club, starting down the hill, when he saw someone standing in the middle of the road outside the churchyard. They seemed to be stooping, but as Tom got closer, he saw they were in fact attempting to rouse someone else lying face down on the road. The Good Samaritan was a young girl with mousy blonde hair dyed pink at the ends. Her large breasts and hips were at odds with her narrow waist and diminutive height, which gave her an odd overall shape. A spiky belt held up a pair of black jeans, and instead of a jacket, she wore a plain grey hoodie. Tom hurried to speak with her. Is everything okay? The girl flinched, looking at Tom like he'd just appeared out of the ether. In a way, he had. She spoke in a thick Scottish accent, which was to be expected, but it meant he only understood half of what she said. I can't get up, the drunken bowl bag. Tom studied the man lying face down on the ground. He wasn't moving at all and was covered in fluids that stained his dark green jumper in a dozen places. The smell coming off of him was unpleasant. Drunk? At ten in the morning? The girl shrugged. That's later in these parts. Will you help me get the bald head on his feet? Uh, of course, do you know who he is? Eh, of course I do. It's Barry Maguire, the village baker. But who are you? You're nothing round here, pal. No, you're right. My friends and I hired the cottage up the hill. We came up from Manchester. The girl didn't reply. She knelt beside Barry Maguire and yanked at the man's arm. On your feet, Barry lad, you can't sleep here. Tom admired the girl's compassion. If it had been him, he would have left the fool to sleep it off where he lay. Let all men carry their own failures, his dad would always say to him. Their arms will never grow strong if you help them. Wanting to be helpful, Tom grabbed Barry's other arm, and he and the girl managed to get him on his feet. The man was as light as a feather, sickly and thin. Alcoholic most likely. There's probably not much else to do around here but drink. I'm Tom, by the way. Chloe? Do you know where Barry lives, Chloe? Everybody knows where everybody lives in this village. You can't move without... Barry Maguire trembled. For a moment, Tom assumed the drunken sot was about to vomit, but instead he turned to face Chloe. Green fuzz sprouted from his left ear. Tom's stomach plummeted to the floor. No, it can't be. Whoa, Barry lad, then I'd get your knickers in a twist, I'm just trying to... Barry snapped his jaws at Chloe like a deranged animal. She let go of his arm and managed to hop back just in time to avoid both his teeth and a swinging fist seeking to pummel her. Tom let go of Barry's other arm and shoved the man away as if he were on fire. He turned to Chloe and shouted like a madman, Stay back, don't touch him! Chloe glared at Barry. Her small fists clenched. It was unclear if she'd even heard Tom's words, for it was clear she was ready to fight. Have you lost your head, Barry? What's wrong with you? Tom knew what was wrong with Barry. He's infected. He has the fungus all over him. Green fuzz covered Barry's face. His left eye peeked through a thick clump of the stuff. His hands were twisted and bloody. Foul fluids dripped onto the road. Chloe was clearly confused by what she was seeing because she hesitated to act, just standing there with a fist clenched. Tom had to grab her and drag her away. She protested but didn't fight him. Barry Maguire stumbled after them, elastic arms whipping back and forth. He's goosed, said Chloe. We shy as piss as a fart. He's infected, said Tom, wondering if this was Sean's fate back at the cottage. She looked at him. Infected with what? Something bad. Barry made no sound as he stalked them. His gait was lumbering, as if both of his ankles were broken. 
Tom kept a hand on Chloe's arm as he tried to think. Whatever Sean had been exposed to was in the village. The fungus is here. It's not safe. How did it spread from the cottage to the village? Or did it spread from the village to the cottage? I need to get out of here. Heavy footsteps sounded nearby, and an older man in a green wax jacket and Wellington boots raced down the road towards them. At first, Tom feared it was another infected person, but when the man began shouting, it became clear he was intending to help. What's all this nonsense? The older man skidded to a halt a few metres away. Barry, is that you, lad? Get away from him, Tom warned. Don't go near him. The stranger frowned, adding wrinkles to his already weathered forehead. The wiry grey hairs on his cheeks twitched as he spoke. What are you saying to me? I'm saying you shouldn't go anywhere near that man. Barry turned to face the stranger and started to move towards him. The stranger was still frowning. Tom gave a third warning. Don't let him touch you. This man is very sick. Are you one of the English boys who rent in my cottage? Mr. McGregor? Yes, I just came from the cottage. Something bad has happened up there. Some kind of fungus. It was on the hill. We... Barry whipped an arm at McGregor, missing the man's face by less than an inch. Rather than frighten the older man, it just seemed to annoy him. Barry, have you gone soft in the head, lad? Calm down before you do yourself an injury. And what's that green muck on your face? Looks like you went face to face with a snooker table and lost. Get away from him, Tom warned yet again. Don't let him anywhere near you. Barry pounced, grabbing Mr. McGregor in a bear hug. What the? Tom grimaced. I warned you, you old fool. I warned you to stay back. Behave yourself, you feckin' idiot. McGregor threw out a Wellington boot and swept Barry's legs out from under him. The infected man struck the road with such a thud, elbows and head smacking the tarmac, that Mr. McGregor immediately bent down to check on him. Crevens, Barry, what's got into you? Are you okay? Tom let go of Chloe's arm and stepped towards McGregor, desperate to make the stubborn man listen before it was too late. Step away from him. I think it's contagious. My friend has it. McGregor pulled his hand back, stood up straight, and stared at Tom distrustfully. What are you talking about? I already said there's some kind of outbreak, a fungus. My friends and I found this big chunk of metal buried in the ground up at the cottage. It was like some kind of corkscrew. My friend touched it and now he's sick like barriers. Whatever it is, it's dangerous. McGregor opened his mouth to speak, but Barry leapt up off the ground and grappled with him again. This time, the landlord got Barry in a headlock but seemed unsure what to do after that. Barry, you mad warper, get off me! Chloe went to help, but Tom grabbed her. Don't! McGregor threw his leg out and tripped Barry again. This time, Barry clung on. His left hand came apart and revealed some kind of bony protuberance. As he hit the road, he swiped at McGregor's face and caused the man to growl in pain. When McGregor stepped back, there was a bleeding scratch on his cheek. Bloody idiot, he said, as he fingered the wound. We have to call the police, said Tom. They need to know what's happening here. Chloe nudged him and pointed down the road. Look! Two women stumbled across a nearby common, clumsily navigating around a bench in the middle of a grassy area. Even from a distance, it was clear they were infected. Their faces were mottled, covered by dark patches. Their arms were too long, swinging alongside their knees. This can't be happening, said Tom. Not to me. Chloe clutched herself, arms beneath her breasts. They have it too late. The fungus you keep talking about. Tom wasn't usually in the habit of swearing, but he unleashed a tirade now. Once he was finished, he took a breath and tried to stay calm. I need to get out of here. I need to get help for my friends too, but mostly I just need to get out of here. Barry got back on his feet and lunged at McGregor a third time. McGregor was out of patience, so he tossed the infected man back down like a rag doll and viciously stomped on his ribs. The old landlord was an ox of a man, which was why Tom was genuinely startled when he turned and glared at him. I'll go get your boys down from the cottage, but I'll wring their scrawny necks if any of this is down to them. He then turned his glare on Chloe. Get help, lass. Get help for Barry. 
and didn't let this English fella out of your sight. She nodded anxiously, blue eyes blinking. I'll call the police, the fire brigade, and everybody. McGregor glanced at the two women shambling across the common. They'd now made it past the bench. Then he gave Tom a quick nod before taking off at a run, hopefully to go and retrieve his car. Tom found himself standing there alone in the middle of the road with a teenage girl and no idea what to do. Barry had got back up now and was stumbling towards them, undeterred by the probable broken ribs. The two infected women were only 15 feet away. We're being penned in. Tom grabbed Chloe's arm again. Where can we go? She looked at him, mouth open. Hey, hey, this is your village. Where is safe? Where is... A sudden tremor sent Tom and Chloe crashing against each other, almost in an embrace. Barry's crooked ankles folded inward and he collapsed in a heap, while the two infected women on the common toppled over on the grass. Chloe screamed into Tom's chest, the sound muffled. Instinctively, he put his arms around her. What the hell had just happened? An earthquake? Like the one last night in the cottage. And then he saw it. A corkscrew. The massive chunk of metal had lodged itself in the pavement at the side of the road. Shattered concrete lay in blocks all around it. The surrounding air shimmered with heat. Before Tom could react, another impact rocked the ground as a second corkscrew collided with the earth only a hundred metres away. The massive impact seemed to swallow up the air and snatch away all sound. Tom stumbled, heart pounding against his ribs. Chloe shouted something at him, but it was as if she was miming, a frantic ghost without vocal cords. I'm deaf. Please, someone help me, I'm deaf. The air seemed to implode and the sound came rushing back. Under attack! Tom shook his head in confusion. Chloe grabbed his hand and gawked at him. We're under attack! We're being bombed! What? No, that's not it! Get inside, quickly! Someone was shouting from nearby. Tom turned and saw a vicar standing in the doorway of the small church. The man was waving urgently and hopping up and down. Get inside, for heaven's sake! Chloe tugged on Tom's arm, and the two of them got moving, racing through the small iron gate that led to the bottom of a shingle path and hurrying up a short incline as fast as they could. Hot air blasted Tom's face as he passed through the entrance to the church. He came to a halt inside a small room. The door slammed shut behind him, a reassuringly heavy thud. I'm safe. I'm trapped. I'm stranded. Chloe pressed up against Tom as the vicar locked the door with an old-fashioned metal key. He was a short, pot-bellied man with greying brown hair around a ball pate. He looked exactly like what you would expect a vicar to look, but he didn't sound like one. What in the nine fucking hells is going on out there? he demanded. Tom pictured the corkscrews, crashing into the road outside, along with that one that had landed on the hill behind the cottage last night. Only one answer would come to his lips. We're being invaded. Chapter 2 Now The corkscrews are everywhere. That was the thought running through Ryan's mind as he desperately hobbled up the shingle path that led to the church's narrow entrance. Tom stood inside waiting for him, waving frantically and calling out. He had assumed his friend dead, but here he was, alive and well, a wonderful relief. But one short-lived as Ryan glanced back over his shoulder and saw how bad things were. Half a dozen infected people shambled towards the church, their silhouettes misshapen and elongated against the backdrop of the village. Tom shouted, Hurry, they're coming! No shit, they're coming. Aaron made it inside quickly, but Ryan, with his swollen knee courtesy of his fight with Mr. McGregor, could barely keep himself moving. The gravestones in the cemetery looked like hundreds of rotting teeth waiting to devour him. Aaron waited in the doorway, reaching out a hand. Ryan, come on! I'm going as fast as I can. Ryan made a desperate whining sound in his throat, panic trying to claw its way out and threw himself forward, 
He grabbed his brother's hand and Aaron yanked him inside, causing him to collide with a young girl standing there. She didn't hold it against him. The door slammed shut. I made it. I'm okay. I think I'm okay. Ryan collapsed on a wooden bench, clutching his knee and hissing in agony. As he did so, he took in his surroundings. The entryway was tiny, little more than a space where people could wipe their feet and check the notice board. It was warm, bordering on stuffy, and along with the candlelight and solid stone walls, you might have called it cosy. The only thing ruining the atmosphere were the grey, stricken faces of the people looking down at him. Tom was standing beside a vicar, both men holding long candles. The young girl Ryan had bumped into gave him an awkward smile. With greasy blonde hair with pink tips, smeared mascara and haunted blue eyes, it looked like her weekend had been as bad as his. Tom motioned to Ryan's leg. You're hurt. I knocked it pretty bad. I think it's just swollen. We'll get you comfortable, said the vicar helpfully. Aaron slumped onto the bench beside Ryan and lowered his face into his hands. I thought it was over. I thought we were okay. I thought it was over. Ryan put his hand on his brother's back, but didn't say anything. What could he say? It spread throughout the entire village, Tom explained, shaking his head as if disgusted by his own words. The same thing Sean has, some kind of fungus. Where are Brett and Luby? Are they still up at the cottage? Ryan exhaled and gave his friend a look that hopefully conveyed the message without him having to say it. He couldn't say it, not yet. Tom's expression curled in on itself and he turned away, hissing through his teeth. He rubbed at his face. We're stuck in a bloody nightmare. I keep hoping to wake up, but things keep going and going and going. When does it end, Ryan? How does it end? I don't know. I really don't know. Aaron and I thought everything would be okay once we reached the village, but... Tom sighed. There's no need to tell me. Aaron still had his face in his hands. I won't go home, he muttered. Ryan knew exactly how his brother felt. They had pinned all of their hopes on reaching the village, but it had all been for nothing. In fact, things were now even worse. What hope did they have now? The vicar looked solemnly at Aaron and then at Ryan. Tom tells me you encountered this fungus last night up at the old Golax retreat. Ryan nodded. There was this big chunk of metal on the hill behind the cottage. Our friend Sean touched it and got this oily green substance all over his hands. There were these weird bugs too. The vicar frowned, but it was Tom who spoke. Bugs? What bugs? Me and Aaron went back up the hill after you left. There were these weird little creatures like four-legged slugs. Aaron captured one in a bottle and it started squirting the same green oil all over the sides of the plastic. The fungus started growing on it a couple of hours later. A thump against the door startled everyone. The infected were right outside and wanted in. Don't worry, said the vicar. That door has withstood a hundred years of Scottish weather. Now it's getting through here. Best we move away though, yes, and keep your voices down. He ushered them into the main part of the church, a space about the size of a tennis court with a vaulted ceiling held up by a latticework of rafters. A dozen wooden chairs formed two rows, split in the middle by a centre aisle. In front of the rows was a simple lectern on an elevated platform. There was also an old upright piano. Moonlight spilled in through six stained glass windows, three on either side, but a much larger one took up the church's rear wall. Ten feet tall at least, it portrayed a mother and newborn baby probably Mary and Jesus. Long candles lit the spaces where the moonlight failed to fall. Welcome to Quarry Kell Parish Church, said the vicar, though the locals just call it the Kirk. You can call me Miles if it suits you. We have a healthy supply of candles, but little else, I'm afraid. It's past midnight, so most of us were about to settle down for the night and hope for a better day tomorrow. Lucky we heard you and your brother talking outside, to be honest, another hour and we may not have. Ryan offered a handshake, feeling oddly formal. Rarely had he stepped foot inside a church, so he was unsure about the etiquette. Good to meet you, Miles. I'm Ryan. My brother's Aaron. Aaron gave no response. He stared ahead like he was in a daydream. 
The banging on the door increased, getting angrier and angrier. Miles cleared his throat and raised his voice slightly to speak over the din. You should meet the family. This here is Chloe. He nodded to the young girl Ryan had collided with. She smiled at him again and this time gave a little wave. Then the vicar pointed to the back of the church, where a small huddle of people sat, all looking his way with interest but no enthusiasm. That we beaut is Helen and her bonny lad, Andy, and christened him myself, I did. A little boy sat on the floor at the feet of an attractive brunette in her thirties. The boy was scribbling away in a colouring book with a handful of crayons. What must this have all been like for him? He's probably traumatised. Ryan glanced at Aaron. I hope he manages to put this behind him one day. Miles continued his introduction with another point of his finger. That big fella is Cameron. Not the friendliest of fellas, admittedly, so we best leave him be. Finally, sitting at the back by the piano is Fiona. She's having a hard time with things lately, so all this excitement is the last thing she needs. A fine last she is. From what we can tell, said Tom, we could be the only people in the village uninfected. Things have been getting worse and worse out there. For a while, you could hear people fighting, but for the last few hours, nothing. I'm glad to see you, Ryan. If I hadn't heard you and Aaron chatting outside... How did you end up here, Tom? Have you been here the entire time? I made it to the village a couple of hours after I left you at the cottage. When I got here, there was a man named Barry. He was like Sean. He attacked me and Chloe over there. We made it inside the church, but we haven't been able to leave since. Oh, I met McGregor too. Sent him to the cottage to come and rescue you. I'm assuming he failed? Ryan took a second to absorb the information. So much had happened in the last 24 hours, but Tom had clearly survived ordeals of his own. We met McGregor on the road. He was infected. And we dumped a Land Rover on top of him. Tom nodded glumly as if it were no surprise. Barry scratched him on the face during a scuffle. He had these bony claws, almost like an eagle's talons, except bigger. Ryan nodded. I know, I've seen it myself. It's the beginning of the apocalypse, I swear down. Miles made the sign of the cross. What we are dealing here could very well be a local catastrophe. Let's not be superstitious. The corkscrews, said Aaron. He'd broken away from his daydreaming and now seemed bewildered, hair in clumps, eyes bleary. He didn't look directly at anyone as he spoke. It might even have been to himself. The corkscrews fell from space like a shotgun blast, scattering all over the earth. They want our planet. The need is gone. The aliens. It's aliens. Miles did the sign of the cross once again. Blasphemy, lad. I wouldn't discount him so quickly, said Ryan, feeling a need to defend his brother. You've seen what's happening. How would you choose to explain it? I'm sure all shall be revealed. Aliens, however, it is not. I've been assuming it's a terrorist attack, said Tom. Doesn't that make more sense, that this is some kind of biological weapon cooked up in a lab? Aaron shrugged and wandered off like a zombie. He took a seat next to one of the stained glass windows and proceeded to place his face back in his hands. Ryan wanted to go to him, but he didn't know what to say or what to do. They were safe for now. That would have to be enough. And for now I'll take it. Ryan let out a sigh as he tried to put things into some kind of order. So our best theory is that terrorists decided to attack the Scottish Islands, one of the least populated places in the entire country. In the world, Miles added, this is the land of whiskey and wilderness. Tom huffed, still makes more sense than aliens. Is this more bloody English? The big guy who Miles had said was called Cameron came storming over. His shoulders were like two boulders either side of a tree stump. He wore a burnt orange jumper with olive-coloured fatigues and scruffy combat boots. He did not look happy. If you're trying to boot what caused this mess, I guarantee it's some fucking scheme to keep us under the English boot heel. Anything to protect their precious union and the coppers flowing into Westminster. Ryan chuckled, assuming the man was kidding. But when he offered a hand to shake, the bigger man just sneered. 
keep your mitts to yourself, English, or you might lose them. Miles ran a hand over his bald head and sighed. Cameron, you're in the lodge house. Please behave accordingly. This is Kirk, Vicar. A place for the children of Scotland. English blood didn't belong here. Miles went to speak again, but Ryan raised the palm to Cameron and spoke first. Listen, buddy, I'm not here to cause trouble. Ain't your buddy, pal, the big Scot glared, then nodded towards the church's entryway. You bought the feckin' greens right to a door. Hear them banging. That's on you. Ryan frowned. The greens? Hey, what would you call them? Ryan shrugged. I haven't thought much about it. Well, perhaps you should start thinking English. It might just save your life. With that non-specific threat, Cameron turned on his boot heel and marched away, retaking his seat at the front of the church. There he threw his head back and closed his eyes to sleep. Tom grimaced. I found it's best to avoid that one. When he and I met this morning, he demanded I show him ID. Said I wasn't a Westminster spy looking to cause dissent. It's just his way of dealing with stress, said Miles. Don't judge him too harshly. He's right, though, said Ryan, turning to look back at the entryway. He winced each time there was a thud. I led the greens right to the door. Miles patted him on the back and gave a gentle smile. Now we can do about it now, lad. I'll go check on Aaron, said Tom. You could probably use a rest and I'm starving for conversation. Ryan nodded. Cheers, mate. My head's all over the shop. But I think Aaron's taking things even worse. He'll be all right. Miles placed a hand on Ryan's forearm. Take a seat and I'll bring you a nice hot brew. You have electricity? Heavens no. This place was never wired up. But I did receive a coal burner back in 94. And I've got an old cast iron kettle I used to make tea. And I keep stocked up on bottled water and long-life milk. We're almost out of water, but you deserve at least one cupper after what you've been through. You have a coal burner? Ryan looked around and saw no place for one. Miles beamed with pride. Can you need feel it, lad? Ryan spotted an iron grate running the entire length of the central walkway. Hot air blasted up and caused his eyes to water as he looked down at it. This place has a basement? A cellar, hey, I'll show you. Miles took Ryan to the front of the church and stopped beside a large wooden hatch cut into a raised platform. When he bent to open it, more hot air blasted up into the church. A flickering light lit the dark space below. That's pretty cool, said Ryan, genuinely impressed. It's like a secret bunker. Not exactly modern living, said Miles. And I go through a pack of batteries a week, keeping the lamp on, but I'm a firm believer that no place should ever be without heat and a good brew. Do you take sugar? What? Oh, yeah. So please, coming right up. Miles descended a rickety staircase inside the hatch and disappeared into the dark. Ryan wondered how the man could stand the heat down there. The woman sitting by the piano was staring at Ryan, and when he noticed her, she spoke to him with a plain accent with no hint of a Scottish twang. Her eyes were naturally dark without the need for makeup. Do you play? he asked her. She gave a clipped chuckle and said, I have many talents, but musicality isn't one of them. Yeah, me either. I played recorder at school when I was little, but I were never any good. Is it still a shit show out there? Ryan gave a thin-lipped smile. Fraid so. You're Fiona, right? I'm Ryan. My friends call me Fee. Ryan's eyes went to her tattoos, which were extensive, intricate designs up and down her arms. Impressive ink. Miss Spent Youth, you got any? Nah. My fiancé and I promised to get matching ones after the wedding. We Suddenly his words trailed off, and he was short of breath. He felt light-headed and weak like a fist had just hit him square in the guts. Fiona leapt up to steady him. Hey, you don't look so good. Maybe you ought to sit down. Here. She helped him onto a chair. Thanks, it's just... I haven't spoken to Sophie in days, and it's starting to feel like I might never see her again. Hey, you can't think like that. Help will get here soon, okay? 
The Fort William Police? The Army? I don't know, but someone. This place isn't as cut off as you think. Ryan squeezed his eyes shut, opened them, then took a breath. Good to know. Is there anyone you're worried about? Fiona folded her arms and looked away. Best not to think about it. We just need to focus on staying safe. She sat down beside him and exhaled wearily. Lucky to even be here, honestly. What do you mean? Just that I was lucky to be at the church when it all went down. I was here speaking with Miles about something. Good timing, huh? Hopefully other people manage to find safety too. It can't just be us. I don't think it is. She shifted in her seat and spoke in a voice barely above a whisper. Sometimes you can hear people screaming. Not so often anymore, though. Ryan had no trouble imagining. The village was small, but there must have still been a few hundred people living there. How many were hiding? How many had been attacked or infected? How many are right outside this church trying to get in? Ryan flinched as something came at him from the centre aisle. It was the little boy, rosy-cheeked and scruffy-haired, with dark bags beneath his eyes the size of ping-pong balls. Considering the time of night, it wasn't surprising. I'm Andy. Hey, Andy. I'm Ryan. How are you doing? I'm bored. I bet you are. You're the only kid in here. Yeah, and no one will play with me. Ryan chuckled awkwardly. Oh, um, <laughs> that's not good. Will you colour with me? I suppose I can do that, yeah. Grand. Very pleased to make your acquaintance, Ryan. You can have the red crayon. Ryan tried to look exciting. Cool, that's my favourite colour. The boy's mother appeared behind him. Same brown hair in need of taming. There was a weary quality to her attractive round face, a slight greying of the eyes and a deep wrinkle on her forehead. She placed her hands on the boy's shoulders and gave him a gentle chiding. Don't bother the man, Andy. He's going to colour with me because you won't. He looked at Ryan, rolling his eyes in a remarkably adult gesture. This is my ma. I don't have a da. His mother shushed him and seemed embarrassed. Sorry. Ryan waved a hand. It's fine. I'm Ryan. Helen, pleased to meet you. It's my birthday in two weeks, said Andy. Do you want to come? Ryan felt awkward, so he reached out a hand. Let me have that crayon, kidder. I can call her a mean butterfly. Are you sure? asked Helen. He's just bored. We've been stuck here for, well, a long time. And there's no food, said Andy. Do you reckon we'll starve? Ryan chuckled. How old are you, Andy? Five. Well... A five-year-old can go weeks without food, so don't worry, okay. What about Reverend Miles? What about him? He's old. How long can he go without food? Ryan glanced at Helen and saw her trying to stifle a laugh. The way her eyes creased at the corners was endearing. Ryan returned his focus to Andy. I think we'll be okay, kidder. We just have to stay together and be quiet until someone comes to help us. And the sick people too? Ryan nodded, and the sick people. Andy stared at the floor, almost like he was disappointed. I hadn't seen them. Ma says we can't go outside to take a look, even though they're right outside. We're safe here, said Ryan. It would be silly to leave. I just want to go home. Helen sighed, and once again seemed embarrassed. I clean here Saturday mornings, she explained, and I bring Ryan with me. We were both inside when the ground shook this morning. Next thing I know, your friend Tom is shouting about manky fungus, making people sick and chunks of metal hitting the road outside. If it was nay for the fact Reverend Miles and Chloe confirmed it, I would never have believed it. But to me still doesn't. It's very real, said Ryan, and it's very dangerous. Helen glanced at her son, prompting Ryan to reconsider his tone. But no one here is sick and we're all safe inside, so we just need to wait a little while until it's safe to leave. It's so boring, moaned Andy. Andy, stop complaining. You'd usually be fast asleep by now, and if you don't, bruise up, get it while it's piping. Miles reappeared, stomping up the wooden staircase with a tray of steaming hot drinks. From nearby, Fee rushed over to help him. Ryan sighed with a relief at the thought of a hot drink. Everything suddenly seemed less dire. 
He leaned forward and gave Andy a playful tap on the arm. Believe me, kidder, boring is good. Now, let me see those colouring skills. Andy liked the English. They spoke funny, but were nice. Tom, the first one to come, was posh, like the Queen. But the new one, Ryan, was different. He used words Andy could understand and called him kidder, which he liked very much. He liked it so much that he'd given Ryan a green crayon to go along with the red. They were currently colouring a dinosaur together. But it was hard going outside of the lines, especially every time there was a bang at the door making him jump. He wished the sick people would just go away. Ryan smiled at him. You're really good at this, Andy. I know. You're good too, Ryan, but you've missed his foot. Andy pointed his yellow crayon at the dinosaur's back leg. Oaks, good spot, kidder. He quickly got to work, filling in the foot with green. So you at school yet, Andy? I started this year, but then I like it. Learning's boring. I hear you. The thing is, though, Andy, school's really important. What do you want to be when you get older? A crane fighter. Ryan chuckled, but Andy wasn't joking. He frowned to show that he didn't like being laughed at, and Ryan stopped. Oh, yeah, okay, well... Crime fighters, like the police, need to do well at school, don't they? They have to be smart in order to protect people. What about superheroes? How smart do they have to be? Really smart. Isn't the Hulk a scientist or something? Andy nodded. Iron Man's smart too. He invents stuff. Ryan chuckled again. Yeah, he does invent stuff, doesn't he? You like superheroes, huh? We have Disney+. Plus. Now lets me watch all the movies as much as I want. My tablet will not turn on there anymore, though. You know how to fix it? I think everyone's tablet's broken at the moment, Andy. I'm sure they'll all be working again soon. Hey, do you like football? Ever heard of Manchester United? Andy didn't like football. Sometimes they tried to make him play it at school, but he never really understood what he was supposed to do or why. He'd never heard of Manchester United, and it didn't sound interesting, so he asked a question about something else. Is your brother okay? Andy had overheard that the older boy's name was Aaron, and that he was Ryan's younger brother. The lad had been sitting at the back of the church for a long time now, holding his head in his hands like he was going to cry. Andy did that sometimes too, like the time he'd stepped on a frog by accident, and it was all squashed up and in pain. He'd run home and got his ma, who had picked the frog up, taken it away to make it all better. That's how Aaron looked. Sad like that. He's just a bit upset, Andy. He's been through a lot this weekend and needs a little space to think. Do you ever think about things when you're upset? Andy shrugged. He wasn't really aware of thinking. He preferred to talk. What's he upset about? He's missing our friends. We came here in a big group, but some of us, some of us had to go home. Are they sick? Sort of. It's okay, though. Aaron will be fine. Thanks for worrying about him. You're a good kid, Andy. Ma says I have to be nice to people and to do what I'm told. Ryan smiled, patted him on the arm. It felt nice and made Andy wonder if having a dad felt nice all the time. He'd never met his real one, and sometimes his mummy cried about it, but mostly he didn't think about it. Ryan was cool, though, and if all dads were like Ryan, then maybe he wanted one after all. He should tell his ma. Ryan sipped his tea, which was an adult drink, like wine. It sounds like your mum gives you good advice, Andy. You should listen to her. She works hard. She's in charge of this whole church being clean. I heard that, yeah. And she works at the pub sometimes too. My granny looks after me while I sleep. Well, that's nice. Do you think my granny's sick like the people outside? Ryan pulled a funny face that was like half a smile. Your granny is fine, I'm sure. Do you have a granny, Ryan? I used to. Now I just have a mam, brother, and a fiancé called Sophie. What's a fiancé? It means she's the woman I'm going to marry. And I have kids with? Ryan pulled another face, this time like he was in pain. Well, yeah, eventually it may be. I don't know. We haven't really talked about it. You'll make a crack in Dad, Ryan. I wish you were my dad. 
Ryan ruffled Andy's hair, another thing he liked. Thanks, kidder. Come on, let's finish this dinosaur before it runs off. Andy picked up a brown crayon and started on the teeth. He knew they should be white, but he didn't have a white crayon. He decided on brown because they were dirty. Dinosaurs probably had dirty teeth because they couldn't use toothbrushes. Ryan continued colouring the legs in green, and soon they were finished. There are lots more pictures we can colour. I don't want to stop yet. Ryan got up off the floor and hopped on one leg. With a moan, he said the words Andy didn't want to hear. I'm going to take a break, kidder. I'll come and play again later, OK? Andy knew it would be naughty to complain to an adult, so he nodded and tried to hide his disappointment. OK. Feeling sad, he watched Ryan walk away and join his other friend, Tom. Tom was OK, but he didn't play very much. You OK, Daffodil? Andy's ma was sitting on a chair not far away. She'd been trying to get some sleep, but he hadn't heard her snoring. She was tired too. It had been dark outside for ages now, and his eyes were all tickly. But his ma hadn't asked him to lie down. I'm OK, ma. How much longer do I have to stay here? I keep telling you, nay much longer. We just need to wait until it's safe. When the sick people stop banging on the door. This will all be over soon, I promise. I'm sorry that you're having to go through this daffodil. It's nae fair. Andy didn't like his ma being so tired and said, It's okay, ma. I love you. That made her smile. It always did. She shuffled along the chairs and pulled him into a cuddle. I love you too. A good wee boy. Andy reached out his foot and turned the page of his colouring book with the tip of his trainer. The brown-toothed dinosaur gave way to a brand new black and white butterfly. Butterfly? I ain't said he colours a mean butterfly, whatever that means. Andy turned to call Ryan over, but instead he leapt out of his skin as a loud noise startled him. His tummy turned flipsy and he let out a scream while his ma squeezed him tightly. She didn't tell him to stop screaming, probably because she was shouting and making lots of noise herself. The window! someone shouted, and Andy saw a black hole appear where there'd once been green and red glass in a pretty pattern. All that colourful glass was now on the floor. What was happening? Did the sick people want to come in so badly they were breaking things? The police will definitely come now. Andy's ma was hurting him with her hands. But that was okay because he was scared. He moved between her legs and she wrapped her arms around him like a big bear while he buried his head in her chest. Nothing bad would happen as long as she was there with him. Ma always kept him safe, like the time the smelly man had spoken to him on the bus. Shake the cannon, someone yelled. It sounded like Cameron. Everyone grab whatever you can! Andy kept his face buried, listening to the sound of furniture being moved and people rushing about. Fiona, look out! Someone help me! Ah! Damn it, stay back! The sound of more breaking glass. Andy could bear it no longer. He turned his head away from his ma's chest and looked at what was happening. Everyone was scattered around the church, leaping around like they were playing a game of kiss chase. He saw Ryan and his brother, the two of them standing right next to each other. And he saw Cameron throwing chairs like a big angry gorilla. He saw Fiona clutching her arm and crying. Then he saw Barry the baker. Barry was usually smiling and laughing. Sometimes at the weekend, he sang songs outside the pub, even though people shouted at him to be quiet. Now, though, he was scary. His face was all fuzzy and green like the Grinch. His arms were long like a monkey's. His hands were all broken and bloodied, with sharp bits of bone sticking out. A horrible sight made Andy cry. His ma prodded him. We need to move, Daffodil. I didn't want him scared. I know, honey, but we need to move out of the way right now. He's going to eat me. Why does Barry want to eat me? His ma didn't give an answer. She grabbed his arm harder than she ever had before, and even though he cried, she didn't let go. Eventually it hurt so much he began to wail. It's okay, Daffodil, it's okay. You're hurting me! Andy looked around for help, for someone who could get his ma to stop hurting his arm, but everyone was at the back of the church. The only one near was Barry. 
Barry barged through the row of chairs like he didn't even know they were in his way. He headed straight for Andy and his ma. Andy screamed, so did his ma. Helen, get out of the way! Reverend Miles came racing down the aisle, holding a big metal cross in his hands. He threw it at Barry and hit him in the chest. Barry McGuire, stole this at once! Andy carried on screaming while his ma dragged him to the side of the church. Barry was bleeding from his chest, but the blood was all horrible and brown, like the dinosaur teeth, and it looked like wee creepy crawlies were coming out of his tummy. Barry was even scarier than the villains on Disney+. Plus. Barry tried to hurt Reverend Miles, his horrible long arms cracking like a cowboy's whip. The vicar threw himself down amongst the chairs and scrambled out of the way. Andy's ma shoved him again. Keep moving! No! Andy finally managed to break away from his ma's horrible hurting hands. It felt good to be free. Now he could run to safety without being dragged there like a wee baby. He could run to Ryan and Tom and Cameron, the big strong men who would protect him. At school, Andy was one of the fastest. He would run even faster now. Ryan was going to be so impressed. Andy hopped over a fallen chair and got ready to run. Barry was still trying to hit Reverend Miles, which meant the way ahead was clear. Tim to run as fast as a superhero. Andy felt something underfoot. He looked down and saw his colouring book, but he couldn't keep himself from slipping. The butterfly page tore away, bringing back the brown-toothed dinosaur underneath. His ma was right behind him. She tried to grab him, but her hand snatched at thin air. Andy splattered down against the nasty stone floor and cried out in pain, Mummy! Barry stopped trying to hit Reverend Miles and turned around, glaring with one fuzzy green eye and one normal eye. Andy didn't understand why Barry was so angry. Barry, over here, cried Reverend Miles. Come and get me, you scabby scrut. Andy's ma tried to pick Andy up off the floor. Come on, Daffodil, up you get, move. But it hurts, ma, I hurt myself. I want to go home. Barry didn't care about Reverend Miles anymore. He was maddest and Andy. Brown puke leaked out of his mouth. He must be really poorly. As scared as he was, Andy felt bad for him. Mr. McGuire, it's going to be okay. Barry didn't seem to hear him. He kept coming closer. There was a loud whip crack. Andy heard his ma screaming. He tried to scream himself, but couldn't. His neck felt cold, so he grabbed it with both hands. Then he wet himself. Chapter 3 Ryan watched from the back of the church as little Andy dropped to his knees, throat torn apart and gushing blood. The child made no sound at all as he fell, just stared off into space like he didn't understand what was happening. Behind him, his mother made an inhuman screeching sound. Miles threw himself at the fungus-covered man and knocked him to the ground before he could do any more damage. Tendril-like arms whipped and slashed at the air, bony talons missing the vicar by mere inches. The merest scratch could mean a deadly infection, but Miles didn't seem to care. It's not deadly. It doesn't kill you. It changes you. Ryan needed to do something, disgusted that he'd stood by and watched. Everyone had been so desperate to save themselves that they'd lost sight of the child among them. Now that child was bleeding to death on the cold stone floor. Ryan broke away, picking up a wooden chair as he hurried down the centre aisle. Miles struggled to keep the fungus-covered man pinned down. He seemed to know who it was because he kept on shouting, Barry! Ryan raised the chair above his head. Miles, get out of the way! Miles glanced back over his shoulder, saw Ryan and leapt aside. Ryan wasted no time in cracking the wooden chair over Barry's misshapen skull. The wooden frame shattered immediately, all four legs flying in separate directions. Barry rolled across the floor, bleeding from his skull. Two seconds was all it took for him to leap back to his feet. His claws glistened in the candlelight, one of them stained red with Andy's blood. Ryan bent at the knees, ready to leap aside when the monster came for him, one wrong move and... 
How the fuck are we, English? Cameron appeared and muscled Ryan out of the way. He had scooped up one of the shattered chair legs and now raised it above his shoulder. Unleashing a stream of curses, he jammed the chair leg, splintered end first, right into Barry's distorted face. The spiked wood slid through his fuzz-covered eyeball and created a horrendous squelching sound. Cameron kept on shoving, pushing Barry back until he collided with the nearest wall. Then he gave the chair leg one last shove and buried it several more inches into the infected man's face. Barry slumped to the floor, his fungus-covered body twitching. Helen's wailing filled the church. Ryan watched Helen drop to her knees and cradle her boy in her arms. Andy might still be alive, but it could only be for a matter of seconds. Dark blood cascaded from his neck and soaked his tiny body. It dripped onto the colouring book lying on the ground by his feet the green dinosaur now barely visible through the growing crimson pool. Andy, Andy, no, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay, Daffodil. Ryan couldn't reconcile what he was seeing. I'm, I'm sorry. Helen flinched, looked up at Ryan and glared. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. The ferocity of her words stunned Ryan, but when he considered she was holding her dead child in her arms, he decided anything was reasonable. He went to speak again to try to console her in some way, but Cameron appeared and put a meaty palm against his chest. Back off, English. I just, I said back off. Cameron knelt beside Helen and put an arm around her as she trembled and wept. We're going to find out who's responsible for this hell and lass, I promise. They'll be in a shallow grave by the time we finish with them. Although she gave no reply, Helen, at the very least, seemed to tolerate Cameron's attempts to console her. Ryan took a step back, deciding he could only make the situation worse. I'm a stranger here, and people always blame strangers. A commotion broke out to Ryan's right. When he turned, he saw Tom attempting to wedge a chair into the broken stained glass window. It was an awkward endeavour, so Ryan hurried to help. Their sanctuary was no longer safe. Miles was obviously thinking the same because he cleared his throat and made an announcement. This is a tragedy for which we shall all mourn. But right now, we need to get our asses out of here. I can see them out there, said Tom, staring through the broken window through the gaps in the chair. They're in the graveyard, half a dozen of them at least. They're watching us, said Aaron flatly. They're smart. Chloe called for help from the opposite side of the church. She was standing with Fiona, who was sobbing and clutching her arm. She'd been injured during the chaos following Barry's entrance, and her forearm was bleeding. Ryan hurried over to the two women. Miles followed. She's been bitten, said Chloe, her mascara smeared, blue eyes wide with concern. Um, I mean, scratched or whatever. Let me see, said Miles. Fiona, let me take a look. Fiona offered up a trembling arm, looking away like she was about to get a flu jab. A two-inch gash parted her flesh, halfway between her wrist and her elbow. It was tiny, and only a trickle of blood ran down her arm. But the green tinge already around the edges of the wound were cause for alarm. I'm infected, right? That's what happens. I'm infected, and I'm going to end up like Barry fucking Maguire. Oh God, oh God, oh God! Miles grabbed her by the shoulders and looked her in the eyes. You don't know that, lass. No one knows. Ryan opened his mouth to offer similar reassurances, but found he couldn't lie. It might have been kind, but it wouldn't change anything. I think this is how it spreads, he said, but Miles is right. We don't know for sure. Chloe shook her head and seemed to be holding back tears. With all the smeared mascara already on her face, she looked like some punk version of a panda or Avril Lavigne's unhinged sister. Can't we do anything? It's just a tiny scratch. Ryan stared at the ground, unable to meet the girl's pleading stare. Back at the cottage, Brett hadn't even got a scratch. He'd merely placed his hands on Sean. That was all it had taken. Less than 24 hours later, he'd been dead. 
Maybe we could try antibiotics, suggested Miles. A dot of blood stained his dog collar. It could only have come from Andy. If we could go out and find... It spreads too fast, Ryan snapped, not even realising he was on edge until he stepped over it into thin air. By the time the medicine starts working... He trailed off as something occurred to him. Chloe's bleary eyes turned on him. What? What is it? It spreads fast, said Ryan, still thinking things through. But not that fast. It's a fungus, right? It creeps along, growing and growing millimetre by millimetre. Fiona moaned. I wish I could say I knew, said Miles. But it at least sounds right. Ryan looked towards the aisle, studying the metal grates that blasted hot air from below. The idea came to him in full, based on nothing except gut instinct. It was all he had, but the alternative was hopelessness. Maybe we have time, he said. Maybe, if we act fast. Miles frowned at him. Spit it out, lad. What are you getting at? We need to take Fiona to the coal burner. If we can burn the fungus before it spreads, we might be able to stop it. Chloe gasped. We can't burn her. Is that or she ends up like Barry? Do it, said Fiona. Do whatever you have to. Okay, but we have to do it fast. He took her by the arm, being sure to grab the one that was uninfected, and allowed Miles to lead them to the trap door at the front of the church. It was still hanging open, so Miles headed straight down the wooden steps. Ryan had to help Fiona because her legs were wobbling. She's terrified. I will be too. Down in the cellar, the heat was uncomfortable but not quite unbearable. A series of pipes took most of the hot air up into the church. But when they moved closer to the archaic-looking burner, Ryan began to sweat. Miles stood beside a small table with an antique kettle, bottled water and some cartoned milk. A child's pink unicorn lamp was perched on a tiny shelf against the wall, giving off an impressive amount of light. Beneath the shelf were two sackfuls of coal and firewood. Ryan wanted to get this over with, picturing the fungus spreading along Fiona's arm with every passing second. If his plan had any chance of working, it needed to be now. Give me your arm. Fiona was trembling worse than ever, but she offered her arm without complaint. In the dim light, her tattoos merged together and formed dark smudges. But it was easy to locate her wound, sticky and glistening. Just do it, she begged him. Ryan grabbed Fiona's arm and yanked it straight, rotating it so the scratch was facing the angular face of the coal burner. The dark metal surface shimmered with heat, giving off a foul-smelling breeze that agitated the fine hairs on Ryan's eyebrows. This is gonna work, he said. I said just fucking do it. Without warning, Ryan pressed Fiona's flesh against the searing hot metal like sirloin to a griddle. Fiona howled and then screeched and then settled upon a guttural moan. Her desperate pleas were so agonized that Ryan could almost feel the torment himself. Despite that, he showed no mercy and held her arm to the boiler long after she begged to be free. They couldn't risk the fungus surviving. If any of it remained, her suffering would be for nothing. I'm torturing her. I'm saving her. Which means torturing her. Ryan held on a second longer before letting go, and Fiona yanked her arm away, screaming and groaning in equal measure. Morsels of flesh sizzled on the cold burner's surface. Burger meat on an ungreased pan. The smell of cooked meat was disgusting but only because of its ordinariness. It could have been pork sausages cooking on a barbecue. I'm going to throw up. Fiona started hyperventilating. Miles put his arm around her and quickly led her back upstairs, where it was cooler and easier to breathe. Ryan took a moment to steady himself and then joined them. Once up top, he examined the damage he had done to her arm and grimaced in a mixture of revulsion and guilt. Some kind of masked demon had previously taken up most of her left forearm, but now it was ruined. Its lower face, a sickly pink mess. I'm so sorry. Tears filled Fiona's eyes. When she spoke, she was short of breath. It's, 
It's, it's okay. I don't want to be in, infected. Ryan almost wished her good luck with that, because the truth was he didn't know if his plan would even work. He supposed they would find out soon. If it didn't work, then he just tortured her for nothing. I'll just add it to my list of sins. How am I ever going to go back to a normal life after this? Who will I be? Fiona caught her breath and let out a small chuckle. Three hundred quid down the drain? Ryan frowned. Huh? The... She swallowed a mouthful of saliva and tried again. The tattoo on my arm. It was an oni. A what? It's like a Japanese troll that punishes the wicked. I got it to remind me to be good, but it looks like I got punished anyway. Ryan smiled weakly. Understanding that Fiona was trying to dispel her pain with humour and idle chit-chat, but he wasn't feeling up to laughter yet. In fact, he felt closer to throwing up. The stench of burned flesh remained fresh in his nostrils. Fiona, when this is over, I'll personally pay for you to have it sorted. You're a total badass, by the way. Yeah, said Chloe, listening. She was sitting on the stool next to the piano. I don't think I could have done that. Fiona huffed, her whole body trembling. Surprising what you'll do when the alternative is turning into an alien. Miles did the sign of the cross. No use well, Fiona. Let's not distract ourselves with the A word, okay? I was just kidding around, Vicar. I don't believe in aliens. My guess that this is all because of a... Another stained glass window shattered, a shower of glass raining down on the cold stone floor. Ryan turned to see Tom racing across the aisle with a chair. A green, he had to stop thinking of them as people, had clambered up onto the ledge and was already halfway inside. Tom used the chair to shove it backwards like a ringmaster taming a lion. We need to get out of here, he yelled over his shoulder. We can't secure this place, there are too many windows. Ryan looked around for Aaron and spotted him standing in the centre aisle. He was staring down at Andy's body, still slumped in Helen's arms, and didn't seem to notice the escalating commotion all around him. Either that, or he didn't care. Cameron was still at Helen's side, but he leapt up now. When me and a can, he yelled. We need to get the hell out of here. Agreed, said Tom, still blocking the window with his chair and wincing every time a green outside tried to get in. I'd rather make a run for it than try to survive a siege we can't win. Ryan balked. You can't be serious. It's not safe out there, Tom. It's not safe in here. Look what happened already. We just need to survive long enough to... No one is coming to help us, Ryan. We have to rescue ourselves. Another window shattered on the opposite side of the church. Cameron cursed and hurried over with a chair, knocking back an invading green before it had time to clamber inside. We cannot hold this fucking place. Even if we could, we may have food and hardly any water. And who about when we try to get our heads down? He glared at Ryan. You led them here, English. I told you this would happen. And he's dead because of you. It was Helen who spoke, and the hatred in her voice made Ryan's bowel loosen. She wanted him dead, no question. Dead like the sweet little boy in her arms. You did this! I led them here too, said Tom. Barry was out front when I got to the village. He saw me come inside. He knew I was in here. And me, said Chloe. Me as well, said Miles, rushing over to help Tom block the window. He had to crane his neck to keep looking at them. He spoke breathlessly, yet authoritatively. And... Cameron Pollock, you're sleeping off one of your benders in the cemetery when all this started. Who knows how many might have spotted you when you came staggering inside. None of us are to blame for this. This is not of any of our making. The English bought the fungus here, said Helen, snarling. There's no evidence of that, said Miles, staring down at her. None at all. Ryan swallowed his guilt, a peach pit in his throat. He was thankful, thankful that near strangers had just spoken in his defence when it would have been easier to say nothing. He went to thank them, but Helen screeched and got everyone's attention. For a moment, 
Ryan thought she was yelling at him again, but then she shifted along the floor with Andy flopping in her arms. It became clear that something was on the ground nearby. A line of bugs marched from Barry's twitching corpse across the stone floor. Helen squirmed away, dragging her dead son with her. Insects! No, said Ryan, something else. They spread the fungus. We need to kill them. Oh my God, said Chloe, covering her mouth. I don't do bugs. Cameron moved closer to Barry's body and bent over to inspect it. A second later, he began to dance, stomping on bugs left and right with his heavy combat boots. We bastards! We need to leave, said Tom, before this church becomes our tomb. I hate to speak ill of a holy building, said Miles, but I agree, this place has gone to hell. Ryan threw up his arms in defeat. And where should we go? Where can we go that'll be any safer? Miles reached into his trouser pocket and pulled out a set of jangling keys. The Bulls Club. I am an emergency contact for the alarm company. I have a key to get in and reset it. There'll be grub there at the very least. That's if we make it. There could be hundred of those things out there. Cameron quit stomping and hurried back to Helen's side. You can do whatever you like, English, but I'm getting everyone out of here. Ryan tried to picture the bowls club he had passed on the way into the village, but he couldn't remember much about it besides the white painted sign, a man kneeling to release a bowl. Whatever the place was like, it couldn't be any less safe than where they were. He was arguing out of fear, not reason. Another window shattered. A tentacle-like appendage poked through the opening, probing the air. We're dead if we stay here. We're most likely dead if we leave. Okay, said Ryan. Everyone grab whatever they can and stay together. We can do this if we're fast. Cameron grunted. Thanks for the feckin' support, English. You just watch your own back. Ryan rolled his eyes, reaching the limits of his patience. You too, Cameron. You too. You had to give Cameron credit. The guy took responsibility. Once everyone had armed up with broken chair legs, it was the big Scott who stomped to the front of the pack and faced down the heavy door with all the eagerness of a seasoned warrior. Green and red stains darkened his burnt orange jumper, and some of it had even got into his short cropped hair. His breathing was heavy, but not from fear or exhaustion. It seemed more like he was pumping himself up on rage. English, I know you boys will want to make a run for it, every man for himself and all that, but try to stick around for the women folk, eh? Ryan squeezed the chair leg in his hands, wanting to bash it over the man's bony skull. We're all in this together, Cameron, so stop being a twat and get off my sodding back. And us women folk don't need protecting, said Fiona. She was covered in sweat, from her constant battle with the agony of her burn, but she still stood tall and defiant. Her dark brown hair had been pulled back into a tight ponytail, exposing the fact that part of her left earlobe was missing. Chloe snorted, her own hair tucked behind her ears. Speak for yourself, Fee. Feel free to protect me, anyone. Carry me even. Miles slapped a hand on the stone wall inside the porch but the impact was muted. All the same, everyone stopped their bickering and gave the small, bald man their attention. How can we expect to survive out there, he demanded, if we can't even work together in here? Ryan nodded. You're right, Miles, I'm sorry. Cameron gave no such apology. Ryan wasn't willing to waste time brooding about the attitude of a man he didn't even like so he concentrated on the people who did matter. He turned to Aaron. You okay, little brother? Aaron shrugged, failing to make eye contact. Ryan reached out and touched him on the arm. Hey, this is all going to work out. We'll be okay. No, it won't. This is the end. Aaron, you can't say things like, Okay, shouted Cameron. Everyone be ready. Once you open this door, we're in a battle. The enemy will lay show mercy to us, so dinner show mercy to them. Stay together and keep it moving. We all know where the Bulls Club is, so there's no excuse for getting lost. Tom glanced over at Ryan, 
anxiety etched on his face. This was a suicide mission, even with Cameron's surprisingly sound advice. Did the man have military experience? He seemed the type, tough, intimidating, and not at all polite. Miles unlocked the door and yanked it open. Here we go! Cameron hopped over the threshold into the dark night. Miles and Helen followed right behind him. Fiona and Chloe were next, while Ryan, Tom and Aaron took up the rear, hurrying to avoid being left behind. The night was cold and wet. It hadn't rained, yet moisture seemed to cling to every molecule. The moon hung low in the sky, halfway full, the warmth of dawn still hours away. At first it seemed the coast was clear, but as their eyes adjusted, the darkness came alive. The greens made no noise, and two appeared without warning. The first attacked from the front, rushing through the small gate separating the church from the road. Even from his elevated position on the pebbled path, Cameron leapt forward and booted the green in the middle of its chest, sending it cartwheeling into the weedy grass as another attack from the graveyard. Ryan swore as he realised he was going to have to face the next one himself. Everyone keep moving, he shouted. I've got it! The group moved in a huddle through the open gate, sidestepping the green that Cameron had kicked to the ground and making it onto the narrow main road that cut through the village. Ryan stood alone, setting his feet and raising his chair leg. The green moved closer, a middle-aged woman with curly dark hair that belonged in the 80s. Her face was a mask of fuzzy emerald growth and brown weeping flesh. Insects writhed inside a sickly wound on her chest, visible even through her silky nightdress. The cold didn't seem to bother her as she lashed out at Ryan. Ryan ducked, a bony talon whistling overhead. He used the stored-up energy in his knees and threw himself forward, swinging the chair leg at the same time. The impact jarred his wrists and sent painful tremors all the way up to his elbows. It struck skull bone and rebounded back, sailing out of Ryan's hands. The infected woman collapsed to the ground, her temple caved in, more greens stumbled out of the darkness. Ryan turned and ran. The green that Cameron had floored was now back on its feet. Ryan was too energised to stop, so he delivered an awkward kick and sent the green tumbling back into the weeds. The others were already on the road, but they weren't yet safe. Greens approached from several directions, appearing from the gaps between the nearby houses. Tom stopped and turned around, calling out for Ryan. Hurry! That's the fucking plan, said Ryan, as he pushed up beside Aaron. His younger brother was armed like everybody else, but the chair leg dangled by his side. He showed no interest in defending himself. After leaving the cottage, he had seemed to turn a corner, but the shock of finding the village in the state it was had clearly hit him hard. He's probably in shock. Everyone move fast, Cameron barked. Dinner not let them surround you. The huddle moved as one, edging towards the uneven pavement that ran alongside the road. All of the houses and cottages lay behind them, as well as the corkscrews embedded in the pavement. The bowls club took up a large area surrounded by a mixture of privet hedges and chain-linked fences. Its single-storey building was perhaps 30 metres from one end to the other, much bigger than the church and hopefully safer too. The problem was getting there. Another green attacked, but Cameron kicked its legs out from under it. He followed up by bashing its skull with a chair leg. The infected people were mushy, like their bones had turned brittle and fibrous, and their flesh had become as much liquid as solid. But one scratch from those thick claws and it's all over. Everyone picked up pace as more greens broke from the shadows. They were clumsy, staggering around on rubber legs and teetering to and fro. Stay together and keep moving, said Miles. We're nearly there. The vicar was right. The way ahead was clear and getting shorter. Ryan looked back and saw several greens in pursuit, but their meandering gait meant they wouldn't immediately make up the distance. We can outrun them. They're slower than us. A grassy common lay ahead, a pair of benches and a flower bed marking its centre. The road branched off around it, left and right, and formed a loop. 
The left road was taken up by a pair of stumbling greens, but the right was clear, apart from a small lorry holding a skip parked in front of a pair of attached cottages. Head that way, yelled Ryan, pointing to the lorry. It's clear! Cameron, leading the pack, took the path to the right, skirting around the common and picking up speed. Everyone jogged to keep up, but Ryan used the breathing space to try and speak with his brother. Aaron, keep your eyes peeled, okay? Us two and Tom have to stick together. We have to look out for one another, yeah? Aaron turned his head expressionless. We're not going to make it out of this. Hey, snap out of it. We need to keep your head in the game or we're going to die in this godforsaken place. I, for one, would rather make it home. Me too, said Tom overhearing. I want to get back to the land of Wi-Fi and motorway service stations. Cameron glared at them. Keep it down by there, English, or we'll leave you behind. The group approached the skip lorry, a rusty old wreck with thick tyres and a rickety crane. The skip was covered by a loose tarp flapping in the breeze. The bowls club was just 20 metres ahead. They were almost there. Several greens cut across the common, but they were too far away to cause a problem. With each passing second, Ryan felt more and more hopeful. The greens were slow and stupid. The army could clean this mess up in no time along with scientists and doctors. This wasn't the end of the world. This was not an unbeatable threat. Sensing they were close to their final destination, Miles pulled out his keys and jangled them. Keep it moving, folks! The group moved up beside the skip truck, but Cameron sped ahead, eagerness taking hold of him. The big Scot was the only one of them who didn't seem threatened by the pursuing greens. If anything, he seemed to relish their proximity. He glanced around like a spitting viper, wooden chair leg waving back and forth and seeking a target. His single-minded focus caused him to drift ten feet ahead of the others, leaving the safety of the group. Chloe called out for him to slow down. Cam, you're going to leave us be- Everyone cried out as something leapt out of the shadows from behind the skip truck. A young man in a backwards baseball cap lashed out at Chloe and she was only saved because Miles grabbed her shirt and yanked her out of harm's way. "'His karma, lady, said Chloe, gasping. "'He he was in my class in school.' "'It doesn't matter who he was,' said Tom, raising his chair leg. "'It's him or us.' "'We're doing him a favor," said Ryan. He tried to kick Kurt in the legs, but missed and unbalanced himself. "'Damn it!' Two more greens appeared from behind the truck. Chloe backed off, dropping her chair leg to the ground. They're everywhere. Cameron sprinted back to help, raising his club and setting himself up to take a swing. But one of the greens lashed out at him first and knocked the club from his hands. The sudden ferocity blew away the big Scot's confidence, and he finally seemed concerned. The other greens made it across the common. Ryan moved closer to Aaron, guarding him like a sentry. Tom tried to join them, but Kurt lashed out at him, whipping both of his talons and knocking the baseball cap off his own head. His scalp was rotten, a bulbous patch of brown skull. In his eagerness to avoid harm, Tom leapt into Aaron. Aaron hit the ground without a sound and made no attempt to get back up. Aaron, I'm sorry. Tom bent down to help him, but froze when Fiona shouted a warning. Look out! Behind you! Kurt raised both talons in the air. Tom leapt aside. Helen appeared and brought her chair leg down like an axe. It wedged in the centre of Kurt's head and caved in his rotten skull. Then she kicked him backwards and yanked the wooden club free. To finish up, she hit him in the head a second time before he'd even hit the ground. Chunks of bone and flesh sprayed into the air. Once Kurt was down, she proceeded to beat at his skull again and again and again until there was nothing left but a sodden pink puddle. Bugs scurried away from the wreckage. The remaining greens closed in, one crashing into Ryan and knocking him to the ground. Fiona rushed to his aid, quickly pulling him back to his feet before he got hurt. Helen stood her ground nearby, swinging at any green close enough to hit. Her bravery was going to get her killed. It's not bravery, it's apathy. She doesn't care. Tom grabbed Ryan's arm. We're surrounded. Ryan looked up for Aaron. 
and spotted him near the skip truck. He was back on his feet, but two greens stood in his way, blocking his path to the rest of the group. No longer was he dazed. He was terrified. Aaron! Ryan! I, I can't get to you! More greens closed in, enveloping the road. Helen bellowed furiously, leaping into the fight like a viking. It created a distraction that Ryan tried to make use of, and he moved to retrieve his brother. Tom yanked him back, keeping him from catching a talon to the face. He tried to get Aaron a second time, but a wall of infected people closed in on him. He could barely even see Aaron through the crowd, and he was being forced back, further and further away. Tom pulled at Ryan's arm. We have to go. I'm not going anywhere without my brother. I brought him here. This is my fault. You can't reach him. Come on. Through the bodies, Ryan saw Aaron spin around frantically, seeking an escape like a cornered rat surrounded by hungry cats. With nowhere to go, he backed up against the skip truck as greens continued to stagger up the road from the direction of the church. Those nearest were still distracted by Helen's furious bellowing attack, but it was only a matter of seconds before they turned their focus on Aaron. Ryan couldn't move, his eyes fixated on his brother. He's right there. He's right there and I can't get to him. I can't save him. Aaron's face was a mask of horror. But despite his fear, he leapt into action, turning and clambering up the side of the truck. He placed a foot on the large rear tire and pushed himself upwards, ducking beneath the flapping tarp and throwing himself inside the skip. The metal container rattled for a second, then went still. Aaron was out of sight, but was he safe? Tom grabbed Ryan again, and this time he allowed himself to be pulled. His brother was lost in a sea of monsters, but he'd found a life raft. Perhaps it would keep him safe long enough to find dry land. Everyone else legged it to the bowls club. Ryan had no choice but to race after them. I'll come back for you, little brother. I swear, I'll come back. Chapter 4 Ryan couldn't help looking back as he and Tom finally made it to the bowls club to rejoin the others. He could no longer see the skip through the crowd of pursuing monsters, and he couldn't help imagining his brother cowering inside. I left him. What kind of a brother am I? Miles led everyone to the bowls club's main entrance, gathering them together beneath a wooden stone awning. A tiny lawn skirted the edge of the building, separating it from a modest car park. Hardy bushes and overgrown flower beds formed ominous shapes in the dark. Miles jangled his keys and inserted one into the stout wooden door. There was a small glass window set in the top, but only shadows could be seen beyond it. It reminded Ryan of the door back at the Golak cottage, the cottage where he had left three of his friends dead. Were their bodies rotting away up there? Luby, Sean, Brett? How long before someone found them? Would it be too late by then to give them a proper burial? Harry, please, said Chloe, clutching herself as if she were freezing cold. While it was certainly chilly, most of the group was sweating. The lock clunked, and Miles had to shoulder the door open to knock it free of its aging frame. Then he stood aside, ushering everyone in as a dozen greens moved within ten metres of the building. It was pitch black inside, and Cameron immediately bashed into something. Bastard! Fiona chided him. Be careful! I can't see my arse from my elbow, woman. Miles went to close the door behind them, but hesitated. Helen! Where's Helen? Fuck, said Cameron. We're supposed to stay together. She stayed behind to fight, said Ryan, realising he had abandoned her as much as he had abandoned his brother. We need to close the door, said Chloe, hands at her face. The right is said, they're going to get in. Cameron shushed her, then marched over to join Miles at the door. I'm heading back out. What? No, just hold on. Miles peered out of the doorway nervously. There, I see her. She's coming. 
Come on, Helen, lass! Everyone went still, quiet, tense. Only Miles and Cameron were in any position to see what was happening outside, so the rest of them stood there in the darkness and silence. There's an entire mob out there, said Cameron, clenching his big fists by his sides. We need to help her or she's not gonna make it. Miles grabbed the man's meaty wrist. Don't be an imbecile. Just stand here and pray that she makes it. Keep your prayers to yourself, Vicar. God didn't listen to the likes of me. With that, Cameron shoved his way out of the door and disappeared back into the night. Chloe grabbed the pink tips at the ends of her hair and yanked them back behind her eyes. Why did he do that? Why would he want to go back outside? He's brave, said Fiona simply. Ryan had to begrudgingly admit that she was right. Cameron was an aggressive loudmouth, but he had just thrown himself back into danger to go and help someone else. The guy had a set of balls on him like no one else. Ryan moved up beside Tom and whispered, We should go help as well. We left her out there by herself. Tom's expression was one of disgust. I'm not risking my life for a woman I barely know. She lost a child, Tom. You were there. That doesn't mean I have to die like a reckless fool. I rescued you tonight, so that's me done. Fiona overheard and turned to face them. Her face was barely visible in the dark, but her disapproving eyes shone like torches. I'll bear that in mind when it's you who needs help. She's right, said Ryan. I'm going back out to help Helen, and I'm getting my brother too. I never should have left him in the first place. Tom started to shake his head, but before he could say anything, Cameron started yelling outside. Miles stood in the doorway and waved his hands. Quickly, watch out! There are more of them over there. As fast as you can now. Christ almighty, get a move on! Shut the door, Chloe shouted. Please just close it. Not yet. Ryan teetered on his toes, not knowing whether to dash outside or to wait where he was. He decided to move up alongside Miles to get a better look, but was taken completely by surprise as Cameron burst through the door and barged him out of the way. The big Scot's shoulder smashed right against Ryan's chin and sent him flying. A galaxy of stars exploded in his vision. Miles grappled with someone behind Cameron, pulling them inside. It was Helen, screaming wild and covered in gore. Her wooden chair leg had snapped in two. Miles slammed the door shut and locked it. The darkness inside became total. We need to find some candles, said Fiona, or we're going to break our necks in here. Helen's screaming puttered out but she was still making noises, mostly guttural growling. Miles had to shush her. He was staring out of the window at the top of the door. Okay, lass, you're safe. We all need to keep quiet. They're right outside. Everyone went silent. Everyone waited. The front door thudded, making everybody start. Miles put a finger to his lips, making sure no one panicked. Chloe started hyperventilating. Fiona placed an arm around her. Helen stood panting and glaring. Ryan couldn't tell for sure, but he thought it was at him. I left her out there. I just stood by while a little boy died. Another thud. The door barely rattled. The frame was solid despite its age, and the fact that it was slightly warped probably only made it stronger. I think we'll be okay. Miles whispered, so long as we keep our voices down and stay away from the windows on this side of the building. Ryan looked around, trying to make out details in the dark. There were several lead-lined windows inside recessed window sashes on this side of the building. Old, but compact and strong. Nets and curtains covered most of the glass. The windows on the other side of the building, however, were made from three large pieces of plate glass, forming an almost unbroken view of the lawns outside. There was no way to stay hidden on that side of the building. The bowling greens are fenced off, said Miles, possibly sensing Ryan's concerns. It should be safe. 
Can we move away from the door? Chloe was still breathing too quickly. I'm freaking out here. The thudding continued, but it wasn't yet enough to threaten the door. All the same, it was unnerving knowing what was waiting outside. Everyone moved deeper into the building and over by the large rear windows, it became easier to see. The moon casting a delicate silver glow over everything. The sky had turned from oily black to inky blue. It was five in the morning, not long before dawn showed up. What then? Will daylight change anything? They were standing in some kind of tea room or club, the kind of place old people liked to hang out, playing canasta and backgammon. You could almost smell the boredom. The only thing livening the place up was a hefty wooden bar at the back of the room. The heavy black drip trays bought back vague memories of Ryan's granddad letting him have a sip of lager in a scruffy social club, just like this one. It made the place feel a little more familiar. Everyone spread out, glad to have a little space to rest after having to run for their lives. Ryan's adrenaline was quickly burning off, and he was forced to contend once again with the pain of his left knee. He was no athlete, but his footballing days were definitely behind him. Food, shouted Fiona, and she rushed behind the bar, snatching crisp packets out of cardboard boxes and tossing them onto the counter. Everyone descended on them like locusts. I could eat a fucking horse, said Cameron, tearing open a packet like he was yanking the wings off a butterfly. His hands were almost too big to get inside. For a while, all you could hear was munching. Ryan noticed a glass sandwich platter sitting on the bar. When he lifted the lid, he found some slightly stale sandwiches. It had been an entire day since he'd eaten, so the dry cheddar and cucumber sandwiches could have been freshly baked pizza for how great they tasted. Fiona came and sat behind him at the bar and took a sandwich for herself. She took a bite and sighed clearly as hungry as he was, despite all the crisps. After she swallowed, she turned to Ryan and said, We'll get you, brother. Ryan exhaled, nostrils flaring. Yeah, how? Hell if I know. But we'll come up with something. It's obvious how much you take care of him. Maybe if I'd had a big brother, like you looking after me, I might have turned out differently. Ryan swallowed half of another sandwich and then turned to her. You seem pretty put together to me. She let out a hooting laugh, spraying wet crumbs onto the bar. Yeah, not quite. I got out of prison three months ago. Stockport. My nan left me a tiny place up here and she died last year. I planned on selling it, but decided it might give me a chance to start over. Some quiet place, away from bad habits, you know? Problem is, there are more drugs and alcohol up here than there was in Nottingham. Nottingham? I didn't think you were from round here. You don't have the accent. I can understand you for one thing. Give me time and I'll be as incomprehensible as the rest of them. Don't get me wrong, I like it up here. It's simple and uncomplicated, but the isolation, the boredom can get pretty rough. I'd lands and all that, I get it. I've been struggling since I got out, but Miles has been helping me. He runs a scheme for helping ex-offenders get on their feet. If I hadn't been at the church to meet him when all this started, I'd most likely be one of those monsters banging on the door. Ryan mulled things over. Eventually he said, Outside, when I fell. You were right there to get me back on my feet. You saved me. Don't mention it. I just wish I hadn't left me brother behind. Like I said, we'll get him. We'll make a plan. I'm not waiting. I'm not going to catch me breath and head back out. The sun will be up soon. Better I go while there's still some darkness left to hide in. Fiona placed her sandwich down on the bar and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand, one of the few parts of her not covered in tattoos. Running off in the night like a mank commando isn't going to help anybody. Aaron might not be comfortable, but he is safe for now. He's not safe. He's trapped inside a skip. Yeah, I was watching. But the Greens didn't see him get in. They're not smart. And as long as he stays put, he'll be as safe as the rest of us. She looked towards the door, still rattling in its frame. In fact, it's probably safer. Look, 
Ryan. I know you feel like an outsider here. I do too. But we're all we've got. I promise to have your back if you promise to have mine. I gave you my arm earlier, and now it's time for you to give me yours. Trust, yeah? It's the only way to live. You learn that in the slammer. Free therapy every Wednesday. You see, part of my past problems have apparently been due to an inherent distrust of other people. I had a shit childhood, which I won't go into, but basically it means I expect people to shit on me. One way I'm trying to better myself is by relying on other people a little more. I have to admit it's a lot less lonely. So what do you say, Ryan? Situational buddies until the whole thing blows over? She offered a handshake. Ryan took her hand with little enthusiasm. Yeah, situational buddies. We're going to get Aaron back, okay? Ryan shook his head and chuckled. Fiona frowned. What's so funny? Mac Commando, I like it. It suits you. She leaned in closer. Hey, you don't have any smack on you, do you? Ryan eased back, a hand flat on the bar to keep his balance. What? Fiona patted him on the back and grinned. Just kidding. The sandwiches'll do. Everyone made the most of the brief respite, temporary though it might be. Helen took a bottle of water and sat alone while Cameron swigged from a tumbler of scotch. He was the only one who chose alcohol. But from the way Fiona constantly eyed up the optics behind the bar, she was clearly tempted to do the same. The young woman clearly had a strained relationship with booze. Don't we all? thought Ryan, as he himself fought the temptation to get blackout drunk. We could have a party and wait for this old thing to blow over, sound as a pound. I know we're all exhausted, said Miles, sitting on a bar stool with a can of iron brew in his hand. But we should give this place a once-over and make sure it's truly safe. We should find weapons as well, said Cameron, despite several gulps of scotch. His words weren't the slightest bit slurred. His suggestion was reasonable. I'm happy to check the place out while everyone takes a rest, said Ryan, too antsy to sit still. He battled a constant urge to race back outside to get his brother. He also wanted to escape Helen's glares. You don't know the club, said Miles. I'll come with you. Ryan shrugged. The building wasn't so big that he needed a guide, but the company wasn't entirely unwelcome. The sun had started to appear outside, slicing through the bottom edges of the night sky. But the club's interior was still dark and foreboding. He went and stood with Miles, waiting for the vicar to finish his drink, and then the two of them got going. The tea room was a cluttered space with several round tables and a few dozen padded chairs. The ceilings were low, and a tiny wooden dance floor abutted the threadbare carpet on one side, with several streaks of shoe rubber marring its centre. There was a loft hatch in the ceiling above it, and Ryan clocked it as a possible hiding place if things got worse. At the rear of the tea room, behind the bar, was a staff area. To the left of the bar, a pair of saloon doors led to what would likely be a kitchen. Finally, at the tea room's far end, was a door marked toilets. There's a cupboard outside through there, said Miles. There might be something useful inside, but most of the club's equipment is outside in the shed. Let's stick indoors for now. Aye, I agree. They pushed through the toilet's door and entered a small corridor. Two more doors lay directly ahead, marked gents and gals. And to the right was a third door that must have been the cupboard Miles had been referring to. Opposite was a glass fire door leading out to the car park. The Greens hadn't yet discovered it, but their shuffling silhouettes danced in the darkness outside. Ryan reached for the door's featureless bronze knob and rattled it. It's locked. Do you have a key? Miles tutted. I'm afraid I don't. We could try to force it. Ryan didn't like the thought of that, or the racket it would create. He grabbed the knob again, yanking on it firmly while futilely wishing that it would simply pop open. Shit on it! Can't one thing just go right? Uh, hello? Ryan leapt away from the door, startled by the voice that had suddenly come from within. He exchanged a glance with Miles, but the vicar seemed as confused as he was. 
Ryan cleared his throat. Um, hello? Who's there? Stuart. Miles took a step forward. Stuart Drinkwater, is that you, lad? Vicar, what are you doing here? Seeking shelter? What are you doing in the cupboard, lad? Sitting. Sitting? Yes, on Henry. Who on earth's Henry? A vacuum cleaner. You know, he's red with a happy little face. Miles groaned and pinched the bridge of his nose. Why have you locked yourself inside a cupboard, Stuart? I'm hiding. Why? A brief silence commenced, broken only by a shuffling sound coming from inside the cupboard. Well, I got here first thing to set everything up for the Saturday league matches, but somebody had already unlocked the place. I assumed Mr Falco had had another fight with Margaret and spent the night here. He usually opens up early when he does that. The wrinkled brigade like to come at the crack of dawn for tea and toast. Sometimes they just hang around outside until you open the door. Hey, lad, I'm partial to tea and toast myself, but that doesn't explain why you locked yourself in the cupboard. Because I was right about Mr Falco being here. I went into the office to say good morning, but he was all messed up. I could tell right away because he wasn't wearing his wig. A new voice spoke. He was like Oscar from that Sesame Street vicar. All green and fuzzy he was. Never seen anything like it in my life. Ryan shared another confused expression with Miles and mouthed the words, Who's that? Miles shrugged. No idea. Oh, said Stuart. I forgot to say, Gavin Tanner's in here as well. He came to help me set up. How you doing, vicar? Well, I hope. Miles rubbed at his eyes, looking more and more exhausted by the minute. I've been better, to be honest, Gavin. Do you think you boys could possibly come out of there? This is getting a wee bit absurd. Is Mr Falco gone? asked the voice belonging to Stuart. There's nobody here but us, lad. No, Mr Falco, not even his wig. Where is he then? At the hospital? Miles put a hand against the wall and leaned. I have... No fucking idea where he is, but he ain't here. Have you checked everywhere, Vicar? Aye, now come on out of there. Did you check the kitchen? Uh, well, no, but... Gavin spoke. We ain't coming out until we know Mr Falco's gone. The Vicar too spud shot of a vegetable patch. He was trying to kill us, he were. Craziest thing I've ever seen. Did either of you get scratched? asked Ryan, trying to imagine the two men inside and whether or not they were hurt. We're fine, said Stuart, just freaked out. I didn't know what was wrong with Mr Falco, but he was sick as a whiskey-soaked dog. Ryan felt a migraine coming on. He didn't know if it was from tiredness or the absurdity of the situation. Look, our kid, if we check out the kitchen, will you come out of there? Who are you? My name's Ryan. Do we have a deal? Will you come out of there? Hey, after you check the kitchen. Ryan glanced at Miles and shrugged. Lead the way, vicar. Miles pushed his way back into the tea room with Ryan trailing behind. The others were still sitting around, eating and drinking, or in Cameron's case, sipping scotch. Found anything? asked Tom, looking up from one of the small round tables. He was sitting by the large rear windows, the sun peeking out above the lawns. The start of a beautiful morning. Too bad about the monsters outside trying to kill them. And my brother being stuck in a skip. There are a couple of oddballs locked inside a cupboard back there, said Ryan. He heard how ridiculous it sounded and almost laughed. He probably would have if he wasn't so exhausted. They won't come out until we check the kitchen. Tom frowned. The kitchen? Apparently they had a run-in with one of the greens. They worried it might still be inside. Mr Falco, said Miles, the club's owner. Cameron put his tumbler down on the bar. Who is it in the cupboard? Gavin Tanner and Stuart Drinkwater, said Miles. Ha, that pair of ass munchers, that's all we need. Miles' expression darkened. That's a disparaging remark, Cameron Pollock, and without a wee shred of merit, I hope to never hear it again. Cameron went back to his scotch with a smirk on his face. Chloe shrugged at the bar next to him and said, I always assumed they would gay too. So what if they are? asked Fiona, alone at one of the tables. 
empty crisp packets surrounded her, and she was in the process of folding them up into little triangles. Every now and again, she would glance at the optics behind the bar. It doesn't bother me, said Chloe. I was just seeing. Cameron snorted back a wad of snot and turned away from the bar. It's a sin, right, Vicar? Miles slowly blinked and sighed. No, it's not the time for an ecclesiastical discussion. We are in a crisis and that means working together despite whatever our beliefs might be. Ryan didn't care whether the lads in the cupboard were gay, straight or other. He just wanted to make sure that this Mr. Falco wasn't still lurking inside the club. They hadn't yet checked the kitchen and until they did, it would be idiotic to assume they were safe. A cage was only safe when the lion was on the opposite side of the bars. Beyond the saloon doors, the kitchen was dark. Ryan shuddered as he approached it. A dozen greens could be hiding inside, waiting for the slightest disturbance to awaken an attack. Yet despite his fear, he wanted to take action. The only way to feel safe was to confirm that he actually was. Without waiting for Miles, he pushed open the saloon doors and crept into the kitchen. Only a single window lay inside, but with dawn fast approaching, it was enough to turn the shadows from black to grey. It was easy to make out the various counters and the small island in the centre of the room, but much harder to make out the smaller shapes that sat upon them. With a little more light, everyone might be able to ransack the place for knives and pans, weapons better than rickety chair legs and soft fists. One thing was clear, however. There were no greens inside the kitchen and no sign of Mr. Falco. Just to be sure, Ryan called out. Hello? Is anyone in here? No reply. No presence of anything but himself. The relief washed over him and he realised how tense he had been. In fact, he could barely believe he'd just walk straight into danger without hesitation. The last two days had changed him. His body had settled into a permanent state of fight or flight, ready for action at any moment. Was this how soldiers felt in battle? Terrified yet more alive than ever? His only fear was that his body would eventually give out from all the adrenaline and come crashing down like an out-of-fuel plane. I just have to keep going a little while longer. Long enough to rescue Aaron and get us the hell out of here. Ryan backed out of the kitchen, ready to reassure the two oddballs in the cupboard that everything was okay. But instead of re-entering the calmness of the tea room, he found a chaotic outbreak of panic. Stools and chairs tipped over as people shouted and rushed about. It was too dim to make out expressions, but it was clear something had alarmed everyone as they retreated to the edges of the room. Ryan's eyes fell upon the bar and he saw movement. Someone was behind the counter. The stranger crashed against the optics and knocked several bottles off the wall, then rebounded against the counter and knocked over the sandwich tray. Miles shouted a warning. Ryan, get back! It's Mr. Falco! but it was too late for Ryan. As soon as Mr. Falco spotted him, he rushed out from behind the bar and lashed out with his talons. Ryan ducked, his muscles used to quickly avoiding danger. The pain in his left knee went away, but only on the promise that it would come back later, fiercer than ever. Mr. Falco had a perfectly bald head and square jaw, along with a wizened forehead. He wasn't a far cry from Bruce Willis. The main difference was that his skull was partially sunken on one side and covered in green fuzz. Also, his left ear had fallen away to reveal a brown fleshy hole filled with bugs. Despite his increasing numbness to the horrors around him, Ryan had to swallow back his revulsion at the sight of a human being in such a wretched state. Did any part of Mr. Falco remain, or had the man's mind been extinguished in the fires of infection? Sean knew. He was confused and afraid, but a part of him knew what was happening. Right up until the end, Brett, too. Ryan snapped into action, ducking and diving as Mr. Falco tried to whip him. 
Helen and Cameron joined the fight, neither seeming interested in helping Ryan so much as merely wanting to deal with the threat. Cameron had a bottle of scotch in his hands, half empty. Helen was bare-handed, fingers splayed like claws. Come down and have a drink, said Cameron, smashing the bottle off Mr. Falco's shoulder. The infected man's flesh burst open beneath his light-coloured dress shirt and a dark stain oozed through the fibres. Before Mr. Falco could recover, Helen leapt forward and shoved him against the bar. The sound of his hip striking the wood was gruesome. Ryan dashed into the kitchen. It was still dark, so he fumbled about blindly. The search made more urgent by the wild shouting from the tea room. His hands swept aside all manner of objects, but none were what he was looking for. Eventually he found a drawer, and inside that drawer he found knives. He pulled the biggest he could find and rushed back into the tea room. There Cameron and Helen were still keeping Mr. Falco busy, while everyone else cowered at the edge of the room. Miles's voice rose above the chaos, trying to keep everyone from fleeing. Ryan raced to rejoin the fight, hoping to plunge the knife into Mr. Falco without taking a hit from one of those razor-sharp talons. But as he got closer, Cameron dodged right into his path. It was like colliding with a brick wall. Ryan rebounded onto the floor, nose flattened and gushing with blood. The knife went flying from his hand, tumbling end over end across the threadbare carpet. He was too blinded by tears to retrieve it. English, you okay? Ryan groaned, scrabbling at the carpet and trying to claw himself to safety. Cameron and Helen rushed to help him, but the whip crack of Mr. Falco's talons sent them leaping for cover. Ryan tried to drag himself beneath the table, but a chair blocked his way. There was no place to go. His luck had run out. Mr. Falco raised both razor-sharp talons, glaring down at Ryan with one human eye and one fuzzy green inhuman one. This was more than just an outbreak of fungus. This was an utter and remorseless perversion of the human body. Someone leapt to Ryan's defence. It was Fiona, made obvious by the tattoos on the back of her arms. A glint of metal revealed she had picked up the fallen knife, and she screeched like a wildcat as she planted it into Mr. Falco's temple, all the way to the hilt. He dropped to the floor like a bag of potatoes and made no attempt to get up. Fiona stood over his corpse, panting, growling, bleeding. Your hand? said Ryan. He remained slumped on the floor, wondering how the hell he had survived yet another scrape with death and why he couldn't seem to avoid colliding with Cameron. Fiona turned to him. Oh, my hand must have slipped when I... when I... She bent over a table and vomited. Chloe came running over. Fiona! Fiona, are you okay? She wiped her mouth and straightened back up, then turned back to Ryan. I'm fine. Are you okay? Ryan wiped his nose and saw that it wasn't bleeding so badly. You saved my ass again. Like I said, I've got your back. With that, she staggered over to the bar, leant on it, and vomited a second time. Chloe helped her onto a stool while Helen grabbed a bottle of water from behind the bar and handed it over without a word. Miles groaned from over by the plate glass windows. The sun had risen fully behind him revealing a vibrant green lawn covered by frosty dewdrops. There was a patio area immediately outside, accessed by a door at the edge of the room. A small ride-on mower sat idle in the middle ground, and a large shed took up the background. I'll go tell Stuart and Gavin that Mr Falco has been dealt with, he said. Then I think we could all use some rest. Ryan didn't bother getting up off the floor. He just lay back and rested his head sidewards, blood still trickling from his nose. The emotional crash landing he'd been so worried about had just arrived. Chapter 5 It was now clear why they hadn't spotted Mr. Falco at first. The back room behind the bar was divided in two. A utility area first, taken up by a sink 
and large stainless steel glass washer, and then a cramped office with a desk, chair and safe. Underneath the desk lay a mattress and blankets. Mr. Falco must have spent the night there, as Stuart had assumed. With regards to Stuart, he and his friend Gavin had finally exited the cupboard, looking the worse for wear and stinking pretty damn unpleasant. They were an odd couple, to be sure, yet it was nice to find more people to share the nightmare with. Stuart was in his early twenties, but Gavin was grasping at the lower half of his forties. Stuart was dressed in trousers and a white collared shirt, whilst Gavin wore a misshapen t-shirt with a vampire on it alongside the words Von Karstein. In addition, he rocked a pair of grimy tracksuit bottoms, barely fit for relaxing at home. The two mismatched friends were currently sitting together at the bar, chatting quietly and munching on crisps. They had been trapped in the cupboard for almost 24 hours and had had no idea of what was happening outside in the village. Even when Miles told them about the crisis, they didn't seem to believe it. In fact, Gavin had even attempted to leave. It wasn't until Cameron threatened both men that they agreed to stay put. The big Scot had his uses. That was a short while ago, and Cameron and Ryan were now carrying Mr. Falco's body into the women's toilets, where the sight and smell wouldn't bother anybody. They used towels taken from the utility area to keep from touching him with their bare hands, and they carefully lowered his body down inside one of the toilet cubicles, before shutting the door. You're on into me pretty hard back there, English, said Cameron, backing out of the cubicle. Your nose will key. Ryan's nostrils felt crusty and dry, but he had only bled a small amount. It hadn't even been Cameron's fault, just an accident. It's fine, fights a messy. Hey, you can never tell how things will go. No harm done anyway, I'm just glad everyone's okay. It was the first time Cameron had spoken to Ryan with anything resembling friendliness, so he attempted to make the most of it. But before he had a chance to continue the conversation, the big Scot walked away. I need a drink, English. Try watching where you're going from now on. I'll try my best. Ryan didn't hurry out of the toilets after Cameron. It was nice to have a few moments alone in peace, so he stood and enjoyed it. It was also strange being in the women's toilet. He found it strangely intriguing as he looked around. Exactly the same as the men's, except there were no urinals, and each cubicle had a grey bin for what he assumed were tampons. Bit gross. Still, less gross than the men's. He looked at himself in the mirror and tried to imagine what he would look like with a fuzzy green eye. Truthfully, he looked unwell, even without being infected. His eyes were bloodshot and dull. His cheeks were pale and streaked with grime. He could smell his own breath. I'm exhausted. How am I going to get Aaron? Whether he liked it or not, Ryan needed to rest. He exited the toilets. The thudding at the front door had stopped at some point, the Greens either giving up or deciding upon another plan, yet somehow their absence was scarier than their presence. The sound of dogs barking in the distance made things even eerier. The sun spilled through the large rear windows and lit up the tea room, but it didn't prevent anyone trying to sleep. Cameron was stretched out on the floor beside Helen, who was sitting with her arms wrapped around her knees and staring into space. There was nothing left of the mother Ryan had met back at the church, nothing in her eyes now except sorrow and regret and hatred. Chloe, Fiona, Miles, and Tom all lay beneath tables, probably feeling safer undercover. Ryan wanted to join them, but he didn't think he could stop worrying about Aaron. There was no way of knowing if he was okay. What if he assumed no one was coming and tried to escape on his own? Who knew how many greens were outside? An entire village is worth? A village of the damned? While he was fairly certain he wouldn't sleep, Ryan was happy to just sit in silence. Watching the others snooze would be replenishing enough after all he'd been through. 
the reprieve might be the last they got, so he decided to make the most of it. Along with his worries about Aaron, Ryan also obsessed about the two women in his life, Sophie and his mam. Were they worried about him? Of course they're worried about me. It was Sunday morning. Ryan should have been on his way home by now, and he hadn't called once all weekend. Admittedly, he wasn't the biggest texter or caller, but Sophie would have expected something. His mam, too. In fact, taking Aaron on the stag do had been dependent upon keeping her updated. She would be losing her mind by now. What if things are like this everywhere? What if Manchester's infected? The entire country? Don't get carried away. I don't know anything for sure. The thought of Sophie and his man being in the same dire situation that he was created an unbearable urgency in Ryan, and he desperately wished he could sprout wings and fly above the clouds. Then he could make it home and wrap Sophie up in his arms and never let go. At the start of the weekend, he had considered Luby, Sean, Tom and Brett to be his best friends, but he realised now how wrong he'd been. Sophie was his best friend. He had to see her again. Some time went by and Ryan's bladder began to twinge. He didn't want to wake anybody, so he tried to get up quietly but his tired arms trembled as he pushed himself up off the floor. Since resting, his body had stiffened all over, and every time he moved it was like cracking half-dried cement around his bones. It meant he hobbled like an old man as he crossed the tea room and re-entered the toilet corridor. The smell from the cupboard was foul. Stuart and Gavin had urinated inside several times, but thankfully neither man had taken a dump. All the same, Ryan held his nose as he peeked inside. All he saw was a smiling Henry vacuum cleaner, a piss-filled mop bucket, and a shelf piled with cleaning supplies. If Ryan had been a chemistry teacher, he might have put those supplies together to make a bomb or something. As it was, his talents ran no further than intermediate DIY and half a dozen GCSEs. He wasn't the man who was going to save the day and rescue everybody. Some big brain scientist or gung-ho general would be the one to make headlines after all this was over. Ryan turned from the rancid cupboard and headed for the gent's toilet. But movement to his right caught his attention. He turned, then gasped. Behind the fire exit's glass panes, a desperately gaunt creature stared back at him. Ryan's fright quickly turned to confusion and horror when he saw who it was. Luby. Ryan's heart thudded in his chest, aching in a way he could barely stand. Unable to help himself, he placed a hand against the glass and looked out at his former friend, now a monster like all the rest. Green fuzz lined Luby's lips, and a small line of fungus traced upwards to his bloodshot left eye. He was a bag of bones inside his jacket. I'm sorry, mate. This should never have happened to you. Two bleeding right out, kid. Now let us in. I'm freezing my bollocks off. Ryan yelped in surprise. Lobes, is that you? Of course it's me. I ain't lost that much weight, have I? What are you doing here? How did you? I saw a bunch of infected people surrounding this place and assumed it meant people were inside. I never expected it to be you, though. It's good to see you, man. Things are pretty bad, huh? This thing is everywhere. He pointed to some green fuzz on the back of his hand. You're infected, Luby. Luby shrugged, like he'd just been told his fly was open. Tell me about it. This shit itches like hell. I think I've even got some in me ass crack. I can't let you in, mate. You could spread it to the rest of us. You'll turn violent. Give it over. I ain't the violent one. Me, am I? Everything's fine. I feel pretty great, actually. Ryan groaned. Luby, seriously, mate? I know I'm a bit worse for wear, but at least let me in so I can get warm. I'm cold and hungry and I need to take a massive shit. You can tie me up if that makes you feel better, but don't leave me alone out here with these things, please, Ryan. Ryan leant back against the opposite wall, feeling dizzy as he stared through the pane of glass at another friend he thought certain to be dead. 
The moment was interrupted by the inner door opening as someone else entered the corridor. It was Tom. Hey, Ryan, what are you? Oh, my days. Is that Luby? Luby waved a hand casually. Hey, mate, how's it going? You're, you're infected. Yeah, we already covered that. Sean got me back at the cottage, didn't he? I feel fine, though. In fact, I feel better than I've done in months. I'm not going to hurt anyone. I just want to be someplace warm and safe. We can't let you in, said Tom. It's too dangerous. He said we can tie him up, said Ryan. Tom rolled his eyes. What a wonderful idea. Let's put the monster on a leash and see how that goes. He's not a monster. He's Luby. He's infected. It's only a matter of time before he becomes an abomination. Luby rapped lightly on the glass with his knuckles. You know, I can hear you, right? You can't come in, said Tom. Luby grunted. I didn't want to do this, mate. But you remember the time you were stranded in Skegness after that girl you were seeing took off with a dude that ran the waltzers? Who was it that drove hours to come and get you from Butlin's car park? How about you return the favour and help a mate out, yeah? We were 19, Luby, and the two situations are hardly the same. You needed my help and I was there. How is it different? Ryan didn't like this. Having an infected person inside with them seemed like the stupidest idea ever, yet he couldn't turn his back on one of his oldest friends. Luby was the one who was always there when you needed a favour, the one who would never refuse to help you, no matter the situation. I wasn't there when he had cancer, but I can be there now. He's not going to die alone. Ryan took Tom to one side. I can't leave him there, man. He saved me back at the cottage. He's infected because of me. I won't turn my back on him while he's still, you know, him. And how long until he isn't him anymore? How long before he loses his mind and tries to infect the rest of us? We tie him up, just like he said. We'll put him in the office behind the bar. Then even if he turns, he won't be able to hurt anybody. Tom glanced at Luby, still waiting patiently behind the glass, then back at Ryan. It's a foolish decision, but I suppose I agree. We can't turn our backs on him. Before Tom changed his mind or anyone else came in and interfered, Ryan shoved the door release and allowed Luby inside. He and Tom then stood anxiously waiting to be attacked and wondering if this had been a mistake. Luby frowned at them both. Relax, I'll wait until you're asleep before I kill you. When they failed to laugh, Luby groaned. That was a joke. Can I get a drink? I'm gasping. Ryan nodded. You should come and meet the others first. The others? There are more of you? Yes, said Tom. But I have a feeling they're not going to like you. How could anyone not like me? Ryan pushed open the door to the tea room where everyone was resting. Cameron was asleep and making growl-like snores. Stuart and Gavin were snoozing on the bar, faces buried in their arms. Helen was the only one still alert, and when she saw Luby, she leapt up and grabbed an empty Coke bottle off the bar. Ryan threw his hands up. Whoa, whoa, it's okay, it's okay. Oh, I'm there, fuck it, wee. Everyone jolted awake, lifting their weary heads and looking towards the toilets. When they saw Luby, they reacted in the same way as Helen, leaping to their feet and panicking. Somehow Cameron remained asleep, his snoring providing a background bass track. He's infected, said Helen in a cold, emotionless voice. Get away from him. He's our friend, said Ryan, looking at Tom, who didn't add his voice to his defence, but he did at least nod. He needs to go right now, said Helen, her eyes smouldering like coal pits. Before I kill him, stand him away and I'll kill you too, Ryan. I should have already after what you did to my boy. What I did to you? Helen, what are you talking about? Luby turned to Ryan, clearly saddened by the hostility. Maybe I should just go. No, said Ryan firmly. We've already been over this. We'll tie you up in the office. It'll be okay. Miles wiped sleep from his eyes and seemed eager to say something. Do you know this person, Ryan? Yes, he's one of my best mates. Back up at the cottage, he saved me and Aaron. Luby glanced around. Where is our kid anyway? We got separated, said Ryan, and he had to hide inside a skip. I'm going to get out as soon as I've got some strength back. I'll be right there with you, mate. Cheers. Enough, said Helen, 
and she approached with a glass Coke bottle raised over her head. Enough talking! Fiona reached out and grabbed her by the arm. Just hold on a sec, Hal. Helen shrugged out of her grasp and snarled. For a second, it looked like she might smash the bottle off Fiona's forehead. Don't touch me! Don't you fucking touch me! Fiona put her hands up and took a step backwards. Let's just stick to words for now, okay? There's been enough fighting. Luby moved past Ryan and Tom and stood in an open area next to the dance floor. When he spoke, he focused on Helen. My name's Lewis. I travelled here to the middle of nowhere to be with my mates and have a good time. Instead, I had to watch two of them die, and I'm fairly certain I'll be following them soon. It's obvious you've all been through some proper horrible shit in the last couple of days, but so have I. All I want to do now is to sit down in the warm with some food and water to pretend things are okay for a while, because a while is probably all I have left. But if you want me to leave, understand and I'll sling me up. He looked at Ryan and offered a regretful smile. This was no monster. This was their friend, Luby. He's just a bit green. Tom sighed. Look, he finally said, you all have no reason to let Luby stay here but I can vouch that he's a good person. We should take care of him like we would any other sick person. It's not his fault. I agree, said Miles, and it raises an important question. What do we do if any of us get infected? How will we behave, like Christians or Neanderthals? If it's me, said Helen, still clutching the Coke bottle above her head, fucking put me down. I refuse to be one of these things. Screw that, said Chloe. What if there's a cure? What if there's a wee chance our immune system can, like, fight it off or whatever? She's right, said Ryan. We don't know that everyone infected turns into one of those monsters. The truth is, we don't know anything about this thing, not really. I feel okay, said Luby, shrugging his bony shoulders. Maybe my body's fighting it, like the hot indie girl said. Chloe blushed. Thanks. I'm okay with him staying, said Fiona, wringing her hands together in her lap. So long as he's tied up, if I get infected, I would hope for the same compassion. As would I, said Miles. Whatever happens, we have to keep a hold on our humanity. Sick or not sick, this man is still aware of himself. Who would we be to turn him away? Enough! Helen lunged at Luby, obvious in her intent. Ryan moved to stop her, but Luby fanned out both of his arms and blocked him from getting past. He did nothing to defend himself. If you want to kill me, said Luby, then you should just do it. I've been fighting cancer for six months and now this bollocks. Tell you the truth, you'll be doing me a favour. It's okay. Go ahead, love. Helen swung the bottle, but it halted inches from Luby's skull. Her arm shook like she was fighting for control of her own body. The whole time, Luby just stood there, looking at her. A few seconds passed, and Helen tossed the bottle away with a grunt. It thudded against the dance floor and rolled away. One wrong move, she said, and I'll slice your face open. Before Luby could reply, she stormed off into the kitchen, the saloon doors swinging behind her. Luby bent double and let out a massive puff of air. Fuck me. I was certain she were going to pay me with that thing. That's one scary lass. Ryan went to pat his friend on the back, but stopped himself, not wanting to make contact. She's been through a lot, more than any of us. Can I just ask something? It was Stuart, speaking from over by the bar. You said this English fella's infected, right? But what does that mean, exactly? Yeah, said Gavin next to him. What does it mean? Everyone turned to look at the two friends, all of them wearing expressions of disbelief. What do you think it means, said Chloe? If you're infected, you turn into one of them. Most likely, said Luby, holding up a hand with green flecked fingers. But not for definite. Gavin frowned. One of them? You mean like Mr. Falco? Chloe nodded. Like we told you, this thing is all over the village, it spreads. Stuart's face fell in horror. 
He unbuttoned another button on his shirt and wafted it like he needed to cool down. Oh, fucking hell. Miles stepped forwards, moving up alongside the bar and staring at the young man suspiciously. Stuart lad, you appear worried. Are you infected? He shook his head. No, but I am, said Gavin, rolling up his t-shirt to reveal a patch of green fuzz on his pudgy white shoulder. Mr Falco must have scratched me before I made it inside the cupboard. I never even felt it. What's going to happen to me? Luby went and patted Gavin on the back. It means you and me are going to be cellmates. Don't worry, I'm a fun guy. Everyone groaned. Then they searched for rope. The only thing Aaron heard was dogs barking. The infected didn't make a lot of noise, which meant he had no idea where they were or how many of them there were. For all he knew, there could be a hundred waiting right outside the skip, or none at all. Every second, he fought with the urge to take a peek from beneath the tarp and see what was happening. The skip was mostly empty, but there were piles of putrid cardboard and other moist things he couldn't see. It was hard to breathe and even harder to stay calm. All things considered, he was pretty miserable. At the cottage, things had happened so quickly that there'd been no time to think. He'd been with his brother and his friends during that initial horror. But now the hopelessness of the situation washed over him. He and Ryan had headed to the village to find help, but they'd only ended up in an even worse situation. Everyone's infected? No, not everyone. That little boy, Andy. While Aaron had witnessed Brett, Sean and Luby die, seeing a child bleed to death was something he just couldn't get out of his mind. If a child could die, what hope was there for anyone else? Ryan is probably dead already. He could be lying in a pool of blood only a few metres away and I wouldn't even know it. If he was alive, he would have come back for me, wouldn't he? The dogs outside continued to bark. They sounded close. Aaron wondered how they'd got outside and formed into a pack. This was Scotland, not the Colombian slums he'd seen in some Netflix show or other. If the dogs were all outside, the owners were likely dead or infected. If there were any survivors beyond those from the church, he would have heard them fighting or calling for help by now. And where was help? The fact that not even the police had shown up worried Aaron no end. Was it because they didn't know what was happening in the village, or were they unable to help because they were dealing with their own problems? How far has this thing spread? The dogs kept barking, anxious and shrill. If they had any sense, they would run for the hills. Which are probably crawling with infected wildlife. Okay, Alan, stop thinking like this. You always do this. You always assume the worst. He couldn't hide inside this skip forever. It didn't matter how terrified he was, hiding wouldn't get him out of the situation. He was a man dying of thirst with a glass of clear liquid in front of him. It could be poison, but he was dead anyway if he didn't risk taking a sip. It was time to lift the tarp. Aaron had been vaguely aware of the sun rising, the darkness inside the skip lifting ever so slightly, but the intensity of it flooding into his eyes as he lifted the tarp was painful, and it took a few seconds for his pupils to adjust. There were infected people everywhere. Aaron froze, certain one of the monsters would spot him at any moment. They were mostly standing still, but every now and then they would break into some kind of fit, like they were being jolted by electricity. Heads snapping left and right, tendrils thrashing back and forth. Just when they reached a complete frenzy, rockets about to take off, they would stop and go still again. Then a few seconds would pass and they did the whole performance again. It's the dogs. Every time they bark. Aaron lifted the tarp a little higher. The skip was five feet above the ground, which meant it was easier for him to see the infected people than it was for them to see him. The more time that passed, the more confident he became that he wasn't about to get spotted. No commonality seemed to exist among the fungus-covered strangers. There were men, women and children of all descriptions. Only one thing was certain. No one was safe. No one was immune. The dogs barked again and the infected went haywire. 
The assorted mutts were gathered at the side of the road, five or six of them. They showed no fear, only aggression. The infected don't like the sound. It makes them spaz out. Maybe I can get out of here while they're distracted. I could find Ryan. No, not yet. Just a little while longer. Help might still come. I should stay here. Help might still come. Aaron slipped back beneath the tarp, his mind running a mile a minute. Suddenly things seemed a little less dark and the chance of escape a little less hopeless. Help will come. Chapter 6 A few hours had passed since Luby's arrival at the club and everyone cautiously settled down. Nobody had managed to find rope to tie up Luby and Gavin, which was no surprise really, seeing as rope wasn't exactly an everyday item anymore. Gavin had clearly been rattled by his diagnosis that his wound would likely result in him becoming a monster like Mr. Falco. But besides growing decidedly pale, he had hidden his fear well. He made jokes and tried to laugh it off the same way Luby did. In fact, they hadn't shut up since the group had locked them in Mr. Falco's office. Their childish giggles constantly interrupted the silence, but no one gave them a hard time about it. They were dead men walking. Let them enjoy their final moments. Even Cameron had accepted their presence upon waking up and being brought up to speed, although he had argued for their removal for a while, almost like it was his duty to do so. They'll kill us all in our sleep, he had warned. Bloody idiots. He's probably right. Gavin and Luby will probably kill us in their sleep. No, Luby might still be okay. Chloe was right when she said there's a chance some people could fight the infection. No disease is 100% lethal, right? People always survive. Luby's been sick for more than 12 hours. He's still holding on. Sean was covered in green fuzz by now. Brett had turned even faster. Maybe Luby will be okay. Please be okay, mate. Ryan was lying on the dance floor staring up at the ceiling. It wasn't as comfy as the carpet and colder. The room was stuffy and although the sunlight was weak, it amplified as it shone through the large glass windows. The frigid wooden boards felt good against Ryan's back. Tom lay nearby, also staring at the ceiling. He seemed troubled, which was hardly surprising. You okay, mate? Ryan asked him. No, me neither. We need to leave soon and get Aaron. If we're quick, I think we can outrun the greens. I'm staying here. What are you talking about, mate? We need to get to Aaron as soon as we can if he tries to escape on his own. Tom turned his head and looked across the dance floor at Ryan. No, you need to get Aaron. He's your brother, not mine. I'm staying here and waiting for rescue. It's the only smart choice. Ryan couldn't believe what he was hearing. You're the one who told me back at the church that help wasn't coming. What if it never does? I wasn't thinking clearly. If there's even a small chance of someone turning up and taking control of this crisis, then I'm going to do whatever I have to do to survive long enough to see it. There's food here, water. Only a fool would leave. I have no choice, Tom. Tom turned his head and stared back up at the ceiling. But I do. Ryan stared at the side of Tom's head, wondering if his friend had been replaced by a stranger. How could he be so selfish? What if it was him trapped inside a skip? Ryan's blood was boiling, so he got up and walked away. Maybe, with a little time to think, Tom would change his mind. He'd been friends with Ryan for a decade and had known Aaron just as long. Surely he wouldn't turn his back. He's just scared. People had been sleeping for a couple of hours now, but the room was beginning to stir. Miles was already up sitting at the bar next to Cameron and sipping from a glass of something fizzy and see-through. When he saw Ryan awake, he nodded. Managed to get any kip, lad? A little. Tell you the truth, I'm busting me neck to get out of here. Miles nodded. Your brother? I can't leave him out there by himself. I've already let him down by waiting this long. The situation gave you no choice, lad. The last we saw of your brother, he was safe. Ryan sat down on a stool and slumped onto the bar. But who knows what happened since then? He might have tried to escape. He could be dead, said Cameron, 
sitting on the other side of the vicar, swigging from a bottle of lager. Miles hissed at him. Candor is not always welcome, Cameron. Aye, but that's the only setting I have. That wee lad's as fucked as a food in a whorehouse. Ryan's fists clenched. I'm getting really tired of your alpha male bullshit, Cameron. My what now? This whole tough guy act. I get it. You're a big manly Scot, but talking about my brother like that is going to get you smack in the gob. Cameron tossed back his stool and moved to confront Ryan. Miles hopped off his own stool to get between them and prodded the big Scot's chest with an index finger. Ryan's right. And if you didn't learn to get along, it'll be me that smacks your one in the kisser. You're a self-centred man, Cameron Pollock. Always have been. But right now, we need you. We need your strength and courage. The testosterone, though, you can keep. The backhanded flattery worked like a charm, and Cameron sat back down, picking up his lager and resuming his drinking after a brief grumble. Miles turned to Ryan and sighed. I expect better from you as well. Ryan nodded. Although he was in no mood to apologise, Tom's selfishness might have been contagious because all he wanted to do was leave these people behind. They weren't his friends, and certainly not his family. They were strangers. They didn't give a shit about Aaron. Luby's laughter floated out of the office and reminded Ryan that he at least had one mate left. For a second, he had a terrible thought. Why can't Tom be the one who's infected? The guilt came immediately, and Ryan reminded himself that Tom was probably just as stressed out and tired as he was. It wasn't fair to oblige him to risk his life. I've been thinking, said Miles, pulling Ryan from his thoughts, before anyone considers leaving, perhaps there's a way we can get a better sense of what's going on outside. What do you mean? Miles pointed to the hatch above the dance floor. If we can get up into the loft, we might be able to make an opening in the roof. It'll allow us a good view of the village. How will that help us? We know what's out there. A shitload of infected people and a pack of annoying dogs that won't stop barking. Yes, but what else? There could be other people in the village trying to stay alive. I understand wanting to help your brother, but it's not only about you and him. We need to help everyone we can. There's no one out there. Everyone's infected. Cameron clonked his beer down on the bar. For once, I agree with English. I don't see what's point in putting a hole in the ceiling. Only thing it'll do is let in the cold. It's easy enough to patch up a hole, said Miles. But I don't like the fact we're blind here. If nothing else, it'll allow us to see how many of those things are right outside the door. If we need to leave in a hurry, it would be good to know where to head, don't you think? Those out there might congregate in one area, allowing us to move to another. It never hurts to know more. Ryan rubbed at his forehead and thought about it. If he could get a good look at the skip, he might be able to see if Aaron was still inside or if he'd made a run for it. Or if he's dead. The most appealing part of the plan was that he might be able to see his brother right now instead of having to sneak his way outside. Maybe he could even get a message to Aaron. Okay, Miles, I'm game. You got a spare ladder? Ha, I'm afraid not, although we could just boost someone up. It's no more than seven or eight feet. I'll give you a bunk up, said Cameron. I've taken bigger shits than you. Ryan thought about it, and it was a sound plan. Cameron probably lifted weights heavier than Ryan for fun. He'd have no problem boosting him up into the hatch. Okay. Let's do it. I can't wait around any more. Miles slid off his stool and Ryan and Cameron followed him to the centre of the dance floor. Tom rose up on his elbow and watched them. What are you doing? Having a wee dance, said Cameron. I'm getting up into the loft, said Ryan, to punch a hole in the roof and try to get a look at what's happening in the village. Tom raised an eyebrow. We know what's happening in the village and it's bad news. Ryan shrugged. Never hurts to know more, does it? I suppose not. Actually, maybe getting up on the roof is a good idea. It'll allow us to signal when help arrives. If it arrives, said Cameron, and he grabbed a chair and slid it over. 
The racket it made was loud enough to stir the last of the sleepers, and they sat up to watch as Cameron hopped up onto the chair and knocked the hatch loose. It wasn't on a hinge, so it just popped out of its frame and slid to one side. Cameron hopped back down and shoved the chair aside with his knee, making more racket as the legs scraped across the dance floor. He looked at Ryan. You there, the English? Ryan nodded. He put his hands on Cameron's shoulder and waited for the big Scot to lace his hands together. One, two, three. Ryan stepped into Cameron's hands and pushed upwards. The big Scot tossed him up like a caber and Ryan only narrowly avoided smashing his head against the ceiling as he threw his arms out and threaded himself through the gap. He grabbed hold of the edge and scrambled into the loft. Five years ago, the manoeuvre would have been effortless. Now it was clumsy and painful and he took too much weight in his left elbow, scraping it against the wooden frame but he made it without breaking his neck. Inside the loft space, strands of fibreglass from bare clumps of insulation exploded into the air like spores. A bout of coughing and an irritated waft of his hand got most of it out of his face, but his eyes grew dry and itchy. Along with the airborne fibreglass was an abundance of cobwebs, and Ryan shuddered as he imagined thousands of spiders watching him in the dark. Are you safe? Miles shouted up from the dance floor again. Ryan! Ryan turned on his knees and peered back down through the hatch. He felt like a little boy in a treehouse. I'm fine. It's pitch black up here, though. Be careful. Ryan turned back around on his knees and started exploring using his hands to locate the rafters and make sure his weight was spread evenly across them. It was painful, especially on his bad knee but it beat falling through the ceiling. The loft wasn't empty. Ryan soon discovered a row of cardboard boxes. When he shoved a hand into one of them, the contents became clear. Tinsel, fake snow, a wreath. Tis the season. Christmas decorations weren't going to help anyone, so Ryan continued on. The pitched roof was too low to stand up in, but towards the back, a few small gaps let in sunlight from where the lead flashing seemed to have come away. It meant he was able to enjoy a delicate waft of fresh air inside the stuffy, insulated roof space. It also gave him a starting point to make a hole. The small gaps in the flashing were a weak point. Ryan shuffled along carefully. With no plan or experience of roofs, he tried to get a sense of what he was up against. Surprisingly, when he pushed a palm against the slope ceiling, it moved. Other than a layer of insulation, only a thin membrane of material made up the inner roof. He could feel the tiles on the other side. A sound startled Brian, and when he turned towards the hatch, he saw Cameron's big head and wide shoulders rising into the loft. The big Scot grunted and heaved himself up onto the rafters. Ryan waited for him to make his way over a worrying thought forming in his mind. Will these beams hold us both? Hey, we built stuff to last in Scotland. Ah, it's an ancient land it is. Yeah, okay, but all the same, I think we should kneel on different sections. If it'll keep you from wetting your kicks. Cameron moved to the opposite side of the loft and moved in line with Ryan. The small ingress of light allowed them to see each other as they talked. How did you get up here? Climbed on a chair and jumped. Didn't need a boost. Well, you're taller than I am. Six foot three and still growing. Ryan believed the first part, but not the second. He turned back to examine the roof again. Need help, English? Do you know much about roofs? No. Cameron seemed aggravated at having to say that word, like it was some kind of defeat, but at least he was being honest. Me neither, admitted Ryan. Fingers crossed we don't kill ourselves. Get on with it then. Ryan tried to force the roof near the bottom where the gaps were, but nothing moved, so he tried higher up. This time he shoved harder, and beyond the thin membrane, he felt the tiles come loose and fall away. Were roofs really so flimsy? Despite his initial success, Ryan failed to create a gap. The membrane stretched but didn't break. It was like some kind of carpet. Felt 
That's what they use for roofs, right? You want to get a move on, English? I'm trying. There's a sheet of felt in the way. I need to cut through it somehow. Here. Ryan turned and saw Cameron pointing a short knife at him. For a split second, he thought the man was going to stab him, but then he realised he was offering a solution. Ryan took the knife tentatively. What are you doing with this? I took it from the kitchen. We're at war in case you didn't notice. We're not at war. It's an outbreak of... of... Fickers that want to kill us, eh? Sounds like war to me. Ryan shrugged, deciding there was little point in arguing. Words wouldn't change anything for the better. Maybe you're right. Cheers for the knife. Aye, but I want it back. Ryan turned back and stabbed at the membrane with the tip of the blade, pressing harder and harder until it burst through. He toppled forward, heart jumping into his chest as he feared falling through the ceiling. Cameron grabbed the back of his shirt. Whoa, easy there, English. No wonder you're in the wars. Ryan steadied himself. Cheers. I made a cut through the roof. Just a sec, I'll try and make a bigger hole. He plunged the knife back into the slice he'd just made and yanked downwards. Then he twisted the blade and cut upwards at an angle. Once he'd cut a shape somewhere between an L and a V, he retrieved the knife and inserted his fingers. Sunlight spilled into the loft, but when he yanked away a wide strip of felt, a great swathe of it entered the loft. Ryan blinked, dazzled by the sun and blinded by the disturbed fiberglass, now twinkling in the glowing shafts of light. Cameron patted him on the back. Thought for sure you'd make a pig's ear of it. I'll have my knife back now. The last thing Ryan wanted to do was hand Cameron a knife. But getting into a fight inside the loft wasn't smart either. He handed it back without comment, then placed his face against the hole in the roof. Oh, shit. What is it, English? Ryan couldn't describe it, other than to say he saw blood. Lots of it. From up high, he could see the main thoroughfare running through the village. The pavement on either side was littered with bodies. Not everyone had been infected. Some people were just dead their blood turning the concrete reddish-brown beneath the feet of their fungus-ridden killers. Ryan quickly counted two dozen greens before giving up hopelessly. Most stood in small huddles, dotted all over the place, a few shuffled in and out of buildings, possibly hunting for survivors. A majority were completely still. One green in particular was trapped in the shattered windscreen of a blue Ford KA, legs kicking up the air as it fought to get free. About midway down the road, a house was on fire, black smoke belching from its windows. There's no one left, said Ryan. The whole village is dead or infected. The bodies is... it's bad. How many greens? asked Cameron, seeming uninterested in anything else. I don't know. hundred, maybe more. They're all over the place. The car park outside is full of them. I don't see anywhere safe to head to. Let me see. Cameron barged Ryan aside and placed his face to the gap. I couldn't see much further than the church, said Ryan. Cameron looked for a full minute before turning away with a frown upon his face. There's no out there but death and disease. Like I've been saying all along, we're on our own. Ryan sighed. He didn't want to accept the truth, but the truth was an angry bear staring him down. It couldn't be ignored. Did you see the skip? I need to know if my brother's still inside. Cameron put his face back to the gap. Hey, I can see his little fish poking out. He's alive, all right? Returning the favour, Ryan shoved Cameron aside and placed his face back against the gap. This time, he immediately located the skip. It wasn't far, a hundred metres or so. It was, of course, still sitting upon the lorry next to the grassy common, and sure enough, the tarp was slightly raised, a pair of eyes looking out into the watery sunlight. What's he doing? The greens are going to spot him. Hi, you idiot. A group of seven or eight greens stood motionless around the common, currently unaware of Aaron's presence, but that might change at any moment. Despite the danger, Ryan couldn't help but grin. He's alive. He's okay. 
Hey, lad was smart enough to stay put. I need to get to him. Cameron barked with laughter. Good luck, pal. There's an army of greens between you and him. You'll not make it halfway. What choice do I have? He's my brother, Cameron. You wouldn't understand, wouldn't I? You reckon I don't have a brother? I have a brother. Ryan cleared his throat, frustration swept aside by the shame of his assumption. Sorry, don't be. The fat fud loves in Portsmouth. Cameron shuffled onto another rafter. Okay, I'm heading back, Dune. This is done now except show us what we already knew. Help me get me brother, Cameron. Ryan didn't know why he said it, but it was either desperation or naivety. Now that he had, he would have to go with it. Cameron turned back on the rafters. You what? Help me rescue Aaron. He's just a kid. I ain't risking my neck for no fucking English. Ryan fumed. Enough with that bollocks, okay. I'm not some greedy investment banker from Chelsea. I'm no different to you beside the accent. Be the decent bloke I know you are and help me. Cameron didn't speak. He crouched in the loft, staring for several moments, until eventually he let out a sigh. If those greens find your wee brother, they'll tear him apart. Exactly. And then there'll be one less English in the world. Cameron shrugged. Shoots me. Ryan's mouth fell open. He knew there were people in the world with immovable prejudices, yet he was genuinely shocked that a person could be so callous. Cameron would happily see Aaron die for no other reason than he'd been born a few hundred miles in the wrong direction. It was hatred for hatred's sake. Ryan looked forlornly out of the hole in the roof, hoping to catch Aaron's eye and let him know that he hadn't been forgotten about. Instead, he saw a black spot moving in the sky. Chapter 7 Ryan clawed at the felt membrane and the roof tiles beyond, trying to make the hole bigger. The moss-covered tiles were affixed by nails, and several of them crumbled rather than fell away whole. With each passing second, his panic grew. He had to make a hole large enough to stand up in. He had to give a signal before it was too late. A helicopter? I can't believe it! The small aircraft appeared as little more than a bug against the dreary grey sky, but Ryan could hear the distant drone of its rotors echoing off the undulating landscape. Cameron hadn't yet dropped back down through the hatch, so when he saw Ryan's erratic scrabbling, he turned around and came back. What's going to you? There's a helicopter in the sky. Where else would a helicopter be, you ball bag? Just take a look. Cameron shuffled back to the hole and placed his face against it. His neck swivelled back and forth for a few seconds, and then he started shouting, Tongue my fart box, you right. That's a helicopter up there! We have to signal it! Hey! Cameron tore at the felt with his huge hands, making much lighter work of it than Ryan had. The tiles fell away in clumps, smashing to the ground ten feet below. Ryan winced at the noise, wondering if it would attract the greens from the car park. Half a minute later, Cameron had created a hole wide enough for both of them to get through. The roof had a shallow pitch, which made it easy enough to stand. Ryan shuffled out of the hole and leant against the section of the roof behind him, holding himself steady with one hand. The helicopter was closer now, twice as large against the sky. The greens in the car park were all looking upwards, alerted by the aircraft's engines. Several of them whipped their talons in the air, and Ryan laughed at their futile attempts. They can't stop us being rescued. Cameron waved his arms too, unleashing a stale waft from his armpits. Ryan didn't hold it against the man, he probably smelled none too fresh himself. The two of them yelled at the clouds like pagan worshippers in the throes of ecstasy. The pilot wouldn't hear them, of course, but it was instinct. It was desperation. Help us! Please help us! Just fucking over here! The chopper got closer and closer, but then it banked left, seeming to skirt the village completely. Cameron started shouting louder, as if he really thought the pilot might hear him. 
the noise started to attract the greens in their droves. And when Ryan glanced down, he saw several of them outside the club. They were staring up at the roof and whipping their talons. Ryan put a hand on Cameron's back. Not so loud! Cameron didn't seem to hear. He continued bellowing at the sky. Ryan patted him on the back harder. Hey, Cameron, you're attracting attention. Keep your voice down. Get off of me! Cameron swatted Ryan away, his focus fixated on the departing helicopter. Accidentally, his elbow struck Ryan's chin, and Ryan squawked in pain as his lights went out. When he opened them again a split second later, the world was tilting. He tried to grab hold of something, but could no longer tell which way was up. English! Cameron's face rolled away from Ryan as he tumbled. A swarm of sliding roof tiles went with him. The sky was above him, then below, then above him again. His body became weightless. Not weightless. I'm falling. Ryan threw out an arm and managed to grab hold of the roof, scuttering, but the thin plastic snapped and did nothing to stop his descent. Ryan's screams were cut off by his body splatting against the ground. He couldn't move. The greens were everywhere. English, get up! Ryan lay there, staring up at the sky and watching the droning black dot getting smaller and smaller. The helicopter was leaving. Had it seen them? He couldn't breathe, his lungs like blocks of cement. Then a gasp of wind escaped him like a widow's wail before his lungs seized up once again and silenced him. Need to move, need to get up. Despite his pain and lack of breath, Ryan managed to roll onto his hands and knees. He'd landed amongst the shrubs, along with the dewy grass and moist soil they'd broken his fall. A few feet in another direction, and he would have fallen right amongst the greens in the car park. They were approaching him now from all sides, tripping as they tried to navigate their way through the bushes and overgrown flower beds. Gotta get up! Gotta get out of here! His right leg was numb. His left knee felt like someone had inserted a pool cue into his patella. He climbed out of the flower bed in agony, still trying to catch his breath. Another second passed. He managed another wailing gasp. The greens were all around the car park and closing in fast. The only place to go was alongside the building, moving past the windows. Ryan looked in through one of them and saw shadows shifting inside. Was anyone coming to help him? An obese man stumbled into the bushes ahead, blocking Ryan's path. It raised a fuzz-covered tendril, but was interrupted as something struck its head and shattered into pieces. Ryan glanced up and saw Cameron balancing on the roof, holding a pair of loose tiles in his hand. Get your ass in gear, English! Ryan considered bolting for the car park and trying to make it to his brother, but there were too many greens in the way. As Cameron has said, he wouldn't even make it halfway. Another tile struck the obese green and knocked it backwards. Its legs tangled in the bushes and it fell over, opening up a path for Ryan that he had no option but to take. He stomped his way through the bushes, biting his top lip to bear the pain of his left knee. Ahead lay the trees that lined the car park and the beginnings of the chain-link fence running around the bowling greens. With the bushes finished, Ryan hopped onto the tarmac. There was only one car parked to the rear of the club, a BMW X3, and he assumed it had belonged to Mr. Falco. There was no reason to pay it any mind until a green stepped out from behind it. There's no place to go, I'm surrounded. Ryan kept moving, trapped between the chain-link fence and the open tarmac of the car park. He might be able to make it to the trees, but that would leave him all on his own, and there was no chance of rescuing Aaron without the other's help. Seeing no other option, he turned toward the chain-link fence and leapt at it. With his wounded knee, he only managed to launch himself two feet into the air, but he managed to cling onto the links with both hands and one foot. He climbed the fence as if it were a great big net, adrenaline taking over where his body failed. 
Two seconds and he'd reached the top, but his ascent was abruptly halted by barbed wire. I'm screwed. Ryan yelped as pain sparked through his foot. Beneath him stood the green that had emerged from behind the BMW. It had struck him with a talon and was preparing to do so again. Another tile smashed, this time against the ground, but it was enough to momentarily distract the green. Ryan looked over and saw Cameron reaching down to grab another. English hating bigot or not, he was doing his best to help. More greens closed in around the fences. If he didn't make it over the top right now, he was a dead man. There was no choice. He grabbed the top of the fence, palms stinging as metal spikes pierced his flesh, and threw himself over. The barbed wire tore at his clothing and bit at the exposed skin of his arm. As he fell, a spike raked at the inside of his forearm. Ryan hit the earth again, this time taking most of the fall on his left hip. This time he couldn't get up, no matter how hard he tried. Blood gushed from his arm. His left leg was a dead weight. All he could do was crawl. The grass was clipped short, soft like a carpet. He had to fight the urge to collapse and go to sleep. Somehow he kept on surviving. Except this time, one of them got me. Ryan couldn't feel anything in his foot, but he knew the green had got him. If its talon had broken through his trainer and sliced his flesh, don't think about it now, just keep moving. Ryan dragged himself along the lawn until he made it to the corner of the building. He rounded it on his belly and found it himself coming up on large plate glass windows that ran the whole length of the bowls club rear. Everyone was inside, but none of them saw him. None of them knew he was there. Except for Tom. Tom was right there, looking out at Ryan. Ryan was almost too weak to make a sound. Tom? Tom, help me. Tom made no move to help. His expression was oddly vacant. Please, Tom. Tom's eyes flicked upwards, and his face finally cracked into something resembling concern. But it wasn't for Ryan. He was looking at something further away. With his belly on the ground, Ryan twisted his neck to look behind him. Across the lawns, a pair of greens stumbled towards him. Both were dressed the same, white jumpers, white trousers and white flat caps. Two old men ready for a game of bowls. Fate clearly had other plans. A corkscrew sat buried in the centre of the lawn beside a ride on lawnmower. If the mower hadn't been parked there, they would have spotted the corkscrew from inside the tea room. They had been resting only 30 metres from it the whole time. The two oldies were heading towards Ryan quickly, probably faster than they'd moved in years. They would be on top of Ryan in less than a minute, and he still couldn't make it past a crawl. In fact, even that was too much. He was getting slower and slower. His entire body turned to stone, yet he kept on going, heading towards the nearby patio area as if it were a boat in the ocean. He'd escaped death several times this weekend. Perhaps his luck could hold up one more time? The club's back door opened. Fiona and Chloe appeared and raced towards Ryan, while Miles kept the door open for them. Ryan reached out to them like a baby waiting to be picked up. When they grabbed him underneath the armpits, they were rough and impatient, but he was glad to feel their hands on his body. He wanted to smother them both in kisses. Come on, Ryan, use your legs, Fiona urged him. I can't. Do it or die. Fiona wrapped his left arm around her neck and battled to get him onto his feet. Once he was upright, his legs worked a little better. The left so stiff he used it like a crutch. The two elderly greens were only ten feet away now and gaining fast. Chloe and Fiona dragged Ryan to the patio door. Once there, Fiona shoved him in the back and sent him hurtling into Miles, who grabbed him and swung him inside. The two women were right behind him. The door slammed shut. Ryan collapsed onto the carpet, gasping for breath and grunting in agony. 
The greens threw themselves against the glass, its protection suddenly seeming extremely fragile. Blood covered Ryan from a dozen cuts and a badly sliced right forearm. Terror coursed through his veins. My foot, he said. I need to look at my foot. Nobody understood what he was talking about, so he was forced to use the last of his strength to sit up and grasp his trainer. He slid it off and tossed it aside, then frantically examined himself. At first he saw nothing, but then his thin polyester sock had a tiny rip at the side of his foot. When he pulled the two edges apart, he saw blood. Shit! 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 I'm infected! Ryan turned his head, unable to look at his wound. Fiona leant over and put her hands against his chest to make him lie back down. He was panicking, a shambling monster rising up in his guts and trying to take control of him. The numbness in his limbs gave way to terror. Don't touch me! One of those things slashed me! I'm infected! Fiona pushed down harder on his chest. Calm down. I'll take a look. She pulled off his sock and everyone gathered around. Miles knelt beside Ryan and squinted, tilting his head left and right to get a better view of the foot. The sunlight bounced off his bald dome. It's just your pinky too, Miles finally said. The tiniest of scratches. Chloe lifted something in front of Ryan, his trainer. The mesh covering the toe had torn wide open. Looks like your shoe took the worst of it. Ryan threw his head back and groaned. I'm infected. No, you're not. Fiona got right in his face, weight still on his chest. She removed one hand and waved her burnt forearm in front of him. I got scratched too, but you saved me. Now we're going to figure out a way to save you. Cameron appeared at the back of the huddle. Give the lad some air. You're pecking at him like a flock of hens. Everyone moved aside as Cameron manhandled Ryan onto a chair. He cried out in pain, but the big Scot showed little compassion. He couldn't feel the scratch on his toe. His body was too broken from the fall to feel anything, except for an overall draining agony. If he hadn't landed in the flower beds, things would have been much worse. He could have broken his back. As it was, his worst wound was his badly bleeding right forearm. Although that's not the injury I'm worried about. I'm so screwed. Fiona marched over to the bar and yanked a bottle of vodka off the wall, ripping the optic away with it and leaving behind a hole. She took a quick swig and returned to Ryan, handing him the remainder of the bottle and telling him to drink as much as you can. A drink was exactly the thing he needed so he received the bottle greedily. As he lifted it towards his lips, he noticed Tom standing on the outskirts of the group looking pale. Ryan tipped the bottle at him in a salute. Here's to the worst stag party in history. Bottoms up! He swigged from the bottle until his burning throat could take no more, and he was forced to pull it away from his lips. Gasping, he thrust the bottle away. Fiona took it, then startled everyone by smashing it over the back of a chair. Miles shielded his face and yelled, The blazes are you doing, woman? What needs to be done? Hold him down. Ryan didn't understand, but Cameron obviously did, because he lunged at Ryan. Ryan tried to fight him off, but he was too weak. The big Scot wrapped an arm around him from behind and held him. Following suit, Miles grabbed Ryan's right leg and trapped it under his armpit. I like your style, said Cameron, looking at Fiona. But a knife might work a wee bit better than a broken bottle. Lift my shirt, there's a blade under my belt. Okay, got it. This is insane, said Stuart, backing off towards the bar. You can't do this. It's the only way, said Chloe. If you hadn't been hiding in a cupboard, you'd know that. Just get on with it, said Helen. She was the only one who hadn't come over, and she was sitting at the other side of the room. She pointed at the plate glass windows. Oh, toss him outside to let Ted and John finish their job. Honestly, I'd prefer it. Ryan looked back, 
and watched the two elderly bowls players. They were whipping at the grass constantly. It was only his panic that allowed him to ignore the noise. Ted and John. Helen must have known them. Because everyone knows everyone in this goddamn village. The banging at the front door recommenced, the greens once again eager to get inside. Ryan's fall from the roof had been like chum in the water and all the sharks were back. Fiona approached Ryan with Cameron's knife and a feral look in her eyes. Suddenly, it was a lot easier to imagine her inside a jail cell. Ryan struggled to get up, terrified by what was coming. Cameron crushed him with his thick arms, barring his feeble attempts to escape. Stop struggling, English. Let's just get it over with. No, no, don't shit. Okay, yeah, just do it. Fiona knelt next to Miles, who still had Ryan's leg trapped under his armpit, and got to work. Ryan couldn't see what was happening, so he held his breath and thought about something happier than the effed up situation he currently found himself in. Me and Sophie on honeymoon next year. Mexico. I saw Coronas on the beach. Kissing in the pool. Sex in the hot tub. Stepping on red or glass. Ryan screamed as fire erupted in his foot. He felt a grinding sensation, like his toe was being pushed into a blender. Flesh gave way millimetre by millimetre, and his agony reached a crescendo. Ryan's breath reached its end, and it felt like he was going to push his lungs up through his throat. Then it was over. His body went rigid in the chair for a moment, and then his muscles gave up, and he flopped like a jellyfish. The pain in his foot travelled all the way to his knee, a constant throbbing eased only by the vodka. To top off the wretchedness, a wave of nausea arrived like a tsunami and crashed against his stomach walls. Fiona moved away and leant over a nearby table. She took long breaths in and out. Chloe went and rubbed her back. Stuart babbled in horror over by the bar. Everyone else fell silent. We need to alleviate this, said Miles weakly. It means my foot, my bleeding, dismembered foot. I'll get rid of this, said Fiona. She means my toe, my detached body part. I think I'm going to be sick. Cameron slid over a second chair and Miles placed Ryan's foot on it, allowing him to see the wound for himself. It wasn't as bad as he'd feared, but it was bleeding badly. The warm, slick blood streamed down his foot and dripped onto the chair cushion beneath his heel. Where his little toe had once been was now a ragged morsel of pink flesh with tufts of yellowy white tissue. The nausea tsunami became a geezer and Ryan turned his head sideways. A stinking miasma of half-digested sandwich spattered the carpet. Miles hopped out of the way. Cameron was on the other side of Ryan and he grunted. Can we try to keep our bodily fluids on the inside? Starting to get ripe in here. Sorry, said Ryan, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. It's okay, said Miles. We'll get you patched up and put you to rest. There's a first aid kit in the office, said Stuart weakly. I'll go get it. A prisoners probably need a bathroom break anyway. He wafted a hand in front of his face and grimaced. I could use a walk too. The elderly bowls players whacked at the windows in unison. Tom appeared by Ryan with a bottle of water and handed it over. You okay? Ryan sipped the water slowly, realising he was shaking. He shrugged. What's a pinky toe worth? It's like the most useless bit of our bodies, right? Tom chuckled. Vestigial debris left over from our days climbing trees. You're better off without it, if you ask me. Ryan chuckled. But it added to his misery and made him want to throw up again. So what's with you, man? Tom frowned. What do you mean? I saw you at the window when I was outside. Everyone rushed to help except for you. Even just now you stayed back. What happened to us sticking together? You would have preferred a friend to have cut off your toe? Ryan shrugged, fought down another wave of nausea. Ah, I, I don't know, mate. You just don't seem like yourself. In case you haven't noticed, 
We're in a life or death situation. Our friendship isn't exactly at the top of my priority list. We need to focus on survival and nothing else. I know, but but nothing, Ryan. I'm not dying here in the land of haggis and bagpipes. Christ, I didn't even want to come up here in the first place. I knew this weekend to be a nightmare. Oh, you suspected this might happen, did you? Of course not. But I knew things would turn ugly somehow. Sean, for one thing. Ryan sighed. Sean's gone, man. Uh, yes, I know that, but I... Oh, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Just get some rest, okay? Looks like a bus backed up over you. Feel like it, too? Look, I'm sorry, man. I'm just stressed out. It's no surprise. But we're safe now. Ryan looked back at the elderly bowls players. How long before they found a way in? Or one of the many greens gathered at the front of the building? Stuart exited at the back area behind the bar. He was carrying a green first aid box. Gavin walked alongside him, the fuzz now covering most of his left cheek and starting to creep around his eyeball. Sweat stained his t-shirt around his armpits and neck, and he moved stiffly like an old man, otherwise he seemed in good spirits. He nodded at Ryan as he came out from behind the bar. Heard about your wee too. That's rough, Paul. I'll live, hopefully. How are you holding up? Gavin shrugged, his misshapen t-shirt lifting slightly and exposing his belly. My bladder's bowling, but I feel good. Reckon I can beat this thing? I hope so, said Ryan, remembering that Sean had felt fine too. Stuart approached with the first aid kit while Gavin tottered off towards the toilets. He opened the lid and pulled out a roll of bandages. Gors first, said Miles, keeping watch from nearby. In fact, give it here, lad, I'll do it. Miles took the first aid kit, then snatched the bottle of water from Ryan's hand. He used the water to rinse the wound, then put the gauze to good use. A few minutes later, he patted Ryan on the knee and smiled. All taken care of. Let me take a look at that arm too. Ryan thrust out his bleeding forearm, amazed by how much damage the human body could take. He had smashed his knee to pieces, fallen off a roof, slashed his arm, and survived a DIY toe removal, all without passing out. It completely changed how he saw himself. As weak as he was, he felt resilient and strong. Tough. I hate to ask great now, said Miles. But did you manage to see anything from up in the loft? In his fear and pain, Ryan had forgotten all about the reason he'd got himself hurt in the first place. Shite, how the hell did I forget? There was helicopter. Miles' eyes went wide. A what? He's late, said Cameron, smacking his forehead as if to chide himself for forgetting too. There was a chopper. Went right over our heads, it did. Everyone heard this news and gathered around. Miles shook his head incredulously. I thought I heard something, but I never imagined. A helicopter, you see. Did it see us? Who knows, said Cameron, but even if it did, it may seem to be interested in us. All right, hurry it, we're in. He glanced at Ryan. Flew off into the distance right after English took his dive. Ryan groaned. Who do you think it was? Probably heading for one of the rigs, said Stuart. My Uncle Jamie used to work on one. They go in and out by chopper all the time. Tom perched against the edge of a table and scratched at his chin thoughtfully. How many oil rigs are there in the North Sea exactly? Loads, said Chloe. Almost two hundred, said Cameron. All of them run by greedy corporations that don't give a shit about Scotland. That sucks, said Ryan. Surprised to learn such a thing. Tom tutted loudly. Why does it? I suppose Cameron and a bunch of his mates would pull up the oil out of the sea themselves otherwise. It takes a corporation to undertake an operation of such magnitude. It takes nothing away from ordinary people. Like hell, it doesn't it, said Cameron. Tom rolled his eyes. Do you enjoy having light and warmth? How about plastic? Petrol? Well, that's thanks to the corporations you hate so much. How can you be so narrow-minded? Cameron bunched his hands into fists and strode toward Tom. There was no one in the way to stop him or anyone so inclined. 
so he made it right up in front of him. You're starting to annoy me, posh lad. Likewise, you ignorant jock. Cameron did what everyone would probably have expected him to do. He threw a punch. The blow rocked Tom backwards and sent him crashing into a table. Somehow he managed to bounce off it and land on a chair, almost like it was rehearsed. He proceeded to rub at his jaw like he'd just woken from a dream where a donkey had kicked him. To Ryan's recollection, Tom had never been hit before. He was asking for it, though. Tom, of all people, what's got into him? Miles hurried over to put a stop to things before they could go any further. That's enough, Cameron. You can't go around hitting people. Right now, I can do what the fuck I like. Cameron stormed off towards the bar and shouted back over his shoulder. And I'm tired of pretending otherwise. Next time I'll feed him to the greens. Tom shook his head, a look of utter contempt on his face. This is the world we live in. A place where thugs and wastrels prosper. I say, let it burn. There's no reason to think like that, said Miles. Tom sneered. Are you blind? Look at the dregs we have in this very room. Cameron, a thug. Fiona, an ex-con. Chloe, a vapid teenager. Fuck you, said Chloe, standing near the bar. I didn't know what that means, but fuck you all the same. Tom huffed. You see? And what about me? asked Miles. Would you like to put a label on me, lad? Tom sneered, as unkind as Ryan had ever seen him be. You spent your days propagating a lie to fill the coppers of a corrupt organisation as old as time. A member of the church, you're beneath contempt, vicar. Faith gives our lives meaning. I'm sorry you can't see that. No, Faith makes your life pointless. Your existence is a joke, and death will be the punchline. This life is all we have, and it's filled with greed, misery, and naive fools like you. Miles reeled, and although he tried to disguise his emotions, the hurt was clear in his eyes. Ryan was too weak to do much, but he managed to shake his head in disgust. You're a piece of shit, Tom. I don't understand what's happened to you. You did! You happened to me, Ryan. I drove hundreds of miles to celebrate the up-and-coming wedding of a loser. You dragged me away from my life to come here. This could have happened anywhere. How was I supposed to know? I'm not dying here, Ryan. I mean it. Not for you. Not for your brother. Not for anyone. Miles sighed. Okay, lad. I understand fear and pain when I see it, so I'll may hold it against you. Go have a drink, though, before you dig yourself deeper. It'll help, I promise. First smart thing you've said all day. Tom got up from the chair unsteadily, rubbing at his jaw and wincing. He stumbled over to the bar where he proceeded to brood, wincing slightly each time there was a bang at the front door or on the glass windows at the rear. Ryan felt embarrassed. He's not usually like that, Miles. Tom's a good bloke, but... Miles cut him off with a raised palm. Not everyone can raise to the occasion in a crisis. Don't judge your friend too harshly. Ryan had expected to be the one defending Tom, but it turned out he didn't need to. Miles was genuinely a good man, not just a blagger in a dog collar. It was nowhere near enough to turn Ryan towards God, certainly not with all he'd witnessed during the last 48 hours, but it at least allowed him to accept the man's faith as a positive thing. Maybe I'll ask him how God could create something like this. Or perhaps it's the other guy, Satan. I don't even want to think about the third option. Fiona came over. She had bandaged her burn and looked a little better. It no longer seemed like she was about to puke. She pulled up a chair beside Ryan and sat down, nodding to his foot. She said, This makes us even, right? More than. I'm just hoping Sophie still accepts me with nine toes. Hey, there are plenty of good parts of you left, I'm sure. After she made the comment, she blushed and seemed eager to change the subject. Anyway, I'm sorry for cutting your bit off. I hope it doesn't hurt too much. The vodka did its job. Thanks for what you did. It must have been hard. No harder than what you did for me. He nodded. You think things can get any worse? 
Nah, that chopper's probably already called for help. This'll all be over by the end of the day. Hot showers all round. You're always so positive, Fee. He smiled to show it wasn't a criticism. It's nice. She shrugged. Positive thought, positive behavior. Another thing I learned in prison. They're very big on self-help and empowerment. Sounds like an amazing place. It's not. I never want to go back there. I have nightmares about it. Despite the tattoos and the various small scars he spotted all over her arms, Fiona didn't seem like someone who would commit a crime. If he had to list one thing about her that suggested any kind of weakness, it was the way she seemed to get lost inside her own head. Haunted, perhaps, was the word he would use. If we get out of this, he told her, you'll be a hero. Prison will be a distant memory. As well as all this, I hope. Gav? Gav? Gavin? Everyone glanced in the direction of the toilets. Stuart stood there, propping open the door that led to the corridor. He was shouting. Miles hurried over, quickly becoming the mother hen of the group. What's all this caterwauling? Stuart looked worried. It's Gavin! He's been in the toilets for ages! Gav! Gav! Gavin! Will you stop that? How long has he been in there? Since I grabbed the first aid kit? He looked at his watch. Over ten minutes? He only went in to pee. Maybe it turned into a jobby, said Cameron, back to swigging lager at the bar. His morning buzz must have cleared. Ryan couldn't judge the man too harshly. He'd done everything he could to help Ryan after he'd fallen off the roof. It's messed up, but I feel more comfortable having Cameron around than I do Tom. Ryan spotted his friend sitting alone at the end of the bar, nursing a bottle of beer. Tom had always been so mild-mannered, and although prone to stressing about things, he'd never been mean or combative. But as Miles had alluded to, this was a situation like no other. Things were affecting Tom. Things were affecting all of them. I need to remember that he's my friend. I love him, even if he's being a dick. Do you think I should go get him? asked Stuart, looking at Miles for direction. Ryan had only half been paying attention, but the conversation moved to the front of his mind now as he suddenly considered what was being said. He jolted forward in his seat. No! Don't go in there! Stuart and Miles both looked at Ryan, but only Miles seemed to get it. This could be bad, couldn't it? He's infected, said Ryan. He might have turned or whatever. Be careful! Chloe moved behind the bar, crouching down so she was barely visible. Let me know when it's over. I can't deal with more of this. Tom got up from his bar stool, shaking his head. We should have kicked Luby and Gavin out. I told you this, Ryan. I told you. Luby moved out into the bar area. The back office had clearly been left open. Cheers, mate. Love you too. He looked over at Ryan and pulled a face. You okay, mate? You don't look good. I don't feel good either. It was a relief to see that Luby was still himself. But they had been lucky. With the office door left wide open, things would have been worse if he had turned. They had to do better or they wouldn't make it another day. None of us has experienced anything like this before. In the movies, there's always a cop or a soldier or a scientist. All we have is a vicar in charge of a tiny church. Surprisingly, the fungus on Luby's face hadn't seemed to have spread any more than when they first locked him inside the office. If not for the green splotches on his cheeks, he was a picture of health and in great spirits. He helped himself to a drink from one of the rapidly warming fridges and popped the top with his back teeth. It was some sort of blue alcopop. He swigged half the bottle in one go like a thirsty camel and then gasped with satisfaction. It was ironic, seeing as how he'd started the weekend not wanting a drink. Cameron went and joined Miles and Stuart by the toilet corridor. If he's turned into one of them, we should bar the door and leave him inside. We can't do that, said Stuart. He's my mate. Then best stop fannying about. Gavin! Gav! Gav! Miles grabbed Stuart's arm. Don't start that again, lad. Ryan couldn't sit by and watch. He also didn't want to sit so near to the glass that was keeping back the two elderly bowls players. 
Carefully, Ryan placed his injured foot on the floor and pushed himself out of the chair. His toe stump throbbed, the bandage already stained red, but his foot took his weight. His left knee was a lump of granite, so he walked like a peg-legged pirate to join the others at the edge of the room. Fiona met him halfway and helped. She smelled of sweat, but oddly it was a smell he was becoming used to. What's going on? asked Luby. Ryan looked back towards the bar and answered him. Gavin hasn't come back out of the toilet. How was he when he was with you? Green and fuzzy, but other than that he was sound. You think he's, you know? Ryan grimaced. I don't know. Gavin still hadn't come out of the toilets, and Miles was now standing in the corridor, staring at the door anxiously. The corridor could act as an airlock if anything nasty came out of the toilets, but the vicar was currently standing right in the danger zone. He would have to flee back into the tea room before Stuart could slam the door and seal off the corridor. Miles shouted at the gent's door, Gavin, are you all right in that lad? Nothing but silence. Miles turned back to the others, seeming unsure about what to do next. Then a voice replied, Vicar, is that you? Miles relaxed. Thank heaven, we've been worried. You've been in there a wee while, lad. I'm not feeling so grand, Vicar. That's understandable, but we'd all feel a lot better if you came out here. You need to get back inside the office where it's safe. We'll give you whatever you need to feel comfortable. I'm really sick, Vicar. I need help. Miles moved right up to the door. Come on out to there, Gavin. There's a good lad. Another moment of silence passed. Then the gent's door began to open. Gavin's sweating face appeared in the gap. And those standing in the opposite doorway gave a sigh of relief. It wasn't as bad as they'd feared. Gavin's face was mostly normal. A thin trail of fungus ran up his left cheek and his eye was half infested with the stuff, but there was plenty of normal human skin showing through. Then the door opened wider. Miles leapt back. He was unable to immediately escape the corridor due to the people huddled at his back. Gavin stumbled out of the toilets completely naked. His chest, arms and bloated genitals were covered in green fungus. Darkened patches had started to fall away to expose bony protuberances, which in turn were cracking open and spilling bugs upon the floor. I itch all over! He rasped, both arms waving about erratically like he was having some sort of fit. He's trying to whip us, but the talons haven't pushed through his hands yet. It's like an instinct for what's to come. Everyone shoved their way back into the tea room. Ryan waited for Miles and dragged him through the doorway. Then Stuart went to close the door. Before he could, Gavin leapt forward and jammed his body into the gap. Stuart stumbled backwards, almost tripping and falling. He regained his balance quickly, then stood staring at his friend. Gavin, are you okay? Ryan yelled. Get away from him! Ah, oh, shit, said Luby, kicking a bar stool and knocking it over. I really thought he'd beaten it. Helen came rushing out of the kitchen. She had a large chef's knife in her hand, and as usual, she was expressionless beyond a quiet rage. Stuart continued standing there and staring, making no attempt to move. Gavin's head was bent at an angle as he focused on him. There's my pal, he rasped, throat bulging like it was full of air. Let's go over here, eh? Xbox and pizza around my place. Maybe get a few beers in, eh? Gav, you need a little well, pal. Why are you stuck balling naked? Gavin shoved his way through the doorway and snatched at Stuart with both octopus-like arms. His left hand connected with a hard smack that sent Stuart reeling backwards, clutching the side of his head. A familiar, sharp talon had emerged from Gavin's palm. Damn it, that hurt, said Stuart, bent over in pain. He got you, said Luby, picking up a stool as a weapon and moving to the lad's side. You played him, mate. It's okay, Stuart muttered, but blood was leaking onto the white collar of his shirt. It's okay. Ryan leant on a nearby table and groaned. He's infected now and we can't cut off his head. 
What's going on? shouted Chloe, still hiding behind the bar. Gavin snatched at Stuart again, this time connecting with his forehead and drawing a bloody line above his eyes. Stuart collapsed to the ground, begging for help. Not everyone can be a hero. Helen came fast, ducking a swipe from Gavin's talons and slicing at his naked thigh with the chef's knife. Blood spurted from the wound and stringy muscled tendons exposed. She dodged aside and sliced again, this time opening a wide gash on Gavin's chest. He staggered backwards and froze, sizing up the woman in front of him. A rotting pit in the centre of his stomach pulsated. Bugs rained down onto the carpet. Oh, God, said Chloe, covering her mouth. Not more bugs. What's all this about? asked Gavin, as if he were genuinely confused by all of this aggression. He tried to grapple with Helen, but with his badly cut thigh, he veered sideways like a lorry with a flat tyre. He staggered over to the other side of the room, moving beside the large plate glass windows overlooking the patio and bowling lawns. Helen stayed with him, her bloody knife ready to feed again. Gavin lashed out at her, his arms growing more and more tentacle-like as his bones dissolved. Helen dodged aside, calmly slicing him across the ribs. Thick brown slurry leaked from the wound. Heads up! Cameron shouted and he grabbed a heavy drip tray from the bar before sprinting across the room with it. Helen leapt out of his way. Gavin turned to meet Cameron's attack, and the two of them collided. Cameron's speed, along with his substantial bulk, sent both of them toppling into the window. One of the sections broke free of its moorings and toppled onto the patio, where it promptly shattered into several large pieces. Ryan lost his grip on the table he'd been leaning on and almost fell, but he managed to grab it again and hold himself up. He hated playing bystander, but there was no way he could do anything useful. Even if he took a single step, there was a good chance he would end up on the floor. The two elderly bowls players spotted the newly opened entrance to the tea room and started sidling along the glass panels towards it. Cameron and Gavin lay in a heap amongst the large shards of glass on the patio, both of them momentarily stunned. Cameron got to his feet first, holding his arm and clearly dazed. Ryan could take it no more. The big Scot had stuck around to help Ryan after his fall off the roof. It was time to repay the favour. Although he was the clumsy sod who knocked me off in the first place. Ryan risked letting go of the table and managed to stay on his feet. He hobbled as quickly as he could to grab Cameron and drag him out of harm's way. Hit me fucking head. Don't worry about it. You weren't using it that much anyway. Bastard English. Gavin took several moments to get to his feet, both hands now useless husks, unable to push against the floor. Shards of glass twinkled all over his naked body. Before he had a chance to locate a new target and attack, Helen stepped forward and buried her chef's knife into the side of his head, then yanked it free. Brownish-red blood spurted into the air. More bugs fell from Gavin's body and skittered away in all directions. His body crumpled to the glass-covered patio, his swollen genitals wobbling like jelly. Gavin was dead. Gav! No! Stuart got back to his feet and hurried towards the patio, unconscious of the fact the two elderly bowls players were right outside. Stay back, lad, Miles said, trying to stop him. There's no can be done. Fortunately, Stuart halted. He looked out at his dead friend and then Miles. Blood covered his face, oozing from deep cuts to his temple and forehead. Oily green patches had already started to spread around the wound in his forehead. Helen glared at him. You're infected. What? Uh, no, I'm fine. Really, I'm... You're infected, Helen said again, and she planted the knife in Stuart's guts. Then she pulled him into an embrace and twisted the blade. Blood erupted from Stuart's mouth. His eyes became like those of a deer, wide, bright and terrified. Then that brightness disappeared and the terror froze in place. Stuart's body slumped to the carpet at Helen's feet and she stared directly ahead, not seeming to see anything except whatever hell existed in her own mind. Chloe 
screamed. Fucking hell, said Luby. Jesus Christ. Miles put his hands against his cheeks. Helen, lass, what have you done? Helen stared at Stuart's body, then glanced at her own blood-slick hands. Finally, she turned and glared at Ryan. You did this, she said in a strange, emotionless voice. We were fine inside the kirk. We were safe. You brought them to our door, and now everyone's dead. My boy's dead. She took a step towards Ryan, the bloody knife in her hand. Miles stepped into a path, palms out wide. Helen, give that to me now, please. There's a good lass. Helen's eyes were unnaturally wide. She muttered something, heard only to herself. Then she bolted. Before anyone could stop her, she rushed through the broken window and disappeared out onto the bowling lawns. The pair of elderly greens narrowly missed whipping her as she passed. The banging on the front door increased. The greens outside excited by the commotion within. Ryan surveyed the carnage of the tea room, all of the blood and destruction, and shook his head sadly. We need to get out of this goddamn village. Chapter 8 Chloe screamed, and she began sweeping frantically at the bar with the sleeve of her grey hoodie. Bugs! she yelped. They're all over the place! Fiona moved in front of Ryan, glancing between him and the two greens now stalking them through the tea room. What are our chances outside? There was no time nor reason to lie, so he gave it to us straight. Bad. The greens are everywhere. We can outrun them individually, but if they manage to block us in or surround us... We need to decide on a destination, said Miles, grabbing a bottle of Newcastle Brown and smashing it against the bar, holding the jagged neck while wearing a blood-spattered dog collar was a good look for him, a warrior priest. It has to be the pub! said Chloe, looking down and stamping at the floor for a moment. It's the only other place there could be survivors, and it's right on the edge of the village. If we get there and it's safe, we can carry on down the main road. We can even stock up on supplies at the petrol station. We could head for Fort William, said Cameron. Never thought I'd say it, but I want to find the nearest police station. The elderly bowls players stumbled into the tea room, dripping rotten fluids on the blood-stained carpet. Both of them had a single fuzz-encrusted eyeball and a bleary human one. Luby grabbed a table and tipped it over to impede their progress. They stumbled, one tottering to the left, the other to the right. Instinctively, Luby dodged out of their way, but strangely they didn't seem interested in him. They didn't lash out or react in any way. Their focus was completely fixed on those further inside the tea room. Hey, did you see that? Ryan took an unsteady step and Fiona grabbed him. Luby, they just ignored you. The two greens continued right on past Luby, beginning to hone in on Cameron, who stared them down like a wolf. He had a lump on the top of his head from his fall through the window, but he seemed to have recovered now. Luby waved a hand and tried to get the Greens' attention, but once again they paid him no mind. They focused only on Cameron. Cameron grabbed another drip tray off the bar and got ready to pummel them. Luby was deep in thought, a scientist conducting an experiment. He took a risk and stepped right up to the Greens. He took an even bigger risk by reaching out and shoving one of them. It stumbled sideways, colliding with the other, and then resumed its pursuit of Cameron. Cameron groaned. This one's got a hard done for me. Luby took a step back, scuffed his foot like a bull, then charged right into the green, shoving it with both hands. This time, both of them ended up on the ground in a pile. It's like I'm invisible to them, said Luby, staring down at the greens in disbelief. It's because you're one of them, said Chloe from behind the bar. Luby flinched. What? No, I ain't. Yes, you are. Zombies don't eat other zombies. What are you talking about? What zombies? The greens started to get back to their feet. Once again, they paid Luby no mind. Ryan didn't want to say it, but he had to. She's right, Lubes. 
The sea was one of their own. The greens were back on their feet. Luby stepped in front of them, holding them back with a hand on each of their sallow chests. A bug appeared from somewhere and crawled along his wrist. You should get what you need, he said. I'll hold them back. Everyone watched in awe for a moment as Luby held the enemy at bay. But then Miles took charge. Fiona, Chloe, find a bag and grab all the food and water you can carry. Cameron, start breaking things. We need weapons. Hey, I can do that. What about me? asked Ryan. Without Fiona's help, he was back to leaning on tables to keep from falling. Cameron laughed. Ha, any more bandages and you'll look like a mummy. I can still help. Miles looked Ryan up and down. We need to figure out a way to get you moving, lad. If we can, I stay ahead of those things. Ryan was gradually getting back a sense of his own body, but his left knee was still swollen and stiff. Every footstep was like a bellows stoking a fire where his pinky toe had been. There was no way he'd be able to keep up with the others if they made a run for it. You should all get going without me. I'll only hold you back. Cameron picked up a bar stool and smashed it over the bar, banging it again and again until he managed to separate the metal legs, which he then handed to Ryan. There's the workings of a splint, so get to work. We ain't leaving no one behind. The banging on the front door grew furious. Ryan took the poles and thanked Cameron before he rushed off to break something else. Miles bent down and started undoing his shoelaces. See, Cam's near so bad when you get to know him. No, he's an interesting character. What's his story? Cameron Pollock does not have a story. That's the problem. He's been drifting through life since he was a bairn. Barely worked a day in his life, yet always seems to find the money for a drink. He's good for nothing, and yet... Ryan frowned. And yet what? And yet... When there was a flood at the church, Cameron single-handedly bailed out the cellar. When little Betty Lawrence went missing last year, he must have scoured half the highlands by himself. The man cares nothing for himself, but when it comes to other people, he shows up. What about the whole English thing? Miles shrugged. Small towns breed small minds. His father was a jobless drinker, too, but there was a time when Ralph Pollock was a well-paid miner. When the industry collapsed, most people blamed the Thatcherite government. Thirty years later, and Cameron is an echo of his father's resentments. I doubt he's ever been south of the border. England is just a mythical place that provides an easy scapegoat for all his life failures. I guess I never really thought about Scotland as being a different place. Can I ask you a question, Miles? Of course, lad. Who is Betty Lawrence? And did you manage to find her? Aye, we did. Poor lass fell in the cut and drowned. One of the saddest days of my life presiding over her funeral. Eight years old she was. Ryan grimaced. Life can be pretty shitty, eh? Huh? I wish I could say it was all part of God's great plan, his way of testing us, but life is as much a mystery to me as everybody else. There is absolutely a God Almighty and he loves us, but I wonder sometimes if he isn't in full control of the wheel. Our current predicament is enough to make me ponder such things even harder. Amen. The two of them laughed as Miles got to work tying the metal poles to Ryan's leg with his shoelaces. He had to work fast, and when the man kicked off his shoes and went about in his socks, Ryan felt guilty. The vicar assured him it was okay. I can barely complain about blisters after all you've been through, lad. We need to hurry this up, said Luby. He was beginning to struggle with the elderly bowls players, his forehead sweating. They whipped their talons around him, trying to get at the others behind him. Ryan gingerly slipped his torn trainer back on and tried to stand. He just about managed it. I'm ready. We're good to go too. Fiona slammed two bin bags full of food and water on the bar. Chloe had a third bag over her shoulder. Cameron started piling bits of wood and metal on the ground. Ryan spotted a wooden mop handle snapped in two to form a pair of rudimentary spears. There was also a piece of sharp copper piping taken from God knows where. Grab what suits you. As usual, Tom had done little to get involved, but he spoke up now. 
Wouldn't it be better to get the window covered? This place was safe until we took our eye off Gavin. I'm starting to think we should stay. What about this pair of monkeys? asked Luby, meaning the two greens he was struggling to contain. Their thrashing tentacles were getting more and more frantic. Tom shrugged. We killed them. You can do it, Luby. You're in no danger. And then what? asked Chloe. These bugs are everywhere. What if one of us gets bitten? And there's no help coming, said Cameron. It's only been 24 hours. and We've already been smoked out twice already. Hiding doesn't work. We've lost Andy, Helen, Gavin, Stuart. He's right, said Ryan. It's only a matter of time before they all get in. Our only chance is trying to leave the village, which is why you should all get going without me. Fiona shook her head. Cameron and I will carry you if we have to. I don't know about that, said Cameron, picking up the copper pipe and whacking it against his palm. He might make a good distraction. Luby turned his head while continuing to hold back the greens. If these things are no threat to me, I can protect Ryan. I'll get him to where he needs to go. The pub, said Miles. We're all going to the pub to start with. It's right on the edge of the village. OK, everyone get moving. I can't hold them any longer. Fiona and Chloe shouldered the black bags full of supplies while everyone else grabbed weapons from Cameron's stash. None of them knew how things were going to go. They could all be moments away from their deaths, but they were going to go out fighting. The front door rattled, its frame beginning to weaken. The car park is crammed with them, said Ryan. We'll have to head out the back like Ellen did. Maybe we can find a way through the edges and go around them. Miles nodded. Hey, that should bring us out at the rear of the village. We might get some breathing room there. OK, said Cameron. Everyone on me. They headed through the missing window panel in a line, Ryan hobbling along at the rear with his splinted leg. He had one half of the broken mop handle, but he didn't expect it to do him any good. Fiona appeared at his side and helped him along, taking half his weight along with the black bag full of supplies on her other shoulder. The two greens turned to give chase, but Luby gave them one last shove and knocked them off course before hurrying to join the exodus. It was cold outside, and the beads of sweat chilling on Ryan's skin was a jolting refreshment. With his left leg bound and splinted, he walked even more like a pirate. But after several strides, he found his groove and started hop-swinging along. With Fiona's help, he managed to achieve an energy-sapping jog that he wouldn't be able to keep up for long. At least for now, he was moving. It's one of those things, said Tom, horrified and pointing at the corkscrew Ryan had spotted earlier behind the ride-on mower. How many are there? Who knows, said Ryan. Doesn't change anything right now. They could be everywhere, said Chloe. Breasts, black bag and pink hair bouncing and swinging. We don't know, do we? They could be all over the world. Luby jogged up alongside her and took the bag. Best not to think about it, sweetheart. You fancy getting a drink when we reach this pub? Huh? Are you serious? Hey, who knows how long any of us has? Best we enjoy ourselves. Chloe glanced back. The two greens were stumbling along 20 metres behind them. The distance seemed to reassure her, but she still frowned anxiously as she replied to Luby's offer. But you're infected. I'm asking for a drink, not a sordid love affair. If this is the end... There are worse ways to spend it than tipping back a few jars with a hot last night yourself. Chloe didn't laugh. She only seemed confused. OK, we can have a drink together, I suppose. But you're not really my type, though. Luby missed a step and had to hurry to get back in line with her. Is it the excess skin thing? Because I can tell you, I've lost about two stones since this weekend. I'll call it the fungal diet. I promise I'll go on you. Yeah? Why don't you? No, I mean, you're not made tape. Luby went silent. The look on his face made it clear he didn't understand what she was saying. For a moment, Ryan didn't either. Luckily, Fiona made it clear for everyone. Chloe's gay. 
Luby stumbled again, his arms whipping out for balance, a little too jelly-like for Ryan's liking. He's changing, the infection's spreading. How long before talons are up from his hands? Luby regained his balance and cleared his throat. Well, I guess it would be nice to make a new friend then. My offer still stands. Chloe's frown went away and she finally smiled. Maze of vodka and lemonade. Vodka and lemonade it is. Let's just get there first, said Fiona. Cameron was ahead by several metres, but he turned back and hissed at them now. Keep your voices doing and hurry up. We're going as fast as we can, said Ryan. We'll go faster. Everyone shut up. Cameron eventually slowed and everyone gathered around him. The boulder at the centre of their stream. He looked back at the Greens, who were still a good way behind, and then examined the nearby hedges. They were some sort of shaped laurel, a bush familiar to Ryan from his job as a landscape gardener. The things grew fast and thick. We should be able to forge our way through, said Cameron. It's only a bush. Try getting through at the bottom, said Ryan. There'll be fewer branches there. Good shout, English. Your pet green can go first. Check the other side. If you mean me, said Luby, a simple please will do. Cameron nodded. Then in a mock accent, more Australian than Mancunian, he said, If you would be so fucking kind, our kid. Luby rolled his eyes, one of them murky, the other tinged with green, and got down on his hands and knees. He moved clumsily, wavering to and fro like a baby learning to crawl. Once he made it to the hedge, he parted the leaves and pushed his face through the gaps. You see anything? Ryan whispered. I think, I think it's safe. All I can see is the road. Okay, hold on, I'm heading through. Shit, there's branches everywhere. Fucking bush. Keep your voice down, lad, said Miles, glancing back towards the bowls club nervously. Everyone waited anxiously while Luby crawled through the bottom of the bush. Small branches and offshoots caught on his clothing. His baggy shirt stretched and eventually tore. His jeans were about three sizes too big after the weight he'd lost, so they pulled down to reveal his pasty white ass. Ryan turned on his bad leg back towards the elderly bowls players. They were making slow but steady progress. He estimated less than two minutes before they caught up. Get a move on, Lubes! How to bloody snake! Luby eventually made it deep enough into the hedge that only the bottoms of his trainers were showing. A few seconds later, and he disappeared completely. Luby! Lubes, you okay? Yeah, I'm through. It's safe. Pass through the supplies and get out here with me. His words were like a starting pistol, and everyone dropped to their bellies. Fiona and Chloe shoved the bags of supplies through the gap left by Luby, and then everyone formed the line and dove among the bushes, scrambling like soldiers on a stealth mission. Ryan found it most awkward, having to drag his splintered leg behind him rather than make use of it to propel him forward. He used his spear to dig into the ground and anchor him. Everyone grunted and cursed, Sharp branches irritating and scratching as they shuffled along on their bellies. Ryan wondered if this was the way Helen had come or if she was still nearby somewhere, maybe hiding. When she'd taken off, no one had gone after her. Perhaps that was a bad call. She'd given up, but that didn't mean they should let her commit reckless suicide. Damn it, said Tom. He was crawling through a section next to Ryan, but he started to thrash. My trousers are caught! Ryan was halfway through the laurel, but he could see Tom through the branches. Can you get free? Hold on, I think. Damn it! I can't see what I'm doing. Ryan shuffled backwards, splinted knee bouncing painfully on the grass. Once back out of the bush, he clawed his way over to Tom's kicking legs. Stay still, I'll unhook you. The elderly bowls players were only ten feet away now. Need to make this quick, very quick. Ryan clambered closer to Tom and searched for the offending snag. He found it quickly, a wiry branch caught on his friend's brown leather belt. It wasn't difficult to remove, but it had clearly been difficult for Tom because it was behind his back. Okay, you're free, get going. Tom shuffled away. Ryan glanced to his left. 
The Greens were almost on top of him. Their talons were lifted in anticipation, ready to lash out. Tom suddenly disappeared, someone obviously pulling him from the other side, probably Cameron. Everyone had made it through the laurel, except for me. Ryan threw himself into the gap left behind by Tom. The branches had all been snapped or pushed out of the way, but that didn't mean he could get his ailing body to move quickly. Above him, the laurel branches shook. The greens had caught up with him. His legs were dangling out in the open like two planks of wood. He saw the road two feet ahead of him. He saw the legs of his companions gather together. He saw Cameron's face right in front of him. Out you come, English! A meaty hand grabbed Ryan behind the elbow and yanked. Suddenly he was sliding forward, face in the dirt. He couldn't be sure, but he thought he felt something strike the grass behind him where his foot had been. His shoulder threatened to pop out of its socket. He was spitting mud. He didn't care. Thank you, Cameron, again. Ryan flopped forward onto the road, rolling onto his side and groaning. Cameron stood over him impatiently. You'd end up dragging you along. Ryan looked up at Cameron from the floor, deciding not to share how close he'd just come to getting whipped for a second time. Cameron's ego was big enough, without the praise of having just pulled his ass out of the fire. Don't suppose you could help me stand up, could you? Cameron tossed his head back and laughed. Cameron got Ryan on his feet while everyone else turned back to face the laurel hedge. The greens on the other side were struggling to get through. All the same, it put everyone on edge. Ryan realised he'd left his spear on the other side. Maybe we should head up into the hills, said Chloe, peering up the road that led to Golak Cottage. No, said Ryan. For one thing, he wasn't about to put more distance between him and Aaron. The countryside isn't any safer. The wildlife is infected. Those dogs ain't, said Cameron referring to the dogs that were constantly barking somewhere in the village. Trust me, said Ryan. Back at the cottage, my friends and I were attacked by a rabbit. It looked like Cameron was about to laugh, but he managed to stop himself. A rabbit? Hey! He's telling the truth, said Tom. He made no mention of Ryan risking his neck to get him free from the laurel bush. Not the merest hint of a thank you. However, I would rather face an infected rabbit than a village full of infected people. My vote is to head into the hills and try to go around the village. Ryan shook his head in disbelief. Tom, you know I need to get Aaron. I'm sorry, Ryan, but it's a death sentence. Anyone who heads into the village is doomed. It would be better to go find help and bring it back. As long as Aaron stays inside the skip, he'll be okay. And what if he doesn't stay inside? What if he thinks I'm not coming and tries to make a break for it on his own? Tom sighed. I'm not dying here, Ryan. I don't know how many times I have to tell you that. I'm heading into the hills where there's at least a slim chance of survival. Me too, said Chloe, and she moved to Tom's side. It seemed to pain her to say it, but she was adamant too. I hope you've managed to rescue your brother, Ian. I really do, but the truth is, I didn't know you, and I need plan on throwing my life away to help you. Sorry if that means I'm a bitch. Fiona moved to Ryan's side and placed a hand on his arm. She looked into his eyes, sad and afraid. I agree with Tom, she said. It's a death sentence heading back into the village. Ryan nodded. While he felt like slapping Tom for his disloyalty, Fiona had already had his back more than she'd been obliged to, so she owed him nothing else. But Fiona wasn't finished. She summoned a thin smile and went on, but I promise to have your back. So let's get your brother. You'll help me. She shrugged. Trust, right? I'm going to trust you not to get me killed. And you don't even have to ask me, mate, said Luby. But you go, I go. I'm afraid I'm going to have to side with Chloe and Tom, said Miles. Now that we're back out in the open, it seems unwise to head right back into danger. Cameron, do you know a way around the village? Cameron looked towards the shaking laurel bush, and then at Ryan. He folded his arms. Should be easy enough to get around the village, I reckon. We can head up to Bosler Bridge. Across the stream there. From there, it'll be a straight hike down the air road south of Bird's petrol station. Miles sighed. Sounds like a reasonable plan to me. Ryan didn't know why he was shocked. 
but the thought of not having Cameron help left him feeling vulnerable. The big Scot faced everything with an angry confidence, refusing to be a victim. Cameron, I need your help. I need to get my brother, and I don't think I can do it without you. Cameron opened his mouth, but no words came out. His brow furrowed, and for the first time since meeting the man, Ryan saw empathy and tiredness. I'm sorry, Ryan. You're all right for an Englishman, but your brother's a lost cause. But if you come with us, you might at least live long enough to remember him. I can't. Cameron shrugged and turned away. Then it was nice knowing you. Looks like it's just us then, said Fiona. Hope you've got a good plan. I don't. Great. Miles stepped up to Ryan and placed a hand on his shoulder. If you manage to rescue your brother, we'll be heading to the petrol station just past the pub on the far end of town. If it's safe, we'll be taking the main road from there. Catch us if you can. Ryan couldn't work out if he should be angry or not. Other than Tom, these people were almost strangers. They owed him nothing, but they were still refusing to help his brother, so fuck them. As a Christian, Miles should be required to help, right? Maybe he's not such a good bloke after all. Tom glanced at Ryan, his expression guilty as it probably dawned on him what he'd done. He just ended their friendship. Hey, Ryan, look, I just... Shut your goddamn mouth! Ryan pointed a finger in his ex-friend's face. You and me have nothing left to say to each other! Tom turned away and started up the road. The landscape could be teeming with infected wildlife, and if so, his betrayal would end up being for nothing. He could be dead anyway. Good luck, English, said Cameron. The lump on his head had risen even more, and he squinted as he spoke. If you don't die, we'll grab a beer together. He handed Ryan the sharp copper pipe taken from the club. You're going to need this. Ryan had left his spear buried in the hedge, so the pipe was useful. Thanks, Cameron. You'll look after everyone, okay? Hey. Ryan stood with Fiona and Luby, and they watched the others walk away. Their group had been divided from the start but he'd assumed the line was between the English and the Scots. Turned out the biggest schism had been between him and Tom. Don't even know who he is anymore. The branches inside the laurel bush began to snap and give way. The elderly bowls players were almost through. Only a few branches caught on their jumpers kept them at bay. Time to go, said Luby. You ready? Eh? As ready as I can be. Ryan put his arm around Fiona's neck. Let's go get my brother. The three of them started down the road, keeping close to the hedge and passing by the wooden sign. The white bowls player was getting grubby, a patch of green covering his back leg. The fungus. It's all over the place, growing. Already, Ryan could see the infected people gathered ahead, congregating around the bowls club. Did they still think everyone was inside? The distant thudding of the front door suggested so. They're still trying to break in, said Fiona. Maybe we can sneak past them. Ryan didn't think he could sneak anywhere with his leg the way it was, but he liked the idea of avoiding the greens rather than fighting them. He nodded further down the road. Maybe we can hop over the wall around the churchyard and stay hidden. It looks empty. Luby stumbled unexpectedly, landing on one knee. He cursed, only just managing to keep his voice down. He straightened back up and wiped the gravel off his knee. Sorry about that. Ryan glanced at the greens ahead, praying they hadn't heard. You okay? What happened? Not sure. The lights just went out for a second. I'm feeling a bit dizzy. Fiona stepped back, pulling Ryan along with her. Are you on the turn? I ain't a pint of milk, love. You know what I mean. Luby's lip curled, but he failed to bring forth the words to match his mood. He ended up just sighing. I was beginning to think I got away with it. The more time went by, the more I started to think I'd be okay. He lifted his hands, now covered in green fuzz. His little finger on his right hand was bent at an odd angle. My cancer slowed it down, but it didn't stop it. Ryan frowned. What? Luby continued examining his green hands as he spoke, a look of resignation on his face. For whatever reason, the fungus has taken me over slower than everyone else. And there's only one thing different about me. I've cancer. 
Don't ask me how. I think it bought me a little extra time. Cancer saved my life. For a while, anyway. He chuckled, but it contained no joy. You're going to be fine, Lubes. We're making it out of this village and home to Manchester. Couple of days in the Royal and you'll be as right as rain. I've spent a lifetime in that place already, mate. How about we go down Old Trafford instead? Whatever gets you better, mate. Fiona glanced behind her. The Bowles players were about to make it out onto the road. OK, she said nervously. Onwards we go. Into the breach and all that. Ryan nodded and on they went. They kept to the far side of the road, which was a strip of scrubland with nowhere to hide. The grass too short to hide a gnome. If any of the greens by the bowls club turned in their direction, it would be game over. Their only option then would be to run, and Ryan didn't have that option. The car park outside the bowls club was teeming with greens, a hundred at least. They amassed around the front door, throwing themselves against it. At the rear of the car park, the chain-link fence started to buckle under the weight of their bodies. The sound of broken glass underfoot suggested a window had broken. It's a good thing we left when we did, Fiona whispered. The whole village is here. If one of them spots us, we won't have a chance. Just keep moving, said Luby. They headed for the churchyard, making slow progress. Fiona helped Ryan while Luby carried the black bag of supplies. Chloe had taken the other. Eventually, and somewhat miraculously, they managed to make it to the low stone wall surrounding the churchyard. Fiona helped Ryan over the boundary while Luby sat down on it and swung his legs up and over the top. Fiona vaulted the wall last and landed next to them. So far, so good. Come on, we can make it to the church. They moved as one, staying behind the larger gravestones to try to avoid being seen. Ryan glanced ahead to the small church building with its broken windows. Andy's body would still be lying inside, growing cold. What if nowhere in the village is safe? he asked. Fiona shrugged. The place was in need of a little excitement anyway. They carried on until they reached the church. In the light of day, the building seemed ancient. The stone bricks were faded and covered in moss. The grout was crumbling in a hundred places. The whole village was ancient. Ryan couldn't understand why anyone would want to live all the way up here, so far removed from the cities and towns of humanity. Manchester was Ryan's home. He longed to be there. I think I can see the skip from here, said Fiona, crouching amongst the knee-high weeds. Ryan moved alongside her and looked towards the grassy common across the road. The lorry was still parked there, and its skip was still covered by the tarp. There was no sign of whether or not Aaron was still inside, but he certainly had been a couple of hours ago. A dozen or so greens surrounded the common, and the pack of dogs that had been barking relentlessly for the past night and day were there too, gathered at the edge of the road. They were excited by something, and Ryan wondered if it was his brother. Did they know he was inside the skip? The greens are acting weird, said Fiona. Watch. Ryan squinted, keeping his eyes on an infected woman wearing a long red dressing gown. It highlighted how the fungus had taken people so unawares. Had the woman's husband come home with the fungus on his hands, or had a green broken in and attacked her in her sleep? There were a hundred horror stories in the village, but no way to learn all of them. Suddenly, the infected woman began to freak out, arms whipping, head thrashing left and right. Then she stopped, went back to standing still. Weird, but it doesn't help me get my brother. There's no way I can get to him, said Ryan, realising more with every second that it was true. There was no way he could make it past a dozen infected people without getting seen. Even if he somehow managed to reach Aaron, they would never make it out of there in one piece. They would die on the common or become infected, and neither fate was acceptable. I'll distract them, said Luby. How? They don't pay you any attention. They might not be interested in me, but they're interested in something else. Ryan frowned. What? Luby snatched the metal pipe out of Ryan's hand and smiled. A little bit of drum and bass. You two get down and wait for the greens to move away from the common. 
then you go get Alan. What about you? If I've learned anything lately, mate, it's not to plan my own future. If I can catch up to you, I will. But maybe it's better if I don't. He held up his fuzz-covered hand. A brown gash had started to form right between his knuckles. His little finger was dangling like a worm. I'm starting to hulk out, and I refuse to be that prick in the zombie movie who lies about being bitten. I'm done, mate. Ryan reached out and grabbed his friend's arm over his jacket. You do whatever you have to do to get out of this village with the rest of us. Do you hear me? Don't you dare stop fighting, not for a second. Luby nodded. Man, you till I die, right? Up the reds. I love you, man. Luby stepped back and pulled a face. Hoi, hoi! You're about to be a married man. I really hope so. Give Sophie my love, yeah? And your mum. Tell her I'm sorry about the couscous. She'll know what you mean. Anyway, get your head down while I take care of this. Ryan looked at his friend for a moment, then nodded. He crouched down behind a gravestone next to Fiona while Luby hopped back over the wall and headed for the road. The gravestone read, Betty Lawrence, beloved daughter, granddaughter, child, 2010 to 2018. Ryan shuddered. The village was a place with history, with families, memories and traditions, a place like any other with tragedies and celebrations. What would become of it after all of this? Did the cemetery have room for a couple of hundred more corpses? Luby hurried back up the road towards the bowls club. Halfway there, he stopped and turned back, giving them a brief glance before lifting the metal pole above his head and bringing it down on the asphalt. The metallic clack echoed and sparks flew up from the gravelly surface. It wasn't a particularly loud sound, but it travelled. The greens around the common jolted, a spark running through them. Slowly, they turned towards the road, and even those further away at the bowls club reacted. If all of them came, Luby would be surrounded. And come they did. It's working, said Fiona. They're leaving the common. The black cloud over Ryan lifted as the greens began to move away, stumbling and bumping into each other. Slowly but surely, they filtered down the road, the small group from the common merging with the larger group from the bowls club. It became harder and harder to see Luby, and before long, the only evidence that he'd even existed was the rhythmic clack of the metal pole against the road. We should go, said Fiona, already moving to put her head under Ryan's armpit to help him up. She went to grab the bin bag full of supplies, but changed her mind and left it behind one of the gravestones. It'll just slow us down. I'll leave it here. Ryan nodded. If we need it, we know where it is. They got moving, heading down the pebbled path until they passed through the gate at the bottom. It seemed too good to be true, but the space between them and the skip was completely open. The Greens had abandoned the area to head up the road. Luby's plan had worked like a charm. Thank you, mate. Ryan focused on the skip, hobbling across the common as fast as he could and wishing he had X-ray vision so he could see if his brother was still inside. Soon he would find out. Please be in there, Aaron. Please be in there. The pack of dogs began to wag their tails and hop around as they spotted Ryan and Fiona approaching. Their mad barking turned to excited yips and throaty grumbles. They're pleased to see us. Pleased to see normal human beings. Have they been watching over my brother? There was no time to stop and fuss a pack of dogs, so Ryan removed himself from Fiona's arm and hop ran as fast as he could. By the time he traversed the grassy common, he had achieved a speed slightly faster than a jog. It was pure agony, but he couldn't stop, not for a second. Finally, he crossed the road and made it to the skip lorry. He looked up at the tarp and said, Aaron, are you in there? Chapter 9 Luby had no idea how he would ever get out of this. The Greens didn't try to attack him, but the road was so thick with them that he was in danger of being crushed by their sheer weight. His plan had worked like a charm, but he was getting more and more dizzy and sick. It wouldn't be long before he dropped where he stood. I thought I had it beat. I felt so strong. 
Now I can barely stand. Luby had hidden his condition from Ryan ever since he came out of the office. He and Gavin had listened to Ryan's screams as he'd had his toe removed, but Luby had been too weak to do anything but sit there in Mr. Falco's chair. Gavin had been lying on the floor, staring silently up at the ceiling. It was no secret that he was succumbing to the fungus, but it had still surprised Luby how suddenly he had turned. It had made him realise how quickly the disease acted and how he had been on borrowed time since the moment Sean infected him. There was no beating the fungus. He had been naive to ever think so. He could feel himself changing. It had started with his memories. Stuck in the office with Gavin, the two of them had started sharing stories. Most of Gavin's involved video games and superhero movies. But Luby had told stories about his teenage years, hanging out with the lads. He had spoken about the time Sean had gone down Donna Hill in a shopping trolley, and the time Ryan had pissed off a high-rise balcony onto the people below. But then the stories had suddenly dried up. Luby couldn't remember a thing. He couldn't remember how he and Sean had met. He couldn't remember the name of his high school. Half his past disappeared in an instant and it only got worse from there. Only pieces of him left. But there's enough of me to know who I am. Ryan needs my help. Despite being sure his time was up, Luby didn't want to give in. Ryan had told him to keep fighting, and if there was any chance of sticking around longer, he wanted that chance. As often as he had faced down death in the past six months, the idea of finally drifting away into whatever came next was terrifying. He didn't want to die. He wasn't ready for it all to be over. He shoved aside a green, knocking it into those behind it. Instead of stumbling, though, it bounced, the weight behind it, too much to give way. He shoved again, starting to panic. He was being buried alive by bodies. A green whipped its talons at the air and Luby caught a scratch across the cheek. He was aware of the wound, yet it caused him no pain. In fact, he hadn't felt pain for a while. Right now he missed it. Its absence was like an absence of life. Being human was supposed to hurt. Luby shoved again, this time gritting his teeth and putting his back into it. His hand struck an infected woman in the breast and kept on going, sinking into hot, moist flesh. Bugs spilled out and covered his arm. He recoiled, trying to tug back his hand, but he found himself stuck. Try as he might, he couldn't pull his hand out of the woman's corrupted flesh. In fact, it seemed to close around his knuckles like a suckling baby. Let go of me, you monkey cow! The woman paid Luby no mind. In fact, she tried to turn away, his arm twisted inside her, and he yelled irritably as he was pulled along against his will. His voice caused the infected mass of people to flinch, but they looked right through him, as if they couldn't quite locate the source of the noise. Green fuzz covered their flesh, quivering slightly as if blown by a breeze. There was damp in the air, and the ground underfoot squelched as bugs and rotting flesh shed from the infected bodies onto the road. Luby tried desperately to get his hand free, but it was no use. His arm was buried up to the elbow in flesh, and bugs covered the rest. He started to feel something. Pain! It's starting to hurt! I'm still human! What at first felt like a pinch soon became a vicious rending of flesh. The woman's sucking innards, pulling his arm in further, enveloping him up to the shoulder and forcing him to his knees. He felt something dislocate, the delicate bones in his wrist snapping, and the pain came in full, a tidal wave of it. Luby was alive, and it was terrible. Chapter 10 Aaron, are you in there? Aaron jolted, striking his head against the inside of the skip. For a second, he thought he'd heard his brother's voice. Aaron! Aaron, it's me! Are you in there? 
Aaron jolted again, hitting his head a second time. This time, he knew he wasn't dreaming. He scrambled for the tarp above his head, and then he lifted it, and cold air and dim sunlight flooded in. The first thing he saw was his brother's face, dirt-streaked, bloody, and grey with exhaustion, but definitely his brother. R ryan Aaron, thank God! I came back for you! Get out of there before they come back! Aaron straightened up his aching legs, wondering how many hours he'd been stuck inside the dingy skip. Clambering from underneath the tarp and emerging into the light, he felt like a prisoner walking free. The experience was so disorientating that he toppled off the truck and landed clumsily on the floor. Oh, are you okay? It was a woman who asked him. She was standing next to Ryan. Aaron recognised her from the church. Her name might have been Fiona. She offered him a hand and he took it. I'm okay, he said, although he'd landed hard on the flat of his thigh. Where's everybody else? It's just us, said Ryan wobbling to and fro, like he was fighting to stay upright. He had some kind of brace fitted to his leg and a bandage on his arm. What the hell had happened to him? Aaron tried to talk again, but his mouth was so dry all he managed was a croak. He licked his lips and had another go. I need to drink. We should head back to the church, said Fiona. There's water in the black bag we left there. Maybe we can join back up with Luby. Aaron croaked and fought to find his voice again. Luby? Luby's alive? Sort of, said Ryan. It's a long story. Come on, we have to get out of here. Ryan went to grab Aaron, but almost toppled, so Aaron grabbed him instead. Fiona led the way, and they moved across the common and back towards the church. In the light of day, the old building seemed even smaller and in no way secure. How had they ever thought the building would keep them safe? Aaron noticed something. The infected, where have they all gone? Fiona pointed up the road. There. Jesus! Aaron almost screamed when he saw how many of them there were. They were huddled together further up the road, a hundred of them at least. I don't hear Luby anymore, said Ryan. Damn it, I hope he's okay. Aaron couldn't wrap his head around Luby being alive. They had left him inside the shed back at the cottage. Left him inside with Sean. Even if Sean hadn't killed him, he'd been infected. Shouldn't he have been one of them by now? They reached the church. Aaron helped Ryan hobble through the small gate and up the gravel path. Fiona rushed into the graveyard and beckoned them to join her. The three of them hunkered down behind a large gravestone and Fiona produced a black bin bag, unknotting it and plunging her arm inside. When a hand came out with a bottle of water, Aaron felt like kissing her and the fantasy of doing so briefly played out in his mind. We have food too, she said, after handing him the bottle. Aaron unscrewed the lid and downed the contents in one go. Feeling better already, he took a bag of peanuts from the black bag and tore into them ravenously. They were the best tasting peanuts he'd ever eaten. While Aaron ate, Ryan peered over the top of the gravestone and whispered, I don't see Luby. Damn it, the greens are coming back. If we don't leave now, we'll be stuck here. Fiona rose up beside him. They'll see us if we head back onto the road. We need to find a way to distract them again. Aaron was so focused on eating and drinking that his fear had abandoned him. But it quickly returned as he remembered he was still trapped in a town full of sick people. How would they create a distraction big enough to get out of the village? The dogs. Aaron looked back towards the common and saw that the canines had dispersed. Some of them had moved towards the church, perhaps intending to follow Ryan, Aaron and Fiona. The infected don't like high-pitched noises. Ryan looked at him. What? While I was hiding in the skip, the dogs were barking at the infected people. Every time they did, they went into some kind of seizure. I'm not positive, but I think high-pitched noises mess with them. Fiona nodded. When Luby struck the road, the greens flinched like it hurt them somehow. How does that help us? asked Ryan. Aaron shrugged. I don't know. 
You said you wanted to create a distraction. Well, noise distracts them. It worked with Loopy, said Fiona. So how do we create more noise? Ryan frowned, the face he always pulled whenever he was thinking. After a moment, he said, The piano? Huh? As in the one inside the church? Ryan nodded. We can hit a high note, right? That'd be the kind of sound the Greens don't like. You're going to play them a rendition of The Entertainer, are you? Even if that works, how are you planning to escape once you bring them all to you? I don't know. Maybe we can trap them inside or... Aaron finished a mouthful of peanuts, swallowed, then spoke. Or what? We start a fire, said Ryan. The church has a coal burner. Maybe we can start a blaze with the infected inside. Fiona winced. Those are people I know. What if there's some way to bring them back? You think Gavin could have come back? His stomach was filled with bugs. All those greens coming down the road are nothing but monsters now, or aliens, or whatever the hell they are. We lead them into the church, and then we torch it. I'll get out through one of the broken windows at the last second. It could work, said Aaron, positive about the thought of being proactive. Maybe the best way to stop being hunted was to become the hunter. Perhaps it was time to fight instead of hide. So, how do we start the fire? asked Fiona, still sounding doubtful. We don't, said Ryan. I'm going to do this by myself. You and Aaron are getting out of here. Aaron spluttered, bits of peanut escaping from his mouth. No way! I'm staying with you, Ryan. I know I haven't been much help since we got to the village, but I'm done sitting by and doing nothing. Then go, if you want to do something useful. Get the hell out of here so I can stop worrying about you. I'm not leaving you. End of story. I can barely walk. You'd be better off without me. I'm not leaving you here, Aaron repeated. There was no way he would be convinced. He wouldn't allow Ryan to keep playing the noble older brother. Me neither, said Fiona. While Aaron had been hiding inside the skip, she and Ryan seemed to have become close. The way she spoke to him, the way she looked at him, they were friends. They've only known each other for a day. Ryan was shaking his head. You don't owe me anything, Fee. Right now, all I need you to do is get my brother out of here. I'll find a way to survive somehow. I've been doing it non-stop for days. Please, just do as I ask. No, said Aaron. It's stupid. Ryan sighed. I know you want to stay and help me, Aaron, but I need to do this. This weekend, I've lost pretty much every friend I have. I can't lose anyone else. You and Fiona need to get out of this village alive or I'll never forgive myself. If anything happens to you, Aaron, then I'd rather be dead anyway. Aaron wanted to shout about how stupid Ryan was being, yet at the same time he couldn't bring himself to argue. Ryan had always taken care of him, so how could he refuse to listen to him now? Fiona sighed. Fine, I'll take Aaron to the pub, but we'll wait for you there. That's the deal, okay? Ryan went to argue, but Aaron cut him off. That's the deal, Ryan. You risk your neck to get me out of that skip. I'm not leaving this village without you. We either stay here with you or we wait at the pub. Okay, you can wait for me, but only if it's safe. First sign of danger, you do whatever you need to do to get out of the village. We'll help you set up here first, said Fiona. You'll only mess things up otherwise. Aaron smiled at Ryan. She's right, bro. You're a klutz. Ryan chuckled, punched Aaron weakly on the arm, and then snuck inside the church. Ryan stood next to Andy's body, realising it was the first time he'd ever seen a corpse. That it belonged to a child made it even more disturbing. All the blood had dried, making it seem like Andy had some kind of weird, all-encompassing birthmark on his neck. The child's expression was peaceful, eyes half-closed and mouth almost turned up in a smile. There was a patch of green fungus beneath his body and Ryan noticed more of it growing in odd patches all around. He didn't want to think about what that meant right now. He was a good kid, Ryan muttered. He was, said Fiona, coming up behind him. There were a lot of good kids in this village, a lot of good people. I hope Miles and the others make it out. They have Cameron with them. If anyone can get them out of here in one piece, it's Dole Q. William Wallace. Fiona hiccuped a laugh. If he hears you call him that, he'll batter you. 
How come everyone split up? asked Aaron. He had remained near the entranceway, keeping an eye on the greens outside. I went into the hills to try and find a safe way around the village. But I had to come and get you first. Aaron nodded as if he understood. So, everyone is okay? Tom isn't, you know... No, Tom's fine. Don't worry about him, though, okay? Ryan almost said more, but decided now wasn't the time. Grab everything that'll burn and pile it into the cellar. We'll start the fire there. Hopefully it'll rise up and catch the roof timbers. And you'll be sat here the whole time playing the piano? Fiona closed her eyes and shook her head. This seems like a really bad plan. There's a window at the back. Once things get too hot to handle, I'll get out and head for the pub. Do you even know how to get there? No. Fiona rolled her eyes. Head down the road outside until you see the bakery, then take a left. Keep going and you'll see the pub. Got it. They started gathering all of the wooden chairs and tossing them into the cellar. The heat coming up from the trap door was inviting after being outside in the cold, but it would soon become an unbearable blaze. Ryan didn't expect to make it out of the village, but he would try his best. Whatever happened and whatever plan he put into motion, the chances of his survival were next to nil. But if Fiona got his brother out of the village alive, it would go some way towards his atonement. Atonement for bringing his friends on the stag do from hell. Okay, said Fiona, after a few hectic minutes. Everything made of wood and not bolted down is in the cellar. Are you really going to do this? Ryan nodded. Unless you have a better plan. Um, yeah, like literally anything else. I'm doing this. He hobbled down the rickety steps into the cellar, clambering over the wooden chairs piled there. The child's unicorn lamp was still lit, which was fortunate as things would have been a lot harder in the dark. The coal burner blazed away happily. He had to wrap his hand up in his shirt to keep from burning himself as he yanked the handle and opened the chamber. Then he began to throw in extra coal and firewood from the nearby sacks. Once the fire was nice and healthy, he grabbed a chair and tilted it backwards so that the frame was leaning into the fire. At first he began to fear that it wouldn't catch light. It quickly turned black and gave off smoky tendrils, but no flames appeared. Just when he was ready to throw a tantrum, a small blue flicker appeared. Triumphantly, he fist-pumped the air, then waited a few moments for the fire to fully take to the chair. Once aflame, he tipped it over onto its side, where it quickly spread its flame to the other chairs. The fire was lit. Ryan could already feel its devouring heat. He hobbled back upstairs and met with Fiona. She was standing in front of the large stained glass window at the back of the church. Beside her was the piano he would soon use to give the performance of his life. She was in the process of positioning the bench from the entranceway to the left of the hatch, blocking that route around it. The other side was blocked with the cork notice board. Ryan put a hand on Fee's arm and squeezed. He even thought about hugging her. But before he had a chance, she moved away to join Aaron in the centre of the church. He was staring through the floor grates at the glowing flames beneath. Fiona turned back to Ryan and said, We'll move to the edge of the churchyard and wait. Once we see the greens distracted, we'll run as fast as we can to the pub. We'll meet you there, okay? That was the deal. Don't die, because you still owe me. I'll do me best. Fiona and Aaron lingered in the entryway watching Ryan for a moment. Eventually, he had to wave to shoo them away. Even then, Fiona had to put a hand on Aaron's back before he would get moving. Once they had finally left, Ryan stood and took some deep breaths, psyching himself up for what came next. He headed to the door and glanced out across the churchyard. Fiona and Aaron were already threading their way between the gravestones and using them for cover while a dozen or more greens had wandered closer to the church's stone wall. Many more filled the road. When he started playing the piano, they would hear it for sure. He held in a sigh and let it go, his cheeks deflating slowly. Once he was out of oxygen, he took a deep breath and cleared his throat. Okay, showtime! 
He cupped his hands to his mouth and bellowed out of the doorway, Hey, you wankers! Yeah, that's it! Look over here, you fuss-covered shitheads! The match is about to start! Let's have it! The greens started to turn one by one until there were dozens of eyes looking Ryan's way. He continued to shout, waving his hands to make him more visible. Meanwhile, from the corner of his eye, he saw Fiona and Aaron crouched at the far end of the churchyard, ready to vault the stone wall and make a run for it. There were more greens further down the road, but they were distracted now by Ryan's shouting. Gradually, they began to make their way up the road. Ryan turned and made his way to the rear of the church. He hopped up the step and dodged around the open hatch. The piano was right behind it, and he pushed it on its casters so that it was right on the edge of the drop. Then he pulled over the stool and opened up the key cover. Wriggling his fingers in the air, he took a deep breath. Hey, Lynn, from the great city of Manchester, home of the UK's greatest musical talents, comes Ryan Cartwright singing for you, We Will Never Die. Ryan cleared his throat and started poking at the keys. He went low, creating ominous droning sounds, all the while bellowing in a voice that had never sang sober. We'll keep the red flag flying here. We will never die. We will never die. We'll keep the red flag flying high. Cause Man United will never die. The first green appeared at the door. A man with a pot belly beneath a Glasgow Rangers football shirt. Ryan could hardly believe the irony. His mouth fell open. You cheeky bastard. Fancy your chances, do ya? Well, if you ain't the sodding rangers, clap your hands. If you ain't the sodding rangers, clap your hands. More greens flooded into the church, the maelstrom of whipping tentacles and cascading bugs. Within seconds, the entryway of the church was packed full of them. The entire time, Ryan continued to abuse the piano keys without any understanding of how to make something resembling a tune. The flames from the cellar began to lick at the floor gratings. The church's interior began to shimmer with heat. Even with the broken windows on both sides, Ryan felt prickles on the back of his neck. The greens continued to file in, spreading out inside the empty church and getting closer and closer to the raised platform at the rear. When they laid eyes on Ryan, they grew excited, slashing at the air with their talons. Every cell in Ryan's body urged him to flee, but he couldn't, not yet. He kept playing the low notes and singing. The greens kept getting closer. The first one fell down the hatch, hitting the cellar and falling amongst the burning wood. The barriers either side of the hatch acted as a funnel, and a second and third green quickly went down right after it. Their bodies would add fuel to the fire. Ryan had counted on them being as stupid as they looked but they weren't completely stupid. After seeing their comrades fall into the trap, the next wave of greens started to push and prod at the barricades either side of it. Ryan had enough space to avoid being whipped, but it became clear they would soon be upon him. It was time for phase two of the plan. I hope your theory's right, Aaron. Now, which of these keys gives me a dog bark? Ryan slipped his fingers away from the low notes and began bashing the keys on the other end of the piano. The high-pitched tinkling made his ears hurt, but it seemed to hurt the greens too. They stopped their approach and began to jerk like arthritic street dancers. Those at the rear of the church continued forward for a few more feet, before eventually going into seizures too. It's working. Ryan bashed at the keys harder, delighting at the pain he was causing his tormentors. He forgot any notion of them being previously human. This was about survival. This was about being able to see Sophie again. Love means never giving up. Let the music play on. The barricades either side of the hatch gradually shifted aside. Despite their seizures, the greens continued to make slow progress forward, while dozens more filtered in from the entryway and shoved the entire pack forward. The flames rose through the floor grates. The air inside the church turned thick and smelled metallic. Ryan's forehead began to ooze sweat. It was nearly time to go, but he kept on hitting those high notes. 
just a little longer. Keep them here long enough that they can't get out. The first green caught fire, just its leg at first, but then the inferno took hold of its entire lower section. It toppled to the floor, green fuzz curling and blackening like burning candy floss. Another went up in flames beside it, its left leg melting and causing it to topple over. Then the church combusted, becoming a theatre of burning flesh. The greens made no sound, gave no cries of pain as their bodies burned, but the crackle of their roasting flesh could be heard even over the loud tinkling of the piano. Ryan was drenched in his own sweat. His forehead and cheeks felt sunburned. The air in front of his eyes shimmered. Thick black smoke began to rise through the floor grates. He could no longer see the entryway. It was time to go. Thank you and good night. Ryan leapt up off the piano stool and picked it up. Turning around, he hurled it at the large stained glass window. It struck the frame and bounced off, hitting the floor and rolling back to Ryan's feet. The stained glass remained intact. Shit on it! The barricades were being shifted out of the way. The greens pushed their way past, no longer held in place by the high-pitched piano notes. Several of them toppled clumsily into the hatch, but plenty more made it around the sides. Shit! 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 Ryan picked the stool up again and tossed it a second time. This time it hit dead centre. The stained glass shattered, raining down on the ground outside. Ryan launched himself over the stone window ledge and landed amongst the shards of glass. Then he was on his feet hobbling away as fast as he could. Chapter 11 The uneven ground behind the church, covered in rocks and weeds, made it tough on Ryan. His stiff left knee and four-toed foot were no longer willing to play ball. He had to use the good half of his body to drag along the bad. Behind him, the inferno inside the church grew and grew. The heat from its flames was spreading quicker than Ryan could retreat. He struggled to breathe, the air itself becoming hot. He glanced back and saw the dark shapes of bodies moving past the broken windows, flesh turning black in the fire. The flames left no gaps. The interior of the church became an inferno. Marshmallows of black smoke escaped the roof and blotted the sky. Something inside the church collapsed a wooden rafter coming down. The greens gathered further up the road, turned their heads and moved towards the noise. Would they walk to their fiery deaths, like moths roasting against a bulb? Or would they realise the danger and stay back? Ryan had seen the way they had moved around the hatch to avoid falling. The greens weren't as smart as people, but they weren't stupid either. Ryan made it to the edge of the low stone wall and froze not knowing where to go next. There were greens in front of him, but they were distracted by the blaze inside the church. Another rafter gave way, and when Ryan looked back, part of the tiled roof had sunk inwards. Several burning greens stumbled out of the entryway of the churchyard and slumped to the ground, their bodies still ablaze. Ryan dragged himself over the low stone wall and stepped onto the road. He looked left and right, not knowing which way to go. What did Fiona say? Head down the road until you see the bakery, then take a left. Ryan searched for a bakery, but all he saw were tiny cottages and short terrace runs of three or four houses at a time. The road only went two ways, back towards the bowls club and deeper into the village. He saw little option but to head away from the chaos at the church. He stumbled down the road, the instinctual feeling of being chased making him panic. But every time he looked back, the greens were still focused only on the church. As he had feared, however, the newcomers were too smart to walk into the flames. They kept their distance, watching from the road, tendrils swishing rhythmically. Ryan kept on going, passing corpses on the pavement and avoiding looking at them as well as the foul stains emanating from their torsos. The myth about a person shitting and pissing themselves after death turned out to be true. Is this how we all end up? Rotting in our own shit? 
His retreat also necessitated moving past the corkscrews embedded in the pavement. He kept his distance, but was able to clearly see the mountain of bugs amassed around their bases. There was no doubt they came from inside the corkscrews, some kind of canister. The bugs were the key to all this, he was sure. They were the vital link that spread the infection. They make the oil. The oil breeds the fungus. The road rose ahead. The village nestled among subtle hills and shallow valleys. The incline started gently but grew steep enough that Ryan's bad leg had begun to struggle. He gritted his teeth and willed himself onwards. He reached the top of the crest, and then he saw it. A few dozen meters ahead, just past a row of cottages with flower-filled window boxes, was a small shop with a plate glass window. Nothing suggested it was a bakery, except for a stack of wicker baskets out front that could have been used to hold freshly baked bread. What tipped Ryan off was the chalk A board sitting out the front on the pavement. He couldn't read the smaller text, but right at the top was a single word, Barry's. It drove home how Andy's killer had been an ordinary man just a few short days ago. Barry the baker had done something wicked, but it was no fault of his own. In the middle of the road was another corkscrew. The sight of it hardly affected Ryan. He'd become used to seeing them. They were as much a part of the Scottish landscape now as the hills and valleys. Maybe this one fell at the same time as the one behind the cottage? Maybe Barry was staggering home from the pub drunk, or maybe he was up at the crack of dawn ready to start the ovens. This thing landed right outside his shop. Barry's fate didn't matter now. What mattered was that Ryan had made it to his first waypoint without being slashed to pieces or infected. The Greens had all been attracted by the blaze at the church, acting like a herd and moving together to inspect whatever might be of interest. People? People are of interest. They want to infect everybody. Falling off the roof of the bowls club had inadvertently helped Ryan to survive because the incident had attracted all of the greens to that part of the village. It meant his escape route was clear. Take a left and you'll see the pub. That was what Fiona had said and sure enough, the road branched off alongside the bakery. Desperate to rejoin his brother, Ryan hobbled onward exiting the village's single main road and heading for the pub where he'd parked his car an eternity ago. He realised he had left his keys back up at the cottage, but there was little hope his Audi would work even if he could still unlock it. Still, the car would be a sight for sore eyes. It was part of his old life, the life before he stepped foot inside Golak Cottage. It was the car that took him and Sophie to the local pub on Sundays for a carvery, or the cinema on the odd Wednesday night. It was the only thing he owned worth more than a few quid, and even after all he'd been through, he hoped it was okay. The road narrowed ahead, forming an alleyway between two rows of feather-edge fencing, with back gates spaced evenly along that must lead to back gardens. Beside each gate were black and green wheelie bins. It was behind one of those wheelie bins that Ryan saw movement. I knew this was too easy. He clenched his fists, balancing on his one leg. A hand poked out from behind the bin, grasping at thin air. The sight of it sent a shockwave of fear through Ryan's spine, but then he considered something. A hand, not a talon. He stepped forward and glanced behind the bin. There, he found a young woman with blood-streaked blonde hair and a guts pooling around her. Somehow, she was still alive, her frightened eyes looking up at him pleadingly. The kind thing to do would be to reach out to her, but the shock sent Ryan the other way. He stepped backwards. I'll, I'll get help, I'll... But the woman wasn't listening. She gave a moan and then went silent, eyes turning glassy like those of a doll. Ryan had caught the woman's final agonizing moments of life. Now he stared at a corpse as if it had never been alive. Death was strangely dehumanizing. How long has she been lying here suffering? 
From the severity of the woman's stomach wound, Ryan doubted she'd been like this for more than an hour. She must have been attacked by a green en route to the church, attracted by Luby striking the road or Ryan's amateur piano playing. Perhaps the woman had thought it finally safe to leave her hiding place, only to run right into one of the creatures. In a way, she was lucky. At least she wasn't infected. Ryan looked around, wondering if there were any chance of the green that killed her was still around. He saw no signs of it, but he did spot something else. A knife lying on the road. Eager to possess a weapon, he took a step to retrieve it, but then paused. The blade was covered in blood, drenched in it, in fact. Several drops stained the road in a spattered line. The splashes led right from the knife to the dead woman. Ryan placed a hand on the nearest wheelie bin, getting too weak to stand. His thoughts were clear, yet they seemed fanciful. Someone had gutted the dead woman with a knife. Someone, as in another person. While he had no doubt that a green could disembowel a person, there were no signs that this had been the case. No oily green stains around the wound, no fungus, no bugs anywhere. And the wound was too deep. The more Ryan learned about the greens, the more he was sure their prime motivation was to not kill but to infect. While an errant claw across a young boy's throat might be lethal, the green's talons were designed to scratch and gouge, not butcher. How the hell could someone do this? he asked himself, although there was nobody there to answer. The greens aren't the only monsters in this village. The alleyway went on for another twenty metres or so. Ryan took one last replenishing breath and got himself moving again. He now had to be wary, not only of greens, but of dangerous strangers capable of stabbing young women to death. He wanted out of this fucking hellhole more than ever. His body had already been beaten, but now his soul was beginning to sicken. If this nightmare didn't end soon... He reached the end of the alleyway. A smile plastered itself across his face. Pie and a pint, five pounds. The pub was like any other rural pub, built from stone and surrounded by picnic tables. An old-fashioned wooden sign hung from a metal post. The Cock and Bull. Ryan staggered forward, his destination pulling him forward like a magnet. Aaron and Fiona could be inside waiting for him with a fresh beer. If they'd failed to make it here, he would have seen some sign of them. I would have found their bodies, then inside, I know it. Ryan entered an open area as the road cut through a pedestrian area. There was a post office come news agent on the left side of the road, and a fish and chip shop beside it. A small car park lay directly ahead, big enough only for a half dozen cars. There were currently three. One of them was Ryan's silver Audi TT. Its curves weren't as sexy as Tom's Alfa Romeo, and its license plate was ten years older, but it was his. It was a part of home. I'll come back for you, honey. I promise. Ryan, help me. Ryan turned in surprise and tried to leap away, but his stiff knee locked him in place. He raised his fists to fight but dropped them again when he saw it was Miles, who was staggering through the alleyway he'd just exited. The vicar bumped into a wheelie bin and almost fell, in such a rush that he didn't even notice the dead woman on the ground. He had blood all over his bald head and face. Miles? Miles kept on staggering out of the alleyway like a wounded wildebeest. The blood was coming from a large gash on the dome of his head. His eyes were wide and bewildered, but he was able to yell as he got closer. A beast! An unholy behemoth! Run, lad! Run! Miles' legs gave out and he toppled over. Ryan tried to catch him, but with only one leg and barely any strength, he toppled over too. They ended up together in a mess on the floor. Miles began to call out for help, clearly terrified. Quiet! Ryan warned. You'll bring them to us! It was right behind me. What was? Ryan tried to get up. He looked towards the pub, but only saw unlit windows. 
Were Fiona and Ryan inside? Why hadn't they come out? Why could they not hear Miles yelling? There was a noise from the alleyway. The wheelie bins falling over one by one. Something was coming. Chapter 12 Aaron stood inside the pub, drinking water and eating pork scratchings. With every minute that went by, he feared more and more that he would never see his brother again. When he looked out of the windows, he saw black smoke filling the sky. Ryan had clearly carried out his plan. The problem was, the plan hadn't gone much beyond starting a fire. How the hell was he going to get out of there? Was he already on his way or was he dead? Those were the only two possibilities, and they were both so different. One was a possibility of hope, the other was full of grief and despair. Aaron couldn't leave without his brother. He wouldn't make it on his own. He'd never been able to. No, I'm on my own. I'm going to wait for Ryan, and then we're both going to get the hell out of here. I'm going to wait. He's alive, and I know it. Any sign of him? asked Fiona. She was sipping from a glass full of vodka and warm lemonade. Drinking was probably a bad idea, but she was an adult, so what could he say? He'd never been a drinker himself, or rather he'd not yet started. But he knew that people drank when they were stressed. Bearing that in mind, he could hardly act surprised that Fiona was getting herself tipsy. I don't see anything, he told her. It's quiet. Fiona nodded. At least there are no greens out there. Your brother did a good job. We wouldn't have made it here without him. Aaron knew she was right. They had encountered several greens during their retreat to the pub, but each time they'd hidden in an alleyway or inside the alcove of a doorway until they wandered away, heading for the sound of the church's piano or merely following their brothers and sisters. The greens seemed to move in a pack whenever they got close to one another, and their attention was apparently limited to one thing at a time. Like zombies on TV? Pity we don't have Rick Grimes protecting us. And too bad this isn't America. Loads of guns and ammo. Aaron muttered to himself, an attempt to find comfort. Come on, Ryan, you have to be alive. And he was alive. Suddenly, as if Aaron was imagining it, Ryan came staggering out of a nearby alleyway. He was in a bad way, covered in unravelling soot-stained bandages and sweat. His left leg was dragging behind him. Aaron stared so hard that his forehead bumped against the glass and made himself jump. He's here, Fiona, it's Ryan, he's outside. Fiona raced over to join him at the window, placing the vodka down on the window ledge. When she saw Ryan, she beamed. Thank God! He's hurt, we need to help him. Yeah, come on. The double doors at the front of the pub had been locked when they'd arrived, so they'd made it in through a staff exit in the kitchen that had been propped open using a brick. It meant that they couldn't immediately make it to Ryan. They had to go out via the kitchen and loop around to the front of the building. Aaron was just glad to see all the greens were gone. They slid out of the kitchen exit and made sure to ensure the brick remained in place. If Ryan was too weak to move, they would need to come back inside to rest. The place was pretty big. It even had an upstairs that they hadn't yet had time to check. It would make a better hideout than the church and bowls club combined. Aaron was the furthest thing from a runner there was, which was why Fiona quickly powered ahead of him as they went to get Ryan. By the time they'd reached the front of the pub, he had a stitch in his ribs the size of one of his mam's knitting needles. The pain didn't matter, though. It was his turn to be there for his brother. Ryan was no longer alone. He had fallen to the ground alongside someone else. Is that Miles? Fiona frowned. What's he doing here? Miles was yelling out in terror. Ryan appeared bewildered staring off into the alleyway at something. An echoing racket was coming from somewhere. Fiona hurried to get to Ryan and Aaron was right behind her. Ryan's face was pale. He opened his mouth and bellowed, Run! But Aaron didn't run, not knowing what was going on. He grabbed his brother and started getting him to his feet. Fiona grabbed Miles. 
something huge emerged from the nearby alleyway. The beast looked upon them with a single fuzzy green eyeball the size of a BMX tire. Instead of two tentacles, like the ordinary greens, this one had a dozen or more, each of them tipped with a bony claw and slashing at the air. Behind its two powerful legs, the beast dragged a sack of corrupted flesh. People? It's dragging people behind it? Somehow, a mass of infected people had lumped together like glue-covered spiders. Their arms, legs, and tentacles were tangled together, seeming to form new combined limbs. Several greens had mushed together to form the beast's torso. Ryan still wasn't on his feet, so Aaron yanked him harder. Get up! With a grunt, Ryan got himself up on his one good leg and wrapped an arm around Aaron's shoulder. It's the devil, yelled Miles, sounding like he'd lost his mind. The devil! Fiona bundled the vicar towards the pub. Then she turned back to help Aaron with Ryan. They moved as fast as they could. You bloody men are useless! Aaron glanced back behind them. The beast was coming after them. It was so heavy that its bounding strides sent vibrations through the road. I tried to hide, Miles jabbered, in Mr. Reed's shed, but it knocked the thing down right on top of me. It knew I was inside. Fiona shushed him. Shut up, keep moving. Aaron looked back again. They weren't going to make it. The beast was big and cumbersome, but it would be on top of them in seconds. Aaron stopped letting go of his brother and planted his feet. Get Ryan inside, he yelled. I'll be right there. Fiona didn't argue, but Ryan did. Aaron, what are you doing? but it was too late. The beast swung a knot of tendrils at Aaron, a multi-headed whip. Aaron threw himself aside and tumbled across the ground, his elbow striking the road. The pain only added to his fear and adrenaline. He leapt up like a cat and broke into a run, heading towards the alleyway his brother and the beast had come from. To make sure the massive creature followed him, Aaron looked back and yelled, Hey, you big ugly freak, come and get me! The beast turned, its giant eyeball rotating amongst the rotting green and brown flesh, holding its entire body together. As it moved, writhing bodies swept the floor, sheets of skin shearing off as they dragged along the ground. Once Aaron was sure the beast was giving chase, he rushed into the alleyway. He saw several wheelie bins and tipped them over. The beast was clumsy. It might buy him some time. Aaron locked his jaw and ran as fast as he could. I can do this! Chapter 13 We have to go back! Ryan fought to get free of Fiona, but he was too weak. Truthfully, if she let go of him, he would fall. Aaron will be okay, said Fiona but her eyes betrayed the lie. She didn't believe it. They'd both seen that thing, the size of ten men, a real-life hulk. She couldn't meet his gaze any longer and looked away. Miles had calmed down a little since they were no longer being chased. He had held his bleeding head and took hurried breaths, walking backwards so that Ryan and Fiona didn't get left behind. It was the wrong decision to abandon you, Ryan. I'm sorry. Fear drove me, and I made a mistake, but I came back to help you rescue your brother. I appreciate it, but it didn't help. How did you even get here? Did you see Luby? No, I saw no one. I headed back to the common to find you, but there were fecking greens everywhere. I tried to cut through the village, but that, that devil found me. Ryan didn't really care, but talking kept him from freaking out. What happened to your head? Are you infected? Miles removed his hand from his wounded pate and examined the blood on his fingers. I tried to hide inside Mr. Reed's rickety old shed, but when the beast knocked the roof right down on top of me, I got clocked by a piece of wood. The beast never touched me, though. I, I think I'm okay. You led that thing right to my brother? I'm sorry, Ryan. Truly, I am. Fiona pointed with a free hand towards the rear of the pub. 
We left a door open round the back. It's safe inside. We should wait inside for Aaron. He'll come back once it's safe. Miles nodded. He'll open the thing. He's a young lad, quick as a whippet. Ryan tried to feel a little more hopeful. While Miles had been battered and disoriented, he had kept ahead of the beast long enough to reach the pub. Aaron was surely faster than he was. Not that a hobby of video games and Netflix was any kind of training, still he had a chance. But we're separated again. Every time I get Aaron back, he falls right back into danger. No, this time I was the one in danger and Aaron saved me. Just around here, said Fiona, leading them around the corner of the pub. The rear of the pub had an uneven patio and a grass beer garden walled off with bricks. Ryan noticed a bench with fungus growing on its legs. Just like at the church, it seemed the growth could take to things other than flesh. He pictured a world covered in green fuzz. No life except for the spreading fungus. Hell. Fiona helped Ryan over to a stack of patio chairs, then placed one down for him to sit on. Then she hurried over to a small windowless door set against the pub's rear wall. It was closed and seemed to have no handle. Fiona banged a fist against it. I can't believe this. How did it close? We left it propped open with a brick. You mean that brick over there? Ryan nodded to a sandstone brick lying on the patio a few feet away. He noticed it was the same as the bricks making up the wall around the beer garden. Fiona stared at it, eyes narrowing. Somebody moved it. Somebody must be inside. She banged on the door again. Hey! Hey, whoever's in there, let us in! No one opened the door. Fiona walked backwards, staring up at the windows of the upper floor. Hello? Is anyone in there? They all waited. Fiona flinched. Hey! I see you! Let us in! Open up! She turned and looked at Ryan and Miles. There's someone up there. I saw the blinds move. Someone's upstairs. Miles looked up at the window and shouted, This is the vicar speaking! We need you to let us in at once! Ryan chuckled. It was all so ridiculous, so pointless. This is the vicar speaking, he muttered to himself. Maybe you should have said you were speaking on behalf of God himself. Miles frowned. The blood leaking out of his skull had stained his neck. His dog collar was now a solid strip of dark red. What are you laughing at, lad? This is serious! Is it? I can't tell anymore. Nothing makes sense. Fiona was growing frantic. This holy
put his hands on his hips and gyrated. Ain't morbidly obese no more, me. Just regular obese. Lasses can't get enough. Ryan chuckled. I'll bet. Luby definitely looked better for the weight loss, but something about him didn't seem quite right. It was as if his bones were too big for his body. He'd shaved his head as well, which made his face appear pudgy and round. Might have to break it to you later, our kid. It's not a good look. Sean and Brett moved from the side of the Stelvio and joined everyone at the front. Sean was twitching like a maniac, as per usual, the human incarceration of Mad Ferret. His green eyes shifted left and right as he hopped on the toes of his blood-red trainers. This place is proper mint. You could chop some poor bastard up here and no one would ever find the pieces. Next to him, Brett rolled his eyes behind his sensible black glasses. He was always the most serious of the group, but it only took a few drinks to loosen him up. After that, he was as up for a laugh as anybody was. It's the Scottish Highlands, Sean, he muttered, not the Nevada desert. There's gangsters everywhere, pal, you should know that. Because I'm black? Nah, because you're a shady bastard. I'm a fully qualified veterinarian. Exactly. What kind of geezer studies eight years to stick his finger up a dog's ass? Shady is what that is. Idiot. Ryan chuckled. He was already having the best time he'd had in ages. Just being with the lads made him happy. When was the last time they'd all been together like this? Too long. I've been spending too much time with Sophie. Luby went to Aaron who was still standing on the uneven slabs that made up the cottage's front step. How's it going, our kid? Oh, good. Are you going to have a lark with us? Yeah. Luby didn't push it. He knew Aaron well enough to recognise his shyness, so he tussled the lad's greasy brown hair and turned back to the others. Sean's right, this place is mint. We're going to have a right laugh. Yeah, we are, said Ryan looking around and enjoying the scenery with his mates. Living in Manchester, he'd hopped the border into Scotland once or twice, but he'd never gone further than Glasgow. The seven-hour drive it had taken to reach the cottage had been miserable. And at 4am this morning, when he and Aaron had set off, it seemed like the biggest mistake ever. That changed as soon as the landlord ferried them up from the village and handed over the keys. Ryan had never seen the sky so wide or the land so vibrantly hued. He had expected mountainous grey rock and featureless glens, but the highlands were nothing like that. The land was full of life, coloured in a hundred different shades. A multitude of birds filled the sky. Every bush rustled when you passed it, unseen critters hiding within. The drive had been worth it. This entire weekend will be worth it. Where's your car? asked Tom, peering around, hands still in his chinos. Ryan blushed. I parked up in the village to grab the keys and the landlord pissed himself laughing. Cheeky sod said I wouldn't make it halfway here before I ended up in a ditch. I had to leave me car behind while he drove us up here in his Land Rover. McGregor his name was. Could barely understand a word he said. Sean threw his head back and laughed. I told you not to buy that poxy Audi, you daft bastard. You're a right poser, you are, our kid. Hey, don't insult the TT. She's my girl. Brett folded his arm and raised an eyebrow. 
It's classic pose born from an innate disapproval of most things. I thought Sophie was your girl. Isn't that why we're here? To celebrate your love and impending nuptials? Do one, said Sean. We're here to get hanging. Starting now. Luby pulled her face. Can't we have a mooch first? Let's enjoy some of this clean air. There ain't a kebab shop in sight. Sean recoiled, orange freckles bunching on his cheeks. You what? We ain't here to go sightseeing, you bellend. I just want to settle in first before the madness starts. It was a long drive and I'm knackered. Tom seemed to agree because he was nodding. The drive was an endurance test, to say the least. It didn't help that Luby and Sean were competing in the Fart Olympics most of the way here. Brett grimaced, his glasses riding on the ridge of his scrunched-up nose. Yeah, that was rough. Luby looked away sheepishly. I couldn't help it. Me guts were acting up. Heaven knows why, said Tom. You didn't need a thing the entire way here. You must be starving. I'll eat later. Ryan was confused. You could usually depend on Luby to have a good time, but he seemed on a downer. His reluctance to party was disheartening, but Ryan didn't want to be a dick about it. So he looked at Sean and shrugged. We're here all weekend, mate. No need to rush. Sod that! Sean reached into his jean pocket and produced a baggie filled with a white powder. He dipped a finger in and rubbed the contents on his gums. Ah, oh, that's banging! Anyone want a taste? Everyone declined. While none of them were saints, this was a weekend on the lash, not the reenactment of train spotting. Ryan had never been one for drugs. Alcohol gave him enough of a buzz. Sean could keep his gear. They still had jobs to go to on Monday. Don't think about work. That's the last thing I want in my head. I'm here to have a laugh and nothing else. This might be me last chance. OK, said Ryan, clapping his hands together. Let me give you the grand tour. He strolled towards the side of the cottage, beckoning everyone to follow. Over here, we have a large, mysterious shed, which the landlord informs me is to remain locked at all times. I'm getting in there, said Sean. I swear down. Try to behave, said Tom, smoothing back his blonde hair as it flapped in the wind. I know it'll be difficult. Sod off. Ryan glared at Sean playfully. I had to pay a deposit on this place, mate, so nothing gets broken, OK? It's not meant for parties usually, but I found it cheap online and convinced the landlord we'd behave. Sean pulled a face. What do you mean it's not meant for parties? It's a spiritual retreat or something. That would explain the spooky-looking cross over there, said Luby, pointing to a circle of white stones, within which stood a large wooden cross. The only thing lacking was a sacrificial altar. Another thing we're not supposed to mess with, said Ryan. It's like hundred years old. The landlord said it would be a crime to damage it. I'm climbing it said Sean, pupils already like dinner plates. Ryan groaned, Sean, don't make me regret inviting you, OK? I came here to party. This is a stag do, ain't it? Ryan rolled his eyes but ended up laughing. Sean was a live wire, sure, but he'd never been any different. A party with him was a party you remembered, and Ryan wanted this one to be a weekend none of them ever forgot. OK, Behind the cottage is a big hill, as you can see. I suggest we don't try to climb it, because the nearest hospital is 30 miles away. Back the way we came, down by the road, is a little stream. Me and Aaron have been down there already, it's nice. The water's crystal clear, said Aaron meekly. There are fish in it. Skinny dipping, said Sean, rubbing his hands together. Nice! Brett pulled a face. Really, Sean, just us guys? Ryan's got strippers, ain't he? Ryan was forced to disappoint them. Do you really think a stripper would come out here? Two miles from the nearest village? To entertain a bunch of drunken idiots? No way, mate. Would have been a non-starter. Tom chuckled and gave Sean a playful shove. His expensive watch glittered in the sunlight. Yes, that would be a rather unwise career move for a young lady. We're not rapists, said Luby, wounded. Jesus, you make it sound like we're dangerous. They all looked at Sean. 
One of us has already talked about chopping up bodies, said Brett. Sean tutted. I ain't gonna kill nobody, am I? I'm just excited. Good to know, said Ryan. Okay, let's go inside. About time. Luby clutched himself and shivered. I'm freezing me nuts off here. You could have booked us a weekend in Ibiza, Ryan. Sean pinched his belly fat. Freezing? With all that insulation? Well, piss off. I'm a bit chilly too, said Aaron, wearing only a light grey jacket. He didn't own anything thicker because he hardly ever left the house. Ryan nodded to the front door, a solid slab of wood with a cute diamond-shaped window at the top. Let's get in and build a fire. Everyone, grab your gear. They grabbed their bags from the car and headed inside. While the exterior was traditional, whitewashed stone and a thatched roof, the interior was modern. Manufactured oak planks covered the floor and the bulk of the living space was open plan. A compact kitchen diner adjoined a large lounge area with a fireplace and television. A stack of shiny blue solar panels behind the cottage provided electricity, along with a diesel generator beside the shed. Even inside, with the door closed, you could hear the motor thrumming away. Ryan led everyone to the kitchen counter, which he'd stacked full of beers, vodka and bottled water. There was shopping bags full of snacks on the floor and pizzas in the fridge. Eat regularly and stay hydrated, he told them, or you'll be out of the game. I'll stick to vodka me, said Sean, grabbing a bottle and unscrewing the cap. Before he swigged, he looked at everyone and shrugged. What? It's what we're here for, ain't it? Ryan grabbed a beer. Let's get this party started. Because Tom is coming out, said Sean, elbowing Tom in the ribs. Tom rolled his eyes. Moron. Next, Ryan showed everyone to their bedrooms. The master was on the ground floor at the rear of the cottage, through a door beside the stairs. Ryan and Aaron would share its double bed. The staircase was opposite the kitchen, and on the upper floor were three cramped bedrooms. Sean and Luby agreed to share the room with twin beds, while Brett and Tom had a double each. Sean pulled a face when they re-emerged onto the landing. There's only one bathroom. I ain't going in after Luby's taking a dump. Everyone chuckled. We're in the wilderness, said Aaron. He clutched himself as he spoke, as if he was worried someone might prod him in the chest. Everywhere's a toilet, if you want it to be. Sean nodded. Good point, our kid. Luby, you'll have to drop your kecks outside. Luby shoved Sean against the pastel blue wall. It wasn't a fair fight when it came to weight divisions. But Sean rubbed his elbow and grinned like a Cheshire cat. Get off, you fat bastard! Everyone laughed. The noise echoed off the old-fashioned white tiles that made up the bathroom's floor. The toilet and bath were lime green, the colour of kiwis. The sink, too. Ryan felt a little queasy just looking at it. Time for an update. Sean was still beaming. I've missed you, Pillux. We should do this more often. Ryan nodded enthusiastically. I know, right? What happened to us? We, we used to go uptown every weekend. Now we're all too busy. We grew up, said Tom. We're not teenagers anymore, Ryan. You're about to get married. I'm settled down with Amanda and Luby has a daughter. Brett sticks his fingers up dog's bum holes, Sean added. Brett rolled his eyes. You really are on form today, aren't you? Are you going to be like this all weekend? There's a strong possibility. Ryan sighed, frustrated without really knowing why. Growing up doesn't mean our lives have to be over, though, does it? We can still have a laugh. Of course we can, said Luby. We're here now, ain't we? Ryan patted him on the back. I'm just missing the old days, I guess. Sean pointed a finger at Ryan and cackled. He's getting cold feet, lads. Is that why you dragged us out here in the middle of nowhere, our kid? You're running out on the missus. Ryan felt himself blush. Give over. I'm just glad we're all together like old times. It means a lot that you all came. Of course we came, said Tom. We wouldn't have missed it for the world. Absolutely, said Luby, cracking his first actual smile since he'd arrived. You're my best mates and always will be. 
Sean reached out and grabbed Luby's cock, making him shy away. The hell you doing, Sean? Ah, uh, sorry, our kid. I thought we were going to start nobbing. Uh, can we go downstairs now and start drinking, you bunch of jesses? A smile crept onto Ryan's face. This was going to be a weekend to remember. OK, lads, let's go make some memories. Everyone agreed. Chapter 2 Ryan got a buzz as he started his third beer, and he was pleased to see Aaron moving on to his second. Maybe his younger brother would actually loosen up and have a good time this weekend. This might make it worth the ear-bashing Ryan's mam had given him about taking a 15-year-old on a stag do. Best make sure he doesn't overdo it. A couple of hangovers won't kill him, though. I just need to keep him away from Sean. Yeah, definitely keep him away from Sean. A blue three-seater sofa took up the largest part of the lounge, placed opposite the stone fireplace. A beige two-seater sat perpendicular to it, with a black leather armchair completing the U-shaped seating arrangement and a low glass coffee table making up the centre. A modest television was perched on a table in the corner, while a narrow console table took up the space beside the front door. A lamp and a guest book sat on top of it. Brett was sitting on the larger sofa beside Ryan, sipping from a highball glass full of vodka and coke. As well as being the most serious, he was also the most intelligent, a full-blown vet as of a few months ago when he'd finally qualified. It made Ryan anxious just thinking about the amount of studying and training it must have taken Brett to get where he was. He would have had to have quit after the first year. In fact, that's what Ryan had done. A year of technical college, but no more, thank you very much. Goodbye, forever classrooms. Stick it up your ass, teachers. Brett was a different animal, though. Driven, determined, and desperate to show that a black kid from Manchester's mean streets could achieve anything an entitled white kid from Hampshire could. To his credit, he'd done just that. Ryan nodded at Brett's drink. You're off to a good start. Tough week? Brett tilted his glass and stared through his glasses into the fizzy brown mixture. Not particularly. Had to euthanise a four-year-old cocker spaniel, which wasn't fun. But other than that, it's been a pretty routine few days. I don't think I could do your job, mate. After eight years of studying, I would hope not. Nah, I mean... I couldn't put an animal down. Brett tutted. I'm not a monster. The cocker spaniel ingested rat poison from a neighbour's garden. His kidneys were failing. It's not my favourite part of the job, admittedly, but I remind myself that the animals are going to suffer with or without me. My job is to help those I can. Ryan raised his pint glass. Proper respect, mate. I'm proud of you. Brett clinked his glass against Ryan's. I'm proud of you too. Give over. I'm 25 and dig flower beds for a living. Yeah, sure, now and then my boss might let me help lay a deck, but other than that, I'm a dog's body. Right success story, me. I'm proud that you're getting married. To be honest, I thought you'd stay a bachelor forever. Instead, you're one of the first of us to take the plunge. Ryan's throat was dry, so he swigged his lager before talking again. I ain't married yet. This weekend, I'm still a free man. I'll toast to that. To freedom, said Ryan, loudly enough that everybody heard him. They all raised their drinks. To freedom and drugs, said Sean. In the last two or three hours, he'd taken another two hits from his baggie of cocaine, and he was now talking a mile a minute. Luby had adopted a blank expression, no longer even attempting to keep up. In fact, he seemed liberated by the brief interruption. Anyone fancy a cuppa, he said. Might take the chill off it. Ryan frowned. I'm not cold, mate. We've got a good fire going. Thanks to Tom, who'd stacked the wood like an expert, due to having grown up in a big old house that seemed to have an open fireplace in every single room. Get a drink down, ya, said Sean. I can't believe you ain't had one yet. What's wrong with you? Luby shrugged. I'm just feeling a bit iffy. Think it's travel sickness from the never-ending dive here. 
Excuse me, said Tom pissily. You were brought here in absolute luxury. Your car might be luxurious, said Sean, but you drive like a joyriding wino. And if you don't ride an Alfa Romeo fast, you don't deserve to be behind the wheel. Sean looked at the others while nodding at Tom. Ark at him, Jeremy Sodding Clark's in here. Tom chuckled. Yes, okay, Bez. Everyone hooted with laughter. Sean straightened up in his armchair. Fuck's that supposed to mean? Nothing, it's a joke. I don't get it. The joke, said Tom, is that we're all from Manchester, but none of us are anywhere near as mank as you. Everyone laughed, except for Sean, who leaned forward with a scowl on his face. His eyes were like deep pools of ink. I'm proud of me roots, me. Why don't you piss off back to private school if you don't like it, Tom? Whoa, 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 said Luby. Chill out, our kid. Don't bring the mood down. Sean's freckled cheeks flushed, matching the colour of his short, coppery hair. Posh twat and his goddamn Alfa Romeo thinks his shit don't stink. Tom rolled his eyes. We've been mates for over a decade, Sean. When have I ever acted like the snob? You always thought you were better than us? Ryan didn't like where this was going. If problems occurred this weekend, it would most definitely be because of Sean. They all knew it. Whenever they had used to go out on the lash, Sean would always be the one to start a fight or disappear in a taxi with some dodgy bird. But out here in the middle of nowhere, there were no strangers for Sean to go off with. There was only the six of them. Get real, Sean! Ryan tried to convey the ridiculousness of the situation by chuckling as he spoke. Tom isn't being a snob, he's just proud of his new car, wouldn't you be? If I worked for it, yeah, not if me old man bought it. Tom growled, are you kidding me? I paid for it myself. In fact, no I didn't, it's a goddamn lease, okay? Sean leapt out of the armchair and started pacing back and forth on the other side of the coffee table like a caged lion. A lease, paid for by a fat solicitor's salary from daddy's firm. Tom stood up too. I've had enough of this. More fool me for offering to drive everybody up here. I shouldn't have bothered. Sean stopped pacing and glared. You want to make a move, our kid? No, I don't. I'm going outside to get some air. Please 